Okay, we're good. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee public hearing for Monday, March 22nd, 2021. Um, I'd like to begin. Any comments from uh, my co-chair or ranking members before we start? Morning, everyone. Um, sounds like we're in for a very long day today, so um, let's let's hope we can keep keep on schedule here and and be judicious in our questioning and hear from the public. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. Thank you. Good morning, all, and uh, I'll say a lot less than my uh, chairman staff. So have a good day. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, all right, we're going to begin with the first person on our list, which I, I see him in the room. It's uh, Commissioner Angel, Angel Kiros. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. You may begin. You have your three minutes. Good morning, Representative Stastrom, Fishbein, Senator Winfield, and Senator Kissel, and the members of the Judicial Committee. I am Angel Kiros, the Commissioner of Corrections. I'm here to, test, to testify on Senate Bill 1059. I've also submitted written testimony on this bill and three other bills before you today. It is vital for this committee to understand the environment I have faced since I was confirmed by the General Assembly last month. I have already announced the closure of Northern Correctional Institution effective this July 1st, and I am working to close two additional facilities before the end of the next biennium. Having spent the last 32 years serving the Department of Correction, I am keenly aware that the plea from the community advocates to close Northern have been voiced for years past. But I made the bold decision as a new commissioner to close that facility. I'm here before you asking for the opportunity to prove to our staff that we can safely and humanely manage these challenging populations at other locations. Simultaneously to the daunting task of closing three correctional facility, all of the correctional bargaining units are currently in contract negotiations with their agreement expiring this July 1st. I'm also anticipating preparing for a significant number of additional retirements before July 1st of 2022 due to the major change to the pension structure. I'm in the midst of training all correctional officers in the use of force, uh, use of force charges as a result of last year police accountability law, as well as the last minute addition of the duty to intervene when excessive or illegal use of force is witnessed. I'm also moving ahead on my own initiatives to make the changes in out of cell time, length of the restricted housing status, and the use of restraints. I'm also overhauling the correctional officer training to include successful uh, returning citizens to address staff, enhancing de escalation techniques, and emphasizing the importance to assist incarcerated individuals to support a successful transition into, into the community. Finally, I am continuing to address the need for our additional health service staff to provide medical and mental health care to those under my custody. I'm doing all these things while moving forward with the COVID vaccination, testing efforts, and eventually resume contact visits and large scale programming in our facilities. These are all major endeavors and changes I must deal with while maintaining safety and security for the public, my staff, and the incarcerated population. Some of the proposed some of the proposals in Senate Bill 1059 are already being addressed by me and my staff, just maybe not to the extent or to the speed desired by the proponents. Reestablishing a correction ombudsman office, which assisted in my career, is, is worthy of a discussion. But this bill is so perceptive, expensive, and costly in the minds of a very dynamic uh, correction environment that I cannot envision any commissioners being able to agree to and successfully execute them without a major negative consequence. Give me the time to execute change, to carefully consider policy, allow me the opportunity to lead the agency through a shift of culture, hold me accountable. In closing, I am committed to work with the committee and the General Assembly on additional improvements which can be accomplished safe, safely within this challenging climate. That is the end of my um, testimony. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Representative Fishbach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Um, Commissioner, I, I can't find your your written testimony, and um, I understand that you're you're opposed to 1059, and I understand the, the reasons. Um, but what is I, I would expect that you had submitted something with regard to SB 972. Did you? 
the telecommunication yes. services. Okay. Yes. And I, and I don't believe that was addressed in your opening remarks. And, you know, generally in a nutshell, what is your position on SB 972? I said it before, I'm not in opposition of uh, uh, Senate Bill 972, which allows for uh, phone calls to be free for the individuals. But I am currently on, a, on under a contract, the Department of Corrections is currently under a contract that DAS administers and uh, uh, um, the negotiation is not done uh, um, by my agency. Uh, but I am support the uh, reduction of the cost. And uh, if the state can find uh, a way to make it free for the individuals in my custody, I will support that. And um, what is, to your knowledge, the status of that contract? I, I thought that it was a two-year contract. And I think the last time we talked about this, it was about two years ago. So is that contract up for renewal and is being negotiated? What's the status? There were some negotiations done in 2020 with DAS and the cost of the phone calls went down four cent. Uh, um, the governor and his um, budget allocated, I believe it was like $1 million towards the um, CSSD's budget for the uh, salary of the probation officers. Um, and this contract, this current contract, I sent it for one more year. So we'll be back out to RFPs uh, sometime in 2022. Okay. And do you know, is DAS actively negotiating the, um, the continuation of that contract? D DAS continued to negotiate and I think they finalized it. And that's where it resulted in a four cents drop on the call call to the uh, individuals under my custody. Um, that will go for another year. And in 2022, um, the whole contract will be going out for bid on an RFP. Okay. And you mentioned that revenue from this goes to pay for certain services. Um, I think you mentioned probation. Um, so am I to understand that when there's a cost for providing the service and there's a, um, a cost that's charged to the end user that comes back to the state. Is that basically the framework of the way it works presently? So there's a, um, the Department of Correction at the end of the, um, each year will get $350,000 from the services um, generated, from the revenues generated from telephone calls, that $350,000 uh, we'll go back into the uh, uh, inmate programming piece. Uh, uh, CSSD does have uh, um, 30 to 40 uh, probation officers that those revenues pay for their salaries. And then there is the, uh, um, the technology project that's also funded with the revenues from these calls. So when you say funded from these calls, is it an enterprise fund? And, and what I mean by that, sir, is that it's all inclusive, that if these calls are free, that, well, free, when I say that there's no money coming back to the state as contemplated, I think, by this legislation, would those positions and those programs go away? Yeah, the uh, state will be forced to look at other uh, options on how to fund those salaries they will have to look at other options on how to find the um, tech, technology uh, upgrade. And then they will have to look, uh, um, because if it's free for Department of Correction, they will still be an expense with the vendor. Okay, and I'm just trying to get to the, my understanding is that the monies that come back from these calls, they don't go directly to the lines that fund, they go to the general fund and then from there, money is appropriated in the budget. There's a revenue portion in the budget and there's an expenditure in the budget, but they it's not just like one account. Am I being clear here? I have, um, let's see. There, there is a statue that dictates where this money goes. Okay. 
And do you happen to know what that statute is, sir? I will be able to get it for you and I'll, I'll email it to you. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, I think that's enough information on that. That's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Callahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, when it comes to what, uh, I, I guess we're going to be using the term kickbacks, the, all the states around the country who have these telecommunications contracts get a certain percentage of kickback that goes into, as Representative Fishbein was just saying, different funds. Uh, do you know what the percentage of uh, kickback Connecticut gets is? I would say the final amount is um, close to um, $12 million. Do you know percentages though, sir? I can get you the percentage. Okay. Uh, and also uh, I'll have other, I, I don't want to uh, belabor the committee's time too much because I'll have questions for some of the other speakers, but uh, on 1059, uh, when it comes to solitary confinement, I, I, want, I don't have, you know, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a tough practice, but being the commissioner correction, are there inmates sometimes that are so dangerous that they're a danger to staff and, and their bunk mates to the point where they need to be kept by themselves? The simple answer is yes, but as a commissioner, I also recognize that if I want to be at the table of criminal justice reform, uh, uh, I am reviewing, currently reviewing those policies that are in place with these restrictive programs uh, uh, as far as the use of restraints, um, the out of cell time, the length of the program, to make some changes to maintain that safety uh, 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 with, with the individuals under my under my custody, I don't want to make uh, um, changes that's gonna I'm gonna end up in a year or two here in front of this committee, and uh, the committee questioned me why are your sauce on the individuals in, under your custody so high? Uh, um, so I want to do it safely, and, uh, uh, and and right, but recognizing that the uh, um, last time we changed these restrictive programs um, status was in 2013, so it's been almost eight years. So uh, um, I have an obligation to review these uh, programs and continue to make changes so that, uh, uh, and this is just a small percentage. It's not a, 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 right now, I think it's like under 3% of the individuals that are, uh, uh, um, that are causing these um, problems. In um, 2009, when I was the warden at Northern, I had 220 AS uh, uh, offenders going through the program. When we made the change in 2014, um, this morning, AS phase one, I had like 32 offenders. So um, so we've come a long way, but there's still room for improvement though. I thank you for coming in this morning, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Other comments or questions from other members of the committee? Comments or questions from other members of the committee? Uh, Commissioner, let me let me just get a little bit of clarity on your, your position on 1059. It seemed to me that you um, were in opposition to the bill, but there were at least some parts of the bill uh, that uh, your opposition wasn't uh, included in, at least in whole. Uh, and you mentioned that when you came into the um, uh, into the system, that there was an ombuds person uh, that that was in effect at that time. Uh, but it wasn't clear to me, uh, I think you weren't in opposition, at least to the concept of an ombudsman, but it wasn't totally clear to me. So if you could clarify if there are parts of this bill that you think are actually um, good or parts of the bill that uh, maybe we could do, that would be useful. We'll, we'll start with the ombudsman, Senator Winfield. Um, as I indicated back in 1989, when we started, there was a correction ombudsman assigned to Department of Correction in 2009 because of a budget issue. That line item was eliminated and uh, uh, um, the abuzzment was removed. So I am not uh, against, uh, uh, I can work with an abuzzman. I can support an abuzzman uh, uh, um, being part of the Department of Correction, uh, overseeing um, the agency, investigating and reporting out. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, uh, the part that's concerning is the, uh, uh, um, the civilian panel and that nine member civilian panels. Uh, uh, that's a little concerning to me for the simple reason that uh, uh, um, if you're gonna have a panel overseeing uh, uh, the Department of Correction, 
I mean, there should be some experience and some knowledge of what it takes to be the uh, 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 to run an agency as a commissioner. So uh, uh, that's a little concerning. So, but I can work with the ombudsman. I think there's language there that I can work with the committee to uh, 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 to get at something where uh, uh, both sides will be happy. Uh, uh, the there's a session two when it comes to uh, um, workers comp for the uh, uh, um, for our workers of PTSI. Uh, however, you're just adding correctional officers. I would wanna encourage that we add all correctional staff because it's not just correctional officers that will respond to an incident uh, uh, and, and witness uh, 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 some trauma. Um, you got nurses are part of the response team. You got supervisors are part of the response team. You may have a teacher that's near the area. Any hazardous duty employee who's around the area will be uh, uh, responsible to respond to the incident. So uh, uh, um, I would encourage more language to go there. Um, on the isolation piece, uh, uh, there will be half, we'll have to have conversation uh, eight hours out of a cell. These facilities, the, the newest facility that was constructed, I just closed, it was Northern. These facilities were constructed in the 60s, 70s, and some in the 90s. Uh, um, th the room in the housing unit is not conducive to uh, uh, allow 100 people to be in that, uh, 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 you know, anywhere from, from 75 to 100 people to be in that recreation area. Uh, and now with COVID-19, it's even more concerning because of social distancing. I mean, so uh, 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 typically in the uh, cell facilities, we do bottom tier and top tier. That's half of the population. And, uh, and even, just even when doing one tier, it's kind of crowded. So uh, uh, that will, uh, um, the way that this bill is written will require me to ask for additional uh, um, resources uh, uh, in order to make it safe for the individuals under my custody and to prevent. Uh, um, uh, I think we can work on the out of cell time I was talking about, and I met with the uh, solitary confinement group recently. And uh, um, you know, there's two facilities. One is Cheshire that I'm working with the deputy commissioner of operation to increase the out of cell time. And the other one is there's a, a housing unit at uh, uh, Osmo CI. We're looking to increase the out of cell time. The eight hours that a mandate here in this, uh, uh, um, in this bill can easily be done in dorm setting environments. Uh, uh, we're meeting that uh, a lot more, but in, in your county jails and in your cell facilities, you know, it'll be difficult to meet eight hours. I'll probably, be going into probably 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning to try to meet uh, 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 these recreation time out of cell just to do it safely with a, uh, uh, with a, a group of, of individuals in my custody. Uh, I can't put 100 people in a, in, in a crowded day room. I can't. So, you know, so we're going to have to get creative on how to do it and it, it will require more resources and more. So, but it, again, I still can work with the out of cell time uh, uh, in this draft. Um, I'm just going real quick on the notes I took, Senator Winfield, see what other um, uh, training. Commissioner, I, I was just seeking whatever you felt oh, you you uh, could answer that question with. I wasn't seeking anything in particular. Um, let me just say this, and then I'll recognize Representative Howard, whose hand I see. Um, I, I appreciate uh, your efforts. You and I have had many conversations. I'm sure we're going to have even more over the next couple of weeks. Um, and I don't think you were saying this, but I just want to be clear that um, the need for additional resources to do good policy uh, is an important thing and not a reason not to do that good policy. Uh, but I, I will say I, while I have had a, uh, I think, better working relationship with you than some of some of your predecessors, I am a, a, a little wary about um, the notion that um, more time is, is the answer uh, because of because of what has been represented to me in the past by uh, prior commissioners of correction, particularly on this issue. I will also say that um, we, we passed a bill not too long ago about uh, the ombuds person uh, as it relates to uh, our youth. Uh, and we still haven't made the progress we're supposed to make on that. And so um, I, I, have to, I have to be honest that I'm a little wary of it, but if we move forward, I hope, and do not move forward with this bill in the way that I'm hoping we do, uh, I hope that what you represent to us turns out to be the case. Um, 
Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Representative Howard for a comment or question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I apologize for speaking after. Just one thing just sort of jumped out at me I, as I was scrolling through this bill. And good morning, Commissioner. Um, yeah. I'm just looking uh, on 1059, line 464, if I read from that, it says that in order to, um, a, a person has to be a captain or above. No staff member with a rank lower than captain may subject an incarcerated person to the use of physical restraints. Is that even reasonable in, in, in the correctional facility? Are, are you gonna be coming back to us and saying, hey, everybody needs to be captain or better now, we gotta start paying these salaries? Great point, uh, Representative Howard. Um, you're right, I don't have a captain on, uh, um, captains are uh, on first shift, second shift, third shift, but they're Monday to Friday. So on the weekend, I have lieutenants that are acting in the capacity of a, of a captain, but I don't have captains working uh, um, on the weekends. I mean, it, it even goes further. It even goes further that on the, uh, uh, to extend it, uh, it reaches all the way up to my office at the commissioner's level for approval, uh, uh, um, you know, so the way it's written, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not practical, but I think that a uh, 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 man which can be put in there, because I am looking at how we use the restraints, but, uh, um, so yeah, the answer is no, uh, not on the weekends. So, so essentially, if you, if you had a, a major fight in a, in a cafeteria or something on a weekend, nobody's going to go in handcuffs until Monday. And, and somehow your, your CO is going to get control of that that way. I, I don't understand how that would happen. Yeah, so the way, the way I'm reading and interpreting, there's a, a, some emergency situation which allows for the restraints to be placed. And this in the situation you're describing on the weekends, first of all, the, uh, the majority of the individual that responds to, uh, 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 to any emergency situation is probably one lieutenant. The captain will go into the uh, main control and uh, uh, um, operates the whole incidents out of main control. And, but the majority of the staff responding are correctional officers. And those are the ones that are applying uh, uh, um, the restraints. But in, this, in the scenario that you, uh, uh, that you indicated, that correctional officer will be able to provide the restraints. Uh, what it speaks about, if you're going to put, if an individual is still uh, acting out, still boisterous about threatening, that speaks that if you're going to keep that person in restraints for more than four hours, that uh, uh, the, the captain is the one that authorized that. If it's going to continue that, then it goes all the way up to the commissioner uh, uh, giving approval uh, 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 for that. So, uh, um, so me as a commissioner, where it's written, if they can't get a hold of the warden, the deputy commissioner, I may be getting calls on third shift on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, uh, Thursday. Well, I hope you answer your phone all the time. So let, let me say this to you, Commissioner, from what I'm hearing from you, and I'm going to say this to my colleagues as well. You, you understand what we're trying to, or what this bill is trying to accomplish, right? So, but I think that what I don't want to see is a lack of convergence between the goal and the practical application. And what I mean by that is if I'm understanding you, you're saying the goal of this legislation is a goal that you share, but knowing what you do, what, knowing what you know about how our correctional facilities operate, there needs to be some changes to achieve that goal in a, in a way that's practical. Am I accurately depicting your position? Correct, 100%. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I apologize. I just uh, buzzing through that quick. I just saw that one thing I wanted to bring up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Howard. It's not a problem. We want to get all of the questions that are needed answered. Uh, comment or question from other members of the committee. Comment or questions. Sitting down, Commissioner, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, you and I will have a conversation or two or 20 uh, in the next couple of weeks. Have a great day. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, next on our list is uh, Nick Rodriguez. Uh, is Nick Rodriguez here? Nick Rodriguez, followed by, uh, I'll just say, followed by Carlton uh, Giles and then Richard Sparacco. Is Nick Rodriguez here? Uh, Carlton Giles, are you in? Carlton Giles was followed by Rich Sparacco, then Sarah Egan is Richard Sparacco in. Richard Sparacco. 
Uh, Sarah Egan. I see you on the list. Are you in? Ready to go? Ready. Yes. All right. You have your three minutes. You may begin. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning uh, to the committee uh, and to the chairs. My name is Sarah Egan. I run the off, uh, state's office of the child advocate. Uh, the OCA is an independent agency, state agency charged with reviewing, investigating, and making recommendations regarding how publicly funded state and local systems meet the needs of vulnerable children. Wanted to offer testimony on two bills, 972 and 1059, and wanted to testify in the context of OCA's existing obligation to investigate conditions of confinement for all incarcerated youth every two years. That was a fine, that was an obligation this legislature put in place in 2016. I'm actually going to start with Bill 1059, which OCA strongly supports because it includes a much needed and comprehensive approach to increasing transparency and accountability for the correctional system, sharing critical information with the legislature, and addressing the persistent concerns about isolation and restraint of individuals in the state's custody. Transparency is a necessary foundation for change. And it is imperative for making progress and addressing conditions of confinement for incarcerated people. In some ways, that, that uh, section about the Ombuds Office may be the most critical part of that bill. So I echo uh, Commissioner Kiros's support for, for that. Since 2016, as I said, the OCA has been investigating conditions of confinement. We have released multiple reports, including a follow-up report in November 2020, which focused on conditions for youth in the adult prison system. And by youth, I mean youth ages 8, 15 to 21. Um, our investigations include site visits, interviews with DOC staff, administrators, and youth, and a review of data regarding cell confinement, program availability and utilization, visitation, and mental health service delivery. We meet regularly with staff and leadership of the DOC, and we thank them for their continued cooperation with OCA's statutorily mandated investigation activities. Our most recent investigation, only a few months, the report's only a few months old, found that significant concerns persist for incarcerated youth aged 15 to 21, and that progress for youth is hampered due to continued resource, program design, and facility limitations of the adult prison custody model and its application to kids. Just wanna run through a couple quick findings. So first of all, there's usually less than 50 minors in DOC custody at any given time, usually about 200 to 220, 18 to 21 year olds at MYI at any given time. There are usually less than, less than three girls um, in DOC custody at any given time. Most concerningly is that black youth continue to make up a majority of all incarcerated youth aged 15 to 21 at MYI and at York. They are 60% of all incarcerated youth at MYI. We find that more than half of the boys at MYI have lived in families that have been investigated multiple times by DCF for concerns of child abuse and neglect, and that approximately one third of boys' families had been investigated by DCF 10 or more times. All of the minor girls at York lived in families that had some or extensive history with DCF due to concerns of child abuse and neglect. We continue to find that the majority of children at MYI, of boys at MYI, do not participate in, pro, participate in either zero or one program during the duration of their confinement. That remains an unchanged finding in our audits. We find that the majority of youth are not identified by the DOC classification system as in need of mental health treatment. For education, we find that the rate of full day school participation for most boys remains, hovers around 50%, and that most of the boys test uh, at the grave. Yes. You're three minutes up, if you could uh, summarize. Yes. Uh, in summary, I would say uh, the, our findings about isolation, which we would call cell confinement, continue to be very concerning, both for kids and, and older youth on restrictive housing, but also frankly, for the entire population and general population. This continues to be a significant focus of our conversations with administration from the DOC. I know they're working on it and they unveiled an action plan to the JJPOC in December of 2020 to deal with these um, findings. I think they're committed to them. I agree with commissioner Kiros that um, a significant it, it, the infrastructure and resources for the DOC to implement these changes in a timely way remains a concern. Thank you for Thank you. 
Thank you for uh, your testimony. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, the hazard of doing it on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> comment or question for members of the committee? Comment or question? Um, I do not see any. Thank you very much uh, for joining us again uh, and uh, providing us with the information. Um, you always keep us updated about what we need to know, particularly as it relates to our young people in the system. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed the day. It looks pretty sunny outside. Um, see you next time. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. I see You're that. Welcome. Okay, my watch is talking for me. Uh, I see that Carlton Giles has joined us. Uh, so, Mr. Giles, you have your three minutes, and I'll fix this watch. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, and honorable members of the Joint Committee on Judiciary. I'm Carlton Giles, and joining me today is Rich Baraka, who will not speak after me, but was listed to share with me. I'm the chairperson of the Board of Pardons and Paroles. I'm here today to provide testimony in support of Section 1 of Ray's Bill 1058, an act concerning compassionate parole release by the Board of Pardons and Paroles and concerning staff of the Department of Correction, with the addition of the board's proposed substitute language. The board takes no position on Section 2 of this bill. Section one of the bill expands the scope of the board's authority to compassionately parole incarcerated individuals. This section contains language jointly developed by the board and the office of the chief public defender. It one allows the board to compassionately parole otherwise ineligible individuals due to extraordinary circumstances such as a global pandemic or other national emergency and two provides the board with more leeway to parole individuals incapacitated, debilitated or made infirm by illness, advanced age or mental incapacity. The section changes the existing and restrictive release standard for compassionate parole to one based on risk. Although the board supports section one, changes which are attached to this testimony are necessary to properly implement compassionate parole and clear up any ambiguity. The board's proposed changes create a statutory scheme similar to what currently exists for medical parole under 54.131 A through G of the Connecticut General Statutes. In doing so, they authorize the chairperson to quickly convene an emergency panel to hear urgent cases and provide the board with the authority to impose standard and special conditions on those compassionately paroled. In addition, our proposed language provides long overdue clarity as to the nature of the board's nature of and board's authority over compassionate parole by clarifying that a panel of three board members is the decision making authority for compassionate parole as opposed to the entire board amending existing parole statutes to appropriately reference compassionate parole as a distinct release mechanism where those statutes apply and making other technical and conforming changes. Our proposed language also changes the wording of subsection A of section one, section four of our proposal from present a significantly reduced risk as a danger to society to present a significantly reduced risk of danger to society. The former seems to suggest that the board would be releasing individuals who continue to pose a danger to society as opposed to those individuals whose condition has significantly reduced any danger such individuals might pose to society. The latter language aligns better with protecting the public. Finally, please note that without further changes to section one, the board will not be able to establish conditions for compassionate parole as this bill eliminates the board's existing authority to do so. The board's proposed changes re resolve this problem. Therefore, the board respectfully recommends the committee's joint favorable substitute report with the substitute language we have proposed. We're happy to provide any additional information the committee might require. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Giles. Uh, Representative Fishbach, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Commissioner Giles. Good morning, sir. Um, I thank you for your proposed changes. Um, it does advance and uh, avail some of my concerns. H how many um, members are there of the Board of Pardons and Paroles? They're supposed to be 15. Currently, I'm dealing with 11. Okay. And those appointments are all supposed to be made by the governor. So you have four that are uh, unfilled by the governor. That is correct. Okay. And the three person panel that you um, foresee here making these decisions, how would those individuals be selected from your body? Yeah. So this just comports with everything else we do. Uh, they are chosen 
by the chair to do all of the release mechanisms, so parole panels and pardon panels. So with no particular specificity. Okay, so it would be discretionary upon you to assign whom you ever felt was appropriate to make those very important decisions. That's right, which conforms with statute. Yes, no, understood. Uh, it conforms with statute with regard to other things, right? Uh, this is certainly, yeah. a, this is yeah. certainly a, a much heightened situation where um, you potentially have somebody who has created a heinous crime and potentially we're releasing them from custody. That's yeah, we, we still do so, uh, Representative Fishbein, with all the usual things in place. You know, we have uh, victim input, we get information from DOC about uh, the medical condition and so forth, and, and of course, with the concern for public safety as well. Yes, but this added element here is, in this particular situation, a pandemic. So I would have to believe that an individual who's being considered here, absent a, a declaration of a public health emergency, would not be eligible, right? Is that to be presumed from the need for this language? We're using existing language and what we're trying to do here is address this whole national emergency piece or the uh, pandemic piece. Understood, that's, the, that's what this language does. This adds in that variable. In the case that's of a pandemic, this is the additional procedure. That's correct. Everything having to do with the individual has remained constant throughout that procedure. The only variable that's changed is the declaration by the government. Yes, sir. Okay. So presently, is there a procedure? And, and the reason why I bring this up is I'm involved in a case where a gentleman had been um, convicted, uh, sentenced to prison, in uh, federal prison uh, for a term of, of a decade. He was serving in Pennsylvania. And when the pandemic started, he was able to petition to get early release and, and he was successful in that. Um, do we not have that procedure um, presently in Connecticut by some way, shape or form where one can, let's say, go back, go to court and file some sort of a motion? Do we have that procedure? Yes, that would be a ju judicial procedure, yes. Okay, so why would this procedure be necessary? The board has always had this authority to do so. And this is simply trying to clarify language to continue to do so under the board's authority. But it adds the pandemic. My understanding was that the pandemic was not part of the board's authority previously. That's correct. We, we felt and we experienced that the language that was currently existing just seemed so narrow that it didn't permit us to do what we thought we may be able to do. And that's why we're giving this really wider language. Whereas one can, to my knowledge, one can presently petition uh, the federal court, let's say if they're in, well, that'd be a different situation. They could petition the state court and say that, you know, they're being incarcerated uh, jeopardizes their health, well-being, safety during a pandemic, and the court could give them relief. Because certainly, yeah, not, I'm well, sorry. Go no. I'm sorry. Not not familiar with that process, uh, Representative. Okay, that's that's what I'm asking because I had heard that process exists. That one has the ability. I have been unable to confirm it, so I didn't know if you knew, sir. No, sir. Okay. Well, certainly, you know. Incarceration should not be a, a death sentence, and you know, and I'm certainly compassionate uh, and sympathetic with regard to the situation. I just don't know that we get to a happy place here. But uh, I thank you, sir, for your testimony and answering the questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. And comment or questions from members of the committee? Comment or questions? Uh, I do not see any. Thank you, Mr. Giles, for joining us and, and testifying on this uh, piece of policy. Uh, it's a beautiful day. I hope you get to enjoy it. Thank you, Senator. Thank you all. Uh, is uh, Richard Baracco in, followed by Heather Pansiera, followed by Shannon Leslie? Is Richard Baracco in? Yes, 
Mr. Sprocko just signed up in case I couldn't uh, make it. So he's not there. I testify. Okay. Thank that you, sir. That sounds good. Thank you. Heather Panciera, Shannon Leslie, Heather Panciera, are you in? Shannon Leslie, who will be followed by Kathy Flaherty and Jania Fu. Is Shannon Leslie in? Yes, I'm here. All right, you have your three minutes. You may begin. Thank you. Hello, members of the Judiciary Committee. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. My name is Shannon Leslie, and I'm a resident of New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm speaking in strong support of SB 1059 and SB 972. Both of these bills are very important steps to a more just future for our state. I'm a graduate student at Yale University studying the role of proteins in neurological diseases. And I chose this field because I wanted to make discoveries that would help improve the mental health and well being of our communities. And that makes it particularly upsetting that in the state of Connecticut, we're actively worsening the mental health of many residents in our state. It is well known that solitary confinement and social isolation are extremely detrimental on an individual's mental health. The United Nations recognizes this treatment for what it is, torture. Yet individuals are suffering this torture every day in our state. Many of my colleagues specifically study the effect of stress on the brain and isolation and restraint are some of the quintessential forms of stress that they use in their studies. It is unconscionable that we are inflicting this treatment upon our fellow residents and this must stop. As a society, we invest in research to find better treatments for neurological and psychiatric illnesses. Yet our state is actively contributing to mental illness through solitary confinement, extreme isolation, and abusive restraints. While I do not have firsthand experience with incarceration, I'm here today because this is a cruelty that all Connecticut residents should be concerned about. It's a human rights issue, and the laws and policies of our states have enabled it, so we must do better. SB 1059 and SB 972 not only ban this torturous isolation, but they help individuals facing incarceration maintain social bonds. This improves the lives of the individuals, their families, and their communities. As state legislatures, it's your job to make policies that uplift our communities and respect the humanity of all those who reside in our state. Today, you will hear from many brave and brilliant people who have witnessed the cruelty of our, this cruelty of our state's incarceration system and chosen to share their stories in the hopes of building a better future such as the organizers of Stop Solitary Connecticut who have inspired and taught me so much. I urge you to listen to their voices and follow their guidance. Both SB 1059 and SB 972 are important bills that affirm the humanity of all Connecticut residents and I strongly support them. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Representative Fishbein, you have the floor. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, good morning, Shannon, how are you? Good morning. Well, how about yourself? Good. Um, you know, I, I don't know to what extent solitary confinement is used in our state, but, you know, I was interested, you know, you mentioned that every day um, individuals in Connecticut are being negatively impacted. How many people do you know are in solitary confinement today? In our I don't have the... Uh, numbers, but I can get back to you. And I know other organizers on this call have more detailed information about um, the exact numbers. But well, my... uh, from the stories I've heard, it's not always even called uh, solitary confinement. There will be extreme isolation where there's prolonged periods um, alone in your cell, um, which also is isolated from social interaction, which is extremely detrimental. Well, I don't necessarily disagree that over a long term that that could be but I'm just trying to get to the you know how much this is actually used and I mean do you know like within the last month how many people in Connecticut were put in solitary confinement because I mean when you say every day it's happening that's that's an extreme and you know I'm just trying to get to where that comes from. Yeah, that comes from um, stories that I've heard from people who were formerly incarcerated who have reported um, about what they experienced. Uh, and I think we'll be sharing their stories later today. Okay, so you, uh, just to be clear, I mean- I don't know, ex I don't have um, numbers. You don't so. know if solitary confinement was utilized at all last week in any of our prisons or last month, or I'm just trying to get to where your representation comes from. Yeah, from stories of people who were recently incarcerated and have um, talked about the time that they know of 
people that they were um, with and how much time they were spent isolated. Um, so firsthand accounts, I don't have um, exact numbers or individual uh, counts from specific locations. Okay, I think I understand where you're coming from. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Are there comments or questions from other members of the committee? Comments or question? Uh, Representative Callahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for coming in, Shannon. I, I see you're here to testify against, uh, or uh, in favor, I'm sorry, 972 regarding the phone calls? Yes. Uh, what would you propose the fee be, you, you, or would you go along with 972 that the, the phone calls be free of charge? I would agree with the uh, free of charge. Uh, I think that maintaining social bonds is extremely helpful um, in terms of mental health and well-being of an individual. Are, are you aware, I, I, I would agree that Connecticut's cost at a, a over, over $4 for 15 minutes is, is the second most expensive in Connecticut, but I also wanna make you aware and the committee aware that these, some of the funds that come back to the state go to, go to fund probation programs like the Technical Violation Unit and the Probation Transitions Unit, which uh, are, are programs that have helped close jails and keep people from uh, recidivating. Uh, and out of uh, probation received about $3.2 million to fund these positions. And if this goes away, they, they looks like an appropriations, there's only about a million there. They've had about a $2.2 million shortfall. So these programs would go away. Uh, they could very well go away. Um, the, the technical violation unit in Connecticut has one of the lowest technical violations and, and, and this isn't really directed to you. It's more, you're, you brought this out. <laughs> uh, when you've got a technical violation unit that is working with people who uh, would otherwise face a violation of probation and driving them to treatment programs uh, and giving an individualized attention that keeps people out of jail and keeps people from recidivating in the future, uh, a no charge program could possibly make all these things go away. The probation transitions program has probation officers going to the jails and meeting with inmates to make sure they transition back into the community uh, and lower the recidivism rates and having them returning to, to, uh, to incarceration. So there are some benefits and a no fee phone call program could make all these things go away. And I just wanted to make sure you and the committee know that. I guess I would argue that the cost of an individual's mental health and maintaining social bonds is something that's really important and it doesn't necessarily need to be an either or. There can be support for both programs. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Callahan. And uh, I think that's part of the reason why some of us are uh, supporting reinvesting the savings from closings into programs uh, that are that's taken up in other bills. Uh, comment or questions from other members of the committee? Comment or questions? Seeing none, Ms. Leslie, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you get to enjoy, enjoy the rest of uh, the, the day that we have going on today. Um, next, we have on the list, Kathy Flaherty, uh, Jania Fu, uh, Senator Looney, and Joseph Galen. Is Kathy F Flaherty here? Good morning, Senator Winfield. Um, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Kathy Flaherty. I'm the Executive Director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project. We provide legal representation to people who are eligible for mental health services from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I submitted testimony on five bills, but I'm only going to focus on three today. Uh, 972, 1058, and 1059. And I thank the committee for raising all of these bills. When it comes to telecommunication, if there is one thing we learned during the pandemic, it is the importance of maintaining connection to community um, and reducing isolation because of the positive impact it has on someone's mental health to be able to do that. Um, incarcerated people are people. They have the same basic needs that all of us have to maintain connection to the loved ones in their life. Um, just hearing the questions raised by the other representative, it is a both and. 
you don't have to necessarily cut another program that you have funded solely by the people who are probably least able to afford to pay for it. The state can make decisions regarding revenue, uh, regarding appropriations that work for everybody. So just because you're not bringing in money from this one source does not mean you can't find that money elsewhere if it is a program that the state values, which I, it should. <coughs> 1058 compassionate release. Um, we did eliminate the death penalty in Connecticut, and yet many people have died from COVID in prisons and jails because we did not decarcerate. There's a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine from earlier this month that said decarceration is a public health measure. Uh, mass incarceration itself threatens public safety. We need to have a mix of making sure people are vaccinated but also decarcerating people who we don't need to keep locked up, especially in the middle of a public health emergency. 1059, the PROTECT Act, so grateful to the advocates at Stop Solitary Connecticut who have been fighting for this for so many years. When Connecticut's uh, facilities draw the attention of the Special United Nations Rapporteur on Torture, that's not a good sign. And it's a very good sign that the, uh, the commissioner is planning on closing Northern and everyone in Northern is in solitary confinement all of the time. So that's at least some of the people uh, who are experiencing that every single day as we exist now. And we just need to make sure that we don't allow DOC to replicate those same conditions of confinement in other facilities. People with mental illness are overrepresented in the population that's subject to solitary confinement, no matter what name you put on it. They have difficulty conforming their behavior to DOC expectations because of their disability and the disability related behavior becomes a basis for discipline and solitary confinement does harm. It increases mental illness. Most okay. people who go into, uh, and I'll wrap up now, yeah. most people who go into corrections rejoin society. And if we are damaging them while they are inside, that is not good. So um, I urge you to support those three bills. Thank you. Thank you very much. Comment or question from members of the committee, comment or questions. Uh, Kathy, I don't see any. Thank you again for joining us and offering your testimony. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Uh, we have uh, Jania Fu, Martin Looney, Joseph Galen. Jania. Hello. Good morning. Uh, Jania, we can't see you. Sorry, I'm just gonna turn it on. Thank you. All right, you have three minutes. So I am a volunteer with Connecticut Bail Fund and I will be reading uh, a statement from my family, Matthew Abraham, who is incarcerated in Cheshire Correctional and has been incarcerated there for 20 years since he was 18 years old. Dear legislators, my name is Matthew Abraham and I would like to share my testimony with you in support of Bill SB 972. On June 19th, 2017, I called my mother from Cheshire Correction in Connecticut. Here. Before she picked up, thoughts from our previous conversation from the night before emerged. My grandmother had had a stroke. She was in the hospital, her progress unknown. When my mother pressed one to connect our call, I immediately heard my family in the background crying. The plug on my grandmother's respirator had been pulled. When my grandmother, Maddie Lou McFadden- You clicked failed her I life. saw you mute. No. A collective cry emerged from my relatives. My heart broke as I began to cry. But then the automated securist recording interrupted. You have one minute left. I knew that this was not an entire 15 minute phone call. My mother's account ran out of money. I hung up, went to my cell and began to grieve for my grandmother, unable to have a few more moments of mourning with my family. A couple of days later, I called my mother's phone and still she had no money on her account, but I was afforded a free 30 second phone call. When the call connected, it was my nephew. He told me very quickly that my mom said she loved me and she would talk to me soon. The call ended. I never got a chance to speak to my mother ever again. Just 10 days after her mother passed, Linda Lou Abraham, my mother died on June 29th, 2017. I tell you this not to suggest 
that Securus is responsible for my family no longer being here physically, but to tell you that when moments of familial bonding and familial support were most needed, I couldn't receive any of it because of Securus's insatiable appetite to feed on the most vulnerable people who happen to have incarcerated family members. A free phone call would have provided my family and I the opportunity to grieve together if only for 15 minutes when we lost our grandmother. A free phone call could have provided me with one last phone conversation with my mother before she left her physical form. So I asked this committee to seriously consider SB Bill 972. If we are serious about changing Connecticut, if we are seriously considering new ways of thinking about the experience of incarceration, this bill is one small step in the right direction. We need to think seriously about how companies such as Securus profits from the pain, misery, and despair of our communities. We have to remove the dollar signs from our eyes and begin to see the humanity of those who have been hit most by the prison industrial complex. Thank you. Um, Matthew also wants to convey his support as well for Bill 978, which would make him after 20 years of incarceration, finally eligible for parole and able to return home to his family and community. Um, and lastly, I just wanna say that I believe uh, Matthew's testimony and the other testimonies you will hear today um, show very clearly the burden of incarceration um, on those facing the violence of the system inside and the, their families and loved ones who face this violence too, um, especially women of color who um, along with um, bearing the, the loss of- we're, we're at the three minute mark, which needs to wrap up. Um, also, still have to take care, take and support their families and loved ones and communities every single day. Thank you, thank, thank you very much um, for being with us um, and for sharing that testimony. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? If not, um, have a great day. Um, Senator Looney, don't believe is with us yet. Um, Joseph Galen, Joseph Galen, Mark Nemec, uh, Ali Perry. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, Representative Stastrom and Senator uh, Winfield and members of the judiciary. I'm the Reverend Ali Perry uh, from New Haven and a member of Stop Solitary Connecticut. I'm testifying in support of Senate Bill 1059 and urge you to vote favorably for it. There are many compelling reasons to do so, but for me as a person of faith, the most imperative of moral and religious. By whatever name it's called, restrictive housing, administrative segregation, isolated confinement is a human rights abuse. It degrades and dehumanizes those who have subjected to it defiling their inherent dignity. If you believe as I do that all persons are created in the image of God, then caging people for 22 plus hours a day in a cell the size of a parking space should shock our consciences. Prolonged isolation is barbaric and cruel, a form of state sanctioned and taxpayer subsidized torture. The Bible exhorts us to remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourself were being tortured. This means that those of us on the outside are to identify with those on the inside as if they were our flesh and blood. And they are. Our siblings, our parents, our children, our kin almost all of whom will return to our communities. We cannot have people returning home more damaged than when they entered the system. We must respect and protect their dignity as human beings. We cannot be torturing them. There are proven alternatives to isolation. Stop Solitary CT has detailed some of these in a recent report that you will all be getting copies of. These are humane alternatives that promote pro-social programming and increase safety and security, not just for those incarcerated, but for staff as well. Since implementing such alternatives, Colorado, for one example, reports an 80% reduction in violence. 
and correctional staff there initially skeptical are now converts. And right here in Connecticut, we have the true unit at Cheshire as another compelling example. If we know that humane alternatives work, why is Connecticut not using them across the system? To fail to do so, I submit, is a form of correctional malpractice and opens the DOC up to lawsuits for abusing the constitutional rights of individuals in its care. The movement to end prolonged isolation is growing across this country. New Jersey, as you probably know, has already passed legislation to reduce the practice. And this past Thursday, the New York legislature passed the HALT, Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Confinement Bill, making the now- And we're at the, we're at the three minute mark. I need you to write. Right. I'll just say it's time for Connecticut to become a leader. Dostoevsky said the degree of civilization and society could be judged by entering its prisons. SB 1059 offers Connecticut the opportunity to be more humane and more civilized. So I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Fishbein has a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning. I just, um, do you have any knowledge as to the amount of utilization that the state of Connecticut uh, partakes in with regard to solitary confinement? Yeah, so I can say a couple of things about that. Northern, although it's going to close, currently still has about 60 as of March 1st people there. They're all in solitary. Anybody ever in Northern was only ever in solitary. But it's used across the system. And part of the problem and why it's hard to answer your question is the data collection. 2017, there was legislation passed that called for Connecticut to collect data and report it on the uses of solitary confinement, who's held, for how long, for what reasons. But that data is very, very difficult. Um, Stop Solitary has a report we've issued as we've tried to make our way through that. But it's very difficult. It's very limited. So we and the part of 1059 calls for data collection so we can have more accurate and more transparent information that it's easier to see. But the, but the fact of the matter is it's used across the board and sometimes there are lockdowns. Um, it's, I know I'm in New Haven, it's used in the New Haven Correctional Facility. Um, so it's used across the board. Um, to answer your question is difficult because of the data and it would be important to get more data and be more transparent about that. So when there's a, um let's say an uprising in um, cafeteria or something like that. There's a, there's a fight, fight starts to escalate, becomes, you know, pseudo riot. Um, I, I could see individuals, you know, uh, protagonists, aggressors that perhaps started the incident. Uh, what would you have if, if solitary confinement was just banned um, outright? Uh, what tools would, would the administration of the facility be able to employ to uh, uh, curtail that activity? Well, so as you can see from reading the bill, the, the tool of having separation and segregation is still there. It's just that uh, there's more specification about how it can be used under what conditions and, and um, how it's regulated. So it's not that you wouldn't have um, cells that would be an out place where people could be held in the instance of an out, as you say, something in the cafeteria or violence or the like. Um, what we know from humane alternatives, if there is there prison systems that have cells that they call de-escalation cells. Um, and the other part of this that's important and relates to the bill is the training of staff to help them with de-escalation. But yes, there are, the bill is very clear that there can be times and there would definitely need to be a way to address if somebody needs to be segregated from the general population because of an outbreak of one sort or another. The scenario that I gave you, uh, would that fall within the, if this bill was to pass, would that fall within that uh, permission to utilize programs such as solitary? 
I, well, yes, I believe so. And again, there's a clear process for, for making that determination. And I think um, we're really talking about segregation and separation. The term for me of uh, isolation and confinement is when it becomes prolonged. And as we know from the United Nations, that's anything more than well, 15 days is torture. But this bill provides for 72 hours to do that separation, segregation. And then if it needs to be extended, there's a process for doing that. But the point is, if there's an outbreak and there's violence, yes, it's really important to intervene. And that's why you have staff trained to do that. And you have places where people can be held to um, de-escalate that. Now, the, the recording or the reporting aspects that you say are presently in place, um, you know, I take it that, uh, you know, one would record when they utilized a certain method and the basis, um, we'll say the probable cause that led to the utilization of that method. What is wrong with the, the data? Is it the data that's being collected or the data, you know, how it's being communicated? What's the problem with the current data collection process? So I myself haven't done the deep dive into that, but our report, which I can get to you, does. That was done by Joe Galen, and I'm sure you will hear from him later. Um, but I, uh, and one of the problems is in order to even get the data, we had to go through Freedom of Information. So it was not easily accessible. And then the way it's um, collected has made it very hard to really understand what it, what's going on. Okay. But Thank I can you. get you a copy of that report. Happy to. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Palm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, Ms. Perry. Um, can you please tell us what uh, a pastoral psychotherapist does? I, I looked for your testimony, your written testimony, and didn't see it. I haven't submitted it yet, so. <laughs> can you just tell us what your work entails, please? Yeah, so um, basically I'm a, a therapist that people know when they come to me. I also um, am a minister um, and I see people for a variety of um, conditions and situations they're dealing with. Um, often that includes trauma. Um, it may be um, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, life changes and the like. Um, so I, I see people who are suffering in one way or another and work with them. And often that suffering is because people have gotten separated from their own sense of agency, their own sense of value. Um, and um, so the work is really helping people to gain a sense of agency, sense of possibility and a sense of hope. And so I can certainly say from the perspective of working with people like that, I find myself thinking about what it would is like for people who are in prison who are completely separated from hope and a sense of agency and choices over their life. And, and would you say that having an intact sense of agency also involves um, a sense of hopefulness about your own future or your own worth? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, the idea and stories that um, I've heard that um, this committee will hear in this the hearing proceeds about the kind of degradation of people's worth treated as less than human is devastating. It's devastating. Some people, it amazes me there are people who come through that and can survive, but um, it is absolutely devastating. Well, I think, you know, we talk a lot during the pandemic about the suffering or the, the deprivation that we've experienced by being isolated from one another, uh, which of course can't begin to compare with people who are incarcerated, who are put in solitary feel. It gives us just a tiny, tiny inkling. So, I just want to um, thank you very much for your work. And also thank you for injecting a little Dostoevsky into the process. <laughs> Always good to have some literary references. Thank you. Yeah, thank you're you. welcome. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further questions or comments from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. And thank you for your work. Um, next up will be Amanda Brenner. Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, and distinguished members of the Joint Committee on Judiciary, my name is Amanda Brenner. I am an MSW candidate at the UConn School of Social Work and the public policy intern at the Connecticut State Office of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm here today in support of SB 1059. I've submitted extensive written testimony, but today I will summarize a few points specifically on solitary confinement. 
The, dispropor the disproportionate use of solitary confinement for incarcerated people with mental illness, as well as the egregious impact of solitary confinement on the mental health of incarcerated people who were previously unaffected by mental health concerns, cause extreme suffering and have adverse long-term consequences. NAMI opposes the use of solitary confinement in equivalent forms of administrative segregation. Eliminating solitary confinement is a priority for this organization on the state and federal level. As past law, reducing the use of solitary confinement as a disciplinary tool has been passed with bipartisan support in Connecticut. We hope that the current General Assembly will be equally enthusiastic about limiting the use of, sol of solitary confinement to a maximum of 16 hours. Conditions of silence, fluorescent lights, limited exercise, and the absence of social interaction have been noted by physicians for the last 100 years to induce depression, anxiety, and first episode psychosis in those who were previously free of mental health concerns. In 1983, Dr. S. Grassian determined that the collective symptoms of those in solitary confinement were so easily replicable and identifiable, such as disturbances in thought, difficulties in executive function, and psychosis, that they could constitute their own psychiatric syndrome, an avoidable illness resulting from the torture of solitude. And make no mistake, human rights experts say this is indeed torture. In 2020, the UN released a statement that said solitary confinement in Connecticut specifically was a form of torture. In some states, it is reported that more than half of all inmates' facilities utilizing the most extreme forms of solitary confinement and social isolation are diagnosed with severe mental illness. Solitary confinement for juveniles and adults living with serious mental illness serves no appropriate purpose in terms of discipline, protection of the individual or others, or the individual's overall functioning in general prison settings and ability to follow prison rules. Instead, solitary confinement of persons with, persons with mental illnesses causes extreme suffering, has adverse long-term consequences for cognitive and adaptive functioning, disrupts treatment and exacerbates illness. Reform is inevitable. Let us then be written in history as leader in writing a historic wrong. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? If not, uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go back to Joseph Galen. Good morning, Senator Winfield, Representative Sastrom, and esteemed members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Joseph Galen. I'm a resident of New Haven and steering committee member of Stop Solitary CT. I'm testifying on behalf of the organization in support of Senate Bill 1059. As we speak about isolation in the Department of Correction, let us not mince words. Solitary confinement is torture. It makes prisons and our communities less safe and disproportionately impacts black and brown people. Solitary confinement is often euphemistically referred to as administrative detention, administrative segregation, chronic discipline, punitive segregation, special needs, security risk group, and transfer detention. SB 1059 cuts through this needless complexity and gets to the root of the problem. It focuses on isolation. By limiting time in cell, this legislation will positively transform the state's criminal legal system. At Stop Solitary, we often get a very simple question. How many people are in solitary confinement in the state of Connecticut? Our current estimate is that in a given year, well over 100 people are subjected to conditions akin to torture. Hundreds of people are subjected to formal restrictive status and well over 1,000 people may well be subjected to isolated confinement. However, this estimate is likely inaccurate and likely undercounts the number of people subjected to isolation in a given year. The inaccuracy stems from the fact that the state does not adequately track the use of isolation. In other words, we do not have an accurate way of understanding the extent to which torture is employed against Connecticut residents. In looking into the use of isolation in the Connecticut Department of Correction, we encountered numerous problems. One, the data on isolation was not easily accessible. No information was publicly available online and we had to wait months to receive a report previously submitted from the Department of Correction to the Criminal Justice Policy and Planning Division. Two, the data was largely disaggregated and was simply a point in time count, which ultimately failed to show how many people were isolated each year. Three, the data only tracked restrictive status rather than time and cell, which failed to capture the extent of isolation in general population. SB 1059 will avoid the pitfalls of current data collection practices that focus only on formal restrictive status. Indeed, current data invites misleading statements. For example, the former commissioner asserted in 2020 that only 29 individuals were on restrictive housing status, when in fact he later clarified he was referring to the number of people in just one of the Department of Corrections seven restrictive statuses. 
By focusing on time and cell rather than restrictive status, SB 1059 will dramatically improve data collection, which is a necessary tool to end solitary confinement. Data is a tool to improve lives. Solitary is a weapon that only harms and dehumanizes Connecticut residents. Thank you for your time and attention to this issue. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us. Um, next up will be Ann Massaro. Good morning. Um, Chairs Winfield and Staffstrom, Vice Chairs Kaiser, Kaiser and Blumenthal, Ranking Members Kissel and Fishbein, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Ann Massaro, and I live in North Haven, Connecticut. I would like to express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059. To begin, I want to say first that solitary confinement is torture, and my humanity will not allow me to stay silent and not act to eradicate this in the state where I live. It disproportionately impacts Black and Brown people, as does incarceration itself. Second, I want to speak to the part of SB 1059 that protects the social bonds of incarcerated people with family as defined by the person themselves, what family is, friends and members of the community. Psychologists have repeatedly demonstrated, and the, uh, the research is widely available, um, the importance of relationships throughout our lives. Experts have continued Experts have continually proven that human relationships impact one's mental, emotional, physical, and psychological health. Loneliness, social isolation, and trauma are linked to ill health, depression, and early risk of death. Incarceration itself is isolating and dehumanizing. So to deny incarcerated people access to maintain relationships with loved ones further exacerbates hopelessness, depression, anger, and isolation. The punishment, quotes, of being incarcerated, being in a locked facility away from everyone you love and who loves you is bad enough. Denying social bonds is cruel and unusual punishment. These policies dehumanize, they shame, and break an incarcerated person's spirit. We're asking in our bill that people get a minimum free number of uh, let free letters, phone calls, and 60 minute contact or social visits per week. We're also asking that visitors cannot get excluded because they are outside the incarcerated person's immediate family or as a result of their criminal history. At a time when people most need love and support of family and community, this contact is drastically limited or denied, basically denying an incarcerated person's human person's humanity and right to their relationships. In this light, I also want to express my support for SB 972, offering free phone calls. I strongly support SB 1059 and hey, urge- Ma'am, we're at, we're at the uh, three minute mark. Okay, now I'm to ask you to vote favorably. Uh, for the bill out of Judiciary Committee. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Um, next up will be Michael Massaro. Is Michael Massaro with us? Good morning. You hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you, sir. Just a second. Just a second. I'm sorry. There you are. All right. There you go. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Chairman Winfield and uh, and Stafford, and Vice Chairman Kessler and Blumenthal, and ranking members Kessler and Fishbaum, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Michael Massaro. I'm a resident in North Haven and own a business in Hamden, Connecticut. And I support the uh, bill, Senate Bill 1059. To, to, to me and many other state 
solitary confinement and extreme isolation by whatever you call it is torture. My humanity would not allow me to support um, solitary confinement. I don't want my tax dollars being spent on torturing other human beings. If you think you cannot happen to you or one of your loved ones, I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. My daughter was incarcerated and spent time in solitary confinement. After three years of being on the outside, she was found her voice to speak of the horror. Prison conditions generally are inhumane and extreme isolation is the worst of and har most harmful. I strongly recommend SB 1059 and urge for a favorable vote to get the bill out of the jurisdiction committee. Thank you, Michael Massaro. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? If not, appreciate you being with us and sharing your testimony. Thank you. Um, next up will be Robert uh, Gillis. Good morning. Good morning, sir. My name is Robert Gillis. I'm a resident of New Haven and a member of the steering committee of Stop Solitary Connecticut. I'm retired after 36 years of service to the Department of Correction, and my experience leads me to speak in support of SB 1059. The bill has many facets to it. The primary element is the reduction of isolated housing in our correctional facilities. In order to achieve this objective, legislation must be passed, but it is executed effectively only through the will, determination, and motivation by the administration and staff of the agency. What we're talking about here is launching a major shift in the organizational culture. We call it the Department of Correction. In fact, since its creation in the 1960s, those aspirations have morphed to the extent that we should call it the Department of Containment and Control. There has been and will be much said today about the damage caused by the various types of isolation called solitary confinement. I know how bad solitary confinement is and I don't have to dwell on it. I'm focusing instead on the language in the bill which references staff training and wellness, especially in the dynamics needed to provide alternatives to isolated in-cell confinement. First, Staff members have to have the confidence that their world will not come crashing down merely because this bill limits the maximum in-cell time to 16 hours per day in normal circumstances. Other states have eliminated solitary confinement at minimal consequence to the safety of staff. I point to Colorado, where the level of violent behavior has shown a reduction of approximately 80% because of the decrease in isolation. Incarcerated persons need to be treated with dignity and respect in order to reduce the frustrations and anger now caused by periods of sensory deprivation, in-cell restraints, staff abuse, and the absence of contact with others. Second, training initiatives have been developed in other systems which seek to modify the behaviors of staff members that are known to be detrimental to the safe and secure management of incarcerated individuals. They're certainly applicable here. Third, in our own state, the true unit at Cheshire has been remarkably successful because of the practices brought about by changes in the environment of incarceration. That initiative rests in the use of policies and motivational skills not yet extended to other locations. This shows that it can happen here, but there must be a statutory requirement that isolation status be curtailed and that training methods be established to ensure successful implementation. Absent a legislative requirement, any improvement in this direction would be discretionary and arbitrary and subject to change at the whim of administrators. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, appreciate your testimony. Uh, questions or comments? If not, we will move on to um, David Cloud. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Cloud. Um, I am the research director at AMEND. Um, we are program based at the University of California, San Francisco, and we apply a health and human rights perspective. 
um, to addressing a range of problems in the U.S. prison system. Um, in that capacity and in my previous role um, working in this field, I have more than a decade of experience both studying the effects of solitary confinement on the health of incarcerated people, but also working hand in hand with a range of stakeholders to addressing this issue. Um, I'm testifying today in support of 1059, which I see as a absolutely critical piece of legislation for addressing a range of issues at the intersections of human rights, public health and public safety. So as many others have said today, solitary confinement is indeed a brutal and inhumane practice that causes severe and lasting psychological damage, trauma, and physical harm. From a public health perspective, you can see it in individuals, both psychiatrically and in their behavior, but also at a bigger level when we're talking about things like violence. Um, and the harms of solitary go beyond prisons and they continue to affect people after they leave uh, prison. So a recent study that I worked on actually linked um, exposure to solitary confinement with mortality post-release from suicide, overdose, and homicide. Um, as others have stated, solitary confinement is desperately enforced upon many of our society's most marginalized groups of people, people with serious mental illness, people who've fallen through the cracks of our social safety nets, and people who I think the, the general public would be shocked how they're treated uh, given their life circumstances and histories of um, trauma. And solitary confinement through its isolation and enforced idleness deprives people of the things we know that are most critical for people to rehabilitate and rebuild their lives. Most importantly, the ability to stay in contact with family and loved ones, but also things like educational programming, vocational training, and things like that that may be available in the general population. Um, but not in solitary confinement settings. And if all this wasn't bad enough, um, in our work, we also focus on how solitary confinement and requiring officers and others to be engaged in it is not only dehumanizing for them, but also creates a range of public health hazards as an occupational health matter. Um, and I also just wanna emphasize here, not just on all the harms, but in my experience, we know that reform is not always easy, but it is definitely possible and it works. Um, several people have alluded to the experience in Colorado. In my organization, we're working in states such as North Dakota and Oregon as well, and coming up with a range of tools to help these states dramatically cut their use of isolation. North Dakota is definitely a success story um, where they've sustained a 70% reduction since 2016. So there, there are countless examples out, not really countless, but there are a lot of examples out there that I think Connecticut can look to to learn how to to cut down on this uh, dehumanizing practice. Um, and you see, you know, the, the evidence speaks for itself. There's been reductions in violence in these places, but also just remarkable transformations in the health of people who've endured long periods of isolation, regaining their health, their dignity, um, both in their emotional and their physical health. Thank but also- you, sir. So we're at the three minute mark. Okay, um, and I'll just close out with that and um, just really point out that um, the, the data piece is quite critical and that legislation is important to sustain any reforms. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, questions from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, next up will be Eric Egan. Good morning, I hope you can hear me. We can. Good morning, members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to offer public comment this morning. My name is Eric Egan. I'm a resident of a 55 year old plus uh, um, condominium community in Newtown. Um, I'm also the secretary of the executive board of the association and our association, um, which is just basically homeowners, uh, is uh, called the Newtown Woods Homeowners Association. I'm here to speak in support of House Bill 5125 or any legislation that would provide a shield against COVID-19 liability for associations like ours. I have submitted written testimony in the form of a letter on behalf of our association, but I wanna underscore three important points, all of which are detailed in my written testimony, but which may uh, affect your deliberations. The first point is that our condominium association is unable to acquire, condom to acquire insurance coverage to protect us, the association, from COVID-19 liability claims. 
uh, coverage is unavailable from any insurance company at any cost. In spite of the fact that we have taken all reasonable steps to protect our uh, residents from infection during the pandemic, our limited association assets are very much at risk. And I would note that we are not unique in this situation. All condo associations, frankly, throughout the country, but certainly here in Connecticut, face this issue. The second point I wanna make is that even our directors and officers liability coverage, coverage that generally applies to um, board members and committee members does not cover volunteer board members from COVID liability. While your bill 5125 doesn't appear to extend to individual leaders of organizations like ours, we urge you to extend the good faith immunity to individual decision makers within those associations. I imagine volunteering to serve on a condo board, which by the way is no fun at all, um, while knowing that you're not covered by any insurance policy. Um, your individual assets are at risk and that's the position we're in. One more point. Um, as we offer our support for this bill, we recognize the individual, the, the um, imposition of liability in a matter like this, very unlikely. Causation, very difficult to prove. But even the defense of a claim would be very expensive to our organization. Finally, in closing, I note we are not suggesting that there should be absolute immunity. Um, we believe the immunity ought only extend to businesses that have complied in good faith with public health gui guidelines established by the state of Connecticut. Um, we also submit that the, the immunity should not extend to intentional misconduct. Or Thank, you, sir. Thank you. Um, are there questions or comments from the committee? Uh, Representative Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, Mr. Egan. How are good morning. you? Um, so interesting aspect to um, to this bill, and have you had has the condo association had um, problems with uh, not cleanliness, so to speak, but um, areas common areas that have had to be cleansed and to make representations as to those that would have opportunity to use those common areas uh, and uh, their ability, the lack thereof from contracting COVID. I know there was a lot there. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, I, I do, I do. Um, just a couple of points as I, as I answer. We closed our clubhouse. We have a community clubhouse. We closed that on March 15th of last year. It's been closed and remains closed. We're thinking about reopening, but we're not quite ready. We also closed our swimming pool period. We, we did not open it up this year um, at all because of COVID concerns. We have uh, a number, of, we are a combined community. We have townhomes and we also have apartment style, what we call mid-rise buildings. And those buildings, we have um, accelerated the, the cleaning schedule um, and uh, talked to our cleaning people about giving us enhanced cleaning of the common areas, elevators, um, entrance and, and uh, exits. Um, areas, the common areas have a kind of a lobby and we've, we've taken extra steps to, to clean them, yes. Yeah, and I, when you mentioned that the cleaning company, I've had a few cleaning companies contact me and I guess that the concern is a representation as to an area being sanitized that they can't meet. Uh, they'll do their best you know, but they're not chemists, they're not laboratories, and they can't make a representation that they're sanitized. And, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, they're just going to get out of the business, um, which is, you know, disheartening. Um, so you do use a off-site uh, third-party vendor for those yes. services. Yes, yes. And, and to, to your point, I, I, I think they have a very valid concern. They, they could come in and kill every COVID germ in the entire common area, but five minutes after they leave, someone could come in uh, just in routine um, entrance and egress and, um, and recontaminate. That's just the way this, uh, this, 
disease works. Yeah, understood. Well, I thank you for coming here today and testifying in support of this bill. So uh, you're welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you to to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions or comments? Seeing none. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, um, Jeff Grant, Adam Yagalov. Good morning. Good morning. My name is. Adam Yagaloff, I'm an attorney at the Center for Children's Advocacy here in Hartford. I'm testifying on, in support of uh, Raise Bill 972, an act concerning the cost of telecommunication services. Um, I'd like to make a few quick points. I did submit written testimony. The first is that our office works with a lot of young people who are incarcerated in Connecticut correctional facilities. And one of the things that we try to uh, maximize and one of the things that we try to reduce is the recidivism. Uh, as you all know, the amount of times that someone is rearrested after they enter the community. And studies show that uh, recidivism is reduced when reentry planning is, uh, begins the second someone is incarcerated. Um, so that means that from the second that they're incarcerated, that they have family contact and that they're able to um, plan for their reentry. And what we found in studies that we've done and in interviews with youth at Manson Youth Institution and other correctional facilities is that the high cost of phone calls is hurting young people's ability to effectively plan for their reentry. Um, some of the things that they need to plan for, for example, are their enrollment back in school, um, thinking about and planning for where they're going to live after their release. Um, collecting documents needed for employment and school enrollment and identification, um, preparing for their medication management and other mental health services. And the phone calls that they have with their family and their loved ones uh, are necessary to start the reentry planning process from the beginning that, that they're incarcerated. Um, and I'd like to say two quick things. The high cost of phone calls is disproportionately affecting youth of color in Connecticut. Um, in our interviews with youth at Manson Youth Institution and other correctional facilities, we found that some youth are only able to talk to their families um, five minutes a month, uh, even less. And so their ability to plan for their reentry is um, very much reduced when they're not able to have these phone calls. And as we all know, the ability to visit in person is also something that's different from community to community. Whereas um, some communities are able to visit the correctional facilities, a lot of communities are not. And so we think this bill goes a long way to making uh, the reentry planning process even for all communities across the state. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, Connecticut, studies show that Connecticut ranks 49th in the nation for our cost of a 15 minute prison phone call. And our neighbors, our neighboring states have done a lot to address this. New York City has made phone calls free for all inmates. Um, Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire have significantly reduced phone call rates. New, New York, New Jersey, and Rhode Island have taken steps to prohibit kickbacks, which is part of what this bill does. So we think that this bill not only helps communities of color in this state, um, it, but it also helps, uh, it also is what other communities are doing to reduce recidivism. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Representative Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, I just want to focus on 972 um, for a little bit. Understanding that, you know, um, I have a cell phone, right? I've got to pay the bill. There's a, a third party vendor who, who renders that service. You know, this bill, the way I read it at least, um, has uh, telephonic, uh, email, uh, video services that um, is of no cost. Is that the way you read it also? The way I read it is, is that no cost to the inmates, that's correct. Okay, so even though Department of Corrections has to uh, get that service from somewhere, that you know, when I pay my cell phone bill, Department of Corrections is gonna have to pay their service bill that there's no cost to the user, correct? Yes, sir. And are you supportive of, of that end here? Because certainly one could say, okay, no kickbacks. Um, you know, what it costs us is what we're gonna charge you. 
I'm trying to figure out where you are on this. Sure. Um, I would say that we are supportive of any bill that reduces phone call costs for inmates in Connecticut. At the same time, um, the cost of recidivism, the cost of people reoffending, and the cost of having reentry programs that are not effective um, are costly to all people in this state, I would suggest. And so if a, if a person, especially a young person within the Connecticut Correctional Facilities is not able to access family planning because of the high cost of phone calls, um, it's our position that those phone calls should be free for that person, um, not only for them, but for the overall well-being of the state to reduce recidivism. Okay, so that would be, are you saying that you would be in support of, of an objective analysis, whereas if somebody's indigent, uh, let's say they're, they're homeless um, uh, prior to being incarcerated, you know, they have no money in the bank, that kind of stuff, that that person should be given free calls, but the millionaire who is incarcerated, you know, tax evasion, something like that, they should not get free phone calls trying to figure out where you are on this. I would suggest, sir, that... Um... I don't think that's a good process. And that's why I think it's important to make phone calls free for all people within the Connecticut Correctional Facilities. I would also suggest, at least speaking for youth, um, I would suggest that 99% of the youth currently incarcerated in Connecticut are indigent um, and that they're not able to access these phone calls because of uh, their family uh, income. All right, so let's take that dynamic, you know, because it's certainly an interesting aspect. Would you be in favor of if the individual is a youth, having the calls free, but if they're not, when we say a youth, you know, just for the purposes of our discussion, uh, we're gonna, we'll say 18 and younger, um, would that be appropriate? And then for adults, 18 and higher, um, would be, um, there would be a, a cost. Well, I would say, um, I would say that I would support there is a bill um, currently through the JPOC that would support it for um, youth under, I believe under 18. I would suggest that youth in Connecticut should be looked at as under 24. Um, but I would say that this bill needs to go further than that. This bill needs to address recidivism for all people in Connecticut. I'm speaking for youth, but I think that recidivism affects um, all communities and it affects all ages. And so I would suggest that the cost of phone calls, um, I believe it's, I think there was a number thrown out. I believe that number is high earlier in the meeting. I think that our state should be able to support that. Um, so I would suggest making phone calls free for all you think, for everybody in Connecticut. Okay. I think that, I think, sir, you will, you will make up savings by successful reentry planning, and therefore you will have less recidivism and less people in your jails. And I think that the data will show that. I, um, okay. Thank you. I, understand your perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions or comments from the committee? If not, um, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, Diane Keefe, Eleanor Roberts. Uh, here, Eleanor Roberts. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi. Um, for my testimony, I'd like to play a recording from Robert Picarillo, who's currently incarcerated and would like to speak in support of SB 972. Please bear with the audio quality and sharp beeping sounds during the call. This is the reality of prison phone calls. The ticker really can't really provide money for the phone. We only get two free phone calls a week. And that's that's not going to do it for the family members I have to talk to you on Twitter to talk to my daughter, to talk to my father, to talk to my mother, to talk to my twin sister, and then I got my niece, my nephew, my little sisters. Um, it gets really, really expensive. And, and, and it's right now, it's really not doable. It's, you know, if we were to get a job in here, we don't get paid much at all. We get 75 cents a day. That's barely enough to get by. I'm sorry, the recording is still continuing. It's extremely hard for us, for my family to get by right now. I mean, with this they don't really put much money in the phone. I mean, we just use one phone call every couple of weeks. And they get work. 
and, and I get worried because my grandmother's quite old and my dad's pretty old. I get worried seeing all these statistics uh, on the news saying this age is getting very sick, this age is dying, this age is prone to get it, and, and, and I don't know what's going on. Um, and I gotta provide for them, and for the able to work for the health of my family as well. It's really hard. Um, they got bills, mortgages, and you tell me the road, dollars and then money on the phone or money on the commissary is just this easy way to go, but it's just really important. The last couple of weeks have been slower because this has been my weekend because I'm here in the air. Um, and I know it's going to be going. Um, so hopefully it gets better. It's getting better now. But, so about $1,500, what they could have put that money to, uh, they could have made so much to back on uh, these laptops for my little sisters to go to school. Uh, and their laptops are not really for the door because they do so you know, these are new houses. They do so the laptops are really. Thank you. This is again testimony from Robert Piccarillo, who's currently incarcerated in support of SB 972. Um, Ma'am, could you just spell the last name for the record, please? Yes. P I C A R I L L O. Um, thank you. Um, are there questions or comments from the committee? Um, if not, I, I'll just know, uh, you know, we, we do um, oftentimes allow folks to read testimony from others. Um, I, I certainly understand what you're trying to accomplish here. Um, I, I just worry with the audio quality that we're not going to get a, um, an accurate transcript of it um so I, i'm sure we'll do the best we can but um uh, certainly if, if there's written testimony um it's preferable that that be submitted as well so um so that we we do have an accurate record of it thank you for being with us ma'am um next up will be ann parrot P yes uh ann parrot <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Yes. Good morning, Honorable Chairs Winfield and Strastrom, Vice Chairs Kasser and Blumenthal, Ranking Members Kissel and Fishbane, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Reverend Ann Parrott. I'm a resident of Waterford, and I have worked in Osborne, Cybulski, and Corrigan prisons and prisons in Massachusetts. I strongly support Senate Bill 1059. Solitary confinement, particularly over prolonged periods of time, causes rage, paranoia, hallucinations, and even suicide. Consider being placed in a seven foot by 10 foot cage for 23 hours a day, allowed outside for one hour a day in a cage where all one can do is pace back and forth. Having your sleep continually interrupted by inmates shouting and banging in other cells suffering the total deprivation of physical and social stimuli. When this is imposed for any length of time, it results in the loss of reality as you focus inward and retreat from the real world. Many inmates subject to solitary experience delusional behavior and exhibit pathological effects. This is torture. In 2016, the National Institute of Justice reported that there was little evidence Solitary confinement reduces overall levels of violence or meaningful Im meaningfully improves staff safety in prisons and jails. Safety inside prisons for inmates and staff is vitally important. However, relying on solitary promotes violence among inmates and between inmates and staff. There are alternatives to solitary which can reduce such violence. One is Rehabilitation Diversion Units, North Carolina, provide a transition program for inmates who otherwise would have been placed in solitary. The program to accelerate clinical effectiveness or PACE in New York City provides mental health support to inmates before they commit infractions. And the true program already described by Allie Perry. 
His non-punitive options provide humane ways to deal with difficult situations inside prison. They work better than solitary, an inhumane program of torture. It has been proven not to work. I strongly support Senate Bill 1059, and I urge all of you to support it as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us. Um, Nancy Alisberg is next. Yes, this is Nancy. Ma'am, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh. There we go. All right. Okay. Um, good morning, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Nancy Alisberg, and I would like to express my strong support for raised bill 1059, also known as the Protect Act. I am a former member of the Stop Solitary Committee, uh, Stop, Stop Solitary Connecticut Steering Committee, the former managing attorney of the State Office of uh, Protection and Advocacy for Persons with Disabilities, and the now retired legal director of Disability Rights Connecticut. I want to make clear that I am fully aware that the Department of Correction has announced its intention to close Northern. While I commend this decision, DOC has not stated that it will not duplicate elsewhere within the DOC system the conditions in which the prisoners at Northern are held. So there, um, any suggestion that the PROTECT Act is no longer required is without merit. In 2003, I sued DOC on behalf of OPA and its constituents who were uh, prisoners kept in solitary confinement at Northern, which is, and solitary confinement at Northern is still utilized every day. As counsel, I directly observed the torture that my clients were subjected to in the conditions of their confinement. I had the opportunity to spend time in the prison where I walked the tears, met with my clients while they were in their cells and had firsthand experience of what it is like to be in, envi in an environment as oppressive as Northern. And the language of the UN um, Special Rapporteur on Torture is, bears repeating. The OC appears to routinely resort to repressive measures such as prolonged or indefinite isolation excessive use of in-cell restraints and needlessly intrusive strip searches. This appears to be a state sanctioned policy aimed at purposefully inflicting severe pain or suffering, physical or mental, which may amount to torture. When my case against DOC settled in 2006, we entered into terms that were designed to improve the conditions at Northern. However, over time after the expiration of the settlement, it became clear that DOC returned to its practices of the past. Prisoners with mental illness once again were housed in solitary confinement, and in fact, some of the conditions had worsened. Prisoners were subjected to in-cell restraints or behavior that they could not control as a result of their underlying mental illness and because of how the dehumanizing conditions of their solitary confinement affected them. Therefore, in February 2021, DRCT filed another case against DOC. What this history makes clear is that despite what the commissioner said, DOC cannot be trusted to eliminate solitary confinement without a statutory mandate. And I'd like to just wrap up by saying, I am also a member of the Connecticut Cross Disability Lifespan Alliance, and I urge you to review the testimony of Mary Ann Langdon, who speaks to what happens to people with mental illness when they are subjected to the um, solitary confinement conditions at DOC. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, questions or comments from the committee? If not, we appreciate you being with us. Um, Molly Franco. Hi. Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Molly Franco. I am currently a Master's of Social Work candidate at the University of Connecticut, as well as the current co-chair of the Graduate Student Organization at the School of Social Work. I am speaking today in strong support of Senate Bill 972, an act concerning uh, the cost of telecommunication services and correctional facilities. As you already know, Connecticut has some of the highest telecommunications costs in the country in fiscal year 2017 to 2018, Communities paid more than $13.3 million to speak to their loved ones. 
In this time, the state pocketed about 7.7 .7 million in corporate kickbacks, while the remaining 5.6 million has gone to Securus. I would like to emphasize that this is not just a criminal justice issue, it is a public health issue, a mental health issue, a family issue, and so much more. In a published 2015 report by the Ella Baker Center, one in three families reported going into debt to pay for phone calls or visitation. Unfortunately, many families sever ties with their incarcerated loved ones because it is more financially beneficial to do so. Although phone calls may appear inexpensive on the surface, in order to make just two 15 minute phone calls a day, a family spends about $68 a week. This is $3,545 a year. Imagine telling a child that they only have 30 minutes to tell their parent about their day, how they're doing at school, how their soccer game was, and how they love and miss them. It is a haunting reality and one that no child should ever have to face. When we lock people up, we disrupt the entire family system, not just emotionally, but also financially. Reducing the cost of prison phone calls will mitigate these compounding costs and enhance family connections. I would also like to remind the members of the judiciary that Connecticut facilities incarcerate both sentenced and pretrial detainees. Research in recent years has suggested that these costs have negatively impacted outcomes for pretrial detainees. In a briefing published by the Prison Policy Initiative, it was reported that three out of four people held in jails under local authority have not even been convicted, much less sentenced. Despite their innocence, many remain confined due to the inability to afford bail. This time in pretrial detention can jeopardize their job, their housing, custodial rights, mental health, and much more. So it is no surprise that phone calls would be vital in maintaining some sense of normalcy in one's life. Additionally, pretrial custody can have negative impact on trial outcomes. The cost of phone calls severely limits an individual's ability to prepare for their defense. Many public defenders testify, uh, uh, testify uh, using their own resources to pay for their clients uh, telecommunications costs, adding additional strain to a fundamentally broken system. Those in pretrial detainment are a large but often hidden population targeted by these telecommunication contracts, and they should not be left out of the fight for phone justice. For so long, the prison communications industry has occupied a blind spot in our efforts of reforming the criminal justice space. Eliminating telecommunication charges would not only ensure that Connecticut is moving in a progressive direction, but evidence suggests doing so would also improve outcomes for justice-involved individuals and have long-term positive outcomes on public safety in communities across the state. Thank, Thank you, you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Um, are there questions or comments from the committee? If not, appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Um, Mary Lee Duff. Mary Lee Duff with us? Yes. Yes. Good. Ma'am, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Turn your camera on for us. There, there we go. All right, go ahead, ma'am. Can you see me now? We can, yep. Okay. Uh, Mary Lee Duff from Guilford, where I am a member of the Peace Affirmation and Justice Committee at the First Congregational Church. We have a long history of working with formerly incarcerated people right there. upon their release and reentry. We meet them at drop off with duffel bags filled with immediate necessities, including bus passes. <clears throat> We have a relationship with a house for women in Hartford and are working on a new project to establish one in New Haven. I am here today in support of the PROTECT Act, SB 1059. We call them correctional institutions, but they are not correctional. Women and men upon release from incarceration need tools to become productive members of the community. They need self-respect, motivation, encouragement to envision a new life and hope. Solitary strips them of all that and only adds to the challenges they will face. Successful reentry does not only benefit them, 
it benefits the community at large. For hundreds of years in our country, people called slaves were treated inhumanely. This was tolerated because it was taken for granted. Now we look back with horror and shame. The inhumanity of solitary confinement should not be a new chapter in our history. The theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. We will not be silent until solitary confinement is no longer practiced in Connecticut. Pass the PROTECT Act. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Uh, Senator Winfield, passing it back to you. Okay, can you hear me? Just want to check. Okay, uh, Olivia Rinks is Olivia Rinks in. She'll be followed by Michelle Murdoch, Mary Morgan Wolf, Olivia Rinks. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Olivia Rinkus. I'm from North Stonington. I'm here to testify in favor of Bills SB 972, an act concerning the cost of telecommunication service and correctional facilities, and SB 1059, an act concerning the Correction Accountability Commission, the Office of the Correction Omnibus, the use of isolated confinement, seclusion, and restraints, social contacts for incarcerated persons, and training and workers' compensation benefits for correction officers. Um, to begin with, according to the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, a private company earning profit off of the internment and or bodies of prisoners is unconstitutional. Therefore, the use of for-profit prison services should immediately cease. In addition to that, it can only really be described as immoral to isolate prisoners from relatives or friends who cannot afford the cost of remaining in contact. Social isolation has a hugely detrimental effect on a person's psyche and an individual in the prison system is already at risk for new or worsening mental health conditions. Um, therefore, I am testifying in favor of SB 972. The justice system is unquestionably over-reliant on punitive reactionary measures rather than rehabilitative services that might give a convicted person more opportunities later on to resolve any mental or behavioral issues that perpetuate the poverty crime cycle. In that respect, I ask the state to pass SB 1059 as a step towards a more rehabilitative and humanizing criminal justice system um, with the su suggestion that section four be removed. State workers already receive workers' compensation benefits and the funds that would potentially be used to train correction officers about the negative effects of social isolation and punitive physical punishments on a person's psyche could be put to better use providing services for recently released individuals and in-person mental health services with more of a focus on addressing and coping with mental illnesses rather than continuously punishing them using dehumanizing and possibly detrimental methods. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to testify. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rinkett. Um, sorry for messing your name up in the beginning. Uh, is there a comment or questions from uh, members of the committee? Comment or question? I do not see any, so thank you for joining us and offering your testimony. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Uh, Michelle Murdoch, followed by Mary Morgan Wolf, and then uh, uh, Jean Reed. Uh, Michelle Murdoch? Yes, I'm here. Um, Ms. And Murdoch, we can't. We can't. I know I can't I, I apologize I can't figure out how to put on the video okay is um uh, oh, hold on start my video here I just got a link from you guys hold on okay. <laughs> start my video there it is there thank you, you for sending that <laughs> it took a second to get no <laughs> thank you I apologize um, good. good afternoon um Senator Winfield and Representative Safstrom and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee I'm Michelle Mudrick. I'm the legislative advocate for the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. And I'm writing today and testifying today in support of Senate Bill 1059 and Senate Bill 972. 
I'm writing on behalf of the 614 congregations and more than 120,000 people in our state's churches. In fact, the United Church of Christ, the UCC, is the largest Protestant denomination in Connecticut. Nationally, the UCC has more than 5,700 congregations with nearly 1 million members. I'm in support of ending the torture of solitary confinement in Connecticut and in favor of humane and effective means to keep prisons and the people who live and work there safe. Unfortunately, decades of misguided policies and a profound lack of oversight have led prisons to rely on highly punitive and ineffective measures like solitary confinement. Many correctional systems are recognizing that using isolation and other forms of violence is cruel, short-sighted, and counterproductive. Instead, more systems are turning to alternatives, including pro-social programming, mental health treatment, violence prevention, and restorative justice to understand why disputes happen in the first place. By prioritizing treatment instead of isolation for individuals who commit disciplinary infractions, prisons and jail systems have reported decreased violence. Colorado abolished solitary confinement a couple years ago, and as a result has seen 85% reduction in violence in its prisons. In 2019, New Jersey passed legislation to end it, and New York recently passed the HALP, Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Confinement Bill. I encourage Connecticut to do the same. And I want to talk now um, to um, read testimony um, in support of SB 972. And I'll be reading testimony from um, Juan Maldonado, who is incarcerated right now. His number is 236268. This is from Juan. I am an inmate incarcerated in Connecticut State Prison, Cheshire Correctional, for the last 26 years, since 1994. Ever since my incarceration, I have already spent so much in this long time away on phone bills to listen to my two boys. Unfortunately, the only person that was able to afford them was my brother, Jose, a state police officer who lost his life to COVID-19. Over the last year, I already have spent over $1,000 in phone calls. The bills for free phone calls to be able to provide free phone calls for inmates is just the right thing to do. I've been incarcerated for a long, long time, and I've seen too many people lose their lives in prison and not be able to connect to their loved ones. I believe the people of Connecticut are people with compassion and people that have mercy. The right the situation right now is that due to COVID-19, not only have we lost our loved ones, but I cannot even afford one phone call to talk to my boys. Not only that, but most of the incarcerated population is black and brown from low income families that cannot even afford one call or one 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 The reason for the bill to pass is to know that there are people in Connecticut who actually care for others. Ms. Mildred, Again, thank you very much. Ms. Mildred, I was trying to find out how long you had. I was gonna give you a little bit of time. Uh, I, I just want to say to, to members, uh, to oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, to people who are testifying, uh, that if we don't know uh, in advance that someone's not signed up, you're going to be, uh, you're still going to have three minutes. Uh, we did a little bit of leeway, obviously, uh, but I but I just need to make sure that people don't uh, take advantage of that because that would set up a whole system of things. Um, but thank you, thank you for the testimony. Um, thank you. Yes. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Questions or comments? Uh, if not, thank you very much for offering your testimony and, and sharing the testimony that you shared as well. Thank you. Uh, enjoy thank the rest. you for all your work. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next is Mary Morgan Wolf, followed by Jane Reed and Luke Noel. Mary Morgan Wolf. Good afternoon, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom and esteemed members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Mary Morgan Wolf. I'm a resident of Wallingford. I retired from the Department of Correction in 2002 after having worked 27 years in positions ranging from counselor to counselor supervisor to deputy warden to warden and in six different facilities, four of which used isolated solitary confinement. That usually meant prolonged isolation, often to include the use of hard restraints, limited social interaction, loss of visits, mail and phone calls, 
and only one hour out of cell per day. When I would tour certain segregation units, I felt the dehumanization of human beings, mostly black and brown. I knew that something just wasn't right there. The noise, the banging on the cell doors, the yelling. Trauma was present, even in me and in some of my staff. Back in the 80s and 90s, rehabilitation was a dirty word. Punishment was in. To cite just one event in my history, I offer the following. When I was the warden at Webster CI, a former minimum security facility in Cheshire, my incarcerated gardener, who had only two months left on his sentence, escaped by literally running down Route 10. He was quickly apprehended, but directly transported to Northern. Why? For punishment and as an example to others. Honestly, I don't know if any changes have been made in that regard. Although Northern will close by the end of the year, I sincerely hope that the specific practices of Northern are not transferred to other facilities. As early as 1985, we know the UN defined solitary confinement as torture. In the 90s, it repeatedly condemned solitary confinement. And just one year ago, in February, the UN again voiced alarm at the department's use of it. Now is the time to promote the use of safe, alternative, rehabilitative confinement options by adopting the standards set forth in Senate Bill 1059. Now is the time and you have the power to legislate against the use of unintended torture on incarcerated human beings. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Moore. Uh, is there a comment or a question from members of the committee? Is there a comment or a question? I, I do not see any. I wanna thank you very much for joining us today, offering your testimony. Oh, wait, sorry, we do have one. Representative Powell. I apologize, Mr. Chair, I was fumbling for the thing. Um, good afternoon, Ms. Wolf. I just wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit when you said the trauma uh, rebounded back on you. Would you mind um, if that's not too personal to talk about <coughs> what you meant by that? Well, it's a bit personal. Um, I, it's very personal. Okay, well, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I, I, I guess my point is that people who work in the correction system also are invested in the job that they have to do. And if solitary is making their lives more difficult as well, I think this committee should know that. Okay. I have, I have been in therapy and in therapy, I come to realize that a portion of my time in the department of correction, um, felt like PTSD and I'm dealing with that. Thank you, ma'am. I had no intention of, of making you uncomfortable. I, I, I appreciate very much your candor and, and the work Thank that you, you. Do. And I wish you well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. A comment or a question from other members of the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us, for offering your testimony, for, for helping us to understand the impact on not only those on the, the inside, but those who, who work on the inside as well. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have Jean Reed, uh, Luke Noel, and then Unison Kellner. Is Jean Reed in? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't hear you. Though. I don't know that I can make this thing work. I do have a camera here. I see the light on me, but I never use it. So. Okay. You can What's that? You can proceed. Okay. Um, well, my name is Jeannie Reed. I'm here to speak in favor of Senate Bill 1059. Um, I'm a resident of Summers. 
Um, I feel very out of my league with the experience of the other testifiers. This is the first time I've ever testified in a situation like this. And I, it's the first time I've ever even been on Zoom. Um, are you still able to hear me? Uh-oh. Okay, thank you. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to say that I, I just learned about the situation and abuse through um, solitary confinement within Connecticut. I felt that Connecticut was an enlightened state. And since learning about the abuses and what the United Nations had to say about uh, the way Connecticut uses solitary confinement, I am devastated. And then further listening to the testimony today and especially regarding us being 49th in the cost of cell phone calls to inmates, I am just horrified. I live here in Summers. It's sickening to me to think that within two miles of where I live in my comfortable life, people are suffering being tortured. This is torture. I don't, that's, that's about all I can say. And um, I hope that uh, you support Senate Bill 1059. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to say to you that uh, you may not have used it before, but you use them. Uh, Representative Palm, do uh, you have a comment or a question? Your hand is up. No, that's from before. Okay. Uh, is, are there comments or questions from members of the committee? Comments or questions? Uh, I do not see any. I want to thank you very much for figuring Zoom out and, and offering us your testimony today. I hope you enjoy the rest of it. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we'll hear from uh, Luke Noel, Unison Kellner, and then I have Sarah Egan, but I think she testified earlier. Uh, so Luke Noel, are you here? Um, Unison Kellner, uh, Luke, Mr. Noel, Noel, are you here? I'm here. Uh, your unit in Calvary. Mm -hmm. Okay, you may proceed then. All right. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Unison. I'm here to testify in favor of Bill 1059. I live in New Haven and I work as a library assistant in the Yale University library system. I'm here as a concerned citizen. Um, I'm here because I'm concerned about our carceral system producing mental illness. The use of isolation within Connecticut's carceral system serves to severely dysregulate the, the nervous systems of inmates for extended periods of time, leaving them traumatized. As someone who understands and lives with post-traumatic stress disorder, I know that the process of treating and healing trauma is costly, it's painful, and it is lifelong. As human beings, a social species, our nervous systems are all wired to seek connection as a means of survival. It is a fundamental physiological need, like food and like shelter. When bodies do not have their needs met, they lose integrity, they turn on themselves, and they begin to fall apart. Isolation is a major risk factor for several psychiatric disorders, and perhaps from our own experiences of quarantining during COVID restrictions, and witnessing the mental health repercussions of this form of isolation, we can all begin to feel the reality of that destabilization and that isolation causes. And, um, and hopefully we can begin to empathize with the experience. This bill codifies into law some basic requirements for making the carceral system somewhat more humane through reducing the amount of time inmates are held in solitary, and it moves to protect social bonds, which establish, and, it, and it establishes some oversight. So I support it with my whole heart, and I hope that all of you support it as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you uh, for your time and for your testimony. Is there a comment or questions from members of the committee? 
comment or question. Uh, I do not see any. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kellner, for your, your time. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I see Luke Noel in the list. Are you, are you there? Uh, yes. Sorry, I think I was in a waiting room. Um, good afternoon. Yeah. Um, as my testimony, I'd like to play a recording from Bobby, who's currently incarcerated and is speaking in support of SB 972. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to share the voices of people who are currently incarcerated. And I'm really hoping you'll be able to hear Bobby's important testimony. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes, my name is Bobby Bob, inmate number 151684. I've been down going on six years. My daughter's mother's a single parent. She's taking care of my daughter. She's a school teacher, so she knows she's been out of work. It's been hard on her. It's been hard on me and my daughter to keep contact with each other. And sometimes it's been very stressful because it's very hard to also be able to get uh, visitation and video consultation and, and things that they have going on, which is hard to do. But the phone calls, the free calls will be very, very, very useful for people that are incarcerated because it's been a burden being here under the pandemic. Uh, even outside of that, just people just struggling to try to help meet our needs on one end and then at the same time being able to have time with their family and their kids, uh, grandparents, mothers and fathers. And I think that uh, this would be very, very much helpful and much needed for us as going forward to be able to have free calls to help us lighten the burden off of our people with everything that's going on, especially now. So uh, I'm going to end with that, and I hope that uh, everything that I've said has been taken in consideration and will be used as a very thought and push it forward to change the phone situation so that we will be able to have free calls and be able to help our family so that we can connect more. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Noel, and uh, thank you for presenting that testimony. I see Representative Fish a comment or a question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just so that I understand, am I able to ask questions of the individual who I just heard from? Or um, is that... So uh, can... uh, Representative Fishbein, you can uh, ask questions of the individual who's actually here. And ask questions of the... Currently in car. So your audio is your audio's breaking up. Um, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, hmm. Uh, are you able to hear me? That's a little better. You seem to break up at the end of what you were saying. Uh, what I was saying was you can ask questions of the person on the recording. Uh, that individual obviously is recorded, uh, currently incarcerated, wanted to provide uh, testimony, but uh, couldn't for obvious reasons. So uh, it's a recording. You can ask the individual who is sitting there if you have any questions for him, but not the individual with the, with the recording. Okay, thank you. I, I'm glad that, okay, now that I know where we are. Um, hey, Luke, um, do you have personal knowledge? Like, have you been incarcerated? And I, can I have not. The, okay. I have Thanks. not. I work at Worth Rises, which uh, deals largely with issues on prison phone justice. Okay, understood. I just, okay, I understand your perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. Comment or question from other members of the committee? Comment or questions? Seeing none, thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Noel, uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Rory Whelan, followed by Brian Moran and Joy Avalon. Uh, Roy Wheeling, you have three yes. minutes. Yes, Senator. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you. I am Rory Whalen. 
I'm the regional vice president of government affairs for the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. And uh, today I'm going to comment on two civil liability uh, bills. Uh, the first is uh, House 5125. Uh, this bill appropriately recognizes that businesses, schools, nonprofits, other institutions and professionals who have done the right thing by adhering to public health guidelines during this pandemic, that they should not be subjected to costly and frivolous lawsuits. I want to thank Representative Fishbein for sponsoring this important legislation uh, that uh, many other states uh, have adopted. Uh, I think it's um, very important that um, Connecticut is, if they enact this law, will lead where Washington has lagged. The Congress has endeavored to enact similar nationwide legislation for more than a year without any success. And I think, um, and as I mentioned, West Virginia is poised to be the 36th state uh, that has adopted uh, civil liability protections uh, for businesses and, and other entities, as I said, who have done the right thing, who have at great effort and great expense changed their, their, um, their policies and their uh, modus operandi um, in order to comport with very fluid public health guidelines. Uh, these folks are uh, kept services, critical services and goods flowing uh, at a time when uh, much of our society came to a, a standstill. Uh, and they should not be burdened uh, with frivolous lawsuits uh, that, that, are, uh, that are wasteful in terms of wasting resources that can otherwise go into helping those who really uh, need the help um, to get out of this pandemic. Uh, so approval of this bill would memorialize in statute that Connecticut will support business investment and job creation by granting legal protections to responsible businesses and other entities. Uh, I would also like to comment sort of the mirror image, at least uh, with respect to nursing homes, uh, raise bill 1029. Uh, in essence, this bill would negate uh, Governor Lamont's executive order of last year, uh, Executive Order 7U, uh, which provides immunity uh, from suit for civil liability for any injury or death uh, alleged to have been sustained because of the Mr. individual. Wellen. Mr. Wellen, uh, your time is up, if you could summarize. Thank you, Senator. Uh, again, this bill is, is drafted so broadly that anyone can bring law, a suit for any claim regardless of whether you were in that nursing home or even contracted COVID. You could simply say that um, your cousin was in the nursing home and she contracted COVID uh, and it caused you emotional distress and you could bring a lawsuit. The bill is really drafted so broadly, um, it, it would invite uh, uh, you know, the uh, frivolous lawsuits from the community of Thank you. We don't Thank get you. paid until you get paid. Thank you, Mr. Whalen. Uh, uh, there's a comment or a question from Chairman Stastrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Whalen, I'm not familiar with your organization. Um, are you an insurer in the state or you represent the insurance companies? Or? We represent the, the pr property and casualty insurance companies, yes. Okay. Um, do you have knowledge of how many um, COVID liability lawsuits have been filed in Connecticut? Uh, I do not know the number. Okay. Um, you... I, 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 would, I would point out though that um, COVID is going to be with us for a long time. And in my written testimony, I did um, note the, uh, the communicable disease experts who've said that they're not quite sure about the lasting impact this will have, respiratory, et cetera. Um, so these lawsuits, may, we may be dealing with for many, many years to come. In addition, additionally, we all know that there are variants, uh, whether it's going to be this year or in the future. 
So especially with regard to 1029, the, the door is gonna be open for a very long time for these lawsuits. Um, but you don't know, you don't know whether there have been any lawsuits yet filed in Connecticut where either an employee or someone who visited a business says, gee, I caught COVID there and I, I'm seeking monetary damages as a, as a result thereof. I'm not aware, no. You're not aware of any of those cases that have been filed yet in Connecticut? Specifically, I, I couldn't tell you a, a case name, no. Okay. Um, and you mentioned uh, kind of the ongoing concern. Is I assume you're familiar with the, the language of the bill before us? Uh, which one, sir? Uh, 5125. Yes. Okay. Um, as, as I read this language, um, this only covers any sort of suit arising during the public health or civil preparedness emergencies, which I believe are set to expire um, unless I guess the legislature decides otherwise, but uh, is set to expire as of April 20th. Um, would, does your organization support a lengthy, I guess, extension of the public health emergency in the state in order for um, this potential protection to, I guess, uh, protect a business entity from right. these future variants? Well, I, I think that is the purview of, of the legislature and, and the governor. Um, I would not second guess um, the state in terms of um, when it decides that the public health emergency is over. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the you know variants are still very much up in the air um so you know i i would leave that to the experts and uh and you good folks um and then i guess on your point about um i guess frivolous lawsuits what what's your definition of a frivolous lawsuit uh, again what what um which bill are we talking about or both or a fifth 5125 right now. I'm just, I'm referring to your testimony. You you used the term frivolous lawsuit a couple of times and I'm, I'm wondering what you meant by that. Uh, I mean, the, the claim that um, the uh, person got COVID from a business who otherwise was uh, comporting with public health guidelines. Um, but nonetheless, they say, I, believe that I got it from um, your store or your school uh, and I'm filing a lawsuit uh, despite the fact that that entity took all the precautions that the public health, the federal and state guidelines asked them to do. That to me is frivolous. But um, I guess on that, how, how are we to determine whether a business has, I think the term used in the bill is substantially complied with the public health guidelines? Isn't, isn't that up to a court to decide whether a business has substantially complied with the public health guidelines? No, I, I, I think um, we can all, based on our, our daily experiences, understand or, or know uh, when a business has the plastic shields when they have markers on the aisle that ask people to stay six feet apart. Um, I think we can all recognize that. And I don't think you need to, to involve lawyers and judges and, uh, uh, and resources that especially for small businesses are in very short supply right now uh, to defend against something like that. Okay, but if, if the public health guidelines say you know, tables in a restaurant need to be six feet apart, right? And my claim is I walked into a restaurant, I got COVID at that restaurant, but the tables at that restaurant were only spaced four feet apart. And that's my claim. Is that a frivolous lawsuit to bring? Well, again, I think if the restaurant is doing the right thing uh, by keeping it six feet apart, then that is frivolous. But I guess my point is, isn't it to a 
court. Doesn't a court need to determine still whether a business has substantially complied with the public health guidelines or not? And, and how, would a, how would a court do that? And are we, are we going to bring every, allow every little um, uh, case like that, four feet versus six feet? Well, I guess that I guess that's the question I'm asking about this legislation and and what it's attempting to do and how it works. Well, I think if, if 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 the restaurant simply said these are our guidelines and this is what we adhered to, then there should be no lawsuit. Period. Chairman okay. Stashman, before before you respond, I, I would just remind uh, everyone that when people are talking, if you speak before they finish asking a question, sometimes it's hard to hear. Uh, Chairman Stashman, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, but I guess, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to figure, I, I get the intent of this bill. I really, in a way, do. I just, I'm not sure how, without invoking the court's jurisdiction to determine whether somebody met their standard of care, which is whether they reasonably complied with the public health guidelines, how you make that determination outside of the context of the rules of evidence, court proceeding, and the dispute resolution process we as a society have set up through our courts. Um, and I guess that's, that's the crux of my question, not to belabor this, but when you say it will prevent frivolous lawsuits, I'm trying to figure out how that's the case. Because as I read this, a court still has to determine whether a business st substantially complied with the applicable health and safety operation guidelines contained in the executive orders issued by the governor and others. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out whether I'm missing something, whether there is another way to determine how a business has substantially complied outside of that question of fact being presented to a court finder of fact. Well, I, I think it's more the the ability to, if you, if it goes to a judge to assert that these were our the, these were our standards, these were our guidelines, and we followed them, and thus the suit would be thrown out. Okay. Now, if 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 that's the case, people will you know they'll stop bringing those lawsuits. Okay. So just so we're clear, so we're not. You'll agree with me then that this bill as it's currently written, is not an immunity provision. If anything, it gives rise to an affirmative defense for a defendant to say, I substantially complied with the public health regulations, therefore I'm not liable. I, 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 sir, I'm not an attorney, so uh, I would defer to others on that. Okay, all righty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Blumenthal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I guess uh, Chairman Staffstrom asked some of the questions uh, that I would, and I have similar concerns. And uh, Mr. Whalen, uh, if some of these some of these questions are more technical uh, about how a lawsuit works, so if you don't feel uh, that comfortable answering them, just let me know. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so I think you know it makes sense to a lot of us that there be some sort of defense oriented around the uh, guidance in place at the time to, to lawsuits um, related to COVID-19. The concern I have is, is providing a civil immunity because uh, I don't quite understand how that would work in practice. And um, so first of all, um, do you, are you, what, what is your understanding of how in like what, the procedure would be for a case being dismissed under this statute or this yeah, again I, I i appreciate that uh, i am i'm not equipped to answer those sort of legal questions okay so it, it seemed like your testimony in response to representative staffstrom that you anticipated that all the entity that was defending the case would have to do would just say that they complied with the guidelines is that a fair characterization of what you testified to? That's my understanding. How would we know if the entity were telling the truth? Uh, 
you know, uh, uh, again, going back to the other bill and, and the executive order, I would imagine in the same way that the, the governor issued that executive order, um, that these cases would be adjudicated in, in much the same way. Okay, those, are you aware of how they've been adjudicated? I am not. Okay, so would it surprise you to find out that they haven't been adjudicated because no personal injury lawsuits of this type have been brought in the state of Connecticut? Again, th this, uh, the pandemic is not over um, and we don't know what the future is going to bring. That's fair. Um, would you agree that potential tort liability provides a powerful incentive to take protective measures against COVID-19? Well, again, the, we're, we're not talking about gross negligence. We're, we're talking about businesses who have done the right thing and have followed all the protocols, protocols that have been very fluid uh, and, and sometimes uh, contradictory. And fair, and, but would you agree that the prospect of potentially being liable in court has been one of the incentives that's motivated businesses to do the right thing during COVID-19? Well, I think not necessarily during COVID-19. I think uh, in general, I think that's a fair statement. So it's a powerful incentive for businesses to do the right thing always, fair to say? Yeah, I think the, the more powerful incentive is to be a, a good upstanding business and get more clients, get more customers, provide better services. Uh, and I think um, the, the incentive is to succeed. I, I agree with that too. Um, you know, I think there's a financial incentive as well through the tort system. And um, it would be fair to say that the businesses you represent, the insurance companies you represent, um, you know, do you, do, do you take into account um, potential policyholders' practices in, uh, in deciding how to underwrite policies? Or uh, do you institute uh, any sort of guidelines or measures to ensure they follow good practices? Uh, so that they are good I'm, not an, I'm not an underwriter. I, I, don't, uh, I can't say I'm an expert in that process. But, would, but, but could you say, uh, based on your position, that insurance companies take measures to ensure that their insureds are being safe uh, and are thus less likely to be sued successfully? Well, I think certainly the, the, uh, what, when underwriting, they do take in consideration uh, historic, uh, historical data. Okay. Um, and, and would you agree that many, if not all insurance companies also uh, take measures to do uh, or to enact policies that uh, insured should follow so that they are not likely to be sued? Uh, I, I, I'm, I can't say that I'm aware of requiring policies for businesses. You mean? I guess what I'm that, saying that is- we would, That we would require that your restaurant have tables six feet apart during a pandemic? I, I don't believe that there's any policy like that. I'll put it this way, just more generally, not COVID-19 directly related, but, you know, insurance companies tell their insureds what to do so as to be safer, right? Insurance companies are a positive influence on their insureds, on businesses throughout the country, because they don't want their businesses to get sued. And the insured com insurance companies don't want to pay out settlements sure, to, or but, judgments. But to what extent? I, I couldn't opine. Right, but just as a general matter, it's true. Right. Uh, again, I really couldn't opine on that. Okay. Um, and on the other bill, the uh, Senate Bill 1029, the cause of action bill, is your primary concern uh, your understanding that uh, anyone could sue rather than just someone who is directly injured by a nursing homes? alleged negligence? No, that, I just I just raised that as an example of how uh, broadly drafted the bill was. Okay. Or is. Okay. I, you know, I, I actually was interested because th that you mentioned this, so I looked at the bill again. Um, it appears to me, I'm just reading from it now, it says section B, which is the cause of action portion, um, says notwithstanding any provision of the general statutes, any person may bring 
a civil action in the Superior Court for the Judicial District where such, such person resides for any loss, damage, injury, or death arising from exposure. Um, my understanding of that language, and maybe it does need to be revised, I don't know, it, it, is that that person who was injured would be able to bring the lawsuit. You have a different understanding, I take it? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, sir, for your answers uh, and your testimony and for appearing with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, I believe you indicated before you're not an attorney, correct? Correct. And do you, you know, there's many people that are not attorneys that have some knowledge as to the procedural civil process procedure in our courts. Do you have a, a knowledge as to how our courts operate? Uh, I do not. Okay. So when we look at 5125, and I know you're in support of the bill, and I thank you for your support. Does any portion of, of this bill say that one cannot bring a lawsuit? No. So I, I know you were asked questions by Chairman Stabstrom um, about that issue. You know, the way I read this language is that it's, it's an affirmative defense. An action is brought. There is some level of whether it be discovery, um, some procedure by which one shows that they followed the guidance of the government, um, public health, all of that stuff, and they can be alleviated of liability. Do you read this any way differently? Right, than that? right. Um, which would be our court process. So, uh, and, and in fact, um, even if they applied, they did what they were supposed to do in the last line, uh, lines 24 through 26, um, it says that even if they did comply, that there may be liability um, if there was gross negligence or willful misconduct by that entity. Right, and perhaps I didn't articulate uh, well enough that with regard to frivolous lawsuits, if, you, if the, uh, say the restaurant or the store owner has the affirmative defense, it will dissuade further lawsuits. It would also help the, the economy because, you know, there's a level of fear out there that if somebody engages in business, uh, you know, I, I brought up, I don't know if you were here before with the uh, sanitizing uh, situation with the cleaning companies. You know, they're fearful that, you know, they're going to be held to an expectation of sanitizing um, a, a particular place and that may create liability issues and they're not interested in being in the cleaning business anymore and that negatively impacts upon um, economic development and the economy of the state. Um, also, you were asked about cases that have presently been brought um, under the auspices of 525, 5125, or the other. Um, you know, is it your experience um, in, in what you do that government is protractive or reactive, uh, proactive or reactive um, for the most part? Uh, in my experience, reactive. Okay. Um, and here, if, if there are no cases, this would be an, an, an example of government being proactive in the face of a pandemic. Correct. Um, do you have any knowledge as to statute of limitation that uh, would be in place? Let's say if somebody claimed that last week uh, they came to a business and they uh, contracted COVID there and made a claim um, as a third party, when would that ability, if you know, uh, to bring that lawsuit, when would that exhaust? I don't know the statute of limitations in Connecticut. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Whalen, for your testimony here today. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Are there comments or questions from other members of the committee? Comments or questions? Um, 
I do not see any. I want to thank you for joining us today and you. offering your testimony. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. uh, next, uh, we have Brian Moran, uh, Joy Avalon, and Deborah Pauls. Is uh, Brian Moran in? He's here. Uh, you have three minutes. Great. Uh, thank you, Co Chair Winfield, Co Chair Staffsrum, and members of the committee. My name is Brian Moran. I'm Director of Government Affairs for the New England Convenience Store and Energy Marketers Association. Uh, in Connecticut, there are home to almost 1,700 convenience stores employing over 20, 25,000 people. Uh, Nexa, Nexima uh, is supporting HB uh, 5125. Yeah. On behalf of our members, I want to thank all the 15 co-sponsors for this forward-thinking legislation and its overall recognition of the importance of essential businesses. Uh, I've submitted written testimony. I just want to highlight a couple of key points. Uh, one is, uh, you know, our members from the beginning of the pandemic uh, chose to remain open. It wasn't an option. We wanted to be open for our customers and our communities and neighborhoods and continue to serve them. Uh, I personally followed the five uh, New England governors in our jurisdiction every day during the height of the pandemic and provided critical feedback to all of our members on the breaking health and safety protocols and requirements uh, for minimizing transmission, not only to our employees, but importantly to our customers as well. We cared and we did the right thing. And in this legislation, I think gets our back, supports our back for that effort and responsibility to minimize the transmission. Um, as it's been discussed as well, this for bill does not reward or provide a blanket protection for people who ignored those safety protocols and didn't chose not to follow them at their own peril. Uh, in some of my research on this, I have found that nationally there are 2000 employment related litigation cases nationally and 38 in Connecticut. The need for this type of protection is real. Uh, the rise of COVID transmission that we've seen historically throughout the pandemic has not been attributed to business compliance. It's been attributed to personal socialization. So we've done our part. And I think that's the, the key piece in all of this. And, and I think it, what we're getting at is being able to have a deterrent or a safe harbor for our businesses from lawsuits that are misplaced where causation for COVID isn't present and it's an, and people perhaps seeking to profiteer. And that's, uh, I, I think some of the key points for us and we certainly appreciate the support on behalf of all of our members. Uh, do you have any questions? I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you, uh, Represent, uh, Chairman Stastrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just real quick, Mr. Moran, thanks for being with us. Can you give me that stat in Connecticut one more time? It was 38 employment-related COVID transmission cases that have been filed? Yes. In my written testimony, there's a link. Um, I don't know if you were able to see that, but I, when I wrote the, legis wrote the testimony last week, uh, Connecticut had 35 cases that were COVID-related employment. I don't know, I don't want to portend that that is 38 uh, cases COVID related illnesses, but they're COVID related litigation that's being tracked uh, by some of the larger national law firms. Okay, thank you. You got. Thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Representative Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Moran for being here with us today. I may have missed if someone else asked you, but are you attorney? Uh, no, I'm not, sir. Okay, so I will not subject you to uh, <laughs> cross-examination um, on procedural matters. Um, so actually, I looked at the link in your testimony, which is helpful, thank you. Um, and I, I looked at the breakdown um, of cases and they seem to all be employment related. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I believe that's the uh, heading for the, uh, the link. Okay, so um, so it looks it looks like um, you know the breakdown I'm seeing is 
you know, uh, a good deal relate to employment discrimination, some more relate to remote work or leave contact, uh, conflicts, um, some more are oriented around retaliation or whistleblower claims, and there's one wrongful discharge claim in Connecticut um, related to COVID-19. And I, I guess my question is, I mean, these seem like serious matters where you would want people to achieve justice if they were discriminated against in the context of COVID-19, if there was some sort of remote work or leave conflict that violated employment law, or there was a retaliation or whistleblower, whistleblower claim, a wrongful discharge related to COVID-19. Um, why shouldn't these cases be brought? Well, I, I think the, this legislation doesn't prevent that. Um, I think it's important. I think, you know, probably the, the most critical piece in all of this is, is the causation standard uh, is highly problematic. And it can, you know, how do you know when you truly became infected and had, uh, you know, a health issue associated with it? And, and I think what's also important is to keep in mind that there are other bills out there that are trying to preempt that as well and basically do the opposite of what this legislation would do, where it's proposing to uh, make COVID an occupational disease mm -hmm. that would be covered under workman's comp. Um, so I think what we're trying to identify is, you know, we put ourselves out there, our workers, our customers, and we chose to stay open. And we wanted, it was unquestionably the right thing to do is to follow those breaking, changing, evolving uh, health safety protocols that were issued almost daily. And, you know, put up the shields, protect your point of sale, discontinue uh, certain products as well. And that was absolutely necessary. And I think what we're looking for here is for the legislature to have our back after our performance and high rates of compliance you, what you know, I would see across all the across the regional governors' uh, press conferences and giving updates, they weren't pointing to business as being the cause of the rise of transmission. It was personal socialization, mm -hmm. and so we're looking for you to have our back uh, to make the bar a little bit higher for somebody to suit to provide suit and give us some protection because we have to defend ourselves. Thanks. And you kind of, you identified a, a key element, I think, that we should be thinking about uh, in terms of these bills. Um, you identified the causation standard. Um, you know, it, it, would you agree it's be pretty hard to prove that you got COVID-19? If you, Sorry, I'll backtrack. If you're a customer and you just went into a store for five minutes, 10 minutes, um, especially if it's a convenience store, you have to drive to get there. Um, go outside, the, you know, the home. Would you agree it'd be pretty hard to prove that you got COVID nineteen in a store like that? Sure, I think it would be uh, a universal uh, difficulty. You know, unless you could, uh, you knew someone had COVID and you directly interacted with them, and they weren't wearing a mask. Um, you know, those are the types of circumstances that this bill wouldn't protect. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, the causation standard is key and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a deep concern for us. Yeah. So you would agree, I think that the causation standard and the difficulty of actually proving you got COVID in any particular business, again, if you were a customer, that's a pretty high protection for uh, businesses, right? It'd be pretty hard to prove that for a plaintiff. Uh, correct. However, and I think what our concern is, is that we're, we're going to be put in that position of having to defend ourselves. And it's those costs mm -hmm. that this legislation helps at least make it a higher bar mm -hmm. and give people a little more time to really evaluate whether that's the best course of action to take. Um, and, you know, it's having to defend ourselves 
uh, without regard to merit uh, of the circumstances as you would be, be suggesting. Okay, and would you agree that um, in terms of the kind of the matters that I was mentioning earlier from the, the data that you presented, you know, employment discrimination, remote worker leave, retaliation, whistleblower claims, wrongful discharge claims. Do you believe that as a general matter, you know, those sorts of claims deserve to be adjudicated? Well, I, I think it's, I think we're not saying that this bill wouldn't allow anybody to adjudicate anything. They can do it. It's just a question of merit and whether, um, there is an opportunity for essential businesses to be able to have some sort of affirmative defense. Okay, well, I appreciate your answers. I mean, the way I think about this, you know, I happen to be an attorney. Um, to me, the idea, you know, that there would be an onslaught of personal injury cases from customers would be quite far-fetched because I just don't understand how any lawyer would take that case in the mainstream because it'd be almost impossible to prove uh, in, in most cases, unless there's really egregious or unique conduct. Um, but I'm concerned about the immunity uh, issue from a employment perspective, because as you said, um, you know, your business has stayed open and your employees were out there exposed to risk. And, um, you know, I, I think that if a business isn't taking measures to protect their employees. Uh, you know, it's the employees who are out there at risk. You know, they need to have their rights vindicated too. So I think uh, that's a concern that's kind of uh, bothering me about this bill. And uh, I, I appreciate your answers and, and your being here with us today. Thank you for the question. Further questions or comments from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, next up will be Joy Avalon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Chairman Winfield, Chairman Staffstrom, Vice Chairs, Ranking Members, and members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm Joy Avalon, General Counsel for the Insurance Association of Connecticut, a state-based trade association for Connecticut's insurance industry. I want to thank you for the opportunity to obviously come before you today. Um, I should note that we submitted testimony on two bills, but that my testimony today will focus on House Bill 5125. Um, you know, we feel very strongly that the civil immunity uh, proposed under House Bill 5215 is smart public policy. It will benefit entities conducting businesses for profit as well as those for not, not for profit, public agencies, workers, and the overall economy. Uh, immunity will also incentivize compliance with safety guidelines. It's probably one of the strongest uh, incentives, in fact. At least 35 states, but I, I believe looking at testimony from, from other individuals, it may actually be as high as 40 states have already recognized the value of such legislation and have provided similar liability protections for responsible entities. And we urge Connecticut to follow their lead. Immunity under this bill is reasonable and appropriate because it's limited to those entities that substantially complied with the applicable health and safe operation guidelines contained not only in the EOs issued by the governor, but also the guidance of the Department of Public Health. These entities may still be held liable for losses, damages, and injuries caused by gross negligence or willful misconduct. And in fact, as I think a, a number of people have already mentioned, you know, claims are, are able to be brought under this bill. Um, this simply provides an affirmative defense. Um, it's also important to note that health and safety guidelines have been continuously changing since the onset of the pandemic and compliance has been challenging and costly for many. Uh, entities covered by this bill have rose to the challenge and in doing so have contributed to the battle against COVID-19 by providing critical and essential services and goods. These entities should really be commended for their work and afforded protection from opportunistic lawsuits allowing responsible entities to operate free from fear of frivolous COVID-19 related lawsuits will have both a short-term and long-term positive economic impact. Businesses that remain shut down on account of the pandemic will be encouraged to reopen, while those currently operating at limited capacity will be encouraged to return to pre-pandemic operation. The reopening and expanded operation of businesses will provide employment opportunities for those who have been unable to work and will ensure access to critical goods and services as we move forward. 
This will not only stimulate the economy during the current stage of the pandemic, but it will also enable a swifter economic recovery once the pandemic subsides. And for those reasons, we urge you to strongly support this bill. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, Joy. Nice to see you. Joy, my concern is that, um, well, how is your industry dealing with uh, the uncertainty? You know, I would think that, um, you know, if I was insuring a business and that business was open to liability for what underlies 5125 at least, that I'd be raising premiums on business. I mean, how is your industry dealing with this? Uh, so I can't say with certainty what each company is doing, obviously. Um, as a general premise, the greater the liability and the risk, you know, the, the more costly premiums are because obviously they have to, um, they have to correlate. We have seen in cases of the auto industry, uh, you know, some companies were able to refund some premiums because there were certainty that there wouldn't be claims resulting from um, the clear reduction in driving. Companies haven't gone that far um, with respect to the, the PNC companies with the business liability, to my knowledge anyway, because there's uncertainty as to how many claims are going to be filed. Um, just in the testimony that we've heard today, there are variations regarding the number of claims that have been filed really on a nationwide level and also on a state level. In reviewing, um, again, testimony from other individuals, there were actually, there was actually a stat that said a complaint, a COVID complaint tracker um, had documented just about 9,000 pandemic related lawsuits nationwide and over a hundred of those were in Connecticut um, with the statute of limitations. And I think it's two or three years in Connecticut. You could correct me because I, I know that you're more familiar with that than me. You know, obviously there's uncertainty as to how many claims are gonna be raised going forward. And this bill would help to provide some certainty at least with regard to um, having an affirmative defense for the businesses that have been able to comply with all of the safety guidelines. Yeah, I thank you for that. I, you know, I guess the concern is if, you know, the, the Department of Public Health said, I mean, early on we'll remember, you know, they talk about doorknobs and things like that. Uh, the COVID was transferable by doorknobs um, that you had to, you know, sanitize doorknobs. And then like three months later, CDC came out and said not transferable by solid objects and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I guess the concern is if somebody brought a lawsuit that said, you know, after the CDC guidance, I touched a doorknob and I got COVID, you know, how is one to defend against that? There's, you know, there was no guidance and you can't sue the governor, you know, it was a sovereign immunity issue. Um, so, I mean, those are, those are all the concerns. Do you see any way to get through those concerns without a bill like this? Uh, I, <laughs> well, I, I can't say with certainty what any other, you know, what any other recommendations would be. Um, I don't know that this would stop all frivolous lawsuits. I don't think that it would have that impact, um, but I do think it would help you know, pretty much the court, the court systems, um, insurers, insureds, you know, um, society as a whole, really, that sounds pretty drastic, but it really would help to minimize, you know, frivolous and meritless claims from going forward, which would give business owners, workers, um, you know, some solace in, in operating and, and continuing to operate going forward. Yeah, you know, I thank you for that. Thank you for coming to testify here today. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks, Joy, for being with us today. Uh, unfortunately, I know you're an attorney, so uh, <laughs> a couple of questions for you. Um, uh, and thanks for your testimony so far. Uh, so um, based on your testimony, uh, you understand this uh, bill to be creating an affirmative defense, not an immunity. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think the title states that it's immunity, but um, I think that a, a proper designation would probably be akin to affirmative defense. Okay, and um, is it is your industry uh, seeking? That's what your industry is seeking: affirmative defense. Correct. Um, we think that it's reasonable for businesses who complied, you know, with these ongoing regulations and, and guidance, to be afforded some protection from 
again, you know, we keep saying frivolous lawsuits. I don't think it's going to stop lawsuits from being filed, um, but I think that it does provide, you know, some security in knowing that not everyone and anyone is going to go out there and file a claim thinking that, you know, something may stick to the wall if it's brought. Okay, thanks. And so I guess procedurally, um, if it's an affirmative defense, uh, then uh, the defendant entity would have the burden of pleading and persuading uh, the finder of fact that the entity com substantially complied with the COVID-19 guidelines at the time? That, that sounds right to me, but I'm not going to represent myself as a, an expert in civil litigation. So, but that okay. does sound reasonable. Yep. All right. Well, uh, thank you for uh, being with us and answering our questions as always. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Eblon. Further questions? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, Deborah Pauls. Hello. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi. Dear Chair, Chairman Winfield, Strafston, Vice Chair Kaiser, Blumenthal, and Ranking Members of the Judiciary Committee. I am Deborah Pauls, and I have lived and worked in Stanford for 43 years. Professionally, I'm a social worker and I have a psychotherapy practice in Stanford. As I approach retirement, I am choosing to put more of my time into supporting changes in our communities and in our state that will make a difference for individuals with mental health issues. As a therapist, there is only so much one can do to undo the harms and traumas that people suffer in the years prior to coming into therapy. Early childhood stressors and traumas have often brought people into my office. Unfortunately, many others have landed in prison. I've come to see that the individual with mental health problems is often not treated in a therapist office, clinic, or hospital, but rather their mental health problems have resulted in incarceration. Their problems only worsen if, as a prisoner, they are subjected to more violence and particularly the torture of torturous practice of solitary confinement. Certainly in this past year, all of us have suffered due to the pandemic. We miss being able to hug a friend, have close contact with a family member and look into their eyes. Perhaps we have suffered with depression or fought off anxiety as a result. What we have experienced is only a taste of what solitary confinement can do to an individual already recovering already removed from caring, friendly relationships. Those of us who have, who have had to quarantine and or isolate have been able to stay in touch with others. We have made calls and we've seen our family and friends through video calls. We have, we have had friends bring our favorite meals to us and we have had the comforts of home and entertainment on the TV channel of our choice. Tough as those weeks were for us in isolation, we've only had the slightest glimpse, glimpse of what solitary confinement does to a person. And we have only had to quarantine perhaps for 14 days. A snapshot in time tells us that on December 1st of 2018, a majority of prisoners incarcerated in administrative segregation, a form of solitary, had been isolated for between 181 to 730 days, according to the DOC's data. Please take this in, 181 to 730 days is six to 18 months of isolation. There is a reason that this is defined as torture under international law. Solitary confinement does not aid in the rehabilitation of a prisoner. It produces a frightened, anxious, angry, depressed person who possibly dissociates or swings from depression to mania. He or she returns to the general population in a mental state that is likely to produce a repeat of the very behavior for which he or she was sent into isolation. The guards and other staff are now expected to maintain a safe and calm environment with these traumatized people. When they are finally released, we then expect this person to return. With three minutes, summarize. Okay, um, this practice does not either um, make sense financially. It appeals, it, it costs twice as much to house a person in solitary confinement compared to the general prison population. So we're spending twice as much money to torture a person as we have, and we, 
and we have made our communities even less safe. So I submit this in writing and there's a documentation. So I ask you to uh, vote for the PROTECT Act. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin Budge be next. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Kevin Budge. I'm a longtime resident of Middletown and I'm a partner at Wigan and Dana in New Haven, where I defend hospitals and physicians and other healthcare providers from claims of medical negligence. I'm testifying today on behalf of Wigan and Dana's longstanding client, Leading Age Connecticut, in opposition to Senate Bill uh, 1029, an act concerning causes of action against licensed nursing homes and facilities for failure to meet the standards of care related to COVID-19. I'd also like to incorporate by reference the written testimony that's already been submitted by my partner, Erica Amaranti, and by Leading Age's President Mag Morelli in opposition to this bill. Uh, first, this bill is unnecessary. There already exists longstanding, well-established causes of action of negligence that may be asserted against healthcare facilities, including nursing homes, that have been through years uh, of well-developed uh, common law. Uh, these were uh, recognized by the governor's executive orders 7U and 7V. Second, on its face, the proposed bill is problematic. It's overly broad. It's inconsistent with existing well-established statutory laws, as well as in conflict with years of well-established common law. It inappropriately seeks to establish standard of care by compliance with unprecedented, fluid, constantly changing guideline, guidance from the state DPH and from, C and from the CDC that over the past year was changed and evolving rapidly, week to week, day to day. In fact, over the past year, there have been, there have been at least 52 pieces of guidance or revised guidance from the DPH and CDC, which does not even include the 12 pieces of guidance from CMS. Which guidance is it that the bill purports to establish as the standard of care and from which time? In addition, what if, it, if a particular guidance conflicts with other federal guidance like CMS? Was one to follow one and not the other? I'm sure you can see the inherent danger of the confusion and conflict that this guidance might create both in the state and federal level. Standard of care in Connecticut is not dictated by defined guidance or policy. It is guided by longstanding principles of case law and existing statutes. It has been vetted, it has been tested. The standard needs to be determined by expert testimony from a similarly situated healthcare provider, not by conflicting and changing guidance. <clears throat> that is, uh, this is even more important in these uh, unprecedented times in this past year. And lastly, on its face, the bill does not state that it is intended to be applied retroactively. If there is this intent for it to be uh, applied retroactively, we have additional arguments that we'd ha be happy to bring forth. However, at a minimum, if the bill is in, uh, intended to be applied retroactively, it, it would certainly be, sub be subjected to constitutional challenges. Moreover, if applied retroactively, it would purport to overrule the executive order entered by the governor that the legislature under statute had had the opportunity to intervene and had not. Um, uh, members of this committee, what this bill purports to do is the equivalent of putting a traffic light at a stop sign. It is unnecessary, will create great confusion, will create inconsistencies with existing statutory and common law, and it will undoubtedly lead to years of litigation attempting to interpret its meaning rather than accomplish its purpose. Thank you. Thank for these you. reasons, and for those expressed in the aforementioned written submissions, Leading Age strongly opposes Ray's Bill 1029. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. Thank you, sir. Um, just, just for the record, sir, you, you do not work for Leading Edge. You said you work for a law firm. I, I, that's correct, Representative, I, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it was just a, a mistake in the way that was entered into the list today. Okay. Are you um, are you a registered lobbyist for them? Testify. I am not. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Uh, questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Um, Brian Sullivan. Yes, sir. Senator Winfield, Representative Stastrom, Ranking Members Kissel and Fishbein, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Brian Sullivan, and I am a leader with the ACLU Smart Justice Campaign of Connecticut. I'm testifying today in support of Senate Bill 972, and that concerning the cost of telecommunication services and correctional facilities. I'm a father of four and someone who has spent more than 30 years in prison. When I was originally sentenced, I didn't have a lot of hope that I would ever come home. I developed a program inside called CHAMPS, which stands for Creating Healthy Attitudes in Men from Prison to Society. It is designed to help people understand the why behind our choices 
and bad decisions and to connect individuals directly with the resources available to help reduce the recidivism rate in our state. A critical step in this program is developing a plan for an area and network. Where do I plan to live and who's in my corner for support? I tried the best I could to surround myself with positive people because positive energy is contagious. But the reality is that prison can be a challenging environment, not just to survive, but to maintain hope and believe that the decision to change the direction of my life was going to result in an opportunity to gain my freedom and be in society once again. For people who are incarcerated, being able to maintain family and community bonds is crucial to mental health, physical health, community health, and overall community safety. This may seem obvious, but these societal benefits should not be borne by the most vulnerable people in our communities. Yet Connecticut has not just expected the loved ones of incarcerated people to bear the exorbitant cost of maintaining relationships, but has also profited off that separation. Senate Bill 972 seeks to correct this injustice. The hidden cost of incarceration to the families of a person who was locked up includes commissary, costs associated with visitation, legal, and the cost of housing a person. A short prison phone call in Connecticut costs an outrageous amount of money close to $4 for 15 minutes. This rate makes Connecticut dead last in the entire country for the affordability of a prison phone call. Even though these families and communities are footing the bill, our entire state reaps the benefits of these societal connections. Good communication throughout incarceration makes people less likely to recidivate, but that should not be from the transfer of money from the families of incarcerated people to the state of Connecticut and a private telecom company. It really should be Connecticut paying itself as an investment in the health of its communities. I am sure this com committee is well aware of the numbers when it comes to what the cost is to families of incarcerated individuals. But I want to compare the revenue the state makes to what it spends individually each year on incarceration. According to Worth Rises, families spend 13.2. That on my end or his end? That's on his end. Okay. I was talking uh, to my family and friends. I went many years without being able to speak to them because the cost was too high. Having been a facilitator for every program in the Department of Corrections, I can tell you firsthand that communication with outside family and friends is the number one thing that promotes good behavior inside and prevents recidivism upon release. Helping keep the bond together through communication of loved ones while they transition from home to prison and back home is key and it's successful for a successful reentry back into society. I urge the members of this committee to support this bill I thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. sir. Um, Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Brian, for coming in today. Yes, sir. As you see, Bill 972 is proposing uh, uh, phone calls free of charge. Yes, and sir. I do agree. Connecticut, I believe, now is, is number two most expensive or for a 15-minute phone call in the United States. I think Maine is the only one that takes that dubious honor over us. Yes. Would you be... Uh, would you agree that the phone call should be free or would a reduced rate satisfy uh, most prisoners? I, and, I, and I said, I do agree that they are too expensive. All right. So let's look at it. Um, something you said earlier, you were talking about the three million that goes towards programs, right? Uh, yes, to the versionary programs. All right. So let's look at it. We know 95 percent of people incarcerated will be released. So if we just look at this year alone and say 100 people are coming home, and the rate is $50,000 a year to house them. If those people have communication and are able to build on a successful reentry, the state would have saved just $5 million on 100 people. And we know a lot more are going to be released. So I support free phone. Again, I, I think the misconception here also is that individuals incarcerated just can make 50,000 phone calls a day. No, that's not how that works. I was locked up for 31 years. I was limited. You get three phone calls a day. That's it. We're not out of the cell enough time to make a whole bunch of phone calls. So I support free phone calls. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Further questions or comments? If not, um, next up will be Gus Marks Hamilton, followed by Mark Nemec. 
Thank you. And uh, good day, Representative Stastrom, uh, Senator Winfield, Ranking Members Kissel and Fishbein, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, my name is Gus Marks Hamilton, and I'm the interim campaign manager for the ACLU of Connecticut Smart Justice Campaign. I support several of the bills before this committee today, including Senate Bills 972 and 1059, although I will be directing my remarks in support of Senate Bill 1058, an act concerning compassionate parole release by the Board of Pardons and Paroles and concerning staff of the Department of Correction. Um, even before COVID-19 uh, pandemic began to spread inside the Connecticut Department of Corrections, Connecticut's prisons and jails were not healthy places. The DOC had already been dealing with epidemic levels of hepatitis C and HIV AIDS for years, as well as other infectious diseases like MRSA. The inability of incarcerated people to access quality medical care, uh, whether due to budget cuts or unfilled staff vacancies or the end of the relationship with Yukon Health has also been widely publicized. But when COVID-19 hit, Connecticut's jails and prisons went to an entirely new level of unhealthiness. Over the course of this pandemic, 19 people have died after becoming infected with COVID-19 while in DOC custody. 4,249 incarcerated people have been infected. At one point, the DOC had a higher in infection rate than any municipality in Connecticut. During this time, Connecticut has had options to move people from incarceration into supervised release in the community. Uh, one, such one such method of discretionary release was compassionate release, which is a mechanism to release people with grave illnesses, diseases, or disabilities who do not pose a safety risk back into their communities. But health crises do not affect whether the Board of Pardons and Parole can grant compassionate release. No matter the public health context, the BOPP must apply the same standards. This is likely why, in the face of the greatest pandemic seen in a century, the BOPP granted 25 compassionate releases in 2020 and denied 20% of the people who applied. Several of the people who died from contracting COVID-19 in DOC custody had medical conditions that should have warranted community release. If compassionate release is about respecting the lives of people incarcerated by placing them into healthier surroundings, a pandemic is exactly when compassionate release should be easier to obtain. As the executive director of the BOP noted, the compassionate release statutory criteria was not drafted to handle a virus such as this. SB 1058 seeks to remedy that. SB 1058 provides the BOPP uh, shall consider different criteria for considering compassionate releases during disasters, emergency declarations, and other public health emergencies. These criteria still require a finding that community risk will be low if the person is released, but they take important context into account. By limiting the risk of serious illness or death for people who are particularly susceptible to the then existing emergency, this bill respects the lives of people who are incarcerated. It also recognizes that incarcerated people are dependent upon the state for their health. The ACLU of Connecticut supports SB 1058 as a necessary step to ensuring that no one dies in DOC custody during a public health crisis again. We urge the members of this committee to support this bill. Thank you for listening to my testimony. I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, um, Mr. Marks Hamilton. Um, you know, I wanna kind of go a little off script here and ask you whether you whether the ACLU has taken a look at 5125 or not. Because as I read this bill, it would prohibit anyone who died in custody well at Department of Corrections while um, during the course of the COVID pandemic to seek any sort of um, compensation from the Office of the Claims Commissioner or others. And I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, your organization shares that concern. I'm sorry, Representative Sash, I'm not prepared to, to answer that right now, but I, I be, would be happy to get back to you about that. Okay, thanks. Um, further questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Um, next up will be uh, Mark Nemec. Thank you. Co-Chair Staffstrom and Winfield, Ranking Members Fishbein and Kissel, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. As president of Fairfield University and secretary of the Connecticut Conference of Independent Colleges, I am honored to join you in strong support of HB 5125, an act concerning the provision of immunity from civil liability for entities that have operated pursuant to health and safety guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Fairfield University has worked diligently to implement the robust public health guidance that the state of Connecticut has issued to safely support the reopening of higher education institutions over the past year. Beyond the reopening higher education report issued on May 6th by Governor Lamont, 14 additional memorandums have been issued by the Department of Public Health for higher education, along with the ECD's various sector rules for operations. To comply with initial guidance, as well as subsequent requests from state and local public health officials, Fairfield will have spent over $10 million in response to the pandemic, including, but not limited, to providing robust testing of students, purchasing necessary cleaning supplies and other apparatus, conducting our own contact tracing, increasing oversight of our students, housing and feeding students consistent with guidelines, quarantining students for significant periods and responding quickly to all requests for supplementary public health interventions. Additionally, our students, faculty and staff have volunteered in various ways, ranging from engineering PPE to administering vaccines at clinics throughout the state. I reflect upon all of this, and in addition to being humbled as president of Fairfield University by the dedication of our community to the public good, as a political scientist focused on American public policy and institutions, I would suggest we as a university have become a vital cog in the state's COVID response apparatus. Acknowledging that universities would be taking on this essential role, as well as recognizing the unusual potential for exposure on a college and university campus, the Governor's Reopen CT Higher Education Committee recommended the state offer an appropriate limited safe harbor from liability for those institutions that comply with the state guidance. The bill before you today aligns with this recommendation and is intended to allow for a temporary targeted safe harbor for private entities, such as private nonprofit colleges, without shielding an institution from gross negligence or willful misconduct. Some may argue that any institution that follows public health standards will prevail in litigation, and thus the safe harbor is not needed. However, the direct and indirect cost of successfully defending lawsuits will nonetheless be very high at a particularly fraught moment when time and resources across the sector have never been more strained. Moreover, insurance for pandemic risks is limited or unavailable, creating significant financial exposure. Institutions of higher learning are already coping with a sudden increase in expenses as well as significant loss memories. The lack of safe harbor only heightens the uncertainty and exacerbates the strain, which detracts from our core mission of educating young men and women of purpose. For the reasons outlined above, we ask for the committee's strong support of this bill. Thank you, uh, thank you, President Nemec, uh, from uh, my my alma mater. Full disclosure, so uh, <laughs> always always good to see you, um, uh, President Nemec. We. We've had a chance to discuss this bill on and off, I think, over the last um, uh, you know few weeks or, or a month or so. Um, you know, I, I guess I would consider myself kind of in that camp of um, still questioning the need for this, given the other barriers that that someone needs to establish, um, you know, causation and reasonableness and the like. But one of the things about a college that I think is different than maybe the convenience store we talked about earlier or others um, is both the residential nature of it and um, that we, we as a state asked colleges and universities to take on uh, the responsibility for providing testing in many respects um, that we certainly didn't demand of, of other businesses. So, you know, I guess, I guess I could make an argument for why colleges and universities um, need some sort of limited protection for, for being required to engage in something that is not part of their core business, right? Testing of, of students is not part of your core mission. It's not like a, a hospital or a pharmacy who, who makes money doing those types of things. Um, I'm wondering if you could just, because I know we've talked about this quite a bit, if you could just elaborate for the committee a little bit, um, 
kind of what was required of a university like Fairfield with respect to testing and um, whether and to what extent the university had to kind of gear up to engage in that type of activity. Thank you, Steve. And I would say that I, I don't want to pretend to speak for the whole of the sector, but I will say thanks to our Connecticut Conference for Independent Colleges, um, the private and independent schools, nonprofits and for profits, and especially um, here in Connecticut, have been pretty much in sync about how we've responded, those of us who are in a residential setting. And I think it's a subtle but important point is that, you know, there's a group of citizens, 18 to 22 year olds, who return to our campuses. And by returning to our campuses, they were thus tested, um, tested on a regular basis. For example, we are testing every student every week. Um, if we had not returned those students to our campuses, they probably would not have been tested, right? And I think that's one of those important and subtle points is we essentially have um, become an instrument of the public health response. And we did so um, willingly. We did so in part because it allowed us to return our students to our campuses and to our high flex learning environments. But we've also responded, uh, I would say, quite quickly and quite nimbly. So for example, um, at Thanksgiving time, there was a response, there was a request that was put to us to make sure that every student who was returning home got tested. It was not something in the original plan. It was not something that anyone had really discussed until uh, early November. And yet we all um, responded quite quickly and ensured that every student um, who was returning home was tested before they returned home. So this idea of us, um, you know, testing, yes, we test so we can ensure the safety of our campuses, but we also test to ensure the safety of those broader communities and do so very much in coordination and in sync um, with the public health officials who we've, you know, worked so closely with on this reopening. Thank you. Um, further questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, uh, appreciate you being with us today. Go Stags. Thank you. Go Stags. <laughs> uh, next up will be uh, Joanna Fisco. Hello. Hey, Dermot. Go ahead. Dear Chairs Winfield and Staffstrom, Vice Chairs Kasser and Blumenthal, Ranking Members Kissel and Fishbean, and members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Joanna Fisco. I'm a resident of New Haven, and I would like to express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059. My background and basis for this support comes from my former position in DOC as a registered nurse. My prior work experiences were all hospital-based and emergency care, working in an inner city hospital emergency department, Healthcare is delivered to patients of low socioeconomic status, patients battling addiction, homelessness, as well as severe mental illness. These populations are frequently found in correctional settings as well. What I found was that there was a very clear difference in the way hospital-based patients were treated versus inmates in the facility, with the overall tone being a severe lack of respect and regard for their dignity. It didn't take long for me to note that the staff both nursing and custody were clearly suffering from burnout, which in turn was affecting how they cared for humans. This was the part that was frequently forgotten. Inmates are humans. These were men who were fathers, brothers, and sons with families at home, hoping that their basic needs are being met until they can reunite again. And unfortunately, this wasn't always the case. With hopeful passing of this bill, extension on policies for telephone communication with families will increase to allow for that humane contact that they need. Correctional environment can be severely draining and mentally taxing due to constant pressures. Pressures to provide safety and pressures to have total control. These pressures mount, causing staff to display forms of toxic dominance and power, which can result in use of extreme measures, such as solitary confinement, a severely overused yet grossly unhelpful method. Navigating toxic work culture on one's own can be difficult, which is why attention needs to be paid to the mental health of staff. I personally found the environment to be morally distressing. Ethically, as a nurse, my position in healthcare is to provide unbiased care, help to all, but it felt as though proper healthcare took a backseat to punitive practices that unfortunately took precedence. Focus on caring for the staff's mental health can in turn produce better work performance, which will enhance the lives of these inmates. Emphasis needs to be placed on restructuring and implementing better de-escalation skills for staff. Enacting time and attention on interpersonal communication can literally save lives. 
knowing how to talk and effectively listen to people can prevent instances of excessive force and use of physical and chemical restraints. Efforts of de-escalation fall on custody, nursing, as well as mental health staff. With continued high levels of stress, it seems as though the first line of action, which is simple communication, goes out the window. We need to retrain our staff and enforce the intentions of help and rehabilitation. I strongly support the passing of Senate Bill 1059. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Um, are there questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, um, appreciate being with us. Next up will be Lisa Wingham. Hi, Chairman Sassram, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Lisa Wingham and I'm the Executive Director of the State Office of the National Alliance on Mental Illness here in Connecticut. NAMI is the nation's largest mental health organization dedicated to building better lives for all people affected by mental health conditions. NAMI Connecticut and its nine local affiliates provide support groups and education programs with people with mental health conditions and their loved ones and advocates for policies to improve the lives of people affected by mental health conditions. NAMI opposes the use of solitary confinement and equivalent forms of administrative segregation. Eliminating solitary confinement is a priority for NAMI at both the state and federal level. States that have adopted proactive efforts to eliminate solitary confinement have documented highly positive results that include reduced psychiatric symptoms, less violence, and considerable cost savings. It's been routinely documented that solitary confinement is used extensively in correctional settings for people with severe psychiatric systems. A 2000 symptoms. A 2018 national report documented that about 10% of all people held in segregated settings are diagnosed with serious mental illness and isolating people, especially for long periods of time, causes severe psychological dis distress, even for people without a pre-existing mental illness. Rates of serious mental illness among those held in supermax facilities, the most extreme form of segregation are even higher. In some states, it is reported that up to 30% of those in facilities utilizing the most extreme forms of solitary confinement and isolation are diagnosed with serious mental illnesses. The unfortunate and very difficult truth is that solitary confinement and other forms of administrative segregation are often used to control and manage inmates with serious mental health conditions. For inmates with a pre-existing mental illness, being put into solitary confinement can cause extreme suffering, worsen symptoms, and is similar to torture. Solitary confinement has long-term adverse consequences for cognitive and adaptive functioning, disrupts treatment, causes or worsens symptoms such as depression, anxiety, and hallucinations, and impedes rehabilitation, recovery, and community reintegration. Rather than using isolation strategies that can cause long-term damage, NAMI urges federal, state, and other correctional authorities to provide mental health care alternatives to solitary confinement and significantly reduce the use of extreme isolation, limiting the use of solitary confinement and eliminating its use for high-risk populations, including people with mental illness and people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities would result in fewer psychiatric symptoms, lower rates of violence, re improved re-entry and transitions back into the community and re significant cost savings to correctional systems, I urge you to vote favorably on Senate Bill 1059. Thank you, ma'am. Um, are there questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Um, next up will be Diane Lewis. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good, Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Winfield, um, Vice Chairman and Judiciary Committee members. My name is Diane Lewis and I am the Communications Director at the Voices of Women of Color. I'd like to thank you today for allowing me to speak to you. I am also a mother of a formerly incarcerated son. I'm a grandmother raising her grandson and I'm also a case manager with a reentry program in Hartford um, and I'm a lifelong Hartford resident. I am here today in support of 
SB 972. The Act Concerning Cost of Telecommunication Services and Correctional Facilities. When my son was 17 years old, he caught a case that landed him in adult prison for the first time. The sentence was 13 years suspended after eight. With parole violations, he ended up doing the entire sentence. The only thing I knew about prison at the time was that what I saw on TV. So I was terrified about what was gonna happen to my young son in there. I found out years later after he was released that he needed to speak to me because he was also scared. At the time, I wasn't thinking about the financial impact that him being in prison was gonna have on me and my family. I was a young mother who was concerned about my 17 year old's well being and nothing else. He and I agreed that he would call every day and I would visit him twice a week. It wasn't long before the utilities were being cut off, the gas was being cut off, I was late on the rent. The lights one month, the gas the next month, but I made sacrifices like a mother does. I didn't really have to eat lunch every day and I could borrow a few dollars um, until payday to cover a few phone calls until I got paid again. But no matter what hardships I was experiencing, I knew he had it rougher and I had to pay the phone bill. There was no alternative. I know parents that send their children off to college for the first time. Some people send their children off to the military and oh, how proud they must be. But they're also worried. Did their child eat? Are they sleeping well? All the questions any parent will have when separated from their child, the greatest love they will ever know. If you can relate to that feeling, then you can relate to me. A mother's love and concern does not change or disappear based on where your child is or based on what the prosecutor alleges he did. But when I had to starve or lose my utilities just to be able to speak to my son, it was just to tell him I love him. That's what the phone calls were about for me. It was to assure my son that I love him no matter what. It was to assure my son that I would be standing with him this entire bid. It was to congratulate him when he got his high school diploma. It was to assure him and motivate him that he could do better until he came home to his family. How do you ever put a price on that? My son has been home a year and still adjusting to the world, but I'm 100, 1,000% sure that the support he received from his family while he was incarcerated is a huge part of why he is doing so well right now. The bill would not only keep money in the households of our most vulnerable population, it will keep families together and that benefits the entire community. I urge you, I urge you as a mother, as a grandmother to please support this bill and keep families together. Thank you for your time and I will be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, ma'am. Um, appreciate it. Uh, Representative Porter. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, Madam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Madam Diane. I got ahead of myself. Um, no questions for you. I just wanted to thank you for uh, coming before this committee and sharing your lived experience and what um, this bill would mean to you through the eyes of what you've been through with your son. And I did want to congratulate your son on, on the great job that he's doing since he's been home. So thank you for being thank with us today you. and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I want to say, I, I, I really, I've been hearing questions about, you know, what if they, if the payments got reduced? No, it's no, we can, that's not acceptable. And the reason why it's not acceptable is because you're asking low income families to keep making sacrifices that they can't afford. I work every day. And if my son was in prison right now, do you know what I would have to do to pay for a phone call? My first rent goes, my first check goes to the rent. There's nothing, we can't, there's nothing to negotiate. I have no, uh, that's it. My work, the, the check I get from work and that's it. So there's no wiggle room. We, low income people cannot, we don't have anything to save. That's, this is just what it is. So please, I urge you, um, Representative Porter and other members of the committee to please support this bill so that families can mm -hmm. together. Thank you so much. 
You're welcome. Um, and thank you again. And as a mom who has been through what you've been through, I've had my son has been incarcerated as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm faced with having to pay those phone bills, um, accepting the call. So I am in absolute staunch support of this bill. And again, I thank you for your time today. Thank I appreciate you. your support, Rep. Yeah. You're as welcome. Always. Thank yeah. you. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you both. Um, all right, next up, um, we will have Dale McGrath followed by Vanessa, Vanessa Mickelson, and I'm going to turn the gavel over to the vice chairman for a few minutes, Representative Blumenthal. Go ahead, Mr. McGrath, you have your uh, three minutes. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, it's Daryl McGraw, just so we get it correct, so people know who I am, Daryl McGraw. How are you, Rep of Chair Staff from um, Chair Winfield, um, Ranking Members, um, Representative, uh, Representative Fishbine, and um, Representative Kissel? It's hard to come after Diane Lewis, you know, um, having been raised by a single mom. There's several bills that I, I am in favor of 1058, um, 972, and um, but today I'm going to be talking about 1059, you know. Um, once again, my name is Daryl McGraw. I'm a formerly incarcerated person. I spent 10 years of my life in and out of the Department of Corrections. So when I hear like people like um, the lady just spoke before, Diane Lewis, I think about my mom and, and then what she had to do to make sure that the phone stayed on. And I know for many years, you know, we talk about trauma and how she had to keep that phone number the same just in case I got in trouble again, you know. But today we're going to talk about, I'm here to talk about, um, to discuss Connecticut's use of solitary confinement and that um, that the Judiciary Committee be in support of 1059 uh, and the use of this so, so we can get rid of the use of solitary confinement. Recently, I'm not sure if you um, if you haven't, I'm, I will be submitting written testimony and in a white paper titled "The Connecticut Connecticut at the Crossroads," and I encourage you all to take an opportunity to read it. You know, COVID-19 has had it, has shown us how to do business, all of us in Connecticut, a different way, as we are here testifying today over Zoom when it usually, we're usually in the LOB and we're across the country, we've learned how to do business a different way. Why not do business? Why the Connecticut Department of Corrections should not be exempt from doing business a different way. We cannot continue the use of solitary confinement. You know, I'm also, I said I'm a survivor of, I'm a formerly incarcerated person, which means I'm a survivor of solitary confinement. I am out, I am in my office, I'm on Zoom. I'm very fortunate to be here, but I'm not fortunate to forget the memories of being strip searched and put in a cold cell in my underwear. I'm not, I'm not fortunate to being able to be able to forget what it was like to be in those cells and to be, to sometimes to be chained up while I ate my um, chow. You know, um, the, what I'm very happy to talk about is the fact that you guys are giving us an opportunity to speak from a lived experience perspective. And I ask once again, that you always bring people with lived experience to the table. Um, I've had a very, uh, the fortunate opportunity to work with some experts from the University Network of Human Rights um, I currently work with Andrew Clark at the Institute of Municipal Policy Re and Regional Policy. We also had some undergraduates from Brown University and the University of Connecticut and the University of Pennsylvania and a couple other universities, Stanford and, and Wesley and along. All of us looking at our, our, our current criminal justice system in Connecticut. And one of the things, several things that have been mentioned today, I don't have to go over like from um, what many people have said, I just want to mention that once again, that uh, we need to be reconsidering how we do business in Connecticut, and especially in reference to solitary confinement, but overall. And if we can't do that, one of the things that I would challenge us as sir. a state to look at. Excuse me, sir, is, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your three minutes elapsed. So if you could please uh, summarize and conclude your. In summary, statement. in summary, one of the things I would say, sorry, uh, those of you that know, I can talk for. Ever, so I apologize for going over, but in summary, I I'm in support of 1059. And if we continue to, if we plan on continuing to do business like this, then we need to change the name of the Department of Corrections because corrections is not happening there with the current methods that we're using right now. Sorry. Okay, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, do we have questions or comments from the committee? 
I see Representative Callahan has raised his hand. Uh, Representative Callahan, you have the floor. Thank you, Representative Blumenthal. Mr. McGraw, good to see you. Thank you for good coming to in you. today. How are you? Good. I've seen you speak many times, and uh, you can, you do uh, bring a lot of credibility to what you say. I've seen the work you do with formerly incarcerated uh, individuals, and I've seen the success you've you've accomplished in your life, which is more than impressive. So thank it's good you, to Rep. see you in a, in a different venue today, and I thank you for coming in. Thank you, Rep. Callahan. I appreciate it. I look forward to doing business with you soon, all of you. Thank you, Representative Callahan. Uh, Representative O'Day's hand is raised. Uh, Representative Day, O'Day, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. McGraw, thank you so much for your testimony. I I've been quiet today. I, I have to admit, I, I have a lot less knowledge of the, uh, the system, the incarceration system than, than a lot of my colleagues. And so my only question I have for you is, um, what was the what, what what do you believe? So solitary confinement doesn't work, at least in its present form. Uh, that at least as, so far I've heard here today. What what was the most effective way, or is the most effective way you think to handle those inmates that are uh, at risk of harming others and themselves, um, uh, as opposed to solitary confinement? How how can they how can they be how can other inmates be protected against uh, those? Okay. There's several ways, there's several ways, and I, I do encourage you to read the, um, and I appreciate the question. I do encourage you to read the white paper that we said that's gonna be submitted with my testimony and reference it because other countries do things a lot differently. So Connecticut at the crossroads, I encourage you to read that. But one of the things is that we should be evaluating people's mental health. These, these situations don't just happen right away. We should be evaluating people's mental health ACEs should be implemented in our Department of Corrections from day one. So when people come in, we should be already identifying trauma issues that they're experiencing. So mental health doesn't just happen. So these things could be prevented if we start to do correct assessments upon entry, instead of waiting until something arises and then we're being reactive instead of proactive. So there's many different ways that we should be addressing these issues and putting people like challenging, actually putting people in certain situations that may create other situations and then the need for solitary confinement isn't the answer because that only exacerbates the issue even further. So I think that we need to be addressing trauma from the beginning and, and, and looking at how other states address these issues as well. And I'd be open to talk further with, with you and um, other representatives and, and senators in reference to this matter. There's, there are other ways to solve this. This is a way, and, and just to say, just to add, the data doesn't show that, <laughs> this is, actually it shows that it's not effective. It only creates more problems. Thank you, sir, very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative O'Day. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, I uh, just wanted to thank you, Mr. McGraw, for being with us today and sharing your story, your perspective, and uh, your expertise. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Next, we have, sorry. Venezia Michelson. Professor Hello. Michelson, you're up. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much for having me today. I am a professor of justice studies at Montclair State University and also a resident of Hamden, Connecticut. And I'm speaking in support of Senate Bill 972. Now, as you imagine, um, I probably have a lot to say about what the research says about limiting communication uh, between incarcerated people and their families and making phone calls impossible to afford. However, today I'm gonna use my time to tell the story of a man named Dope. There was an interview that was done and recorded by the Connecticut Bail Fund, but the audio is uh, not so great, which is, you know, a little QED. Um, he's incarcerated in the Carl Robinson uh, Correctional Facility in Enfield. He's been there for four years already. He has four children on the outside. Two of them are autistic children. His family pays $300 a month so that he can communicate with his children every day. One of those autistic children does not speak, is nonverbal, and they make it work, but he said that it's really, really hard. Now, one of his autistic children sticks to the mom until the dad calls, until Dope calls. Some of the things that were sort of really impactful about the phone call for me 
um, was that autistic children need routine. And so if he doesn't call, that his child really struggles. And honestly, he said that his brother sometimes has to call to act like him if he doesn't have money on his account, or else the child will have a meltdown and will really struggle. And then when he does call, the limited communication that his child has is so-called echolalic. So he'll say, I love you. And the child will say, I love you. He'll say, are you okay? And the child will say, are you okay? He repeats. He said the really important thing to, to that Dope said was it's not a choice for him to call his family. He has to call his family. Now, let me tell you, I've been waiting on Zoom for a really long time with my own autistic child. I have a nine-year-old son who is autistic. And you know what? We went over to some train tracks to watch trains. And I've been watching, you know, the phone was in my pocket and I was, you know, pulling it out occasionally to see people in their beautiful outfits with their gorgeous just backgrounds and their, you know, beautifully set up statements. And I, I was worried that I was going to have to go on with my hair crazy. You know, we got home just in time, but you know, my kid needed his routine and my kid had limitations in his communication, his frustration. You know, they didn't have white bread at the, at the deli and he, you know, freaked out a little bit about that. And I'm on the outside and I don't have to worry about whether or not I can afford to talk to my child and whether or not I can afford to give my child the routine that he so desperately needs. So the idea that a parent is on the inside worried every day about the, his own special needs children, his own autistic children, sickens me already. To add to that, that the state and a corporation profit off of this family and thousands of other families means that our state has to do better, let alone that facilitating contact between incarcerated people and their families mean that everybody does better, right? Recidivism rates are lower, children do better, they have better outcomes, and that all of us do better with when we treat people with humanity, we must, we must make phone calls free this year. It's time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michelson. And you were pretty much right on time. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so uh, any questions or comments from the committee for Professor Michelson? Seeing none, uh, thank you for being with us today, for sharing for your testimony and sharing your story with us. Next, uh, we have uh, Tiheba Bain, followed by Belinda Hel excuse me, followed by Belinda Heller. Uh, Tiheba Bain, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, honorable chairs and member of the judiciary committee. My name is Tahiba Bain, and I'm the founder and executive director of Women Against Mass Incarceration. Today, I offer testimony in support of Senate Bill 972, an act concerning the cost of telecom services and correctional facilities. In serving time in both state and federal prison, I'm compelled to support this bill from the position of a direct experience. The cost of telephone calls not only impacted my budget, but also the ability to connect with my family. Now, you heard a lot of testimony about people telling their stories, but I just wanna bring out one point that I don't think was heard too, much, too often here today. The, we have 15 minutes and within those 15 minutes allowed, it is constantly interrupted by automated prompts stating this call is from a correctional facility, which removes and extracts from the already less time, that little time that we already have, which is degrading, intrusive, intrusive and embarrassing to all involved. I knew this one girl in prison that used to actually have to time her telephone calls to keep her child from hearing that one statement saying this is a call from a federal or state facility. And because she told her daughter she was in, she was in college. And um, sometimes it's, you know, the negative effect and the psychological impact of not being able to speak to your family, especially during a crisis can be mentally cha challenging and sometimes irreversible. When, my, when I was in prison, my grandmother passed away. I didn't have access to her and I did only, I only had 15 minutes to talk. And, some, and if it wasn't for her sending me money, I wouldn't have had that money. So when she passed away, I didn't have the money in my commissary to actually make call home and speak to my children. The daunting cost of communication from prison and connecting with family should not be a monetary strain on already financially strained families. Prison pay for labor, is not designed to support incarcerated person with all their needs and phone calls. And we talk about the, the talk about money. The DOC get a proportion of what of the money that's being spent. 
So I don't believe the DOC budget should, uh, the, the, DO, the people should not pay for the DOC budget. The DOC should account for all and pay for all salaries within the DOC. Nothing should come out of payment from what we pay to call our families or for our families to put on our books to have us call them. That's just wrong. In, 19, in 2019, when we first started this campaign, Secure spent over $40,000 lobbying against connecting families with legislation. Later, Secure withdrew its opposition and um, committed to supporting Connecticut and safely, efficiently implementing legislation to alleviate the cost of connect connecting families. Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, to be, but uh, you've reached the end of your three minutes. Uh, if you could just uh, summarize and conclude. Summarize. Uh, Senate Bill 972 is a cr crucial element for our vulnerable population living behind the bars and to help them connect with their families without any further harm. Senate Bill 972 should be the impetus to eliminate the cost of all prison calls. And on behalf of WAMI, we urge you to vote in support of Senate Bill 927. Thank you. Thank you, Tahiba. And I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name earlier. Uh, <laughs> Any questions or comments from the committee? Uh, seeing none, thank you Tahiba for sharing your story and your experience with us. Next up is Belinda Heller, followed by Belinda Jacobs and uh, Joe Richardson. So Belinda Heller, you have the floor whenever you're ready. If you could un unmute yourself. Can you unmute uh, yourself, Ms. Heller? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear her. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, can you we hear can me hear you. now? Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, my name is Belinda Heller Colwell. I am um, I am with the Connecticut Better Fund. I'm a support group sister. Um, I support this bill, SB 972. I am here in the I'm our daughter wife, and I'm a mother to um, our special needs son um, who needs to stay in contact with my husband um, who's in, um, currently incarcerated. Um, it's very impact with us very, very much so. It's so important to us to still keep in connect with my husband and the father to his son for the communication, you know, with our son, who is also special needs with um, behavior um, issues. It's very expensive for me, especially when I'm the only person in the household that has to keep up with the household bills, have to keep up my son's medication, his therapist, and all that. Um, with, you know, with the income bills are very tight. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm just hoping and pray that you guys will um, support this bill and to pass it so to give people like us um, a peace of, peace of mind and so we can just, you know, move forward. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Heller. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for being with us and sharing your testimony. Next up is Belinda Jacobs, followed by Jewu Richardson and Inez Rivera. So Belinda Jacobs, whenever you're ready, you can unmute. Okay, um, I think that may have been a double. All right, so uh, Jewu Richardson, you're up, followed by Inez Rivera and Fabian Moore. Good afternoon, everybody. I just wanna thank the Judicial Committee and all the other elected officials that are on this call I want to start by saying my name is J.O. Richardson and I support 
Bill SB 972. I want to talk about some of my personal experience being incarcerated and having to rely on a prison phone calls to stay in contact with my loved ones. There was a time when I was incarcerated, it was close to my daughter's seventh birthday. There was no money on the phone and none of the accounts, so I couldn't reach out to her. So in my mind, I said, I need to talk to my daughter because for seven years straight, we've been talking, we've, we celebrated her birthday together. So I didn't want a birthday to go by without her hearing my voice at the very minimum and me being able to show, let her know that I love her and I care for her and that I'm supportive of her even though I was in a position that I was in. I searched, I searched, tried to get phone calls through people. I was unsuccessful in getting a phone call. And that brought fear to me, that brought a fear to me. And the fear that came to me was my daughter was gonna get used to not hearing from me during her birthday. Not just the fact that I wasn't able to call, but for her to get used to that. And I tell this story because this is a representative of what's happening in DOC. It's, 10,000, approximately 10,000 people incarcerated across the state. These are 10,000 mothers, 10,000 fathers, 10,000 grandmothers, 10,000 uncles and grandfathers that are incarcerated across the state that are dealing with the same dynamic that I'm dealing with. Telephone is the most accessible way for people to connect with their loved ones. You know, this not only are they just connecting with their loved ones, but this is their connection to their support system. It's connection to everything that they have that's going to promote them to be successful when they get out. With limiting that, it's almost like the DLC is saying, hey, we don't, we're not invested in the success of people when they get out. You know, this is an easy medium to have to promote people being successful by making all the phone calls free. Um, Years, people have been exploited by DLC. They've been exploited, but these, these high securities costs have been exploited by the commissary, high costs in commissary, and the low pay that people are getting paid to do labor behind the walls. It's a known fact across the state this has been happening. Um, I just want to say, reiterate again, that I support Bill SB 972. And I stand in solidarity with everybody behind the walls and everybody else that support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Uh, I am seeing uh, Representative Gilchrist has her hand raised. Uh, Representative Gilchrist, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Richardson, for your testimony. Um, as a parent, I could feel the pain of struggling to try and get that phone call on your daughter's seventh birthday. So. I just wanted to thank you for your testimony. It was really impactful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Richardson, for being with us and sharing your story. Next up, we have uh, Representative Josh Elliott. Thank you. Um, thank you to co-chairs uh, Senator Winfield and uh, Steve Stastrom and uh, you, of course, Vice Chair Blumenthal and Ranking Members Fishbein and Kissel. <clears throat> I'm here testifying on uh, Senate Bill 972. So I don't want to use a lot of your time. Ultimately, <clears throat> we all agree, I think, or most of us agree, that the state should not be taking kickbacks from companies that are uh, hyper-targeting fees toward folk who are incarcerated to provide for services really that the state should be providing. <clears throat> the vast majority of the cost of this bill is that very specific issue. <clears throat> A very small sliver of the cost to provide these telephone calls is what Securus actually takes in. If we had parity with Illinois, who is less than one cent a minute, uh, the, the cost would be less than a, a million dollars a year. So while down the line, the cost is going to be, let's say, in the realm of eight to $12 million a year, the fact is that we should never have borne these costs in the first place. And if you agree that the state should not be taking kickbacks, then you agree that the state should be essentially 
uh, chipping in that amount to pay for those correctional officers, to pay for those judicial officers, those probation officers, and uh, and, and you're with us. So I, what I want to use my time for very specifically is to thank the chairs of this committee for working on this the last couple of years, um, for being patient with us the last couple of years. I know that uh, we are very passionate about this issue and we make your lives a total nightmare. Uh, I understand that and recognize that. Uh, and, and it is, is not just for the sake of, of, uh, of aggravating you. It is very honestly uh, for the sake of, of being a leader in the country where we have um, been historically the most expensive and we can now be uh, leaders and, and be providing these telephone calls for free. So uh, I thank you so much for your time. I thank you so much for your patience. And I hope that if and when this bill comes out of your committee, uh, you continue to advocate um, through the process and through the appropriations process so that we can uh, reach finality this year. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Josh. Good to see you. And thanks for your leadership on this bill. Uh, I see the co-chair of the committee, Steve Stastrom has his uh, hand raised. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. I just want to state for the record that I have never personally called you a nightmare, Representative Elliott. <laughs> Uh, but no, I do. I do want to uh, do want to thank you for your advocacy on this. Um, certainly, I know this has been uh, a labor of love for you, and and I don't think I don't think a week goes by that I don't get a text message from you saying what's the status, when's our public hearing, where's the bill language, something. So, um, uh, certainly appreciate all of your um, for originally flagging this issue for this committee and. Um, uh, for the level follow through. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none. Uh, thank you, Representative Elliott. Uh, good to see you. You as well. Thank you so much. Next, we have Belinda Jacobs, followed by Sarah Pimenta and Austin Bernarski. So uh, Belinda Jacobs, you have the floor whenever you're ready to unmute. Hello, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Blumenthal. Um, again, my name is Belinda Jacobs and I'm calling on behalf of my loved one um, who was incarcerated for mm, almost four years. Um, I actually support the bill because I am one of the many family members who have paid thousands and thousands of dollars um, for calls um, and some days warranted more calls than others. I know they had a limited amount of calls that they could make per day, but sometimes he was burning all six calls to me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, for, you know, whatever reason or another, whether it was, you know, to make complaints or whether it was, you know, something that had to do with this case or whatever the case was, um, I have spent quite a bit of money and it, it, becomes very tough at times. You know, I have to say I was truly blessed that I was able to keep the phone lines open for him, um, as well as other family members that I have who are currently incarcerated and I've been paying for calls, but it becomes very costly. Um, and when I look back at the amount of money that I've paid, you know, for phone calls, and, the, and these phone calls are very important for them only because, you know, that's their only means of communication to the world. That's their only line of communication to keep in touch, to know what's going on with their loved one. Um, you know, because it was so tough for his family to keep money on the phone, he had to find out about his grandmother who was um, gravely ill and eventually passed away through me because I was the only one who was able to keep money on the phone so that he can stay in touch with the world. Um, so, you know, so everyone's not as fortunate as I was or am to be able to do that for their loved ones. So I think this bill is very important um, that you know these lines of communication are open for them so that they can keep in touch and know what's going on you know, with their, their mothers, their immediate loved ones or whomever it is they need, their children, whomever, whomever it is they need to keep in touch with. I think it's very important that um, they're able to do that because that's what helps to keep their sanity. Um, the one thing I can honestly say is he always said to me that if it wasn't for him being able to talk to me, he probably would have gone insane the whole time he was there. Um, so had I been one of those members who couldn't keep money on my line, 
so that he could call, who knows where he would be mentally now, who knows where he would have been in his sentence. Thank God he was able to come home, you know, um, with a sound, pretty much sound mind. But had he not had that available to him, um, he wouldn't have been able to come home in the state that he was in. So to know that there are others out there who don't have or who are not as blessed as he was, who will be, you know, like I have a cousin now who's inside, who's not that blessed and he doesn't call me as often, but he calls me when he's at the point of break at his breaking point because I'm his only line of communication because his other family members can't do it. Um, and, you know, again, thank God he has me. So if, if they don't have that, what do they have? Hey, uh, Ms. Jacobs, uh, your three minutes are up. So please just uh, summarize the remainder of your testimony. Yes. Yeah, so um, case in point is, I said all of that to say is it's very important that they're able to keep in touch with their loved ones. You know, um, and I, I think it's important for the family to be able to have those means to be able to to keep the lines open for communication with their loved ones inside. Thank you very much, Ms. Jacobs. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, thank you, uh, Ms. Jacobs, for being here and for sharing your experiences with us. We appreciate it. Next up okay. is Sarah Pimenta, followed by Austin Bernarski and James Jeter. Uh, Sarah Pimenta, you have the floor whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm Sarah Pimenta and I'm a volunteer with the Connecticut Bail Fund. And today I will be playing a recorded statement from Louis Mate Jr., who is incarcerated in McDougal Correctional currently. Sarah, I don't think it's coming through. If you could put it closer to your microphone, maybe. Okay, one second. My name is Louis McKay Jr. I've been incarcerated since December 26, 2002. I was 19. Through tireless determination, I have worked to make the most of these years. Our time is also burdensome. I'm fortunate to have a supportive family but it's difficult being a 37-year-old man who slowly drains their pockets whenever I check in. My experience makes me a staunch supporter of Senate Bill 972. For far too long, the state and securities have profited off of Connecticut's most destitute and desperate citizens. This collusion must end. You're concerned about losing an $8 million annual kickback that's earned by taking advantage of your most vulnerable citizens. Where is the justice in that? Or have you forgotten that you represent us as well? We know that fostering strong family connections creates a stable foundation for more motivated, equipped, and successful returning citizens. Is $8 million too steep a sacrifice for closing the revolving door and creating peace of mind? The majority of incarcerated citizens will return to your community. My relationship with my family motivates me daily to prove I am now someone they can count on. Due to the burdensome cost, many men are relegated to memories and hope. Hope is a funny thing when you're incarcerated. It tends to dangle out in front of us until we learn to ignore it. SB 978 has been the proverbial terrorist for many of us. I come from a community that is heavily over-policed and an environment rife with abuse and inequity, but I make no excuses for my lot in life. As I said before, I've been incarcerated since I was 19. Over the past few years, restorative justice has slowly become more politically palatable in this state. While minor changes have been sparsely made, the necessary overhaul has merely been rhetoric whispered into the wind. To, to truly undo the political culture created by Connecticut's truth and sentencing laws, actions must be taken. Every year, SB 978 is discussed and impeded. There are not enough apologies to make up for the pain many of us have caused. But is systemic retribution the answer? I've learned that I have a duty to live for those I've hurt. Therefore, my life must be extraordinary. How long will I be defined by the worst mistake I made and judged as irredeemable? Many of us work tirelessly to be the men our communities need. All we need is the opportunity to prove our work. So as you vote on whether or not to change these policies that exacerbate the racial and socioeconomic divide in this state, I ask that you remember that you will represent all of Connecticut's citizens and residents. Are you bold enough to do what's right? History is watching. Thank you. 
Thank you for sharing that testimony. Uh, I see Representative Palm's hand is raised. Representative Palm, uh, go ahead whenever you're ready. Mr. Chair, um, Ms. Pimenta, I, I'm sorry I didn't catch the gentleman's name. Are you in touch with the person whose voice we just heard? Excuse me, I'm can sorry. you repeat that question again? Well, one second, we're trying to fix the audio. What was that? Yeah, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I'm saying I didn't catch the gentleman's name. Can you give us his name again, please? Luis Mate Jr. and he is in McDougal. Correct. And are you are you in regular touch with him? Um, we've been working on some um, organizing. I'm sorry, ma'am, uh, to interrupt, but if you're going to be uh, testifying too, could you just identify yourself for the record? Oh, I'm sorry, Jania. Hi. So, so my question is, can either of you get a message to him? Yes. 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 Could you please tell him uh, that a member of this judiciary body very much appreciated um, his articulate heart and mind and complimented him on how beautifully written his testimony was um, and uh, that I found it very moving. Please, we will do that. Tell him yeah. that. Representative Palm. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you both. Um, further questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Sarah, for being with us today. Next, we have Austin Brunarski, followed by James Jeter and Allison Barlow. Hi, can you hear me all right? You're good, go ahead. My name is Austin Brunarski. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Connecticut Bail Fund as well. And um, I offer testimony from Michael White in support of uh, raised bill 972. Um, in support of this bill, and I'm gonna play it, it's uh, no longer than a minute and a half. Yes, this is Michael White, 310236. I am a 36 year old male serving a 25 year long sentence, 17 of which I have completed. I come from a community plagued by poverty, just like many inmates be housed in Connecticut. None of the 13 prisons that house sentence inmates are located in a reasonable option for our community. Telecommunications is the only way in which many of us can communicate with family and loved ones. The first puts a family so tight on the family structure that many of us prisoners lose contact with family or go years without talking to family members that we essentially become strangers to members of our own family. My family is well below the national poverty line and depends on the fixed income. For me to call for a week accounts for 80% of their monthly income after rent, utilities, and groceries are paid. No other industry is allowed to monopolize the poverty like the way the phone company to a prisoner's family. The government would have been the companies accountable. I'm asking for the legislators to hold these phone companies accountable and make changes to a broken system unless it's not broken and it's functioning how it was designed to. Thank you. And just for the record, uh, Mr. White is incarcerated at Cheshire Correctional. Thank you, Austin. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing uh, Mr. White's testimony. Next, we have James Jeter followed by Allison Barlow and Brian Highsmith. Mr. Jeter, you have the floor. All right. Uh, uh, the committee chairs, Gary Winfield, and Steve Strassman, all members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, my name is James Jeter. I am the co-director of the Full Citizens Coalition to Unlock the Vote. I write in strong support of SB 972, a bill that would eliminate the cost of prison communication and help connect Connecticut families with incarcerated loved ones. Um, I have gaps in me that I don't know how to address, and they affect every aspect of my life. As much as I love my family, at times I don't know how to get close, and I don't know how to reach out. So my inability to go beyond the mechanisms that allow me to survive growing up in prison remind me that there are these invisible chains on me, sort of like uh, when a dog is, is, is constantly choked by the attempt to obtain uh, what lies right beyond the restrictions of his chain. And after so many futile attempts that always appear to uh, self-inflict pain, once the chains are removed, he never goes beyond uh, the limit that the pain from the choking has left in him. 
And I often feel like that at times in, 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 in my progression. Um, I say that about myself and still, yeah, I consider myself one of the lucky ones, one of the blessed. Like um, my mother, whom I was barely on speaking terms with at 17 when I went to prison, was there every day of my nearly 20 year period of incarceration and could afford to accept my phone calls. And on those calls reinforced in me that I had worth before prison, maintain my worth while incarcerated and return with my worth. And yet still I have these gaps. And I bring this up because uh, I know you've been hearing this about this particular bill uh, from men and women who are currently incarcerated and people who have had the experience. And you know, to be honest, I don't envy this committee this session, um, yet I champion you um, because before you have come several bills that I believe can truly take Connecticut and push them into a, a, a pioneering light, a, a state uh, that has tackled and begun to tackle um, dismantling the dredges of chattel slavery that resonate in our carceral system. Um, even though we've done great work in reducing our population by 58%, the population that remains is still overwhelmingly black and brown, though we are, not, though we are the minorities of the state. And when it comes to these phone calls, the hard part is, is that the money that comes out of these poor and disenfranchised communities gets rolled over to the general fund. And, and it raises the question that, how do you fill that gap? But that's a question that in our history concerning these same populations, we've answered. When we went to war, we said, find another way. And we have to be able to stand in today and say that and, 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 and stand in that same truth. Um, Cause this is not an issue of crime and punishment nor of any consequences. This is the issue of oppression and profiteering. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a, a stable, in our history, but we have a chance right now to like not wait in our nation to catch up, but to lead our nation in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jetter, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, I just wanna say uh, a special thank you to Mr. Jetter for being here today, for sharing uh, your story and your testimony. You're a really powerful advocate and uh, we should all be thankful, not only for your you're sharing today, but also for all the work you do in the community. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have Allison Barlow followed by Kevin Paulin. Allison, whenever you're ready, you have the floor. Allison Barlow, there you are. Whenever you're ready, uh, you can start your statement. Good morning. Um, my name is Allison Barlow. I represent the Connecticut Bail Fund and the people. Forgive me for my emotions because I'm I'm a recently. I just recently got home. I, I had a 35 year sentence. Off of that 35 years. I did 23 years, nine months. Um, I'm a little emotional because I know Louis Matei and I know Michael White. I did time with them both. Um, I'm here to, to, to stand for the, uh, the, the SB 972 bill and the SB 978 bill. Regarding the, um, regarding the, 972 bill. I stand for that. Excuse me. I, I stand for that because, you know, I realize the, the strain that I put on my family for all the years that I've been away. And now that I'm home, um, I try to stay in contact with my friends and, 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 and that I left behind. But for me personally, it had a big effect on me and my daughter. When I'm when I went to jail, my daughter was she was two and a half years old. She's 26 now. We have a hard time. We have a hard time getting along because because of the disconnect, just from being away, not being able to see her, not being able to help raise her, not being able to speak to her on the phone as much as I like to, you know, as the times went on, you know, I, I contributed to telephone bills from inside at oftentimes only making 75 cents a day or 70, 70 cents an hour. I did my best 
but we still had that disconnect. It's, it's, it's rough. You know, I'm, I'm out here now. I overturned my conviction. I'm home on, on post-conviction bail. I'm on, I'm on house arrest. I, I'm on a bracelet. I do have a job, but my hours got cut. I only work uh, Monday, through, uh, Monday through Wednesday. I'm off today trying to find another job. But, you know, with brothers like Lewis, John Brewer, Tyson Hunter, Paul Coney, I try to stay in touch with these individuals. I love these brothers. And, and, and for that, I would love to continue to stay in touch with them. And that's why I support Bill 972. As for uh, Bill 978, you know, a lot of people have deal with pride and they don't want to go to uh, a counselor or a therapist and seek help. But maybe I uh, unwittingly self-diagnosed myself but i realized that you know i went to jail at 23 years old and now i'm 47 um i i i come to learn and, and grow and, and read and study a lot of materials and i and, and and i know the difference now between not knowing how to make proper decisions not you know i never realized that you know my mental capacity wasn't fully developed but I just ask for the support of these bills. I, I, I'm sorry for my not being uh, prepared. I don't know how to partake in, in, in these types of hearings, but I hope you hear me. I hope you hear us all. I appreciate your, your time and your concern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barlow. Uh, and uh, certainly don't apologize. We appreciate your passion uh, and sharing uh, what is very personal uh, experience and story. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Uh, Representative Palm, I see your mm -hmm. hand is raised. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Barlow, I just want to thank you for your testimony and um, respectfully say that you uh, are exactly the kind of person we need to hear from and that your testimony was exactly what we need to hear. So I agree with Representative Blumenthal, nothing to apologize for, and I wish you all the best of luck, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barlow. Are there further comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, thank you again, Mr. Barlow, for being with us and, uh, and sharing your, your testimony with us. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. You too. Um, next, we have Kevin Paulin and then uh, Brian Highsmith, whenever we get him back, followed by uh, Dai Muhammad McKnight. So, uh, Kevin, whenever you're ready, uh, please go ahead with your statement. Thank you. Greetings to all. Uh, much appreciated for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Kevin Paulin. I am a resident of East Haven, Connecticut. I am also a homeowner, a business owner and an executive director of Winning Ways, which is a nonprofit here in New, in New Haven, whose mission is to foster the rehabilitation of formerly incarcerated uh, individuals while strengthening our community. Um, I am here to support with great vigor the uh, SB 1059 bill. Uh, I too have lived experience, being that I did four years of prison in the state of New Jersey. Um, and during that time, uh, my Mima sent me a letter that changed my life. And in that letter, she uh, eloquently put that I have an opportunity to turn poison into medicine. And I've been fortunate enough to do that. One of those poisons or better known as traumas was actually spending time in solitary confinement in the state of New Jersey. And though it was in the state of New Jersey, uh, these practices of breaking us, uh, the spirit of a fellow man of woman is common practice. Um, during this time, um, I got news that my brother in faith, Daniel Joseph, was killed in Irvington, New Jersey, and um, pro my family called down to the prison to let me to let to let someone know to tell me. And protocol was then initiated, where I was removed, where I was shackled, removed from my cell, and put into um, administrative segregation without any reason. It wasn't until I was placed into the cell and unshackled was I then told that my brother was murdered. Um, I went into a great, great depression and later through counseling found out also um, 
suffered uh, from anxiety. And this was literally the lowest part of my life. Um, several days later in solitude, uh, being emotionally unstable, uh, a case manager came to me and asked if, um, was I contemplating suicide? Um, I certainly was experiencing SI. However, I did not want to admit that because I didn't want to spend more time in solitary. So I certainly denied it and was let uh, get given the opportunity to go back into general pop, but the trauma and the pain was still there. Um, I was broken. It wasn't until I picked up the practice of Buddhism and started um, going to therapy was when I really started healing. And I'm one of the fortunate ones to actually to actually um, come out of this trauma and able to turn it into medicine, but many, many, many aren't able to do that. And um, many succumb to the trauma of uh, unable to, to transition back into society. And it's certainly a great, great barrier when we ask people who are now leaving these institutions with a broken spirit and low self-esteem to then ask them to have enough self-worth to do all the things that we we ask uh, people to come home to, to be successful. So prison and corrections should be to re rehabilitate and empower people, but instead it's set up to break the spirits of brothers and sisters. And then we wonder why recidivism rates continue to go up and why gun violence is so prevalent in our society. So today, again, I just want to support this act, uh, SB 1059 and really, give us all the opportunity to treat each other better than we have for centuries. We need to break these chains of uh, solitary confinement and inhumane practices. And remember that just because someone made the wrong decisions, we shouldn't take their quality of life and their quality of being a human away. Thank you, sir. And, we're, we're at the three minute mark. If you could just wrap up. Uh, and to wrap up, um, thank you, sir. Um, and to wrap up, Again, I just wanna impose that we all take the opportunity to support this act of SB 1059 and uh, let's start treating people the way that they should be treated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Um, is Brian Highsmith with us? Yes, hi, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Sir. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Highsmith, and I'm a PhD student at Harvard University in social policy and an affiliated senior researcher at Yale Law School here in Connecticut. And my research focuses on the unaffordable financial obligations that are imposed on poor families as a result of their contact with the criminal system. Uh, previously, as a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, I worked on uh, litigation that challenged the excessive cost of securist phone calls in uh, Massachusetts County jails, and also I've written several reports about the economic harm that result no. from prison from prison phone charges. Oh, so before my brief remarks, uh, I'd like to play a short recording from Burns, who's currently incarcerated and would like to speak in support of SB uh, 972. And uh, I'll ask that you bear in uh, bear with the audio quality here. Uh, now, what I would like to say is that um, my family really struggles. My mother struggles with paying uh, five dollars five dollars to call for fifteen minutes when. It's the, it's the, the work out there is very low. She's a hairdresser. She she really can't afford to be putting money on the phone like that every time I call her. I, it's a very big emergency going on inside here right now with the whole COVID epidemic. So I just, you know, it'd be very, very helpful if, you know, if the secure somehow tries to lower the calls, the cost of the money for the calls and something happens, you know. So I, I, I would really like that to happen because it's, very, it's a hard time right now with all the money. So as you've just heard, calls are a lifeline for vulnerable families. And I'd also like to note that they're an issue of economic justice for consumers. Charging loved ones to stay connected during incarceration creates unnecessary financial hardship for vulnerable Connecticut families, preventing them from having more regular contact with their loved ones and making it harder to get back on their feet. And this is all part of a 
broader trend that I've written about. And uh, increasingly, people who have contact with our legal system are left with unaffordable debts that create hardship for these families uh, that have contact with the punishment system. They undermine their ability to acquire savings and also to invest in local in the local economy. And of course, they work to keep poor people for, poor. For a typical family that's receiving one 15-minute bedtime phone call a night, those costs can add up to around $150 a month in prison phone charges. And for a low-income family, that's a grocery budget. It's an overdue car repair. It's money that could be invested, reinvested in Connecticut communities, and it will be if this legislation passes. SB 972 would keep families connected by ending an oppressive system that traps vulnerable families in cycles of poverty and makes it harder for people who have contact with, our, with the punishment system to get back on, our, on their feet. The nation is watching and Connecticut families can't wait. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Representative Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, Brian. How's it going? Good, good to see you. Um, so you mentioned that you dealt with this issue in Massachusetts. I was just wondering if you could tell us uh, how Massachusetts handled resolving this issue uh, and or any other places around the country that you're aware of. Yeah, so um, as uh, others here can, uh, can share, um, this is an issue, um, Connecticut is, is last in the country on affordability, but this is uh, not unique to, um, so in some ways this is uniquely a Connecticut problem, but, uh, but you know, Securus has contracts around the country. Uh, this is a very typical arrangement and, and we have the same in, in Massachusetts. So we worked to uh, challenge the cost of calls there. And there's um, in, in a federal class action lawsuit that's ongoing. Um, and there's also legislation in Massachusetts that would end charges as well there. So uh, would it would be fair to say that the state may also be subject to le legal action if we don't somehow uh, correct this issue? There, so there has been a number of lawsuits around the country challenging phone calls. Uh, and so that, that could be a fair assessment. And um, I was also wondering if you could tell us a bit more about uh, the other issue that you talked about in your research, which is uh, points at which folks with contact with the criminal justice system uh, are used as funding sources uh, or assessed unreasonable uh, fines or fees uh, or other payments. Definitely. So I'd be happy to submit um, to the record a, a report that I wrote um, about this. And uh, the, the main conclusion of that report is that at every single step along the way in the process, uh, from the moment of arrest all the way through and actually after release, uh, families who um, are impacted by this system, of course, including not only the people who are arrested and subject to charges or experiencing incarceration, but also entire communities are subject to fines and fees, the commercial bail system, uh, the cost of making phone calls, commissary uh, of financial transactions, including debit release cards in the outset. So just really families that we have moved uh, towards this system of extracting wealth from already vulnerable families and using that to fund uh, these, uh, not, not only our systems of, of justice um, or ostensibly of justice, but also uh, going back to general revenue. So it's, it's this very concerning trend. Uh, and this is one of the best examples of, of this and would be a real opportunity to lead as a state in uh, setting an example for the country. Well, thank you very much, Brian, for your testimony. Um, I would love to see the report. So if you want to send that to the committee or to me, uh, please yeah. do. Happy to. Thank you. And uh, th thanks very much for being with us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for your work on this. Further questions or comments from the committee? If not, thanks for being with us. Um, next up will be um, Dave Mohammed McKnight. Go ahead, sir. You have three minutes. Yes, sir. Let me open uh, by saying in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, I greet all of you on the Judiciary Committee and all of the participants, citizens, and the greeting words of peace be unto you. Let me quickly say that I'm here in support of SB 1059, um, and I want to take you through a exercise in, re in reference to ending solitary confinement. The exercise is called, Can You Guess What Country I'm In? Uh, in 1988, I was in a certain institution in a certain country in a certain state. And unfortunately, I was 21 years old. My brain wasn't fully developed. And I came from a traumatic background, 
from Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I committed a violent act in this certain institution, in a certain country, in a certain state. And I was taken to um, a place within this institution and I was put on four point restraints for 48 hours. And if you don't know what four point restraints are, four point restraints are your hands are handcuffed to a bed and your feet are handcuffed to a bed. And by the great benevolence of a captain, he walked by and he said, that's beyond the um, allowed time of 16 hours. And they took me off of the four point restraints. I stayed in isolation without reading a book for 60 days. I wasn't allowed a book. I was only allowed a shower Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I was allowed uh, no rec at that time until I left punitive and I went to administrative isolation uh, for a year straight, 12 months, where I only got a shower on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I went to rec for an hour a day outside, handcuffed in a dog kennel cage for an hour where I walked around the dog cage. Not a figurative cage, but a literal dog cage. I stayed that way for a year and maybe once a month, mental health unit representatives would walk by the cell very quickly and look in it, but keep walking and never ask me, how was I or was I okay? Now, if you can guess what country this is, you are the winner of a $100,000 grand prize. In case you haven't guessed, I was in America, in the United States of America. I was born as an American citizen here, and I was in a state called Connecticut called Summers Prison. And those acts seem to be rather something that you would think came from a foreign movie where people were being tortured, but it happened here in the good state of Connecticut. I, fortunately, I have been out of prison for 15 years and I have been directly involved in reentry for about 12 years, helping facilitate successful reentry for people. But I am one of the fortunate ones. I am an exception to the rule and my therapeutic intervention came from spirituality. People from my community that don't have that, they usually self-medicate with alcohol and illicit drugs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We're at the three minute mark, so I just need you to just wrap up, please. In, in summary, very briefly, uh, like I said, I have experience from the inside and I also have experience from the outside of facilitating successful reentry for the last 12 years. In summary, I am in support of the humanity of supporting SB 1059. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, sir, and uh, thanks for your work with Family Reentry um, and for sharing your story with us. Further questions or comments? If not, appreciate it. Um, next up will be Cynthia DeRoma. Hi. Can Hi. you see and hear me? Yep. Uh, okay, so my name is Cynthia DeRoma. I'm a resident, a resident of Summers, Connecticut, home to several correctional facilities including where uh, Mr. McKnight was. Uh, and I would like to express my support for Senate Bill 1059. Uh, even, I've been privileged to have never had to deal with incarceration in mine or my family's life. However, as a Connecticut citizen, I don't want to be complicit with a system that is not only inhumane, but also fails to accomplish its purported goals. How can prison rehabilitate, rehabilitate a person if he or she leaves it not only worse off, but also an even bigger threat and burden to public safety? Uh, as mentioned in testimonies and in personal narratives like Albert Woodfox's powerful memoir, Solitary, widespread use of extreme isolation is a form of torture that puts undue strains on incarcerated, pe incarcerated people and officers alike. Uh, and these burdens fall disproportionately on uh, people with a history of mental illness. Um, therefore, um, SB 1059 is a step in the right direction. And that is why I strongly support it and urge you to favorably vote the bill out of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Questions or comments from the committee? Uh, if not, appreciate it. Um, next up will be Cindy Prizio. Hi, everything good? You can see me? We can't see you now. 
Hmm. We could before, but now we can't. Okay, wait a minute. I'm going to have to switch then. I have to learn how to do this. Uh, let me call up my um, testimony. Sorry. I thought I had it. Do you want to go to the next person, yep. uh, uh, Representative like, uh, Stastrom? Yep, looks like Melinda Tuhus is ready. So we're going to go to her. Ms. Tuhus? Melinda? Can you hear me now? Yep, go ahead. Okay, thank you. To all the distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Melinda Tuhus and I live in Hamden. I've been a journalist for the past 40 years where I focus mainly on two issues, the environment and criminal justice. I am mostly retired now and spend my time advocating for climate justice and social justice. I am speaking in strong support of SB 1059, which would treat incarcerated persons in Connecticut like human beings and also support correction officers who have a very stressful job. My only experience with solitary confinement in the criminal justice system was 10 years ago when I participated with hundreds of others in a nonviolent civil disobedience action at the White House. I was searched very thoroughly and handcuffed with my hands behind my back before being put into the back of a police van where I sat alone until joined by fellow arrestees. That took 10 minutes or so, but seemed like much longer. When we got to the police station, we were put in cells in groups of at least four where we talked and sang for eight hours until our release. I knew I would not be abused and that I'd be getting out within 24 hours when I would rejoin my comrades. This experience was so far from what people experience in solitary confinement in prison that I hesitate to mention it. But the very fact that these were my circumstances and I still felt panicked and distressed for those 10 minutes drove home that the situation of incarcerated men and women is horrendously worse. It's scary having no control over your person and being at the mercy of individuals who maybe don't care very much about your well being. I can't imagine how much worse my short jail stint would have been had I been alone in a cell. And I can only imagine how much worse it would have been if I were someone who had no financial resources or social emotional support system, especially if I were black or brown and basically someone whom society has already dealt a bad hand. Humans are social animals and we need human contact. SB 1059 would require that inmates be in their cells no more than 16 hours a day, except for emergency situations. So it's not you know, eliminating solitary confinement and that it could never be used. It would also end the painful dehumanizing practice of in-cell restraints and would provide for regular communication with an in, in, inmate's loved ones. It would also create uh, oversight within the prison system and the provision of mental health services to correction officers. Our entire criminal injustice system needs to be overhauled and humanized, but passing this bill is an important step toward that goal. According to the United Nations, solitary confinement of more than 15 days constitutes torture and lifelong harm can result when someone Thank is held you. even half that time. We're at the three minute mark, so I just need you to wrap up, please. I shall right now. We should not be torturing people in our custody. Um, I strongly urge you to pass this bill out of committee. And I also wanted to mention that I do support SB 972 for the reasons many others have mentioned. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate you being with us. Seeing no questions or comments, it looks like Cindy Prizio is back with us. So we're gonna go back to her. Okay, let's try it. Thank you, Representative Stastrom. Uh, good afternoon. I'm testifying in support of SB 1059 with qualifications. My name is Cindy Prizio. I am the executive director of One Standard of Justice, a statewide civil rights advocacy organization working with men and women arrested or convicted of sexual offenses and their families. I come from a justice-involved family. 
Um, I, too, am going to quote Albert Woodfox, who was the 2020 Harriet Beecher Stowe Prize winner for his book, Solitary. He says, solitary confinement is used as a punishment for the specific purpose of breaking a prisoner. Nothing relieved the pressure of being locked in a cell 23 hours a day. The only way you can survive in these cells is by adapting to the painfulness. Connecticut prison should not be invested in sustaining or creating mentally, physically, emotionally unwell people. Too many justice involved people become dependents of the state rather than productive citizens, not only because of the 500 plus barriers to reintegration, but because of their inhumane treatment while in custody. Best are the very policies that maintain vital pro-social connections to the community, like kindness and respect, physical touch, being able to regularly see and speak with family and friends, to see your children when you're in prison and continue to see them in the community. Can you imagine the harm done to the people that are denied seeing their children once they're released from prison and the harm and confusion we're doing to their little ones. Fact, 95% of people incarcerated will return to their communities. All Connecticut citizens should want these men and women to return in the best physical and emotional shape possible for public safety. Don't we wanna be creating good neighbors? OSJ unequivocally supports the PROTECT Act. I believe when you treat people like people, the, the results will dramatically be changed. Example, true unit. OSJ is most interested in replacing, I have no idea here, in replacing corrections with a more civilized model of what justice means and how to achieve it. We believe in a restorative model, one which elevates humanity and dignity. Incarceration is not real accountability, nor does it change behavior. Connecticut Corrections is a rogue system that has been built entirely on punishment rather than rehabilitation. There is inadequate transparency and the all too frequent cover up when things go wrong. Just like transparency and accountability in policing, this organization advocates for the same for our most vulnerable citizens inside Connecticut prisons. Cindy, we're at the three minute mark, so I just need you to wrap up for me. Can I wrap up? Okay, I just have a couple sentences. Trauma is the common denominator for people on both sides of this coin. I speak today to, for Robbie Talbot, who cannot speak for himself as he was killed two years ago while in segregation at Wally Prison. As a mom of a person once incarcerated, it could have been my son. And um, in closing, I quote Maya Angelou, I did then what I know I knew how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. And isn't it time for Connecticut to do much better? Thank you. We Steve. know this stuff. Thank we, you so we do, much. I think we do have a question for you. Um, Representative O'Day. Uh, no question. Just a, a thank you for your testimony, Cindy, as always. Uh, appreciate it. And of course, you can reach out and happy to talk about this further. Thank you, Mr. Well, uh, Representative O'Day, I just want to tell you in my written, uh, um, written testimony, it goes much deeper into our rationale. But I want to say we also unequivocally support free phone calls in 972 and 1058, which uh, which speaks to compassionate release based on risk level. We're we're totally robustly for that. And as the people who went before me, I want to thank them. They spoke so eloquently. Thank you, Cindy, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both. Um, next up will be Alana Rosenberg. Hi there. Can you see me? Yep, you're all set. Go ahead. Chairs Winfield and staff, Strom Vice Chairs Kasser and Blumenthal, Ranking Members Kissel and Peschbein, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Alana Rosenberg, and I'm a resident of Woodbridge, Connecticut. I'm here to urge you to pass SB 1059 out of committee. I was thrust into the world of mass incarceration in 2011 when I began studying the link between incarceration and health at the Yale School of Public Health. The studies I have worked on involve longitudinal in-depth interviews with people touched by the criminal legal system in New Haven. It was through my role as a researcher and interviewer that I began to glimpse this underworld of our society in which we failed to find a way to help people suffering. 
from poverty, substance abuse, trauma, lack of opportunity, and mental health issues. Many of those we fail to help are black and brown people that have endured historic systemic racism. Instead of help, we wait until a crime is charged and we lock the person up out of sight and out of mind. It sounds so terrible and extreme that you might not believe it. I wouldn't have either back in 2011 before I began seeing it with my own eyes. Many of my colleagues today have talked about solitary as torture and it surely is. Imagine those folks who needed help but were instead locked up and when exhibit difficulties adjusting to their rights being stripped away, they are further penalized and their very humanity is taken away. This is what solitary is and as Barbara Fair states, it is designed to break people. We may have a sense that this process occurs only to a small minority of incarcerated people that pose an unsolvable problem to the DOC, but this isn't true. Of the 300 low-income New Haven residents with an incarceration experience that we enrolled in our study, nearly half had been placed in solitary confinement. And if you count the full array of types of segregation included in the PROTECT Act, the percent is surely a majority of those who have been incarcerated. This is a pervasive, inhumane treatment that we as citizens have condoned with our silence. We must stop being complicit in torture of our fellow residents. Incarcerated people are people and they deserve dignity. Likewise, shame on us that we put state employees in the position of administering this cruel treatment to other human beings. Correctional staff should be given the tools necessary to undertake their jobs humanely and should not be asked to treat any other human being as less than. People develop coping strategies that normalize the traumatic, especially if that trauma happens on a regular basis. The mental health of correctional staff suffers because of this practice and it needs to stop. We need to take better care of our employees and our incarcerated people. The PROTECT Act includes attention to the mental wellness of correctional staff. In every other place in society, there is recourse for mistreatment. We have protections in the workplace and healthcare and as consumers against wrongdoing. This is not the case in prison. Incarcerated people suffer. Suffering from unfair treatment within correctional institutions have written to me with their very real problems and complaints with no recourse, no recourse to corrective action. What does that do to a person to know that a state sanctioned body, the DOC can get, get away with whatever it wants? It is high time we had a correctional accountability commission as would be mandated by the PROTECT Act. Without it and the protections in SB 1059 for incarcerated people, the wounds that people have endured at our hands will continue to fester. We will continue to damage people and our communities and detract from our collective goal of achieving a justice society. I think Dostoevsky was quoted already today, but I'll quote him again. The degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. As our elected officials, I urge and compel you to pass SB 1059 to raise the humanity of our prisons and to thus our society. The fate of so many of our most vulnerable citizens is in your hands. I thank, thank you for you. your time. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Um, if not, thanks for being with us. Uh, I will turn it back over to Senator Winfield. Thank you, Chairman Statsham. Uh, Valerie Horsley, followed by Colleen Ford and Bradley Pellisier. Is Valerie Horsley in? Yep. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear and see you. You have three okay, minutes. Okay, great. Um, dear members of the Judiciary Committee, uh, thank you so much for your service to Connecticut. My name is Valerie Horsley. I'm a resident in Hamden, Connecticut. And I'm here to testify to support SB 1059, the PROTECT Act, as well as SB 972. Um, in 2017, I visited the solitary box in the Capitol building. Um, and I was really surprised at uh, the limited size of the cell and the emptiness that I felt in the few minutes after I entered the box. I couldn't believe that we would put um, men and women in such a solitary confinement in our own state. In my own work, I'm a scientist and I use animal models to study how tissues repair. And I have strict regulations that are governed by the Institutional Review Board that ensures that we do not house animals um, alone. We are not allowed to unless we specifically ask why and, and um, put, put paperwork through the committee to ensure that we're not causing distress that impacts the mental, mental or physical health of the animals that we use. So I'm surprised that we're still allowed to do this to human beings in our own society. Humans are social beings, just like most other mammals. And it's no surprise that um, solitary confinement causes 
post-traumatic stress disorder, um, as a 2018 study confirmed, and as advocates have been saying for decades. Solitary confinement is not humane. We don't really allow it on animals and we shouldn't allow it on human beings, no matter what um, punishment we are trying to give. In terms of the phone calls, how can we um, in our society use money from incarcerated family members for programs? We should be encouraging people to connect with their family members and we should not allow them to go further into debt because they wanna to talk to their family. We ask all of our children to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance every day as they go to school. And one of the lines in that Pledge of Allegiance is liberty and justice for all. Justice means that we will help individuals build relationships so they can excel in this world. And we cannot allow trauma of men and women that have been incarcerated anymore. Please um, help Connecticut put relationships first by supporting SB 1059 and SB 972. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a comment or a question from members of the committee? Representative Porter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Valerie, for being with us today and for your testimony. Um, a question in regard to uh, the work that you do in the laboratory with animals. Is there any kind of fine or, um, you know, what happens if animals aren't treated according to uh, the instructions that you're given? So if, um, if we get written up and it's funded by a federal grant, um, we can be reported to the federal government and we can have our grants taken away or our research privileges taken away. Um, and so every three years we have to apply for our protocol and make sure that we're doing things in a humane way. Um, and this is something that we take very seriously because we want to be ethical and we want our research to not be induced by stress. Um, and so we want, um, we should be doing the same thing for human beings in our, in our world. I, I totally agree. Absolutely. And like I said, thank you for sharing uh, thank that you. perspective because I've always said that if we treated animals the way we treated people that are incarcerated, we'd be in jail. So yeah. thank you for, for that validation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Porter. Comment or question from other members of the committee? Comment or question? I don't see any. Uh, Valerie, thank you for joining thank us you. again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, next, we have Colleen Lord, followed by Bradley Pellissier, followed by Timothy Fair and Bianca Tylek. Is Colleen Lord in? Thank you. Chairs Winfield and Stopstrom, Vice Chairs Catherine Blumenthal, Ranking Members Kissel and Fishbein, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Colleen Lord. I'm a resident of West Haven and I'd like to express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059. I am Robbie Talbot's mother. Yesterday marked two years since DOC staff caused his homicide in New Haven, Connecticut. Certain provisions in SB 1059 would have prevented his extremely painful death. And my support of the bill, too late for my son, is in hopes of ending torture and seeing humane treatment of those who are incarcerated, whether for serious crimes, mistakenly convicted, or like my son, solely because of a lack of available mental health treatment programs in Connecticut. My gentle Robbie Bear was a poet. Some time ago he wrote, I want to die from life and natural causes and avoid death because it hurts. He was born in trauma with the cord around his neck cutting off his oxygen, which likely contributed to, if not caused, his serious mental illness he was diagnosed with as a young child. And he died in trauma, in excruciating pain, abuse, and neglect, as his last gasped out words being, can't breathe. Incredibly, there's still no internal investigation of my son's homicide after two years, though the video is very clear on what was done to him. Excessive chemical agent, six times what is allowed, abusive restraints, unwarranted and unmonitored solitary confinement in a box filled with chemical agents so strong that 90 minutes later when he was found dead in early rigor mortis, EMT workers were still being affected and coughing from the toxic fumes. Proven false statements to the state police by DOC staff remain unaddressed, so Connecticut needs a correction accountability commission as provided for in this bill. I tell these details to dispel some myths 
and illustrate that abusive restraints, excessive chemical agent torture and solitary confinement is opposed upon non-threatening, non-violent, vulnerable and compliant individuals simply for punitive reasons. Robbie was completely nonviolent and never hurt a person in his life in jail for breach of peace. Seconds before the assault on my son, DOC staff are seen laughing and pointing at my son who was slow in the shower while awaiting a psychiatric evaluation that he never received, being sent to solitary instead against DOC regulations. Despite my son's compliance, he was chained to a metal cot in a solitary cell in five point restraints and left to die. DOC staff needs training in the many aspects of mental illness as provided for in SB 1059. DOC staff needs mental health evaluations for themselves and treatment if needed so they do not abuse those in their care as provided for in SB 1059. And above all, Connecticut needs a correction accountability commission. In Robbie's memory, I support SB 1059 and I ask you to favorably vote the bill out of judiciary committee. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lord. Is, are there comments or questions? Uh, comments or questions? Um, I don't see any. I wanna thank you for what I know to be your continued advocacy. Um, thank you for joining us today and providing what I know to be tough testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll next hear from Bradley Pellissier, followed by Timothy Fair, Bianca Talek, and then Tracy Bernard Bernardi. Uh, is Bradley Pellissier here? Um, is Timothy Fair here? Um, Bianca Tala? Hello. Oh, Timothy Fair. You, yeah, um, I don't see myself. We can't see you either. Um, so I'm not sure how to fix that. Well, we'll we'll work on it, but okay. you you want me to want me to wait so you can, you can go to someone else? Because um, I have I have no way of getting to uh, starting the video here. Okay. okay. Well, all right. I got it. I got it. There you go. There you go. Yep, there I am. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Chairman Winfield, Stratham, uh, Vice Chair Kaser, Blumenthal, Ranking Members Kisso and Fisper, and other judiciary members. My name is Timothy Fair. I'm a resident of Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I would like to uh, express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059. I've also submitted written testimony and also support the bill regarding uh, phone call, prison phone calls 972. Uh, I wanna begin by saying that while uh, functioning somewhat as quote unquote normally in in society, uh, I've yet to uh, realize uh, the exact measure uh, from my sustained trauma after nearly 40 years of incarceration, 27 years consecutively, uh, which began in 1980. Um, I was incarcerated, released in 20, uh, 2007. I personally witnessed uh, the consequences, not benefits, of persons being in solitary confinement or in cell time for 22 hours a day as I was subject to myself <clears throat> and what is defined as sometimes segregation, administrative, punitive, uh, although I've never been in Northern, which is much more than just what they call the whole of se segregation. These are all very detrimental to the mental, psychological and emotional well-being of anybody who suffered under those consequences. Uh, our country has outlawed the, the practice of waterboarding, uh, even our enemies of combat, uh, uh, yet confinement, solitary confinement is just another form of this inhumane practice, yet we treat fellow citizens worse than hostile enemies of the United States. Uh, it is beyond absurd to, re to, to remotely imagine that persons, regardless of their constitutional constitution to endure pain and suffering under duress, one cannot elude the psychological, emotional, and spiritual damage of isolation. 20, 23 hour lockdown, in a cage or cell, however we wanted to find it, um, being fed through a slot in a door, in a steel door as, a, as an animal, uh, a trough for like cattle. Uh, most of these men and women, as myself, are, were returning or at some point going to return to our communities, broken in spirit, as the program that is designed to execute and, and, and the results absolutely accomplished that 
you, you're going to be broken, uh, have no hope, and, and, and you return to society with the demand that you become a productive member of, of the community. This is dehumanizing, uh, dehumanizing uh, upon eventual release uh, and, and reasonable expectations. What am I supposed to, what, are, 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 do people really expect uh, that we're going to have an attitude of appreciation for just having survived the physical years of torture and abuse, secluded from daylight in some practices? Uh, this, this is category, not, nothing productive about uh, solitary confinement, does not secure or nor enhance secure uh, public safety. Uh, and, uh, you know, while, while the dogs, while, while dogs were fed daily, my brothers had a dog. Let's give you a little story. My brother had a dog that he had for years. He walked this dog, he fed this dog. But one day, this dog saw a little bit of light in the door burst through the door, ran away, never was seen again. What do you imagine people who are chained down physically 22 hours a day, all day in a cell, sometimes no daylight, no air, how are they supposed to get back out in society and function uh, as a normal person to be productive? And with that, I thank you for the time and, and, and your work on this matter. Thank, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, is there a comment or question from members of the committee? Comment? or question. Um, I do not see any. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, it was a pleasure, sir. Hope you can enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, sir. You as well. Uh, Tracy Bernardi, uh, Kevnisha Boyd, Carl Testa. Is Tracy uh, Bernardi in? I'm right here. <laughs> All right. You have your three minutes. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Winfield and um, everyone else for the sake of time. <laughs> um, my name is Tracy Bernardi and I'm an ACLU smart justice leader. I am the co-founder of Once Incarcerated, Once Inc. During my 23 years in prison, I served seven long years in solitary confinement. And I can tell you without a doubt that solitary confinement in Connecticut still exists, not just in Northern, even though Northern is getting shut down, but solitary confinement and with any other name is still solitary confinement, whether you call it restrictive housing, whether you call it closed custody, whatever aliases they assign it, a rose is a rose by any other name. Cruel and unusual punishment is cruel and unusual punishment. 23 hours locked alone in a cell. The most abuse happens in the darkest places. Solitary confinement, it drives the human spirit allowing prisons a separate and isolated and private place to punish people. It only promotes abuse within the correctional system. The Department of Corrections, like the police, has to have accountability for the way that people treat the people that the state entrusts their lives to. Guards live under a cloak of secrecy. That enables them to deny inmates their human rights and their dignity. I know this because I spent over seven years in solitary confinement. I went to jail at the age 19, sentenced to 30 years of incarceration. I entered solitary at age 26. I didn't see the light of day until age 32. I spent seven summers, seven winters, seven springs, seven falls all alone with no one. I nearly went crazy. I eventually hung myself. That's how bad it got. What would you do if I was your daughter? What would you do if your daughter was me? Would you allow that? Would you let them cage your child, your sister, your mother, your brother, your family member endlessly like an animal, feed them through a slot and a door, let them take three showers a week if they're lucky? And in my case, they didn't have doors up at the time on the shower, so I had to take all my showers in handcuffs. What would you do if I was your daughter or your friend? We need to ensure that people in Connecticut prisons and jails are not being abused and re-abused and, re and traumatized and re-traumatized. Even people with 30 year sentences like me, we come home. And you know, for the last year, I have been homeschooling my seven year old stepson. I run two, weeks, uh, two meetings a week with formerly incarcerated people. Um, I'm necessary in this world. Tracy. I was a warm line operator. Yes. Yeah, your time is up if you could summarize. Okay. I'm just so excited about being able to help pass bill SB 1059 because, you know, 
society will be safer when we come home better and not worse than we went in. That solitary confinement has me with severe post-traumatic stress. Don't continue to do this to people. Figure out alternative ways and have a lot of oversight. Thank, Thank you, you so much for everyone. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I see a comment or a question from Representative Fishbach. Yes, okay. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Tracy. How are you? Hi. Nervous again. <laughs> oh, nothing to be nervous about. We're just sitting around talking about this stuff. Yeah, very, <laughs> very important stuff. So, you know, just relax. And <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to figure because you know you, what you present is uh, is concerning, and I just want to you know double back. You know, okay. so so you got you got sentenced to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And where, um, where are we supposed to serve that? Um, I was supposed to serve that in your correctional institution, but um, I got redesignated as a security risk group member. Um, it's easy to get redesignated. And um, when I got redesignated, I had to give them two years in solitary confinement, discipline free. And I was unable to do it because I was mentally un unstable from being in the room all the time, from having the sentence I had, living with the guilt I was living with and um, inadequate mental health treatment. Every time I would try to harm myself um, after I was medically cleared, I would get a ticket. So those tickets would set me back and I would have to start the two years over. Okay, so you were reclassified as a what? You were you were going really fast there. So oh, as a um, as a gang as a um, they redesignated me as a gang member as a result of um, a bunch of drama that was going on in the facility. Okay, we also had some suicidal ideation going on, right? Um, actual acting out of yeah, I hung myself and I was actually an inmate was walking by my cell to go to the phone. She saw me and called the guard and I was cut down. But, um, you know, I'm grateful that I'm alive, but that's where you get driven to when you're in a room alone for 23 hours a day. Okay. Well, at least at the point that that unfortunate event occurred, because certainly when, you know, somebody gets to the point that they undertake those acts, it's not a, it's not a good thing. But um, how, if you were in solitary and, and perhaps, you know, an aspect of this is subjective, you know, what one person thinks is solitary is not necessarily solitary. Um, how is another inmate be able, um, able to, you know, essentially save your life? Because when um, he, everyone in solitary in, in the women's prison, their actual tears and um, their rooms, a bunch of rooms on it and, and the phone is on the tier. So each person gets a limited amount of phone calls during the week and the guard will pop them out of their room to go make the phone call. And we were all very close in our tier. So even though it was risking getting in trouble, we would all look in each other's window and smile like and try not to get caught by the guard on the way to the phone. So that's the girl was checking on me and she saw and started screaming and the guard came. But um, normally um, there's tours. If no one's out on the tier, there's, um, they do 15 minute tours um, if they feel like it, they're supposed to, but it, it, sure. it's, I mean, and don't get me wrong because some guards were good people and are decent, decent people, but the oversight is to make sure that all guards are decent people. Okay, and then how long did you end up serving actual time? <sighs> 23 years. I wow. served from 19 to age 42. And then I did parole. And then when I was done with all that, I was 43. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a portion of your incarceration was the seven years in solitary. Now, was it, was it all like, you know, seven <laughs> years in a row or was it, you know, no. you're out in the general population and then solitary? How did that work? Um, okay. So this seven years that I'm talking about, is separate from all of my stints in solitary confinement. This seven years is from 2001 until, and from March of 2001 until the summer of 2007. Um, so um, the other times I've been in SAG, um, they stopped a while ago, but they used to always put you in solitary. If you cut your arms, which I was a cutter at the time, um, if you cut your arms, if you try to hurt yourself, they would send you to mental health, but then you would get a class A self-mutilation ticket. 
And, you know, I, I, I fought while I was in there and other inmates fought while we were in there to try to keep them from doing that. And they eventually stopped doing that. But like, I literally lost good time, um, which was you were able to earn because of self-harm instead of being having the proper mental health treatment and, you know, but they're overcapacitated. They never, you know, they have two or three um, social workers and one psychologist for the whole compound of over 500 women. So of course, you know, it's just meet and treat and get, you know, medicate. Okay. And, and I would expect that whatever you were using to cut yourself was some sort of contraband, something that you weren't supposed to have. Uh, in the beginning, they used to sell, I'm sad, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, but in the beginning, they used to sell um, disposable razors. And because of me and one of my co-defendants, uh, who also was a cutter, they literally stopped selling them. And then we would resort to anything. Um, there was times where, you know, you could break a pair of glass, you know, I'm not going to give people ideas, but, but there were, you know, they, there's plenty of things that you can still figure out how to improvise and use when your mind says, hurt yourself. Sure. No, I, I'm well aware. Um, so, you know, if, if one is attempting to self-harm themselves, using an implement that they're not supposed to do you do you think that there should be a level of concern by the administration of the facility that that individual may use one of those implements to hurt someone else you know a guard another inmate is that a legitimate well, concern i don't think so because i think that most people that self-harm are not they're self-harming because they don't want to hurt anyone else because they, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's a concern. And I don't think that, you know, I think, I don't think that's a concern. I do think that it's a concern that if you want to tell staff, you need to talk to someone because you feel like you're reaching the point of suicide and you say um, to the guard, can I please talk to someone? You have to tell them that you're suicidal. If you don't say I'm suicidal, you can't see anyone. And once you tell them when you're in solitary confinement in York, when you tell them that you're suicidal, they put you on the max side in a, sing in a single cell, whether you have, because in some um, parts of SAG, you get a cellmate and, um, and they'll put you in a single cell in handcuffs and shackles until they call um, the medical team at the mental health unit. But in order to teach us a lesson in case we're just playing around and wasting their time, sometimes they'll leave us in that cell in those handcuffs and on the floor, you know, it's a, it's a empty mattress. They don't give us sheets or anything. Um, they take away our sneakers, our, our bras, or anything we can hurt ourselves with. And they handcuff us and they leave us in that room. It's called J2 for anybody that was at York CI that can tell you about it and verify what I'm saying. And sometimes they would wait until second shift, like it could be morning and you could tell them and they would be like sick of you because you always want to talk to somebody, but you're in 23 hour lockdown, you know, and you need to talk to somebody. So you do say, I'm going to hurt myself just so you can see somebody. And then you're in that room being punished more and, and it's more trauma. And then we're going to come home to your society. Like me, I'm lucky. I have a lot, a lot of support, but what about those people that are put through that system where there is no accountability and the things that happen to them horrible and they don't have all the support I have? You know, what happens to them because they might come home and be trauma triggered by something and recommit a new crime. People don't realize society is so much safer when you treat us like human beings while we're incarcerated. I, I'm not I, saying I, give us candy and, and goodies and all that, but I'm saying treat us like human beings. Don't cage us like animals and don't hold our families hostage. Let them not have to pay so much for phone calls. My mother paid so much money for phone calls for 23 years. There's so many injustices. God let us live through these things so that we can come home and tell you and make you aware. Cause then once you know, you can't unknow, you know, you have to do something about it. No, I, I thank you for that. And you know, just so that you know, I, I have been a proponent of doing something about the phone calls. So um, thank you. you know, I do, uh, you know, well, I thank you for coming here to testify and, you know, seems that you're doing, you're doing well and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Representative. Are there comment or question from other members of the committee? Comment or question? If not, Tracy, it's uh, good to see you again. 
Uh, nice I know you said you're nervous, but you don't seem like the first time I heard you say that. You seem like you have really adjusted well to this testifying thing. So, well, I'm getting seasoned. Five years doing it, so yeah. <laughs> five years yeah. home, five years telling everything that I know to help make all the changes I can. Well, thank you for doing that, and uh, keep up the good work. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, I, I see that Bianca Tylek is in. So, uh, Bianca, you have th your three minutes. Great, thank you so much. Um, hello, thank you so much, chairs, uh, staff room and Winfield for uh, for having us testify and for being here. Um, with that, I want to um, jump in. I'm gonna, you know, I think that families have been making the case today for why um, we need to support SB 972. Um, so where I'm testifying as the executive director at Worth Rises, um, having passed bills like 972 and other jurisdiction, um, but in support of 972. And I think families have made the case. So with my three minutes, I wanna spend a little bit more time on the logistics of the specific bill and also answering some questions that I heard come up from representatives um, and senators sort of throughout this hearing. So I wanna say specifically um, that SB uh, 972 would save directly impacted families in Connecticut, uh, families that are uh, facing the incarceration of a loved one, um, at least uh, $12 million a year, but probably closer to $15 million when you also consider all the additional fees that are often not discussed. Um, I wanna note that there was a representative who asked what the percentage of the kickback was that the state was getting. Um, the state is getting a 68% commission um, back uh, off of the cost of calls. That amounts to roughly $7 million a year. Um, to understand how that money is actually distributed, uh, 350, a thousand of that goes to the Department of Corrections, as the commissioner mentioned earlier today. 2.2 million of that goes to CJIS, and 4.4 million of that goes to the Judicial Department. Um, it's important to know that actually the Judicial Department filed uh, testimony. Um, generally supporting the intent of the bill, um, SB 972 earlier, did note that they would need $2.2 million to support probation officers. So I wanna be very clear. Um, they asked for $2.2 million, um, which is half of what the judicial department actually gets off of um, phone calls uh, to support specifically 28 probation jobs. Um, I wanna also note there was somebody who asked about the contract. Um, the original contract would date actually was supposed to end um, at the end of this month. It's been extended for one year. Uh, rates have been slightly negotiated. Um, those new rates would take Connecticut from being 50th in the country for the affordability of prison phone calls to 45th. Um, this is not a meaningful uh, negotiation and actually is, is pretty abysmal. Um, the edits that we would specifically ask uh, for the bill is one, for it to go into effect much sooner. Um, the bill was noted as going into effect uh, or currently has language that goes into effect 2022, which feels a, a very, very long time from now, uh, October, I should say, of 2022. Uh, we think that should be October of 2021. And also supporting um, Senator Looney's uh, uh, testimony that it should also have a floor minimum of how much time people should get. And we recommend that be 90 minutes. And finally, I just want to also say um, that the coalition behind the bill to uh, make phone calls free, which we know has been moving now for a few years, has grown really dramatically this last year um, to also include child advocates, victims' rights advocates, and even industry, AT&T and Verizon, filed testimony in support of this bill. And lastly, I just want to say that we also stand in support of bill um, SB 1059. Um, and I will use my time that way. And happy to answer all of the questions because if there's um, questions regarding the contract or questions regarding how this Thank looks you. other places, you know, that's sort of um, okay. definitely things we can answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's a comment or a question from Representative Callahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Bianca. I'm that state rep who asked the question. So. I, I know. Hi, Representative <laughs> Callahan. I wanted thank to make sure I got to your question. Thank you. I appreciate you coming in informed. Um, I will just say that it was about 3.2 million that judicial gets there. They have a shortfall of about 2.2 because uh, uh, appropriations was going to uh, give them a million of that 3.2. Uh, and the reason I brought up those points is because there's a lot of, I, not that I'm saying I agree with this, this uh, outrageous fee that's been charged to inmates and, and, and we were second worst in the country, as I mentioned earlier behind Maine. And uh, it, it's just, uh, there's some good work being done with the money as long as we, I think that judicial can get that money from appropriate appropriations in another way. Uh, 
because Connecticut does have one of the lowest recidivism rates. And I don't wanna see us going backwards is the reason I'm bringing this up because several jails have been closed in Connecticut and we're continuing to close jails. And that's because there's community supervision programs like probation and parole who are handling that. So as long as, as, long as there's a balance there and I'm not, I wasn't advocating for these outrageous fees just so you understand. Totally understand that. I wanted to like obviously specifically answer that question. Now I just do want to just add that um, to clarify actually what I also want to add. So actually in 2019, I have the numbers right in front of me right now, judicial collected 4.4 million. The reason that I mentioned that figure, the 2.2 that they're asking, and you're right, it's addition to the 1 million that the governor's budget currently has put in. So that gets you to the 3.2. The reason I wanted to note that though is because what they're asking for is 3.2 million and not the 4.4 that they usually get. So the reason I think that's important is because we don't want this fiscal note to be inflated. Um, there isn't a fiscal note yet. There needs to be, obviously, we do know that, like, you know, we are hoping just, as you said, Rep. Callahan, that that money does come from appropriations and can fill in that gap. But let's not try to fill in a $4.4 million gap when judicial is telling us they only need $3.2 million. Um, and so it's those kind of like discrepancies that we do want to um, address. And the one other thing regarding the fiscal note, I'll just note on that, which is that we have done the estimate having done this in multiple other jurisdictions, New York City, um, San Francisco and San Diego, um, that we that the actual fiscal note for providing phone calls is one point three million dollars. It is not the five million dollars this company is making off of our families every year. Um, and so this total fiscal note should really be closer to seven or eight um, and not, you know, the 14 or 15 that okay. it claimed last time. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Callahan. Is, uh, are there comments or questions from other members of the committee? Comments or questions? Uh, I don't see any, Bianca. I wanna thank you for uh, coming today, offering your testimony, uh, answering some questions and uh, for your efforts to uh, pass this uh, legislation or legislation like it, like in, in past years. Um, thank you again, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much, Senator, take care. All right, next we have Kevnisha Boyd, Carl Testa, and Gordon uh, Lied. Uh, is Kevnisha Boyd in? Yes, sir. Can you hear and see me okay? I can hear and see you. You have your three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Dear Chairs Winfield, Stastrom, Vice Chairs Kayser, Blumenthal, Rankin members Kissel and Fishbean, and members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Kevnisha Boyd. I live in Hamden and I'm a board member of Stop Solitary CT. I would like to express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059. I have been negatively impacted by the dehumanization of incarcerated people as a former mental health counselor for Department of Corrections. The job was causing me to lose my sanity, integrity and morals as a result of the witness abuse and lack of external oversight. The poor standards of care conflicted with my professional ethics as a licensed professional counselor. In 2017, two years into my career with DOC, I began to seek therapy to address symptoms of trauma I was experiencing as a result of the toxic work environment. In March 2019, Robbie Talbot, who I got to know as his assigned mental health counselor in DOC, was found chained dead in isolated confinement in a cell. You heard from Robbie's mother, Colleen Law, earlier today. Robbie needed a clinical intervention, not excessive punishment. I was forced to resign after his death because I could no longer suffer while working for a department that was choosing to provide poor standards of care, causing me to fear being sued for medical malpractice. As a healthcare staff, I have ethical obligations to do no harm, which requires a humanitarian mindset. According to a study conducted by the Correctional Supervisor Council, correctional staff are exposed to the highest level of trauma exceeding the national average. In addition, correctional officers die 15 years younger than any other Connecticut resident. Correctional staff have limited resources for rehabilitation lending themselves as the primary tools for rehabilitation. The mental health and physical wellness of staff is the route to building safer and more therapeutic institutions. 
The foundation of my support is established in establishing oversight and accountability. Lack of surveillance, public view, and oversight makes correctional institutions more susceptible to abuse and neglect. A rigid chain of command like the one that exists does not support a safe and secure procedure to report misconduct and or grievances from incarcerated people. Through external oversight and accountability, incarcerated people will be safer, correctional staff will be safer, all fostering a healthier environment. We must humanize the DOC system, the practices, and most importantly, we must humanize the people. I urge you to vote for SB 1059 and in doing so, protect the lives of incarcerated people as well as DOC staff and their families across the state. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, are there comments or questions from members of the committee? Uh, Representative Callahan, is your hand still up or do you have a, a question this time? It must still be up. I'll see if I can get rid of that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Representative Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hello, Kenesha. I, I'm curious about the um, procedure for filing a grievance. Um, we heard earlier from another former DOC staff member who had a similar reaction to some of the um, procedures that she was required to uphold. And she also mentioned trauma. So I'm, I'm very interested in your experience. Can you please tell me if you tried to file a grievance um, about, about something that you might have witnessed? Yes, thank you for the question, Representative Palmer. I do appreciate it. So I want to, I'll talk about both sides. I'll talk about the procedure for reporting misconduct, uh, possibly from a staff member, and also the grievance procedure from incarcerated people. So I, I worked for New Haven Correctional, which is the, the local county jail for four years from 2015 to 2019. And so the grievance procedure for incarcerated people consists of filling out a form. And there's a lot of times where forms are not made available either intentionally or unintentionally. Incarcerated people are then asked to put this form into the, a non-secure mailbox. That mailbox is basically collected from any staff member. There is no real accountability or operational system to ensure that the grievances are upheld so I unfortunately have witnessed grievances disappear, become shredded, um, and a, a lot of unethical practices. My personal experiences with my attempts to report staff misconduct, uh, what I mentioned to you in my oral testimony is there is a very rigid chain of command that aligns with the military model that Department of Corrections uses. With that military model comes a very strict and toxic blue wall of silence uh, for the lack of terms. And with that blue wall of silence comes a real sense of losing your identity and really conforming to a group of people that oftentimes neglect the basic needs. And so that rigidness causes a feeling of who can I trust to report this misconduct? Who can I trust to fully facilitate or bring this misconduct to a higher chain of command? And from a personal standpoint, those reports go nowhere. They go nowhere. I personally have tried to report staff misconduct that was resulting in uh, incarcerated people being confined unwarranted. Um, it was really resulting in a lot of incarcerated people, mental health decompensating. So on multiple occasions, staff misconduct doesn't go anywhere because a part of the administrative directive with grievances and misconduct, there's a big part that says discretion. Th that is a big open window. So, so who assesses discretion? And that leaves a lot of opportunity, again, for medical negligence, um, negligence collectively, I'll just say. Do you, do you agree that uh, the prison system is a paramilitary kind of a system? It, it is, it is, it, it, it is not my opinion. I believe that the uh, current Department of Correction staff or even past Department of Correction staff can confirm that uh, the rankings are military based, captain, lieutenant, 
um, the uniforms, the keys, the boots, uh, even when a, an incarcerated person may be exhibiting um, a, a mental health crisis. Uh, there's a procedure called a cell extraction. That includes military gear, uh, yielded guards, masks, boots, the marching, the yelling. It is very, very military based and that really ensues a toxic work environment. It, it doesn't feel safe for staff or incarcerated people. I, I don't know, of course, what, where on that chain of command your uh, job classification falls, but I'm just wondering, did you, have you compared notes with people who ranked higher than you did, and did they experience a similar um, response to lack of accountability? Were, were their complaints similarly squashed or magically disappeared? I can't speak to higher rank. So as a mental health counselor, uh, the healthcare staff and correctional staff have different rankings and very different operational systems that, that ultimately do cause a lot of conflict. Because as healthcare, that's a medical model. Department of Corrections, again, does not operate on a, a medical model or any type of uh, therapeutic model other than the military safety and security model. So I can't speak to in comparison to my experiences as a healthcare worker compared to um, a lieutenant or a captain, but I will generally say, I'll, I'll specifically say for the healthcare workers, we often felt a conflict in terms of who can we go to to advocate for our legal ethics? Because again, worst case scenario, an incarcerated person pursues a lawsuit, the Department of Correction staff will be protected. Um, I, I would still have a licensing board to answer to if the lawsuit were pursued where I wouldn't be protected by those same models because I've taken a, a separate oath to do no harm and to follow a very um, humanitarian type of policy. So it, it kind of sounds as though the people who run the front line of doing the care also were at the most risk for the negative evaluations. Is that, am I hearing you correctly on that? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, how, how would you like to see the, the uh, grievance procedure strengthened? I would like to see the grievance procedure strengthened um, on both sides in terms of some security, in terms of an external body where staff and incarcerated people can say, I've gone through the chain of command and my needs are still not being met. So from a healthcare standpoint, that would mean a great deal to say, my ethics are being compromised, right? And that I can safely go to this external body where I don't have to necessarily worry about um, my report being disclosed to other people, which then would cause an extreme level of uh, being ostracized. And that doesn't feel good when you're in a small facility and your coworkers are your allies. So my, and my last question, Mr. Chair, um, it sounds to me as though you went into this line of work with a, to do some good and, and yet you had a different kind of expectation. Would you just say quickly, yes or no, that's Sound like that happened to you, right? That's why you that is very that is very accurate. My goal was to heal uh, from the inner city. Both my parents were incarcerated. I put myself into a lot of debt. I got my master's degree specifically in forensic psychology because I wanted to work in a prison. And when I got there, I was not able to do that because my own mental health was compromised. Well, um, I, I, I admire uh, so much the work that you did, and I, I think it's a terrible loss to, to the correction system that it wasn't the fit that you hoped. So thank you for your work, and, I, and I'm sorry that you had that experience. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Representative Palmer. Thank you, uh, Representative Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have no questions, Kavanish. I just wanted to thank you for coming forward and sharing your lived experience and what it is you saw and how it impacted you as a worker to give some kind of definition or depth to what inmates are going through or people that are currently incarcerated. So I just wanted to commend you on that and thank you for being with us and for sharing. Dory is thank powerful, you. very powerful. Thank you and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Porter. Comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? 
Uh, I don't see any. Thank you, Kevinisha, for joining us and providing us with your testimony. I uh, hope you can enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Have a good evening. You as well. Uh, next, we have Carl Testa, followed by Gordon Lyde and Floyd ha Hartfield. Carl Testa. Hello, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Carl Testa. I'm a resident of New Haven, Connecticut, and I would like to express my support for Senate Bill 1059. While I have no direct uh, experience with incarceration, I have been moved today listening to the testimonies of people with direct experience within the system as formerly incarcerated individuals, those currently incarcerated, former corrections officers, and family and friends of those impacted. I fundamentally believe that all of our faiths are intertwined and interconnected. Neuroscience tells us that our need to connect socially with other human beings is as fundamental to our basic needs as food, water, and shelter. Extended deprivation of social connection is damaging to our bodies, which encompasses both our physical and our emotional well being. Connecticut's use of solitary confinement has been determined to be torture by the United Nations. For these reasons, it is imperative that we make sure we end solitary confinement in Connecticut. The United Nations Special Rapporteur has noted that Connecticut's use of solitary confinement triggers and exacerbates psychological suffering, in particular in inmates who may have experienced previous trauma or have mental health conditions or psychosocial disabilities. This use of solitary confinement is not in the interest of the public because it increases inmates' trauma, reduces their ability to heal, makes it more difficult for them to rejoin society in the future. And has been noted numerous times today, the mental health of corrections officers is also put at risk by having to enact this policy. Senate Bill 1059 will end extreme isolation, end abusive restraints, protect social bonds, promote the wellness of correctional officers, ensure data collection on the amount of time spent in a cell, and ensure oversight and accountability. We all have a responsibility to make sure we are enacting policies that are humane and promote healing and reentry. I strongly support Senate Bill 1059 and urge you to favorably vote the bill out of Judi Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? Uh, I do not see any. I want to thank you for joining us and, and sticking around and offering your testimony. Hope you can enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, next, we have Gordon Lyde, fought, followed by Floyd Hartfield. Uh, and then Diane Keith. Uh, is Gordon Lyde in? Uh, Floyd Hartfield. Um, I see Mr. Hartfield on the list. Yes, uh, Hartfield's here. Floyd Hartfield's yes. here. All right, you have your three minutes. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to the Senator, the Republicans. I'm sorry. The representatives, I'm here to testify um, with the act, the Protect Act of SB 1059. I am a um, a minister at Phillips Metropolitan CME Church, and I go out prior to the pandemic. We would go to prisons and talk to the uh, people that were incarcerated. Right now, we're still writing letters to people that are incarcerated, and um, Although I have no personal experience, but I do hear uh, what was going on in there uh, with guys that, or people that were in solitary and it was very inhumane for me for, uh, they were de dehumanizing these people, um, putting them in restraints for 23 hours, locking them up with one hour of daylight, uh, meals, maybe every other day, you know, it's just for me, I have to deal with the back end of it. My first and foremost is the person that's incarcerated. It's, it's their well-being. Secondly, the communities that they come into are the communities that I go into. And if they're not prepared from being incarcerated, that's where it starts. And I don't see them being prepared for society. So when they come out, they're damaged. And they're severely damaged. And some are broken. Um, if you take 100, 50 are, 50 are damaged and broken. And um, I, I just want to address this 
and, and show my support for what has been transpiring and how unethical it is and how unfair it is. And, and um, we're just gonna keep having a revolving door if we don't address the issues that are inside because mental health issues are very serious. And that's what's been going on. Um, and I just wanna share my uh, support in, in the bill, as I said, the SB uh, 1059. Thank you all for your, uh, your time. Thank you, Mr. Hartfield. Uh, comment or questions from members of the committee? Comment or questions? I do not see any. I want to thank you, Mr. Hartfield, for joining us today and offering your testimony. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Diane Keefe, followed by Randall States and Chris Hurd. Uh, Diane Keefe, are you? I see you on the list. I am. I am. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Diane Keefe. I live in Norwalk, Connecticut. I want to thank the members of the committee for listening to all this testimony. I'm going to read to you a decision made by the Wilton Quaker meeting, uh, which is one of many Quaker meetings in Connecticut. As Quakers, we have a strong belief in the possibility of positive transformation within each person. Our long history of involvement in correctional facilities throughout the country with the Alternatives to Violence Project gives us direct experience of such transformation. We believe that the way people, the way we treat people affects their ability to connect with that of God within. Criminologists have demonstrated that solitary confinement is not an effective tool for rehabilitation. The use of solitary confinement creates permanent psychological injury to incarcerated people and could impact their capacity to make positive changes. A group, a group of Quakers from many meetings in Connecticut recently published an op-ed in the Connecticut Mirror opposed to solitary confinement, referring to our recognition that centuries ago, our religious practices were considered a model for what became penitentiaries. Now, with knowledge from modern psychiatry and direct experience volunteering in prisons, we are aware of the damage done by prolonged social isolation. I'm testifying in support of SB 1059 uh, for that reason. I'm gonna step away from my written testimony at this point because uh, there's uh, another interesting juxtaposition here, uh, which you probably haven't heard this perspective before on Senate Bill 972, but since I was listening to other people testify, I recognize that it was the state benefiting from institutionalized racism. Uh, I was formerly a Wall Streeter. I ran the Pax World High Yield Fund for seven years after founding it in 1999. And uh, I had had a long career on the trading floor in the high yield sector before that. And private prison companies were one of the issuers, uh, one of the groups of issuers in the high yield bond market. And the, um, the scuttlebutt on the trading floor was this sector was called forced lodging. Um, okay, that is, that is not funny. Uh, and while I was a um, portfolio manager at Pax World Funds, one of these companies that sold directly and made higher profits as a result of selling services into correctional institutions was offered to us as portfolio managers at Pax World. And we, of course, rejected it, even though if, if it was just listed, it had an innocuous telecommunications name on it. Um, we were not going to be making usurious profits over monopoly control of contracts with state governments to sell to people who in general come from the lowest socioeconomic position in society and taking uh, usurious profits from them is, is just a really unethical business practice. So I just wanted to share um, that, that I clearly support 972 as well and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keith. Are there comments or questions from members of the committee? Comments or questions? Uh, I see none. Uh, I wanna thank you for uh, joining us this uh, afternoon and offering your testimony. I hope you can enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, have a good day. Uh, you too. Uh, next, we'll hear from Randall States, followed by uh, Chris Herb, followed by uh, Judy Miko. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Go ahead. You have your three minutes. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for your attention and your time. My name is Randall States. I'm a resident of New Haven, a civil engineer by profession, and I'm here to support SB 1059, the PROTECT Act. 
Solitary confinement is wrong. It's obviously harmful to the incarcerated and ineffective to society. Solitary confinement should be illegal in Connecticut. And the use of solitary has been discontinued in other states and is illegal in many countries. As a civil engineer, I'm trained to make observation, analyze what works, identify inefficiencies. I'm professionally bound to protect the public and provide services for public welfare. Solitary confinement causes harm. The harm is obvious to the prison, imprisoned and their families. The depth and long lasting effects of that harm may not be as obvious, but it's clear. No one looks back at their time in solitary and thinks, yeah, that was tough at the time, but overall, I, I think I learned from that. No, it just doesn't happen. Solitary confinement creates more anger, creates more damage and more fear. As an engineer, I model systems to understand what happens on a small scale, then scale that up to look at larger effects. On a small scale, if my daughter got into a fight or flagrantly violated school rules, I could lock her in the tool shed, in the basement, the bathroom for a day, a week, or a month. That's not going to help. She will not learn from it. Of course not. She'll come out angry, depressed, more likely to get into another fight, create more havoc. Following our current system of using solitary confinement, if she reacted like that, she should be locked up again for a longer time, maybe handcuffed, shackled. Think that's gonna correct her behavior? Scale that up to include thousands of men and women over months and years of solitary confinement. This is wrong. Solitary confinement does not create better citizens. It does not reduce recidivism. Solitary does not teach or enhance job skills for future employment. It does not teach people to read, write, or communicate better. It serves no corrective function. Solitary is meant to cause harm. We have to do better. Stop solitary now. Pass SB 1059, the PROTECT Act. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? Uh, I do not see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us today and offering your testimony. I hope you can enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Uh, next, we have Chris Herb, fo followed by uh, Judy Meikle, followed by Ramon Garcia. Is Chris Herb in? Yes. Hello. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Chris Herb. I'm the president of the Connecticut Energy Marketers Association. We represent 600 family-owned home heating oil and propane companies, and our Motor Fuels members own, operate, and distribute to gasoline to over 1,000 convenience stores throughout the state. We're submitting this testimony in support of HB 5125. As local family-owned businesses designated as essential, we work throughout COVID-19 to ensure that homes and businesses could stay warm and that first responders and the public could fill up when needed. Despite economic challenges, our businesses remained open to provide critical fuel, HVAC services, groceries, cleaning supplies, PPP, over-the-counter medications, and other products to our customers. Our members modified their business operations to protect their employees and customers from contracting COVID-19. Unfortunately, the precautions that family-owned businesses took may not protect them from political lawsuits, alleging that Customers or employees that may have been infected with COVID-19 got it from working or doing business with us. They cannot afford to face the unfounded lawsuits that will potentially cost them tens of thousands of dollars, compromising their ability to continue their operations. Essential businesses like the ones I represent have acted as good Samaritans and should not need to worry about being sued for providing critical services during this, that critical time. The hardworking people who work for our heating oil and propane members made life-saving repairs to heating equipment that was failing and made fuel deliveries without missing a beat. Employers incurred great expense to purchase personal protective equipment and implement COVID-19 mitigation plans to keep their employees and customers as safe as possible. 
Our motor fuels members and employees faced hundreds of people every day to make sure that they had groceries and gasoline. Without these services, it would have been impossible for our nurses, doctors, EMTs, and other first responders to get to work. If the local gas station closed during the shutdown, it would have had a devastating effect on the communities that you represent. Now we are faced with the potential for litigation if someone gets sick or dies from COVID. As taxpayers and employers who went to great lengths to provide essential services as safely as possible, we need to be protected from lawsuits that could do economic harm. While we strongly support HB 5125, we ask that the language of the bill be modified to expand protections that the bill seeks to provide beyond the premises of the entity. Licensed HVAC professionals and fuel delivery drivers spend very little time at our offices. The vast majority work at your constituents' homes and businesses in your districts, which necessitates that the bill be expanded to cover work situations that are off campus. These essential businesses that answered the call to serve their communities when Connecticut needed us the most um, needed reliable, need reasonable liability protections. The bill does not cover negligent businesses, but it does protect the family businesses that were there for, for your constituents in their time of need. Uh, please support 5125 with the suggested changes that I've had. And just for instance, it was a little bit of a moving target. Oh, Mr. Hope, look, look, your time is up, let, and I see there's a question. So let's let's see about the questions. Uh, Representative Stastrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just real briefly, sir, have any of your um, member businesses in Connecticut been sued by a customer saying they contracted COVID while on your, um, well on that business's premises? I'm not aware of any filed lawsuits. I'm aware of threats of being sued. Okay. But, but those threats were not followed through with an actual attorney taking the case and filing a complaint they may have been i I'm, I'm i'm not i'm not aware of it at this moment but they they may have okay so so is the sorry so is the answer yes you're aware of lawsuits that have been filed or no you're not aware? no i'm not okay all right thank you thank you representative Stastrom. uh representative fishbach thank you mr chairman oh, good afternoon sir um, you were mentioning another aspect that you wanted to bring to our attention uh, of this bill. If you could, uh, what, were you, what did you want to tell us? Yeah, I was just, I thought I had a little extra time. So thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to bring up, for instance, some of the guidance that our, our small family owned businesses, it, when I tell you I represent fuel marketers, we don't represent Exxon Mobil or Shell. We represent literally family owned convenience stores that sell gasoline or the heating oil dealer uh, or propane dealer. And, um, Guidance that was initially provided by the CDC um, and by the state of Connecticut was a bit of a moving target. And, and I'll just give you a really simple one. Um, for instance, uh, if originally we were told if we had masks that we should donate them to hospitals and to uh, first responders, which our members did. We literally sent PPE that would have been used with our employees to hospitals and other first responders to protect them when the, when the shortage was there. So if, if we were to be sued now after doing something that we were being instructed to do and later on being told you had to wear a mask, you could see how that could be problematic in a court of law. I'm not a lawyer, but I could see um, being twisted up and being, uh, being questioned to say, well, if you reasonably had this and you didn't provide it to your employees to protect them with a mask, why did you give it away? And shouldn't you be held liable for not doing everything in your power? That's the sort of thing that we're concerned about. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And that's perhaps why it's more prudent to make those decisions, you know, through the legislative processes, as opposed to by executive order or without the public being able to. Sure. So I appreciate that. But thank, yeah. thank, you. thank you, Representative. Comment or question from other members of the committee? Comments? A question. Uh, seeing none, Ms. Harvey, it's good to see you again. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope you can enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next, we have Judy Miko, followed by Ramon Garcia and Nicole Packett. Uh, is Judy Miko in? I'm here. Oh, yes, you have your three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Winfield and Stastron, and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Judy Miko, and I'm a resident of New Haven. I'm also a member of the Religious Society of Friends, where I've spent many years doing prison ministry, um, visiting men in prison, worshiping with men in prison, corresponding with men in prison. And I'm here to express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059. 
This legislation ends extreme isolation for all incarcerated people in Connecticut. I know this is the right thing to do because I've listened to and heard the testimony of people who have survived such isolation. Not everyone survives as we've heard today. Um, in order to convince the world of the devastating harms of isolation, survivors and their family members relive their trauma through telling their stories. I've seen people trembling from fear and anxiety, knees almost buckling, sweat pouring down their faces at the impact of recalling their experiences. And I believed their lived experience to be torture. Solitary confinement isolates people for the majority of the day and deprives them of resources and meaningful human contact. It causes dire mental health problems with people engaging in serious self-harming behaviors and, it in, and increased rates of suicide. And the harms of solitary confinement falls disproportionately on black and brown people. As a Quaker, I have um, trained as, as, as a facilitator with a program called the Alternatives to Violence Project. And this program was developed by um, a number of different constituencies, but it, those included um, people inside in uh, correctional facilities, started back in the 80s. And this project um, is, through that project, I have witnessed positive transformations when we treat people with respect and connect with their humanity. I know prisons to be engines of violence, and I know that the process of isolation, of extreme isolation, boosts that machine, exacerbating mental health issues and diminishing pe people's ability to successfully rejoin their communities. I know that the, 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 the violence inside prison also impacts correctional staff and, and that isolation is counterproductive for everyone. We, we've heard from so many people today that what we need is a change in culture. SB 1059 has transformative potential, ending the use of extreme isolation in Connecticut and ensuring a focus on minimum standards. It addresses oversight of facilities and working conditions for correctional staff and will improve wellness for both incarcerated people and staff. Formally, um, yes. Your time has expired if you could summarize. Okay. Um, we need to, we need formerly incarcerated advocates battle panic attacks and depression caused by isolation and then inflict further pain on themselves as they share their testimony in the struggle to change hearts and minds. I pray their struggle will not be in vain. In solidarity, I strongly support SB 1059 and urge you to favorably vote the bill out of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or questions? I do not see any. It's uh, good to see you again. Uh, thank you for your consistent uh, work on these matters, and I hope you can enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ramon Garcia, Nicole Packett, and Tasha Blanco. Uh, uh, Ramon Garcia, Nicole Packett. Um, I believe that's saw Nicole Packett. I'm here. Up oh, there, you are. You have your three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Winfield, Representative Ostrom, Senator Hill, Representative Fishbein, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Nicole Paquette. I'm a licensed funeral director and the legislative co-chair of the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association, CFDA, which represents approximately 220 funeral homes throughout the state. Thank you for raising HB 5125, an act concerning the provision of temporary immunity from liability to entities that have safely operated during the COVID-19 pandemic, which seeks to protect certain entities from civil liability resulting from one's exposure to COVID-19. CFDA submits this testimony in support of the proposed bill. Providing temporary immunity from civil liabilities for certain entities, including funeral homes, is sensible and logical. The pandemic outbreak was caused by a new coronavirus that very easily spread from person to person. The risk of exposure warrants inherent responsibilities and prudent measures to be taken by a minimum of two parties and contingent upon all parties in a shared environment to uphold uncompromised compliance. One, an entity to provide, promote, and sustain a safe environment 
one void of gross negligence and willful misconduct, and two, one to navigate such entities environment and conduct oneself in a safe manner. Our funeral home member firms have and continue to safely operate to serve the communities in Connecticut through times of crisis and public health emergencies. Funeral directors and embalmers are cognizant of public health and their importance, the responsibilities for their dedicated employees, the care of the decedents and the families and friends who mourn them. Despite upgraded cl cleaning of our facilities, best practices, and mitigating and mandated measures, this invisible foe by nature thrives upon easy transmission with a brief time of exposure. It is not a crime to laugh, sing, speak, cough, sneeze, yawn, or breathe, a necessary bodily function. These natural actions are scientifically accepted to produce respiratory droplets. By such means, an infection can transmit via airborne exposure either from a symptomatic or an unsuspecting asymptomatic person. Resulting loss, damage, injury, or death can and has already taken a devastating toll. Many of us look to the vaccinations available to finally eradicate our common viral enemy. However, there are still unknown days ahead and HB 5125 will provide a steady beneficial hand to Ms. allow Beckett? funeral home your, your time has expired, if you could summarize. Sure. Um, HB 5125 will provide a steady and beneficial hand that will allow funeral home establishments to remain operational and continue to serve their communities uh, during COVID-19. Um, we thank you for raising the bill and uh, we ask you to uh, continue with support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee. Comment or question. I do not see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us this uh, afternoon and providing us with your testimonies. Uh, have, a, have a great day. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, next Tasha Blanco, uh, followed by Michael Diamond, Pamela Hovland, and Jovan Lumpkin. Is Tasha Blanco in? I am here. Can folks hear me? We can hear and see you. You have your three. Well, we could see you. Uh, you, you may want to restart. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tasha Blanco, and I'm the current co-director of Connecticut Bail Fund. Our mission is to reduce the direct harms caused by criminalization, incarceration, and deportation while building power among the people and the families in our community who are most impacted by these systems. I am here in support of Bill 972 to provide free calls and communication for those on the inside and their families. As someone who has had my own experience in the necessity in keeping my husband connected to his children for five years and navigating the inflated cost of prisons in the form of payment of phone calls, commissary, balancing my mortgage, other bills, and putting food on the table. I believe charging these high call rates for phone calls is unacceptable for our families, communities, and our loved ones incarcerated in Connecticut. We are at a critical point of where it is necessary for this change. I have a recording I would like to play from Andre Pierce at Chester Correctional Facility, a loved one on the inside speaking about the importance of being connected to family. He talks about building a bridge for those in prison as to their loved ones. Um, and I can pull that up now.
ma'am, I, I think we, was that the end of the recording? No, there seems to be some trouble with it. Um, give me one second. Okay. Um, if I do not get it to play, I think that you hear the eloquent words of Andre speaking to being separated from his families and the importance of this bill. And it's a critical time for us to make a change here in Connecticut to keep our families connected. Um, I can resubmit this. It seems like there's just a problem with um, communication all of a sudden, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but as you hear from my testimony and also Andre's testimony, it's very important for us to make a change and uh, create free calls for our loved ones who are on the inside. So Thank that would be uh, my summary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from the committee? If not, um, appreciate your uh, your advocacy and taking the time with us today. Um, next up will be Michael Diamond. I'm here. Um, thank you all. My name is Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee members. My name is Michael Diamond. I am uh, one of the managing partners of Affinico. We're a janitorial firm here in Connecticut. Um, we have roughly about a thousand employees in Connecticut. And uh, I was past president of my industry association, which is an international group. So I'm familiar with our industry quite extensively uh, from around the country and a number of contractors in the state of Connecticut as well. I'm here in support of Bill uh, 5125. I believe that you know we need immunity as we go in and service locations. There is no way of telling where COVID's coming from. And our industry plays an essential role in helping the economy reopen by bringing uh, and making environments clean again to have people come back. Part of the challenges our industry faces with as it addresses COVID and especially around immunity is we've been in most of our contracts, certainly we sanitize and we uh, uh, clean ba bathroom surfaces as well as break areas. But a lot of the other areas in the buildings that we take care of we're simply cleaning for dirt. And there is a difference between cleaning for dirt versus cleaning for sanitizing and killing germs. So the scope of works in the majority of our contracts do not include sanitizing. Uh, on top of that, we now have customers that have asked us to come in, whether they be schools we service, uh, office buildings, uh, public transit sites. They've asked us to come in and do extra sanitization. And uh, we're doing that, but we could clean or sanitize a building uh, today and an hour later, an occupant can come in and uh, spread the germ again. So we have no way of knowing how the disease is spreading and if our work is responsible for preventing it fully because of the way it spreads and where how it can reoccur very simply. Um, the cost of sanitizing, also the margins are very low. And what my fear is, is that as, our, as my competitors and peers uh, work to service a building, the margins, uh, you know, to get sued for $100,000 over someone's medical issues, um, when the profit margins on a $1,000 or $2,000 job are very low, I think a lot of companies will opt not to perform those services, and that will prevent co companies and buildings from being ready to reopen the economy in Connecticut as we come back to work. The other aspect I would say is we're not in control of the protocols within the buildings. As customers apply mask uh, requirements or, or enforce mask uh, requirements as well as hand washing and other things. It's not within our control. So we really can't be sure how they're taking care of the facility after we sanitize it or, or clean it. Our insurance is also, uh, our general liability insurance have gotten so expensive that many contractors have increased their deductibles to high limits. And if we're burdened with having to cover the cost of any lawsuits, we're gonna end up maxing out and possibly going out of business, some of the contractors. And there's so many lower income families that depend on our industry for jobs that if our businesses close, um, there'll be a, a, a meaningful impact to the jobs in the state. Thank you, sir. Uh, last, lastly, our, I'm sorry, go I couldn't ahead. hear you. Go ahead. Lastly, our, our clients, the property managers and the building managers of the world have similar issues with their insurance. And so they're burdening us with the legal language to take the burden on it. And if these if this changes in terms of having them having to add scope of work uh, to have us cover their li their immunity issues or liability issues, it's just gonna create a, a, a huge change in the cost of real estate for communities and helping hurting come back and reopen. Let me ask you on that point, because I think this is actually one of my 
fears with this bill, right? Is that it, it in some respects, it, it provides a false sense of security in my mind. You know, I keep hearing folks say, well, we're gonna be immune from suit. Um, I don't know if your lawyer or have law degree or if, if your general counsel has looked at this language, but you know, I, I practice in this area. I do civil litigation defense work for a living, right? Um, this bill doesn't prevent a lawsuit from being filed. In fact, it puts the burden or the onus on a defendant in the lawsuit to prove as an affirmative defense that they have substantially complied with CDC guidelines. Well, actually not even CDC guidelines. It doesn't say CDC guidelines. It says public health guidelines. Um, so that's kind of my fear. So if, I don't know if you have a response to that or, or not, but it seems to me that as somebody going in cleaning a building, um, you know, through this language, if you are sued and you have to defend the lawsuit, um, you then have to show as the defendant in that lawsuit that you have substantially complied or your employees have substantially complied with um, those public health guidelines. And, and it sounds like, particularly in an instance where you weren't hired to go and sanitize, it's gonna be problematic to try to try to make that showing. Is that how you read this or you read it some with some different I way? think the challenge is twofold. I think, you know, right now, some of the buildings we service used to have a thousand occupants. There's 20 people coming to work every day, meaning the customers we service after. They need confidence to come back to work and they need cleaning companies like ours to be able to service that. And our companies, our company or many others are not going to want to do the work if we risk being having, even if we could win a lawsuit by showing that we've uh, uh, followed all the right protocols for our employees and for the people that we service, um, it's going to cost us a boatload of money to defend ourselves just to win. So it right. I, I, but what I'm saying is, is I think under you still need to make that showing under this bill. And I think the other, the other thing, I, to your point about folks coming back, and this is this is where I'm I'm failing to see the need for this legislation as drafted is. If the way this is currently written is as soon as the governor's public health emergency declaration expires, whatever that may be, I think right now it's scheduled for mid-April, right? I think the legislature may be coming in later this week to try to extend it. But if that doesn't get extended, the governor's public health declaration ends mid-April. Folks bring their employees back into you know an office building here in downtown Bridgeport on um in may right somebody claims they got sick after they went back to work in may because the building wasn't properly cleaned this bill doesn't cover that situation this bill only covers activity that occurred during the public health declaration so as soon as that declaration ends the bill becomes moot in some respect so there are obviously a lot of cases that occurred in the past 12 months I'm assuming this bill would give protection for people saying that this, those facilities were had immunity for the work that was done uh, last year sometime. And I understand that point. I just want to I just want to be clear because I don't want I don't want folks to get the false sense under this language that they are either not going to get sued at all or that um, this provides some protection on a going forward basis after the public health declaration because as I understand the way I understand the bill it covers the temporary period when the state has has been either shut down okay or I just, time. just want to make sure we're on that. yep representative Blumenthal excuse me thank you Mr. Chair and uh, thanks Mr. Diamond for being with us uh, here today just a couple brief questions I heard you mention earlier that uh, insurance companies had either been not underwriting the risk of lawsuits related to COVID-19 or charging you more. Could you clarify what exactly is going on, uh, at least in your experience with, ins with liability insurance in relation to COVID-19? They're covering the loss, they're covering the insurance. What's happened is the expense has gotten so big that companies like mine have taken on high deductible plans. And so in turn, the burden and the risk falls back to our company for, in our case, the first $10,000 of each case. 
So are they charging significantly more for premiums just generally based on the perceived threat of lawsuits related to COVID-19? Is that what they've informed you? I'm not aware of anything due to COVID. I could just tell you the insurance industry over the past 10 years has gotten harder and harder to get written and it's gotten more and more expensive. So companies like mine have taken on more of the risk to offset the increased cost. Okay, so uh, that increased cost is a general matter, not directly related to COVID-19 as far as you know. As far as I know, but there's nothing that tells me that if they have to pay out a huge amount of money because of liability claims, we're not gonna get hit for huge increases in 22 or 23. Okay, and are you specifically aware of any personal injury cases related to COVID-19 in Connecticut? I'm not aware of any cases in Connecticut specifically. I will tell you that I'm involved with a national lobbying group that's worked with the federal government about similar legislation about immunity. And I've been told, and I can get more information, I don't know how I would send it to you, but if you're interested that there's been some 800 plus lawsuits filed around the country over liability issues. Okay, well, uh, my understanding is that over that there are no cases in Connecticut and that uh, over the whole country, the number has been very, very small in terms of cases directly related to COVID-19 in the personal injury arena and that most have been kind of COVID-19 adjacent related to employment matters or contract matters or other similar things. Um, but in any event, I appreciate you coming here to testify and answering my questions. Thanks very much and thanks for Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, sir. Just wanna deal with that uh, prospective um, application of this that I believe the chairman was asking uh, you about, you know, looking at section B lines um, 21 through 23, you know, I read it to be that compliance was substantially with regard to the executive orders of the governor and the guidance of the Department of Public Health. So if the executive orders went away, then it wouldn't be prospective, right? That's the way I read this. Okay. I mean, you're you're probably better at interpreting it than I am. Are you a lawyer, sir? No, I am not. Okay. Okay. I just, um, it's a little, okay. Understand. I understand where you're coming from. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would add, as you talk about perspective, it's a challenge because there's what other infectious disease or variant becomes an issue in the future. So, you know, there may, at least with COVID, there may be some future consideration for this based on different variants. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, seeing no further questions, appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Um, next up will be Pamela Hovland. Um, Javon Lumpkin, Abby Steckel, Amani Pennant. Uh, Amani Pennant. Sorry about that, sir. Go ahead. Um, Good afternoon, Senator Whitfield, Representative Stastrom, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Imani Sharif Pennant. As a member of Qatar Center for Equity, Health, and Justice, I strongly support passage of SB 1059, the PROTECT Act. The PROTECT Act is monumental and changing the very fabric of how the inside of prisons operate. The immense ripple effects of passing a substantial bill like SB 1059 will indubitably show positive and productive byproducts in our communities. Right now, the insides of prisons are built to break as incarcerated individuals in every way, especially psychologically. It is a place built to take our faith and leave you uninspired. Prisons warp and dehumanize our natural way of interacting with people to the point you can't even function in normal society. Most people who go into prison end up worse than before they went in because of the trauma and mental health repercussions. One year ago today, in fact, I was sitting in solitary confinement in a, in a Connecticut department Corrections. I was placed in solitary confinement because I wrote a letter to the warden of McDougal Walker Correctional Institution trying to address concerns about the inhuman conditions we were subjected to. We were experiencing things like black mold in our showers, the shortening of our wreck, being fed expired food, and many other things. 
For the letter to the warden, I ended up getting signatures for every last incarcerated individual in my tier, which totaled up to over 115 signatures. A few days later, after sending the letter, I was placed in the box. The reasoning being I was inciting a riot, quote unquote. All I asked was to be treated like a human, and the, in, and the immediate response was unjustified and inhumane punishment. The correctional officers that placed me in the box didn't even want to do it in the first place, yet were forced to. This is another reason why I support the PROTECT Act as much as I do, because staff members alike are adversely affected by the punitive system. Staff members of the DOC are incentivized to treat their fellow human beings as animals and are told to go against their natural inclinations of compassion and care. Long-term effects of working a job like this corrodes the mental health state of, and well-being of those employed. So this is not just an issue concerning the humanity of people who are incarcerated, but an issue concerning the humanity of everyone in the DOC. At the onset of the legislative session, we at Qatar began our Cut, Shut, Invest campaign, which we seek to cut the number of people incarcerated in jails and prisons, cut the number of people on probation and parole, and in turn shut down prisons and ultimately invest in the communities most harmed by systematic racism and mass incarceration and then use those funds to use to go towards housing, healthcare, education, jobs, and more. At Catal, we support the PROTECT Act and we support Stop Solitary CT's ongoing rigorous efforts to see that Northern CI not only be closed, but demolished. We have to put an end to the harmful and torturous practices of Northern CI and ensure that those practices are not recycled in other parts of our correctional system. Um, I humbly and graciously thank you guys for your time today for giving me an opportunity to speak with you guys. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, Representative Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Pennant, hello. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, did you hear at the um, testimony of Ken Kevnisha Boyd by any chance? I don't know if you were um, listening. I think I just missed it. Okay. She, uh, she was a former corrections officer who told us about the um, disappearance of uh, petitions for, for redress of grievances. And I was wondering if, um, did you feel as though, you, you said that your incarceration or your being put into, into solitary was a direct result of the grievance that you were trying to bring forth. I think you said it was a petition of names, is that right? 100%. And were you told that that's why you were being put there they didn't say it's because you did something else that you didn't do they were actually telling you that's why that's, there was there was nothing else that i did do ma'am and um and the ticket that i received was inciting a riot um the only other ticket you can receive from that is getting signatures from everyone else and then that be taken as you know inciting a riot well that's that's outrageous um do you do you have any suggestions of how the grievance procedure could be improved? I don't know if you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you have ideas for it, but it seems as though when people make a good faith effort to bring to light some problems that are happening yeah. in the public corrections shouldn't uh, go away. Um, definitely, I would have to get back to you on that, probably speak to you one away. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but it's a pretty tall hill to to climb up when um when you try to send letters out and it's being intercepted so it's pretty tough to address something like that especially when a lot of the things are being addressed in-house and aren't making it out and and just tell me again sir one more time how long were you in solitary as a result of this petition uh i was there for almost a month up until my release one month yeah and during during that time how often were you let out at all one, one hour well, a day well i was released on uh, the 27th of march 2020 so this was on the cusp of the whole entire covid situation so i wasn't allowed to come out even for a regular solitary confinement time which is like an hour a day so i was let out once every three days just to shower okay thank you thank you very much for being here and i'm sorry that you went through that more sorry than you know and i appreciate very much um I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, next up will be uh, Rena Kapoor. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Rena Kapoor and I'm testifying today in support of SB 1059. 
I'm a forensic psychiatrist and associate professor at the Yale School of Medicine. I've spent my career providing mental health care to people involved with the criminal legal system, including in the Connecticut DOC. My scholarly work focuses in part on studying the psychological effects of solitary confinement. And over the past 10 years, I have advised the US Department of Justice, the National Institute of Justice, other state legislatures, federal courts, state prison systems, and advocacy groups about mental health treatment in prisons and the use of solitary confinement. Um, I'm happy to be able to be here and speak with you today. A lot of what I had planned to say and what's in my written testimony has already been said much more eloquently and persuasively than I could have uh, by people who have lived through the experience of being in solitary confinement. So I think I'm gonna use my time just to address some of the questions that the committee members um, raised earlier or issues that I haven't heard uh, addressed already today. The first question was about how many people are in solitary confinement in Connecticut. Um, and I agree with what was said about the lack of transparency. And so it's difficult to know, um, but I can give you one data point that um, the outstanding students at Yale Law School um, and the Correctional Leaders Association put out a report in the beginning part of 2020 before the pandemic, where they had surveyed state prison systems and just asked them, on the day you're filling out this survey, how many people are in solitary confinement defined as greater than 22 hours a day in their cell for more than 15 days? And Connecticut's answer uh, was 106. Um, and about half of those had been in solitary confinement for six months or more. Um, I'd also note that um, they asked kind of about people who didn't quite meet that threshold, either because they were only spending 19 to 21 hours a day in their cell or um, had been there for less than 15 days. Um, and that number was 297. So my best estimate about how many people are going to be affected by SB 1059 is several hundred. I also wanted to highlight um, some things about self-injury um, in solitary confinement. Half of the suicides in prisons occur in solitary confinement cells, even though less than 5% of the population is there on any given day. There's a seven times higher risk of suicide um, for people in isolation, and that doesn't go away once they've been released. And there's a higher risk of death even after they've returned to the community in that first year, um, if by virtue of having been placed in solitary confinement. Maybe you're at your three minute mark. I just need you to wrap up. All right. Okay. Great. I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Um, next up will be Richard. Uh, Scarso. Yes. Go ahead, sir. We can see you. Yes, uh, it's Richard Scarso. I live in Waterbury, Connecticut. I'm giving testimony today regarding uh, SP 978. And I'd like to read a letter that was sent to um, Senator Winfield from an Edward Falby, inmate number 84588, who's incarcerated in Cheshire uh, regarding the 978. He says, uh, my name is Edward Falby. I'm currently incarcerated at Cheshire Correctional Institution. I am serving an indeterminate sentence of 15, 15 to life for a crime that occurred in June of 1978. I have written to you in the past concerning the maximum term of life in my indeterminate sentence. For your convenience, I am closing a copy of the last correspondence on that above matter. I am also writing to you about the raised bill 978. Once again, the language in this raised bill number 978 appears to be exclusive to persons such as myself because of my crime occurred during this state's indeterminate sentencing era. As a reminder, my crime occurred while I was 18 years old. The raised bill 
number 978 offers a lot of new protections for the class of people whose crimes occurred before they turned 25 years of age. While I appreciate and applaud Ray's bill number 978, I once again feel that myself and others similarly situated crimes occurred before we turned 25 years of age, but prior to this state's definite sentencing law becoming effective July 1st of 81 are being excluded, denied all the protections this raised bill will give them, give to persons who were under age 25 at the age when their crimes were occurred. I don't know if, if it's the intent of raised bill 978 to offer protections to one group of people whose crimes occurred while they were under the age of 25 yet also deny these very same protections to another group of people whose crimes also occurred while they were under the age of 25. But prior to this state's definite sentencing scheme being enacted on July 1st, 81. If this is the intent of Ray's Bill 978, it definitely lacks equity and fundamental fairness for persons such as myself and others similarly situated. Although I see language that may offer me the same protections, it clearly offers those under this definite sentencing scheme. Will you please let me know if I am offered the same protections under Bill 978? Thank you, sir. Um, yes. We're, we're past the three minute mark. Uh, yes, I I'd just like to summarize that Mr. Falby um, committed his crime when he was 18. He was sentenced 15 years to life, you know, with parole, but he's been incarcerated now over 40 years for a 15 to life sentence. Uh, I got thank a you. I got a question for you from Representative Fishbein. Yes. Yes, thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank um, you. Sir, um, You've been referencing Bill 978. Yes. And I don't see a Bill 978 on our agenda here today. Um, is it, um, if you could just focus me where I'm supposed to be. The only, we have a Bill 972. Um, no, it was my understanding that uh, in this session, Ray's bill 978 was uh, being worked on. Maybe it's my mistake, but it's... I, I think, sir, and, you know, I, I appreciate you for coming here today and, you know, giving us your perspective. 978 had a public hearing on March 10th. Ah. So I appreciate you, you know, and that's... Yeah. Like we've got it all together now. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Fishbein. I, I missed the reference. I appreciate you catching that. Uh, sir, um, unfortunately, the, the testimony you just gave, we, we, we have to kind of disregard for today because that, that bill is not on our agenda. Um, but I would encourage you to make sure you resubmit the written testimony um, with respect to the bill number and uh, we can we can work to still add that to the, the record from, from when we heard that, but um, for today. For the 10th. Yeah, I, I thank you, Representative Fishbein, for catching that. Um, we will move on to um, Abby Steckel. Thank you. Um, hello, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Abby Steckel, and I'm a resident of New Haven who supports Senate Bill 1059. I'll be using my time today to read anonymous testimony that was shared with Stop Solitary Connecticut by someone who is currently incarcerated. So here's what they wrote. I've been chained up, shackled, handcuffed, tethered for 72 hours at a time. On different occasions, I've been tied down in four point restraints to a bed for 16, 18, 24, 26 hours. There is no individual therapy going on just mostly emergency self-harm cases. One phone call a week, $25 spending limit per week, commissary, one hour of rec, 
this is what starts the proverbial tumbling down the rabbit hole. It's just you alone with your thoughts. You have some who are too mentally ill to behave. These guys smear shit on themselves and the cell, get maced, chained up, etc. Another kind of inmate is a fearful one. That falls into two categories. A, being they've been here so long, they come to regard their oppressive captivity as a sanctuary. They self-sabotage themselves by catching frivolous tickets to basically hit reset on a 10-month program. B, being inmates who are particularly scared of other inmates and or staff and participate in the self-sabotaging behavior only to isolate themselves from general population, all of which is well known to staff, but with inadequate mental health staff and higher ups basically saying no harm, no foul, all of these men described suffer the same psychological damage induced by solitary confinement. There is no correct way to be held captive and humans were never meant to be caged. This punishment is a breaking one. Thank you for your time. I'm calling on you to end solitary confinement by passing Senate Bill 1059. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions from the committee, we appreciate you being with us. Uh, next up will be Hannah G. Um, who I don't believe is with us. So Willa Ferrer. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Willa Frere. And I'm a resident of New Haven who supports SB 1059. Uh, like Abby, I'll be using my time today to read te anonymous testimony that was shared with Stop Solitary Connecticut by someone who's currently incarcerated. At first, being in Northern was me judging my fellow inmates, not knowing the torment that was really going on, thinking this prison was made for belligerent, mentally insane, suicidal inmates. Even though I have some disorders with my mental health, I seek help for on the outside. I was confident without knowing it's about to be a hardship for myself and that my mental capability wasn't safe. Months in, I started to see, realize wearing cuffs to the back, a tether chain, which is in use attaching to animals and leg irons everywhere inmates go is starting to affect my mental. I see us inmates being provoked, talked to like less than a human being. As a black man, I look at solitary as a BLM movement. A couple inmates have been brutally beaten by officers here. Inmates are human, no matter what they are convicted of. When I was supposed to be placed in phase three of an administrative segregation, they didn't place me for no reason. A few days later, I, got, I get a refusing program ticket stating I didn't wanna to go to the next phase. They regressed me all the way back to phase one after being positive for a whole seven months. They placed me back on full restraints from a false allegation. So I had a reactive mindset and all the suicidal thoughts. I tried explaining, but they wasn't trying to communicate. I swallowed pills and covered my window. I just wanted to die. I was tired of mentally suffering at Northern, having the light of getting out of Northern blocked off right at the end of the tunnel for no reason. I ended up getting sprayed with chemical agent and placed on in-cell restraints, which is cuffed hands tethered chain and leg irons for hours in an unclean, unsanitary cold cell with other inmates feces still linger around and the smell of urine, even old dried up food. The trap where we cuff up and where our food is placed is beyond filthy. The day I was let off that status and placed back in my cell, I wasn't allowed to shower to get germs and chemical agent off my body, which led my body to burn for two days. Then the hot shower didn't help. It felt like my body was on fire for two weeks. I wanted to commit suicide again. I talk to the walls all day. I feel hopeless, worthless, and helpless. I'm going home feeling less than a man. The hardship everybody on and I was judging finally sunk as well. I feel guilty for thinking I was better, not knowing the true story of solitary confinement. Every inmate placed in solitary confinement will mentally fall victim to it. Thank you for your time. We need to stop solitary confinement by passing SB 1059. Thank you, ma'am. Um, seeing no questions from the committee, um, appreciate being with us. Next up will be Allison Brown. Thank you. Um, for my testimony, I'd like to play a recorded message from an individual named Valentine who is currently incarcerated and would like to speak in support of SB 972. Um, please let me know if you can't hear the audio. 
Ma'am, I need you to spell the. Nope. Pardon? Sorry. You spell the last name of the individual. This, I. I Again, for the record, the problem we have is we, we have to keep a transcript of who's testifying before the committee and, and try to document it for the public record. So if folks are playing recordings or reading anonymous testimony, um, it, it does make it difficult for us to, um, to get an accurate transcript and to get an accurate rest, record of, of who has testified uh, before the bill. So um, if, if folks are not testifying for themselves, they're they're reading something. Um, I need folks to 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 say very slowly and clearly the name of the individual and to um, spell it as well, so that we can um, try the best we can to get an accurate record. So if you could just not not to call you out for that, but but I just have been meaning to kind of make that warning um, for everyone. So if you could just start over with the the name of the individual and then play the recording. So the name is Valentine, spelled like the day, um, V-A-L-E-N-T-I-N-E, -E, and they're testifying in support of SB 972. And what was the first name? Um, not provided. Okay. All right. Go ahead. One, two, go. So I'm calling because I'm here to support the bill. Yeah, so just to briefly summarize what was heard in case the audio was a little bit um, hard to hear, um, the individual was calling because um, their partner has to pay for four separate um, Securus accounts to speak to them. And they're unable to speak to their children during the pandemic. Um, so just to underline how important SB 972 would be um, to connect parents to their children. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um... Seeing no questions, um, next up will be Andrew Lama. Hi. Go ahead, sir. Am I, am I on screen? Yep, you're all set. Great. Um, my name is Andrew Lama. I'm the program director at Emilio. We're a New Haven-based nonprofit founded out of Yale University um, with a West Hartford-based team. Um, we're a Connecticut-based organization that focuses on free communications for incarcerated people and their families. Um, and that does not mean solely advocacy, but also the technical side as well. Um, and so in our role, we've approached the Connecticut Department of Corrections, as well as other departments of corrections, with an offer to provide free video conferencing uh, services to the DOC at no cost to families and at no cost to the state. Um, we're here today just to speak in support of SB 972 and to speak on the state of video communications and advanced communications in the state of Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut, since Thanksgiving, um, has implemented a limited free video uh, program um, for incarcerated people in certain facilities, and that is to be applauded. Um, it shows in part how easy it is to develop and promote free communications for incarcerated people. Um, it should not. Uh, it should be noted by you know the committee and everybody here today that this video call that's been going on for a few hours now is free. Um, there might be an institutional fee um, that the state of Connecticut has to pay to make this video call happen, um, but, can, but video and, and telephonic communications these days is actually very cheap. 
Um, and we're launching similar programs in other states, two states, um, as of May 2021. Um, we're, we're providing free video calls for all incarcerated people to these two states for free at no cost to the state and at no cost to the people. Um, now, this is possible because, like I said, technology has gotten cheaper by the year to support free video calls. Um, and because the state has taken responsibility to actually store these recordings. Um, the storage of these recordings and the state's willingness to store recordings of video and phone calls is one of the largest contributors to the cost and the only reason for why for-profit providers are the only providers in this space. Um, so in short, I would summarize that Emilio is the only nonprofit provider of prison communications, of the technology of prison communications. We're interested in supporting our home state of Connecticut. Um, We've approached the state in the past. We ran into some, some difficulties with the Department of Administrative Services um, that claimed that due to an RFP that there would be a conflict to having a conversation with us. Um, we found in other states that this conflict is kind of a phantom. It doesn't exist. Um, and that's in large part because we are offering a free service at no cost to the state or to families. Um, and so we're interested in rekindling that conversation with DAS, rekindling that conversation with the DOC and promoting free family contact in the state of Connecticut. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm willing to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, uh, appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Have a great one. Uh, Sana Shaw. Here, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, and esteemed members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Senator Shaw, and I'm testifying today on behalf of Connecticut Voices for Children. For the purposes of time, I am reading a truncated version of our submitted testimony. Connecticut Voices for Children is testifying in support of Senate Bill 972, an act concerning the cost of telecommunication services in correctional facilities. Every year, Connecticut families spend over 12 million to talk to incarcerated loved ones. And even prior to this pandemic, nearly one in three went into debt trying to stay connected. This presents a major economic barrier to families and black and brown women carry 87% of this burden. Today, the state's income and wealth divides are greater than ever, but so much of a child's well-being is rooted in family economic security. There is an interdependent relationship between economic justice and criminal justice, and without addressing these economic barriers, further justice reforms would be limited in their effectiveness. Incarceration already places emotional and economic pressure on families, and more than half the state's pr prison population are parents. The physical separation between children and their parents during incarceration can disrupt attachments and harm children's health and well-being. Additionally, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, prisons have decreased visitation, making it even more difficult for children to have the secure parent bond necessary for them to flourish. As a result, families are now especially relying on phone calls to keep them connected with their incarcerated loved ones. But Connecticut has the most expensive prison phone call rate in the country. It costs as much as $5 every time a child wants to hear their parents' voice for just 15 minutes. Research shows that children facing parental incarceration also do better at home and school when they can maintain relationships with their parents in prison. Economic stability from not going into debt due to the high cost of phone calls will increase child prosperity and future economic outcomes. Finally, family contact through phone calls also helps incarcerated individuals transition back to their communities. Connecticut Voices for Children also supports Senate Bill 1058, which will make it easier to release individuals who have pre-existing health conditions into community supervision, and Senate Bill 1059, known as the PROTECT Act. Connecticut Voices for Children urges the Committee on Judiciary to pass Senate Bill 972, Senate Bill 1058, and Senate Bill 1059. These policy changes support parents' ability to connect with their children and loved ones, decrease recidivism, mitigate the risk of serious illness or death, protect the safety of incarcerated individuals and their communities, and promote the humane treatment of people who are incarcerated. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Well, well done on the three minutes. Um, uh, Good afternoon, Senator Winfield, Senator Stratstrom, 
and all the members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Karima Mickens Weber, and I reside in Hamden, and I'm here to express my strong support for Senate Bill 972 and Senate Bill 1059. Every year, Connecticut families spend over $12 million to talk to incarcerated loved ones. Nearly one in three went into debt trying to stay connected, and women, largely Black and Brown women, carried 87% of that burden. Black and, brown, when black and brown people continue to suffer at the hands of systemic racism. The state should not profit off of people's pain. The telephone is a lifeline for prison families. Restricting communications in and out of correctional facilities can lead to strain in relationships, a fracturing of networks, poor mental health outcomes, and a greater likelihood of recidivism for people who are incarcerated. Research has shown that the regular communication between incarcerated people and their families improve physical and mental health in prison and can help prevent the children of incarcerated people from falling into depression and poor school performance. Maintaining family bonds while in prison also reduces the chance of recidivism and helps former incarcerated people make an easier transition back into society. I'll be honest. I struggled preparing this testimony because for me, it's very painful. I know what it's like to be on the outside, young person trying to support my family members, maintain the relationships, recognizing mental health was on the line, connection to their children, to their support system, being able to provide direction, hope, connection to life outside and encouraging preparation for re-entry. We can all agree investing in our children is investing in our future. Investing in families benefits our community. Every year we spend millions of dollars on programs that service at-risk youth, underserved youth, and youth with incarcerated parents. Programs for inmates to prepare them for successful re-entry. And yet, we are inflicting a state-imposed barrier to providing children access to their parents. Parents who can provide them the very connection and guidance they, they need. It's a penalty, a financial burden imposed on families, spouses and children after the court's judgment has been rendered. It's further damage to the family that was not adjudicated by the judge. The state acting as a court of its own. I personally think it's shameful to profit off the most marginalized among us. Families disproportionately black and brown struggling. If COVID didn't show us anything, it reminded us that human connections are vital. Connecticut is a wonderful state and we're always looking for ways to improve the lives of our citizens to make it more equitable. People over profit, right? Let's make it more accessible for inmates to communicate with their families. Thank you, I ask that you please act now to protect Connecticut families by passing Senate Bill 972 and removing the financial burden of connecting with incarcerated loved ones now and forever. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No questions. Just wanted to thank my good friend Karima for being with us today and for sharing your um, testimony and staunch support for this bill. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative. Uh, thank you both. Um, next up will be Nancy Peters. Senator Winfield, Senator Staffstrom, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Nancy Peters. I live in New London, Connecticut. As a member of the Catal Center for Equity, Health, and Justice, I strongly support passage of SB 1059, the PROTECT Act. When people are able to get their basic life needs met in society, including for housing, education, a livable income, and dignity, they're unlikely to risk taking actions that might lead to their incarceration. We know that the majority of those locked up in Connecticut 
prisons and jails are poor black and brown people, the very same people whose basic needs are disproportionately not being met in our society. And we know that a significant number of incarcerated people suffer from mental illness and substance use disorders. What they desperately need is appropriate medical care, treatment and skills they can use to make it on the outside. But instead they get torturous solitary confinement, shackles and restraints. They get an environment in which they have no recourse to justice when they're mistreated. They get substandard medical care and virtually no treatment. And once released from prison, they emerge with greatly compromised physical and mental health and a badly damaged self, sense of self. And now as ex-felons, they must try to survive in a society that discriminates against them at every turn. Among other important important reasons, the PROTECT Act is greatly needed because it would restrict the use of isolation, restraints, and shackles on incarcerated people, practices that cause needless suffering and permanent psychological damage while doing nothing to increase public safety. At Catal, whenever we come together to plan an action, we start by stating the values that are motivating us. I'm here today urging you to vote for this bill because I believe that as human beings, every incarcerated person deserves to be treated with respect, dignity, and fairness. And if I know there are people whose basic human rights are being violated in my name, it's my obligation to petition you, my elected officials, for changes. I'm so grateful for all the impacted individuals who are testifying today. May their so authentic voices move you to do what's right and pass this bill. I hear you and applaud you. My heart and gratitude especially go out to Tracy Bernardi for presenting such strong testimony and for her courage coming here, despite knowing that she might be subject to questions that could re-traumatize her as I'm afraid might have happened today. But I don't have the right to sit back and do nothing, telling myself it's not my concern as I'm not directly impacted. The fact that neither I nor my loved ones have been incarcerated has everything to do with my white middle class privilege. In fact, I am profoundly impacted by injustices that are happening to other people in my name. Most of my incarcerated neighbors get out of their car cages at some point, and if they have been hurt, traumatized, and scarred by their treatment inside. How does that impact all of society? How does that impact me? And I'll finish. At a deeper level, as my Zen Buddhist practice teaches, those abused others are not separate from myself. They are me. Our humanity is intimately intertwined. And Thanks, so for yeah. these reasons, please do support this bill today. Thank you. Um. Questions or comments? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us, ma'am. Thank you. Um, next up will be uh, Sophia Fraunhofer. Yep, Fraunhofer, that's me. So um, right. hi everybody, I'm Sophia Fraunhofer and um, I'm a, a college student. I live in Torrington right now. I've lived here basically my whole life. And you know, Connecticut is my home and I really care about what happens here and the health and safety of every person in Connecticut. And that includes our incarcerated people. Yeah, and, you know, I can't, I can't speak to what that experience is like, but I can speak to my own experiences with health and safety, mental health particularly. And I've dealt with mental health issues for much of my life. And I've got to say, this past year has not been great for it because um, like a lot of my stuff got better as I went away to college, but coming back and being isolated from all the people who I've met and have loved has just been immensely difficult and has brought back a lot of self-destructive behaviors that you know, I thought I'd recovered from years ago, like self-harm and disordered eating and stuff like that. And so you know, the thing is like, this is coming from somebody who's had it relatively easy throughout the pandemic. Like I'm in a stable home environment, I have friends who live nearby and the friends who I don't have nearby, I can easily call or text, you know? Yeah, and so the thought of like being in solitary confinement, I feel like that would just be disastrous for my mental health or anyone's mental health. And I know that I'm not alone in feeling that way, that a lot of us have had a lot of struggles over the past year mentally because of the isolation of the pandemic. So, and like, it's not, 
hypothetical, the thought of being in solitary confinement, that extreme isolation. There's real people in our state dealing with that right now. And studies have shown that about 50% of incidents of self-harm that occur among incarcerated people occur among those who have been in solitary confinement. And that even seven days of solitary can have irreparable harm on their mental health and can make them more violent. And so out of concern for the mental health of these people in our state and their loved ones, the people around them, the people they work with, I strongly, strongly urge you to support SB 1059 to end solitary confinement in Connecticut and SB 972 to widen access to free phone calls. And I thank you so, so much for your time and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions, appreciate you being with us. Next up will be um, Christina Quaranta. Start my timer. Chairs, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, and other distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Christina Quaranta, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Justice Alliance. I'm writing this testimony to communicate my strong support for Senate Bill 1059, otherwise known as the PROTECT Act. CTJA is a statewide youth adult partnership that works to end the criminalization of youth through work in public policy and advocacy. We strongly support the PROTECT Act, an act that promotes responsible oversight, treatment, and effective correctional transparency. We also strongly urge the legislature to ensure that funds that are saved from the closure of Northern Correctional Institute, around $46.9 million, are invested back into the communities of color and into improving reentry and internal support services for folks who are incarcerated or who have been released. The oversight and accountability portion of this bill is sorely needed to ensure that there is an independent service and ombudsperson that's responsible for responding to people who are incarcerated and hearing their concerns. A body that is able to fully investigate the DOC and advocate for people who are incarcerated would be an improvement to the criminal legal system. The Office of the Child Advocate testified this morning and clearly outlined in verbal and written testimony all the findings of their November 2020 report that detailed their investigation into Man Manson Youth Institution and York Correctional Institution. The data inside of that report is important to the PROTECT Act because youth that are incarcerated inside of MYI and YCI are continually subjected to solitary confinement. Some of the Office of the Child Advocate findings included Black youth making up a majority of the incarcerated population at MYI and York, they discuss education, isolation and restrictive housing concerns, chemical agent use on young people, among other things. One should be careful not to get stuck on the word solitary and how the DOC defines it. Being locked in a cell for 22 to 23 and a half hours per day is isolation and punishment. It's not an intervention. MYI is a prison that's located in Cheshire where young men ages 15 to 21 years old are incarcerated. Currently, there are 33 young men incarcerated there and about 85 to 90% are either black or Hispanic. York Correctional has one young woman at this time and because she is the only one under 18, she's in de facto solitary. Uh, stated above and as talked about in the Child Advocate Report, Manson Youth also utilizes confinement to quarters, which looks like 18 to 23 hours a day in your cell that can last from one to 30 days. And many of the youth there have been on that status multiple times and that's regardless of any type of disability or special education needs. Uh, in summary, the Department of Correction continues to use frequent and prolonged cell confinement and isolation as a behavior management tool. Uh, we strongly support the end of that. There are other methods that need to be used and employed. Solitary confinement must end. Uh, I've submitted written testimony with statistics and other items if you're um, interested. We support the PROTECT Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, questions or comments from the committee? If not, uh, always good seeing you. Thanks for being Thanks with us. See you too. Thanks. Uh, Liliana Pujols. Hello. Um, dear Chairs Winfield, Staffstrom, and members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Ileana Pujols. I am the Policy Director of the Connecticut Justice Alliance, and I am writing this testimony in strong communication, um, in communication for my strong support for SB 972. Uh, the Alliance is a youth adult partnership model working to end the criminalization of youth. We include justice staff, justice advisors, 
and steering committee members, which include lawyers, researchers, clinicians, and et cetera. I strongly support SB 972 for many reasons. Personally, I know what it's like to see someone struggle to maintain phone call costs for individuals that are incarcerated, and it impacts more than just the inmate. A 15 minute phone call is an average of about $4.87, which means only one 15 minute phone call each day is almost $35 a week. Um, during a time like this now, especially with the current pandemic, that cost can be really hard to maintain. Many families were impacted and are still being impacted by the loss of employment and are barely able to make a, you know, the standard minimum wage to afford bills. With the current pandemic, the Department of Corrections should be encouraging an increase in communication between inmates and their family. And this means the calls become more frequent, which means the bill adds up to be more expensive. Uh, with people already struggling to maintain daily costs during this time, their loved ones unfortunately have somehow become a financial burden, which isn't a predicament that anybody really wants to be in. Many inmates experiencing a long time of isolation during this pandemic. So these conversations with their loved ones, especially for those who have children and others that depend on their communication is really important. Uh, outside from it being the most humane thing to do, the shift of cost of course state function onto families, primarily women of color from low income um, communities, misrepresents state priorities and is not effective, substantial or ethical. We need to eliminate these inequities that are unintentionally impacting low income communities and most of all, our loved ones. Eliminating the cost of telecommunication and correction facilities would be a great step towards exercising policies that encourage family engagement and restorative practices. The removal of this barrier will give those that are currently incarcerated the basic level of human interaction that everybody needs, especially during these times. Um, I ask that you put yourself in the shoes of an inmate and imagine what it's like to need to talk to someone to maintain sanity, yet not wanting to overwhelm them by becoming a financial burden. So I'd like to thank you for allowing me to testify today and I'm open to answering any further questions. I've also submitted written testimony. And thank, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we appreciate it. Um, seeing no questions, next up will be uh, Sydney Klotz. Oops, um, can you see me? We, uh, no, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Sorry about this. I'm not sure what's happening. Give me one moment. You know, we're gonna um, we'll give you a minute to get out, get your um, try to get your camera working. We'll go on to the next person, which is uh, Anastasios Savetas. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Staffstrom, and the rest of the committee. My name is Andy Savides. I'm a trial lawyer in Stanford, Connecticut, and I'm the current president-elect of CTLA testifying today in opposition to Committee Bill 5125 or any legislation that would establish immunity for businesses. It seems to appear in this bill in the form of an affirmative defense, if you got, as you guys have pointed out uh, earlier today, providing immunity from negligence for businesses so long as the business operates in substantial compliance with the, the appropriate health and safety guidelines regarding COVID-19. I think it's a misguided attempt to fix a problem that doesn't really exist. That's the sentiment that I get from listening today. Many of the individuals that have supported this bill uh, who testified earlier kept saying the same things, that they don't wanna face lawsuits or liability if they operate as safely as possible. Well, if that's true and that's what they're doing and that's how they conduct their business, then they have nothing to worry about and they won't be held responsible. Current law simply requires businesses to act in a reasonably safe way as it similarly requires an individual to conduct themselves in a reasonably safe manner. It appears the bill as drafted, there's really nothing more than shift the burden of proof on the issue from the plaintiff to the defendant in order to obtain the benefit of the immunity, the so-called immunity. I can't imagine that's what the business is intended when drafting this bill. Uh, there is no onslaught of litigation against businesses for COVID-19 violations in Connecticut, as has been pointed out. There won't be for many reasons, especially now with vaccinations moving along. From a legal perspective, it's very difficult to prove where or how someone contacted COVID-19. In the great majority of cases, the symptoms from a positive case are very mild or non-existent with no ascertainable long-term effects. For most of those cases, litigation isn't even really an option. Immunity from accountability for unreasonable negligent behavior is never an answer. 
Providing businesses immunity won't promote reasonable safeguards. All it will do is create a disincentive for companies to act in a reasonably safe way and further jeopardize the health and safety of the public. Continued recovery from the pandemic will require the public to have confidence that businesses are operating safely. Establishing any form of immunity for businesses will do the opposite of that. Instead of instilling public confidence, it's gonna introduce additional anxiety to an already highly anxious public. <clears throat> the power to hold a business accountable for harm caused by a failure to take reasonable care is one of the most powerful incentives we have to ensure that businesses continue to operate safely. When businesses and workplaces are not properly protected, patients, workers, customers, clients, the community at large, we're all at risk. From protecting workers, consumers, and preventing needless deaths in nursing homes, it's clear that companies responsible for the health and safety of others must have every incentive to act accordingly and responsibly. The pandemic can't be an excuse for failing to take whatever the reasonable steps are to protect individuals. Thank the you. Only thing providing, the only thing providing this form of immunity will do is protect the businesses that don't care enough to do what is reasonable, what's safe, and what's right. I'm not sure Thank that's you, a public sir. policy we um, want to promote. Thank you for considering my testimony. Question. Yep. Uh, Representative O'Day, how are you, sir? Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney Spice, uh, good to see you. Good to see you too, Representative O'Day. Um, quick question: You were you were getting into uh, public policy. It, it would be a bad public policy for us. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, to your you you provided written testimony, correct? CTLA did. I did not individually. No. Okay. Well, I, I would just say if, if you want to provide some written testimony in addition to what you've just said, that would be great. Uh, even just submitting what you've articulated here now would be helpful just so that we can share it with others. I'm happy uh, to do that. And um, I greatly appreciate your testimony appearing here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative O'Day. Further questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, I want to uh, appreciate you being, you know, let me just let me just ask real quick because we've asked a couple of people this. Are you aware of any cases in Connecticut, any cases that have been filed in Connecticut where someone has, is seeking personal injury or wrongful death damages as a result of visiting a business in the state and claiming they caught COVID while at that business? I'm not aware of any to reiterate what's already been said. And I honestly don't think that's a case that I would take and talking to other lawyers that handle these kinds of cases. I think they're very difficult to prove for many reasons, probably take longer than the time we have here today. But again, I, I, I don't see this as an issue. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, all right, it looks like uh, Sydney Kloss has got her video up, so we're gonna go back to her. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Sydney Kloss and I'm a resident of New Haven who supports Senate Bill 1059. I will be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of Darnell Walker, D-A-R-N-E-L-L, -L, Walker, W-A-L-K-E-R a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he is incarcerated. My name is Darnell Walker. I'm from New Britain and I strongly support the PROTECT Act. I am currently incarcerated. I have experienced prolonged isolation firsthand at Northern Correctional Institution where the conduct of the staff is nothing less than white supremacy to the point that even non-white staff just follow suit in fear to confront their colleagues. I've been shortchained and on incel restraints for up to 17 days to the point that I didn't even feel like a human at times. At times, my human rights were so deeply violated, it felt as though I was living in a whole nother world or country because the physical and mental pain I've suffered inside was none of the world in which I know to be the United States of America would approve of. The building was one of a torture chamber of the mentally ill. The same ill intents follow the chronic discipline programming 
Most prisoners obtain these mental illnesses once in these programs, because not only they're locked up all day, put in in-cell restraints for the simplest things, but they're also told not to talk on the tears, which caused a hate and rebellious attitude towards others. Paranoia is, a cause, is another cause of the effect. The lack of transparency and accountability for misconduct of the staff don't make things any better. It only worsens the hate and rebelliousness in the mentally ill. Ending abusive restraints is essential to protecting incarcerated people. I support this provision and it must be included in this bill. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Um, seeing no questions, I appreciate you being with us. Um, is Hannah G with us? Um, hello, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Hannah and I'm a resident of New Haven who strongly supports SB 1059. Um, today, I'll be using my time to read anonymous testimony that was shared with Stop Solitary Connecticut by someone who is currently incarcerated. I spent years incarcerated at Northern Correctional Institution. Because of the facility's restrictive practices, I was stripped almost entirely of all my meaningful community relationships and denied at least half a dozen basic human rights. For example, the high cost of phone privileges mixed with the immediate family only visiting policy effectively ended my relationships with my son's mother and strained my relationship with my son. The neighborhoods I and my friends come from are underserved with the higher percentage of people living below poverty. After bills, groceries, kids' needs, etc., there's just not enough money left to afford any regular phone conversations with me, which has resulted in months, sometimes years, of no communication with close relatives. Mix this with restrictive visiting, I am lucky enough to have a mother in my corner, but no, that's not the case for numerous reasons for others. For everyone incarcerated, a support system looks different. It could be a girlfriend, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, or a friend, none of which will qualify as immediate family. So when you take the high price of phone privileges and add the restrictive visiting policy, it can result in complete isolation from society for someone in which there is no option of immediate family support. Another thing I experienced at Northern was a form of punishment known as in-cell restraints. When on, when on this punitive placement, prisoners are forced to eat, sleep, and use facilities all while cuffed, shackled, and tether chained with your hands around your waist. If you do figure out a method in which you can defecate and wipe while in this position, the toilet in the cell can only be flushed manually from outside the, of the cell. I found myself on in-cell restraints for blocking my window, a behavior they say interfered with my safety and security. Now, I'm not saying that blocking my window is correct, but to be placed in a dry cell and chained up for 72 hours after it was clear that neither I nor my cellmate were in any danger seems a little excessive. Thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. Um, seeing no questions, we appreciate you being with us. Um, Thomas Piezo. Uh, Bryn Kalam. Kalam. Hi. How you doing, ma'am? Thank you. My name is Bryn Coulomb and I'm a resident of New Haven who supports Senate Bill 1059. I will be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of William McKinney, a supporter of this bill, who cannot be here today because he is incarcerated. And William's name is spelled W-I-L-L-I-A-M-M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y. My name is William McKinney. I'm from New Haven and I strongly support the PROTECT Act, Senate Bill 1059. I am currently incarcerated. I have experienced prolonged isolation at Northern Correctional Institution and here at Osborne Correctional Institution. When I was at NCI, I was inceled over 20 times, placed in cells covered with blood, feces, urine, and semen. I was always chained up for 72 hours, even if, quote, I behaved. I was beaten by staff while I was in chains and maced. They wouldn't allow me to wash off the chemical agent so, it, so I'd stay with it on my skin. It would burn me for hours, sometimes days. I was shortchained multiple times and forced to eat my food like this. It was humiliating. Most of the time they would leave me naked, chained up in a freezing cell. I had no meaningful social interaction, no contact with my family or friends for years. This created social anxiety and interpersonal issues that I still suffer from to this day. I cannot keep a girlfriend or friends. 
I have very poor social skills. I have a hard time keeping a job. I can't be in crowded rooms or events with a lot of people. I can't stand in line with people behind me and loud noises startle me greatly. It caused a feeling within me of impending doom. I thought at any moment I was going to be attacked. Walking a human being in a cage all day causes long-term suffering and permanent damage. I found myself isolating inside my apartment. It was like I was still in prison. We need to end this isolation because people eventually come home and enter the community. DOC is ruining people's lives forever following these practices. I strongly recommend you pass this bill. Isolating people creates a public health issue. Imagine going from extreme isolation to total freedom. It's sensory overload. I freaked out when I entered a grocery store. Seeing all the colors, people moving fast around me, I perceived everyone as a threat. I was extremely paranoid and afraid all the time. It gave me mental health issues for life. Please pass this bill for all our sakes. Thank you, ma'am. Um, appreciate you being with us. Um, Na Apoku, Shanira Billup, Molly Shapiro. Hi, I'm Molly Shapiro. Hello. Go ahead. Yep, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. My name is Molly Shapiro, and I'm a resident of New Haven who supports SB 1059. I will be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of Carlos Baez, a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he is incarcerated. That is spelled C-A-R-L-O-S Baez, B-A-E-Z. My name is Carlos Baez. I'm from Waterbury, and I strongly support the PROTECT Act. I am currently incarcerated. I've experienced prolonged isolation firsthand at Cheshire Correctional, where I was in a cell for 30 days all by myself, and my request to be placed with another inmate went ignored. I witnessed other prisoners in in-cell restraints, and the sight was a hurtful thing to see. It's like they were animals. I also personally suffered from being four-pointed with soft restraints, which was very torturing. Ending abusive restraints is essential to protect incarcerated people. I support this provision and it must be included in the bill. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, questions or comments? Seeing none, appreciate being with us. Uh, Marilyn Kegley, Stephanie Roberge. Good, I guess now early evening, Attorney yes. Roberge, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much, Representative Stastrom, Senator Winfield and members of the committee. Um, I'm the president of Connecticut Trial Lawyers Association. I practice in New Haven um, and I'm here to oppose Bill 5125. You just heard literally a few minutes ago from um, the president-elect of CTLA, Andy Savides, and I, of course, share uh, his testimony. Immunity for businesses is, um, is not necessary. The law already protects businesses who have complied with the governor's order and the health and safety uh, guidelines set forth by the Department of Public Health. Um, and uh, as, as long as these uh, businesses have acted responsibly and continue to act responsibly, um, there is really no need for this legislation. One of the biggest hurdles to pursuing um, a civil lawsuit uh, is to be able to prove causation. Um, in addition to fault or being able to establish that uh, businesses may not have complied with the standard of, of care, uh, one of the most important elements is also causation, and that is one of the primary hurdles to pursuing these types of cases. Um, as we all know, it's very difficult to determine where individuals may have contracted uh, COVID, and uh, as a result of that, myself and, and, and many of my colleagues and uh, attorneys who engage um, in this practice um, have found it very difficult and, and really there have been essentially no cases uh, brought for um, people acquiring COVID. 
What would happen, however, is um, it would promote non-compliance uh, with these guidelines and essentially breed non-compliance. Even the language of the bill uh, talks about substantial compliance with the governor's order and the guidelines from the Department of Public Health. Clearly these guidelines were not meant to be followed substantially, but they were meant to be followed. Um, and uh, by granting immunity for substantial compliance really uh, you know, makes, a, makes it sort of a gray area. And this is a bad time to, um, to engage and to, uh, to walk down to take steps in that regard. We see a light at the end of the tunnel here with vaccines. Um, we're getting close to the end of this uh, pandemic and we want everyone, including businesses to act responsibly, do their best to adhere to the guidelines um, and ensure best practices so that we can get out of this. So um, for all the reasons in our written testimony, um, as well as what you've heard earlier from my colleague, we uh, oppose um, this bill, Bill 5.25. Thank you, um, Attorney Rebeer. So I, I just, I just want to ask a, a little bit because, I mean, obviously we've had, we've had some folks come before us and testify on this bill. Um, I think, I think you're only the second or third attorney or practitioner we've actually had um, testify on it, and I just, I guess. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about this in a little bit of an academic way, which which is kind of the nature of this committee, understandably. But um, just for a second, you touched on something that I think is really critical to this, and that is the reasonableness prong of proving some sort of wrongful death or personal injury type case. And from your read of this bill, um, how, if at all, does this bill change what is the existing reasonableness determination that a court needs to make? Well, um, in negligence cases, which is what a liability case, which is what I believe the majority of these this is, is geared towards in these types of cases, is um, a standard of care or what a reasonably prudent party would do under same or, or similar circumstances. Uh, applying this to the governor's order or to even the guidelines from the Department of Public Health is only one component essentially of, of the of what an o overall looking at each case on its, on its facts of what would be determined to be reasonable under those circumstances. So, um, so, so the way that this uh, is seems to be drafted is that substantial compliance with the that's only looking at one component of what is uh, reasonable uh, behavior under under uh, the business practices and how businesses or any particular business um, has uh, promoted following and acted and their actions of action acting reasonably uh, under the. Um, circumstances of the pandemic. I don't so know fair that, to I say that the I... reasonable. No, so fair to say that the reasonableness inquiry, right, that that needs to be undertaken in one of these cases under a negligence suit, is more expansive, or um, would look at a wider variety of cases than just whether somebody has substantially complied, whatever that term may or may not mean, but but it's broader than substantial compliance just with some directive from a state agency. Exactly right. In, in, in under current law, the standard of care looks at all of looks at a, a whole host of things, these guidelines being one element of all of those things and making a determination as to whether a particular entity under a particular set of facts has acted reasonably. And that reasonableness inquiry and a negligence standard, that's a function of common law, correct? It's not in statute someplace. That's hundreds of years worth of common law doctrine. Um, yes, that's not, correct. We don't have the business is negligent under Connecticut statutes, correct? That's correct. 
So I guess one of my concerns, and I think in, as well-intentioned as this legislation may be, I fear one of the unintended consequences is you're taking, you're taking a statute, you're trying to plug it into one part of one element of a common law cause of action and how a court is going to try to take this entire body of common law, interject this one piece to it in the context of certain types of claims, but not every claim because it's just for a period of time. Do you have concern that that is going to create confusion in the courts, potentially false safe harbors or, or feeling of security for businesses when they really don't have it, um, and also kind of just, just general confusion in, in how these cases are adjudicated, if these cases are brought at all? Yes, I would agree. I, I think that, look, immunity in any sense, um, um, my organization, myself, um, just immunity generally, um, we're against. But this particular bill and the way that it's it's drafted and it's as it's limited to and, and basically zeroing in on the executive order and the guidelines from the Dep Department of Public Health, I think um, uh, will result in the concerns that um, you are raising representative. In addition, um, even the language of substantial compliance, what does substantial mean? That also is going to um, raise issues, not only for potential litigation, but also what does that mean potentially moving forward um, for businesses? And it will also cloud the guidelines about how businesses then uh, decide to act moving forward. So, so this will uh, cause a lot of uncertainty um, and I do not believe that it, it uh, putting aside that we're against, uh, you know, I'm against immunity um, and immunity for businesses uh, because I think it's important. But I just, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor this. But right, right. Just, I guess my, I guess my question, and, and we keep saying the word immunity, and I know that's in the title of the bill. I'm still trying to figure out where there's actual blanket immunity in this bill. It seems to me that a court has to adjudicate whether a business has substantially complied or not. And so in that's that respect, this is a, at best, it's an affirmative defense, but it's certainly not a blanket immunity that says you can't bring the case at all. You're, you're absolutely right. The cases will still be brought and, and uh, but then it'll be uh, based on this bill, the the, uh, the language of the bill. Um, uh, it's based upon whether a business entity can prove that they've met uh, the guidelines or the executive order. So yes, I agree with that. That that it doesn't prevent cases from from being brought at the at the courthouse door. They will actually uh, cases you know may still be brought. What I'm saying is none have been brought thus far that I'm aware of in Connecticut. I don't anticipate there being, you know, any cases or or uh, any that require this type of, of legislation, anyway. Well, I, I think I think if you're being with us, as I said, I, I certainly understand where the proponents of the bill are coming from, and and um, you know, no no one wants to be unfairly held liable for something when they when they've tried to do the best, particularly in a in a state of emergency like this, but. Um, I thank you for highlighting, I think, some of the concerns that I have that, um, you know, what, what may seem um, useful on the surface when you, when you drill down to, to some of the details could, could create several unintended consequences, even for the businesses we're trying to protect. So um, thank, you for, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments from the committee, um, We'll move on to um, Aileen Kays, um, Steve Rosenthal. I 
Aline Case, no. Um, Steve Rosenthal. I'm here. Oh. Okay, so go ahead. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to express my views. I'm here. I, I am Steve Rosenthal, I'm the president of Leahy's Fuels, a residential and commercial heating fuel supplier in Danbury, Connecticut, now celebrating 104 years in business. Um, I'm here in support of Committee Bill 5125, the Act Concerning Provision of Immunity from Civil Liability for Entities that Have Operated Pursuant to Health and Safety Guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic for several reasons. The first reason is that it will actually promote public safety. Uh, over the past year, on a few occasions, one of my service techs has been exposed from a family member to COVID and became symptomatic and subsequently tested positive when they have been already in a customer's home doing uh, service work on heating and cooling equipment. Uh, each time that that has happened, uh, I would call the customer and we would notify them of the fact that we've been in their home and that subsequently one of our employees has tested positive. And each time we've been told that they were following protocols, they had their masks, they kept their distance. So we've done everything that we possibly can. So to the best of my knowledge, no one has actually con uh, contracted COVID from any of my employees. Uh, and we have not been uh, sued at this point in time, but we have a risk of a lawsuit. And the difference between this claim and any other claim of a risk of a lawsuit is the fact that this is an uninsured risk for our business. Our insurance policy has specifically sent us a notification that they will not cover a COVID claim. So the issue is the defense costs. It's, I'm not worried about losing a lawsuit. I'm worried about how many lawsuits would be filed potentially, given the fact that we have 13,000 customers and we've been going in and out of homes for a full year. Um, the defense of these lawsuits can be extremely expensive. And the insurance companies oftentimes settle them because it's cheaper to pay off the claim than it is for, to go through the process of the entire lawsuit. I think this particular uh, statute will make it more difficult and less likely for frivolous lawsuits to be brought against different companies, and not only mine, um, but you know, people in our industry. But this applies to many different industries. Um, on a personal note, I'm also a resident of Newtown Woods Condominium Association. Uh, our clubhouse and pool have been closed for over a year. A major factor in making the decision by the board was a lack of insurance protection because their insurance also does not cover uh, to protect against the COVID claim. Uh, so their volunteer board members were potentially risking not only HOA's assets, but their own personal assets. Uh, many of the residents are widows and widowers living alone, suffering from isolation that comes from not seeing their families, but also their neighbors, who many would see at the clubhouse a few times a week. Um, this bill would expedite the opening of those facilities uh, while still using masks and following other protocols. There's, uh, small businesses could be put out of business because of the lack of insurance and the fact that there will be law firms who are already gearing up and advertising to promote the filing of these lawsuits. A previous testimony that was that there, this, uh, uh, some people may not be aware of lawsuits that have been filed. I don't know what the number is. But numbers nationwide were quoted earlier today at 9,000 and 100 in Connecticut. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So we're at the three minute mark. So I just need you to summarize. Okay. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that this protects the rights of the victim. It just changes the standard to gross negligence. So it's not an immunity bill. It does hold people accountable who are not following the protocols. Thank you, yes, sir. I got a question for you, uh, Representative Callahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Rosenthal, for coming in. Uh, I did work next door to you there for about 30 years at the courthouse. So uh, okay. your, your input from uh, small businesses and uh, large businesses like yourself and how COVID has affected, affected uh, uh, how you, you're able to be insured, it, it, it's definitely uh, it's helpful when you come in. So I appreciate you coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further questions or comments? If not, um... Next up will be Eileen Kays, and I'm gonna turn this back over to Senator Winfield, who's back with us. Thank you, Representative. Good afternoon, honored members of the Judiciary Committee, co-chair Senator Winfield and Representative Staffstrom. My name is Aileen Keyes, and I am the project manager for the Connecticut Children with Incarcerated Parents Initiative at Central Connecticut State University. 
CTCIP works to improve the quality of supports for children with incarcerated parents, or CIP, through research, policy, and practice development, personnel development, community engagement, and education. I'm here to express support for Senate Bill 972. When an individual is incarcerated, many forget to consider the impact that that separation has on the individual's loved ones. These ramifications damage children's and families' health and financial standing even beyond the term of incarceration. In the US, it's estimated that one in 14 kids have had a parent who they have lived with go to prison or jail, and approximately half of those kids are under the age of 10. In Connecticut, it's estimated that a child experiences parental arrest more than 62,000 times a year. More than half of the state's prison population are parents, with 80% of the women being moms who were the primary caretakers of their children. In terms of impact, a study conducted by our initiative at the New Britain Courthouse showed that a child loses many important supports when a parent becomes incarcerated. This includes financial support, help with personal problems, assistance with schoolwork, transportation, childcare, and so on. Other studies have shown that the absence or unavailability of a parent is emotionally equivalent to life-threatening for children. A recent study conducted by Kristen Turney demonstrates that when a demographics, socioeconomic status, and familial characteristics are controlled for, parental incarceration is independently associated with learning disabilities, behavioral or conduct problems, developmental delays, and speech or language problems. The author stated that children's health disadvantages are an overlooked and unintended consequence of mass incarceration. Interestingly, results from another study show that when families are able to maintain regular contact during incarceration, those families are less likely to experience negative health impacts associated with incarceration. Finally, families have lost a contributing member of the family financially and have added expenses associated with that parent's incarceration due to childcare expenses, providing money for needed commissary items, including toiletries and prison uniform, and the costs associated with visiting and phone calls. Parents left to care for CIP have report difficulties in meeting basic household needs due to the family member's incarceration. On average, a family's income declines by 22% when the father is incarcerated, and even a year after the father's return, that family's income remains 15% lower than it was before incarceration occurred. Family contact through phone calls and prison visits have been shown to help an individual transition back into the community. Maintaining or mending positive relationships during incarceration reduces the likelihood that an incarcerated individual re will reoffend, suggesting improved public safety, reduced victimization, and a reduction in costs associated with future criminal justice system involvement for the state. It is for these reasons uh, that it is clear to us that encouraging a strong connection with loved ones during incarceration is in the best interest of the state and we therefore support SB 972. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keys. Uh, are there questions or comments? Questions or comments from members of the committee? I do not see anything. Any, uh, thank you for joining us. It's good to see you. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Nani Sajeev, uh, Rahisha Bibbins, and Andrew Gearing. Uh, is Nani uh, in? Yes. Uh, you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Nani Sajeev, and I am a resident of Trumbull, Connecticut. I am enormously concerned about the devastating impacts of mass incarceration, especially on victims of sexual violence. I'm wholly in support of SB 1059 and SB 972 because it will pave the way for a safer future. Prisons are centers of racialized and sexualized violence. One way this is manifested is through the abuse to prison pipeline, which primarily impacts young black women. Instead of treating young people who are suffering from, uh, from sexual violence, some survivors, especially young black girls are criminalized for the ways that they experience trauma. Prisons do not make us safer. Instead, they exacerbate inequalities, compound traumas and destabilize communities. COVID-19 has worsened this by increasing the control and surveillance of incarcerated survivors while continuing to weaken their sense of agency, autonomy, and community. Expensive phone calls ensure that survivors cannot reach their loved ones for support. This leads to heightened isolation and more incidents of abuse. By the time business with incarcerated people are allowed again, system involved survivors will experience several levels of compounded trauma in almost complete isolation. Furthermore, it is practice for incarcerated survivors of sexual violence to be placed in solitary confinement after reporting. This is ostensibly done to protect survivors. However, as others before me have said, solitary confinement is absolutely a traumatizing practice in itself. How do we even begin to measure its impacts on survivors of sexual violence? 
How can we justify that? If we care about survivors of sexual violence, then we must care for all survivors of sexual violence, including those who are incarcerated and subject to solitary confinement. SB 1059 and 972 will be a powerful change to Connecticut's carceral systems. Both bills protect social bonds for incarcerated people. Survivors who can communicate with the outside world will be able to create safer communities for when they leave prison. This will not only lead to lower recidivism rates, but also move towards patterns of healing instead of harm and violence. I also want to specifically highlight the importance of SB 1059's Correction Accountability Commission. I don't expect nor want the Department of Corrections to completely undertake the massive responsibility of safety for incarcerated people. That is a responsibility that all of us must hold, that many people across the state want to take on. This commission will facilitate transparency and partnerships that will create safer communities in and out of prisons. This includes providing services for incarcerated survivors of sexual violence. Together, we can interrupt devastating cycles of violence like the abuse to prison pipeline. I strongly support SB 1059 and SB 972 and urge you to favorably vote the bill out of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, comment or questions for members of the committee comment or question. I do not see any. I wanna thank you for uh, joining us today and offering your testimony. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, next, we'll hear from Rahisha Bivens followed by Andrew Gearing and Nicholas Frittini. Uh, it's Rahisha Bivens and Hi. Yes. Can you see me? I see you. you all right. Too. All right. Good evening, Sen Senator Winfield and esteemed members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Raisha Bivens and I am a resident of New Haven. I'm a board member and organizer with Stop Solitary Connecticut, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and justice advocate. The most important title that I carry is that I'm a sister of my beloved brother, Joshua, who was formerly incarcerated. And I am here today to urge you to support SB 1059, otherwise known as the PROTECT Act. I got involved in advocating for the rights of incarcerated people, and in particular, the end of solitary confinement, when my brother Joshua, who had schizophrenia before he was incarcerated, uh, was incarcerated at Garner Correctional Facility, where he languished in a cell 21 hours out the day in pretrial detention. Imagine my surprise as someone who practiced social work when I learned that the Department of Corrections idea of care and treatment was having him in his cell with not much to do for the majority of the day. The nightmare continued when I learned that he wouldn't be able to receive contact visits and be able to hug or touch me and my mother for almost two years just because of his bond. And the nightmare continued even worse when I went to support him at every court date and watch as he became morbidly obese before my eyes. My mother refused to go to court because she didn't wanna see her son who was in college and had a full-time job before incarceration deteriorate. The nightmare still continued when he called me two and a half years into his incarceration and told me that he now had diabetes on top of schizophrenia, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder and was gonna need insulin several times out the day. I knew in that moment that I had to be unrelenting and have this nightmare in. Fortunately, through my advocacy, I was able to finally get my brother into a treatment setting. And today he has zero to no mental health symptoms because he's actually getting care and treatment. Fortunate, unfortunately, there are thousands of people incarcerated in the state of Connecticut who are not as lucky. And we know through research that irreparable psychological harm can be caused in as little as seven days. There are up to 80% of people incarcerated in Connecticut pr prisons that have existing mental health issues and are not getting care and treatment. I urge you to support the PROTECT Act and SB 1059 so that people actually have a chance to re rehabilitate and enter society as whole human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from members of the committee? Comments or questions? Um, I don't see any, but uh, Raisha, I, I know the work that, that you've done. Um, and I, I just wanna say, I'm glad your brother's in a better setting um, and, and getting the help that he needs. And uh, you really have been a, a true advocate on his behalf and the behalf of uh, many thank people you. in our state. So thank you. Thank you um, very much. Yes. Enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. Um,
next, uh, we have Andrew Gearing, uh, Nicholas Fratini, and then Catherine Bradley. Is uh, Andrew in? I'm here. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can hear and see you. You got your three minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, Co-Chair Senator Winfield and Representative Stavstrom, Vice Chair Senator Kasser and Representative Blumenthal, Ranking Members Senator Kissel and Representative Fishbein, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Andrew Gearing. I'm a resident of New Haven and an attorney with the Connecticut Federal Defender Office. Many of my clients have experienced administrative segregation and other forms of confinement in DOC facilities. I speak from that experience, but in my personal capacity, in solidarity with Ms. Bivens and the brave organizers at Stop Solitary. I'm here today to ask you to vote out of committee SB 1059, the Protect Act. I ask you to give utmost credence to what you heard today from the mental health experts, legal experts, and especially the directly impacted people who have taken the time to testify today in favor of abolishing solitary confinement in Connecticut. On mental health, I think the statistic that about half of prison suicides take place in solitary confinement says it all and these findings are nothing new. I'd like to refer you to a Supreme Court case from 1890 called Inri Medley. Uh, the citation is 134 US 160. In that case, the Supreme Court observed that even after a short period of solitary confinement, many prisoners commit suicide or become violently insane. And even those few who would stand the ordeal are not reformed, but are so mentally damaged that they cannot be of any subsequent service to the community. Most of those are the court's words. Today, somehow solitary confinement is still legal, but thankfully it is on the way out with courts increasingly holding that solitary confinement can constitute a cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. You've heard today how cruel the practice can be and also that unfortunately it is not that unusual practice in Connecticut's prisons. I would just like to very briefly add just one point about the men and women on whom this punishment is inflicted. We all know that the number of defendants serving prison sentences in DOC facilities has been declining for many years. But at the same time, there has been no such decline in the pretrial population. In other words, an increasingly high percentage of the people living in Connecticut prisons have not been convicted of any crime, but are just there waiting for their day in court. Many have now been waiting for a very long time as there have been no criminal trials in state or federal court in Connecticut since the onset of the pandemic. I bring this up to suggest that it is contrary to the presumption of innocence to use such extreme a punishment as solitary confinement against people who are, as a matter of law, innocent. To lock up like animals people who have not pled guilty or seen a jury, but merely stand accused of a crime, who supposedly were not punishing yet, but are only being detained, in theory for the public safety, or perhaps in practice because they are poor and cannot afford cash bail. Respectfully, I ask that the committee stand on the right side of history by passing favorably on Ray's Bill 1059. Thank you very much for your time and your service. Thank you. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I don't see any. It's uh, good to see you again, Mr. Gearing. Uh, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for testifying. Thank you, Senator. Always good to see you. All uh, right. Next, we have Nicholas Frattini, Catherine Bradley, uh, and then Jan Combo Piano. I think I did that justice. Uh, Nicholas Frattini. Yep. Here. You have your three minutes. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, and uh, and yeah, thanks for listening to me. Uh, my name is Nicholas Frattini. And I'm a graduate student in physics at Yale, uh, a resident of New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm here to support the PROTECT Act, or SB 1059, as well as SB 972. Both bills will help incarcerated individuals maintain social connections, which is absolutely vital to their mental health, as you've heard uh, so far from many today. While I've not myself been directly affected, nor am I an expert, I am a concerned citizen. We have an ethical obligation to end solitary confinement for all people. It is torture as defined by the United Nations. Solitary confinement and instances of prolonged isolation are designed to break a person. And it is routine practice right here in our state of Connecticut to leave incarcerated individuals in solitary confinement for a majority of the day. Again, as you've heard from those affected, it is torture and it should stop. Additionally, these practices of prolonged isolation do not work for our communities. 
I'm an engineer by trade, and every engineer's job is to design an efficient system that generates the desired outcome safely for all those individuals involved. I ask, what is the desired outcome here? The current outcome is that those who survive solitary confinement come out with long-term health effects and are more likely to engage in self-harm. In a study of over 200,000 incarcerations from the American Journal of Public Health, only 7.3% of the admissions of, the, uh, of those uh, included some solitary confinement. But 53% of the acts of self-harm that they uh, recorded uh, and fatal self-harm occurred from within this group who were solitarily confined. This is not an outcome that we want. And I repeat, it does not work for our communities. Finally, an important part of engineering is testing and quality control to make sure that you meet the desired safety requirements. Without testing and quality control, unsafe products come to market, which is why it is required in the first place. In prisons, we're talking about the lives and the well-being of real people. You as legislators have the opportunity to enforce some measure of safety requirement here by passing SB 1059, which requires an ombudsperson to ensure concerns are heard. With that, I thank you for your time and again voice my strong support for the PROTECT Act, SB 1059, and also SB 972. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fertini. Uh, is there a comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I do not see any. I want to thank you for uh, joining us and providing us with your testimony. I hope you can enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next, we'll hear from Catherine Bradley, followed by Jan Combo Piano, and then Rachel Brown. Is Catherine Bradley in? Yes, I am. All right, you have your three minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening to the members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Catherine Bradley. I am a resident of Ridgefield, and I would like to express my strong support for the PROTECT Act SB 1059. I am currently pursuing my master's in social work at Fordham University, and I chose the social work profession out of a desire to support the mental health of all people. But it is very difficult for me and mental health professionals across the state to do that work when the state's policies are actively harming people's mental well being. One of the ways in which the state endangers mental health and perpetuates psychological trauma is through the use of solitary confinement in its prison system. Solitary confinement and isolation in Connecticut prisons cause deep harm to all incarcerated people who are subject to these cruel and punitive forms of punishment. Many incarcerated people are already suffering from mental illness or the effects of trauma before entering the prison system, as we have heard through several testimonies today. Once in the system, does the state of Connecticut offer support to treat mental illness, heal trauma, teach healthy conflict resolution skills, and reduce recidivism? No. Instead, the Department of Corrections regularly puts people in solitary confinement or other restrictive status, isolating them for indefinite amounts of time, often for arbitrary reasons. A UN human rights expert, specifically referring to the Connecticut Department of Corrections, says the current isolation practices, quote, may well amount to torture. I think that statement is a condemning portrayal of our state and should anger those such as myself who care about the state and want to make it better. I believe that all of us have a collective responsibility to promote health and wellness for all people from birth until end of life. Solitary confinement does not do that. Instead, it traumatizes, triggers new or pre-existing mental illnesses and fosters anger and resentment. And after release, it sends formerly incarcerated people to social and mental health services with needs that are oftentimes greater than they were pre-incarceration. As a future social worker, I am well aware that many of the service providers that I may someday work for are already overwhelmed and under-resourced. That strain only grows the longer the state upholds practices of violence, trauma, and torture. So in conclusion, I strongly support the PROTECT Act SB 1059, and I urge you to vote favorably uh, this bill out of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? Uh, see, I don't see any. Uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us, uh, waiting around, and spending a part of your evening with us to testify. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Jan Combo Piano, Rachel Brown, and then Geneva Stewart. Uh, is Ms. Combo Piano in?
are you in? I see your name. Um, what about Rachel Brown? Hello, I'm here. All right, uh, you have three minutes, you may begin. Awesome. Um, my name is Rachel Brown and I'm a resident of New Haven who supports SB uh, 1059. I'll be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of Joseph Stewart, um, J-O-S-E-P-H, Stewart, um, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he is incarcerated. Um, my name is Joseph Stewart. I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm currently incarcerated in New Haven Correctional Centers. I'm writing this testimony for the matter of abusive restraints. In 2015, while incarcerated at Osborne Prison, my back slipped a disc due to an injury I already had. I had to go to the hospital where I was treated and then released back to the Osborne Prison Hospital bed for two days. I was in a lot of pain after two days and I was asked by the COs to leave. I told the officers I was in a lot of pain and couldn't use the restroom properly. The CEOs told me that they didn't care about my back pain and said if I didn't get up, that they were going to cuff me behind my back and drag me on my belly. I was very scared and had to walk, sometimes falling and crawling to get to the next cell to avoid more injury while in cuffs. I also noticed they had no camera to record the situation. My point is, that a lot of physical harm could be done when COs rough handle injured inmates. And sometimes this could lead to death. If we include the PROTECT Act in this bill, we may save some lives. So I support this bill strongly. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from members of the committee? Questions or comments? Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, it will try Jan Combo Piano again, Geneva Stewart, Ivana Bozik. Is Jan Combo Piano in? I see you, I do, all right. How do I move in here? Oh, we got you, we got you. <laughs> okay. You, 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 you have your three minutes, you may begin. Thank, thank you so much and thank you for saying my name correctly. Um, <clears throat> I want to, thank the Judiciary Committee for having this hearing and for allowing me to share a testimony from two currently incarcerated people who wrote in in support of SB 972. The first is from O'Shane, O-S-H-A-N-E. I'm sorry, I do not have her last name. <clears throat> We've not been able to contact our families in the outside world during the pandemic. They said they offered us two free phone calls, but these calls are never enough to contact all your loved ones to make sure they're all right and to make sure they know you're all right. So with that, you catch a charge and it's a burden on them. People are going through the pandemic just as much as, as us, having bills to pay, having to think whether you're going to use a portion of your stimulus to check on us or on things that are needed on the outside. It all boils down to an excessive amount of money and only giving two free phone calls wanting to pacify us. It's not right. My mother lives in Jamaica. My father lives in Canada and my grandmother in another state right now. My father has a rate that's more like calling international and my mother also has to pay. Right now she's struggling and my father isn't doing much better in Canada because of the pandemic. My grandmother doesn't work. She's 77 and collects social security. It comes down to whether she wants to send me a couple of dollars to buy toiletries and stuff like that, or whether she wants to make sure I'm okay and letting me know what's going on out there. It's like a pick and choose. And altogether, I know it's hundreds being spent monthly between the three of them. The next is from Shawnee, S H. A-U-N-I-E. My experience is that both my mother and father live in North Carolina, and I'm only allowed to call them on the weekend, Saturday or Sundays, when they have free phone calls, because they're both, both on fixed incomes and can't afford it. And plus, they are long distance. They're not in Connecticut. They're way down in North Carolina. Them being on fixed incomes and my pop, he's retired. They have a house, they have a mortgage, they have other responsibilities. 
If it was an emergency, I couldn't call them. I would have to wait until the following weekend or would have to tell somebody in my place that if something happened to me, please call my parents for me. But they would have to wait until the following weekend because it was too expensive to call. These calls in the secure system right now, even if I call two minutes or 20 minutes, it's a $5 phone call. And not only that, it deals with two different phone companies in two different states, and that all adds up to my parents. If it wasn't for letters for the mail system for which we get envelopes when we're indigent, but even that's hard because if we aren't indigent for 90 straight days without having money in our account for commissary, we can't get it. We can't have contact. Thank you. Thank you. That was pretty, pretty much on, on the schedule. Uh, comments or questions from members of the committee? Comments or questions? I don't see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us and uh, sharing the testimony of those individuals. Uh, appreciate it very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next, we have Geneva Stewart, Ivana Bozek, and then Eliza Kravitz. Is Geneva Stewart in? Um, Ivana Bozek? Thank you. Oh, can I start? Yeah, you may start now. Okay, hi, I wanna thank you all for your patience and listening to all this testimony today. Um, my name is Ivana Bozik. I'm a resident of New Haven and I would like to express my strong support for SB 1059. I'm a student at Yale studying cognitive science and my research and reading on social neuroscience has made one thing very clear to me. Social isolation is traumatizing, having the potential to cause lasting brain damage. So today I wanna to share some of the science behind why solitary is so damaging. The human brain requires social contact. When we look at brains of different species, the number one predictor of brain size is the number of social connections that an individual has. So in other words, the reason that we have brains so big is because we have social needs as human beings. Our brains were literally designed for social interaction. And the social areas of the brain that aren't in use literally atrophy, like they decay and sometimes they can't be regenerated. Um, the stress of social isol isolation shrinks the hippocampus. That's the region responsible for learning, memory and spatial navigation. One professor of psychiatry at the University of Chicago said that solitary confinement was nothing less than death penalty by social deprivation. Now calling this the death penalty might sound extreme at first, but we've heard people testify about the strong causal link between solitary and suicide. Um, and researchers have found this link even in people who didn't have mental health problems before. And the ones that do make it out of solitary alive, they have decreased life expectancy from PTSD, worsened immune systems, risk of cardiac arrest. Um, earlier, Tracy Bernardi shared her experiences in solitary and um, Representative Fishbein, you told her that experiences were subjective. Someone's experience of solitary isn't the same as everyone else's, um, but actually the data is pretty clear that her perception was not an outlier. Solitary is torture, and that's the norm uh, in the ways that people perceive their experiences. And this is a bipartisan thing. Um, we can look at respected Republican Senator John McCain. He spent two years in solitary confinement when he was a prisoner of war. And even he said that it was torture. He said, it's an awful thing, solitary. It crushes your spirit and weakens your resistance more effectively than any other form of mistreatment. And that's coming from a man who was beaten regularly, denied medical treatment for two broken arms and his legs, um, chronic dysentery. He was even tortured to the point of having an arm broken again. And he said solitary was the worst torture he'd ever experienced. So how many more people have to die before we do something? But that's not a rhetorical question. I really genuinely want any, anyone who doesn't want to pass this bill to sit there and re reflect on how many more people have to die until we do something about this. How many more mothers like Colleen Lord have to come to us in tears before we stop torturing people? If you don't vote to pass <laughs> SB 1059, you will have blood on your hands. Thank you. Oh, well, that is a good wrap up. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or questions? Um, I do not see any. Oh, wait, 
I thought it, sorry, no. Just Representative Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your patience with my hand raising malfunction. Um, Ms. Bozek, I just want to thank you very much for bringing the neuroscience into this. We've heard a lot of really um, emotional testimony, heartfelt and, and real testimony from folks who've experienced this, but it's also really interesting to think about the hippocampus and, and the changes in the brain structure. So just wanted to thank you for bringing um, that perspective. And, and tell us one more time, please. Are, are you a student or professor? I'm a student. I'm a senior. And you're studying? Cognitive science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative O'Day. Representative O'Day. Oh, sorry about that. I, uh, I, I pulled over to ask a question. Uh, I'm not uh, driving at this point in time, but I, I want to thank you for your testimony, ma'am, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for recognizing me. Sorry, I'm late, but can you can you get us? I, I don't. I honestly am embarrassed. I don't know this answer to this. How many people have died uh, in solitary confinement in in Connecticut or even countrywide? If you have that stat, uh, I agree with you. We, we we need to do something. I just don't know what we need to do, and I don't have the numbers. So. To the extent you can get us that information, that'd be greatly appreciated. I actually don't know the exact number, but I'll find it and email it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Comment or question from other members of the committee? Comment or question? I don't see any, Ms. Bozik. Thank you Thanks. very much for joining us this evening and providing your testimony. And uh, please feel free to email the committee. Uh, have a, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. Uh, next, we'll hear from Eliza Kravitz, uh, followed by Bradley Pellissier, and then Jessalyn Burns. Uh, is Eliza Kravitz ready to go? Yes. Hi. Good evening. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, my name is Eliza Kravitz. I'm a student and undergrad at Yale University, um, a resident of New Haven, and I support SB 1059. Um, I'll be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of Jason Good, that's J-A-S-O-N-G-O-O-D-E, a supporter of this bill who can't be here today because he's incarcerated. My name is Jason Good, and I am currently confined at the Northern Correction Institution in Summers, Connecticut. Originally, I'm from Waterbury, Connecticut. For the purpose that you all are gathered here today, I very much agree with and support the proposed Protect Act SB 1059. I've been housed at Northern this time on administrative segregation since October 2016 continuously. Continuously until recently without mental health treatment and this egregious omission towards someone with issues of mental health impairment prior to his in in imprisonment. The Connecticut DOC, including its Northern Correctional Institution, has policies, practices, and procedures that discriminate, penalize rather, prisoners who are diagnosed with mental disabilities, causing such persons to miss their earliest release date from custody, whether it be parole or one's estimated release date from accrued good time credits. This is what long-term segregation does, effectively helps destroy the social bonds of family, not to mention enabling one with mental impairments to remain in jail longer. And after a several year bout of long-term isolation, with all its accompanying tortures and missed earlier release dates to the community, would anyone with a mind of absolute reason believe that the soon to be released solitary confinement prisoner would be an ameliorated one? This is not a hard game show Jeopardy type question. For this and all other reasons, those with the power to do so should pass the Protect Act SB 1059 into law. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comment or questions from members of the committee? Comment or questions? I don't see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us and offering your testimony. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we'll hear from Bradley Pellissier, followed by uh, Jessalyn Burns, and then Wilkins Guadalupe. Uh, Mr. Pellissier, are you here? I see that you're in. Uh, Bradley Pellissier. Uh, yeah, we are. Hello. Yep, there we are. 
Uh, can you turn your camera on? Is it possible? So you for a second, there you are. Oh, there, you're going again. All right, you have your three minutes. Sir. Thank you for taking the time to allow me to testify before the committee. Uh, my name is Brad Pellissier. I'm a resident of Summers, Connecticut, and a former investigator for the former State Office of Protection and Advocacy for Persons with Disabilities. And in that role, I have seen firsthand a number of the, the difficulties faced by people with a number of physical and psychiatric disabilities um, who have been through the corrections. And I would like to speak in support of this bill, which will end the use of seclusion, which has created great harm in many people's lives. Uh, we as a society have advanced in medicine, in psychiatry, in psychology, in technology, in many ways that we're still using methods and corrections that date back centuries. Not because these are necessarily good ideas, just because they've worked. It is tradition, not to make people better, but to control the immediate situation. I would suggest that the practice is similar to a doctor today continuing to use bloodletting to treat an illness. We would see him as engaging in malpractice using centuries old techniques to try and really rehabilitate people and bring them back into Connecticut society is at least as egregious. Frankly, the legislature owes it not only to people in the Department of Corrections, but to the citizens of Connecticut as a whole to return people to society, at least not worse off than they went into the department and hopefully better off. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Comment or questions from members of the committee? Comments or question? I do not see any. Thank you for uh, sticking around and uh, making sure that you were able to testify and providing your, to your perspective. Uh, hope you have a great evening. Thank you, too, sir. Uh, next is Jessalyn Burns, followed by Wilkins Guadalupe, and then Natalie Troy. Is Jessalyn Burns uh, around? Wilkins, Guadalupe. Here. Okay, right. you have three minutes. I'm gonna testify in the support of 1059. There's a Sierra Western in Stanford. Um, vice race chan I can't like, say white, but I'm nervous. So this one, my, my name is Wilkins Guadalupe. I am a disabled person that's been incarcerated. I have mental health problems. I got skin suspect family. I went to jail in 2010. In 2010, I had a couple of accidents because I was a drug addict one time too with a mental health problem and I have brain injury. So I had an incident, I had a fight. I went into SAG for seven days. I left out of SAG, miserable. I started reacting crazy and didn't understand myself. Then I had an accident with this guy that was uh, opposite length of me. He was gay and I wasn't. And that day it was October 30, 2010, the same year I just came in. And the seals pepper sprayed me that day, fit so much that I couldn't breathe. I was handcuffed, put my face in the water, my head backward, and the um, pepper spray wasn't enough to come off my eyes. I couldn't see. I was handcuffed. He pulled, He told me to step, take two steps back and go in my knees. And next thing, I told him I couldn't go in my knees because I was handcuffed. And he like he tried push like put me down, and I fell face first to the floor. I had a black eye and a freaking tooth loss. See. And I've been paranoid since that. So I started not eating property in jail. I couldn't eat and stay focused. I couldn't tell my mom what's going on because they had me in IPN wound. I was naked with, with a green tan, with a green tan they hold us. It was cold and I did not like it. I was feeling like I was there for a month, but I was so miserable in there. My appetite started freezing, scared, nervous, you know? I couldn't stay there. I couldn't wait to go home. I couldn't tell my mom to come see me because I was scared to come and hunt my, hunt my family and do something to them. 
then then I, I started being there working out because I couldn't cry because when I cry, I had to sweat myself out so much that that's the only way I could have cried because I needed to be a man in there. I put a pen in my pocket just to to wonder why I'm holding a pen in my pocket thinking that I'm not home because I feel like I'll come home. I'm not home because I still think I'm in there suffering the same pain that I've been going through, the, the paranoia, the, the schizophrenia. I still take my meds that drug me so much that I was so medicated that I couldn't understand myself. I was so desperate to leave. I have fights to handcuff me so tight. My hand was so tight. I had a lady, a captain in there watching me naked in a womb, in a seg womb. And I, I felt it disgusting and I couldn't understand why she was there looking at me. I'm there handcuffed, bent over. Mr. Mr. Guadalupe, um, if you could uh, summarize, your, your time is expired. Oh, oh okay. Oh, I'm saying, um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> It's, I'm nervous, you know, and I'm just saying that it was messed up how to treat us in there. It was so much things that happened in there. I, I could write the whole story, but it just is so much difficult to write it down and let y'all know everything because I feel like they're going to come after us. I just support in the, the 1059 because I'm, I'm still nervous until now. Mr. Guadalupe, um, Thank you for your, your testimony. And I know you're nervous, but um, we hear you. And, and let me check to see if there are any comments or questions. Um, or comments or questions from members of the committee? Comments or questions? Uh, I don't see any, any comments or questions. I wanna thank you. Uh, obviously this was a lot for you to uh, come and testify before us, but uh, I want you to know that you are being heard and that it really does matter. So, so thank you for braving it out anyway. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. I appreciate your moment. And I wanted out, I, I got so much things to say, but I couldn't write it down because I still think about it and I don't want to think about it. I try to black it off my mind. Yeah. That's why I didn't want to go into detail too much because it was too awful for me. You, you, did, a, you did a great job. Um, you should know that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a great evening. You too. Um, next, we have uh, Natalie Troy, followed by uh, Kai Cedeno, uh Marcelina Padilla. Uh, Natalie Troy. Hi. Yeah, I'm here. Um, thank you so much for all of your patience um, and sitting through all of this testimony today. My name is Natalie Troy and I am a resident of New Haven who supports SB 1059. I will be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of Julian Bennett, that's spelled J-U-L-I-A-N space B-E-N-N-E-T-T a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he is incarcerated. My name is Julian Bennett. I am from Hartford, Connecticut, and I 100% strongly support the PROTECT Act, SB 1059. I am currently at Northern CI on administrative segregation status, which is, in all actuality, solitary confinement status. Never once in my life have I tried to kill myself until I came to Northern CI's administrative segregation. I've been placed on in-cell restraints over roughly 50 times into cells that were freezing cold. The conditions of said cells were repugnant. While chained up like a slave overnight, I've been forced to stay in cells that had feces, urine, dried up food particles, and little insects all over. I remember a time when I was on in-cell restraints. The CO banged on the door and said, Bennett, ciao. I explained to the CEO that someone else's dried up poop and urine has been sitting inside of the trap and that I'm not taking any food to eat from out of that safety trap until it gets cleaned. The CEO then stated, okay, I guess you don't eat then. I went on for three days without eating or drinking while on in-cell restraints. I recall numerous times when supervisors and CEOs entered my cell while I was on in-cell restraints to do a quote restraint check without a camera being present and staff would beat me and spray me with mace and claim I was resisting. Sometimes I can't tell what's worse, the physical abuse or the psychological abuse. 
Here at Northern CI's administrative segregation status, they use psychological tactics such as learned helplessness, sensory deprivation, and drug therapy. Since a child, I've been diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and impulsive disorder. Being in this kind of environment does not fit my institutional needs, and in fact, worsens my mental disorders to the point where sometimes I don't feel as though I am human anymore. The PROTECT Act gives me hope that people will never have to endure what me and others have had to while being in solitary confinement, physically or mentally. I am a little content knowing that there are people on the outside who see that we are not animals and are actually trying to protect us with the PROTECT Act. The DOC is always quick to penalize us inmates if we are or if they feel as though we are in the wrong, but if DOC is in the wrong, they never own up, nor do they get penalized. I strongly and sincerely support the PROTECT Act because it seeks to create an Office of Corrections Ombuds. If you have the power to fix a problem that is so obviously staring you in the face, then the power is meant to fix. If not, then you've officially become part of the problem you so openly condone to. Thank you. Um, Representative Bembus. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for sharing your testimony on behalf of Mr. Bennett. Um, quick question for you. Do you know how long ago Mr. Bennett was placed on, I believe you had in your testimony said 50, 50 times in constraints. Do you know when that took place? I do not know, but you should ask um, Madeline Batt from the Lowenstein Clinic at the Yale Law School. Okay, I'll be... I'll be more than happy to. It's just to get a time reference as to if this is something that just occurred and is occurring or something that's taken place, uh, you know, a few years ago. Do you know what the charges are that um, put Mr. Bennett in prison? I don't. I was just sent the testimony, but she, I'm sure, has all that information. Okay. Have you ever spoken to Mr. Bennett then? I have not. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Rabimbas. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I uh, do not see any. I want to thank you very much for coming and uh, sharing that testimony with us. Have a great evening. Uh, Kai Cedeno, Marcelina Padilla, and Freunds. It's Kai Cedeno. And yes, good evening. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Kai Cedeno. I'm a member of the Yale University Prison Project, which works closely with Stop Solitary Connecticut. And I'm a resident of New Haven speaking today in support of SB 1059, the PROTECT Act. I'll be using my time to read excerpts from testimony from the testimony of Carlton Wallace. That's Carlton C-A-R-L-T-O-N Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-C-E, a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he is incarcerated. Solitary confinement is like a prison system within a prison system, a double prison. Past commissioners of DOC, along with their prison administrators, imagined that they were preventing and stabilizing potential violence and ongoing violence in Connecticut's correctional facilities. But what they were really doing was sweeping everything under the rug until the whole fabric was ruined beyond repair. I speak in respect to how those who are incarcerated in solitary confinement have very high mortality rates compared to the non-solitary confinement prisoners in Connecticut and other states of America. Suicide, homicide, and drug overdoses are the three main killers of isolation as captives. In other words, we make our own departure from solitary confinement in prison to make a negative impact on society as well as ourselves. Even when we transition into the general population of Connecticut DOC, we find it hard to get back to our old selves which have many flaws, various shortcomings, but still a lot better than our newfound selves, the versions of us that personify self-destruction and self-degradation. Out of everything that has been emphasized about Northern CI and solitary confinement, there is one main thing that is, in my cognizant opinion, underemphasized. That is, the racial implications of this primitive system of Connecticut's Department of Corrections. Most administrative segregations most of, rather, administrative segregations inmates are Black, then Latino, while every once in a while, someone white will be admitted into the program. Northern CI, in Northern CI, there has been many cases of CO brutality, deliberate indifference to mental health and medical needs, sexual abuse, and other forms of cruel and unusual punishment to so many Black prisoners. Even with the grievance system, as well as the DOC disciplinary process, 
there's a systemic capacity for institutional denials of mock compromise and mock compromises. When we submitted grievance forms with legitimate requests and arguments, we were mostly denied. While the AS administration treats me like the rat in Skinner's box, I keep going round and round with the same detrimental behaviors. All they can do is bombard me with tickets and sanctions, not doing enough to treat me with the right tools of treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedeno. Comment or questions from members of the committee? Comment or question? I do not see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us this after, uh, evening and uh, sharing that testimony with us. I hope you have a great after, uh, evening. Uh, next, we will hear from Marcelina Padilla and Foyne and uh, George uh, Guzman. Is Marcelina Padilla in? And Freund. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Senator Winfield and all the members of the Ju Judiciary Committee. My name is Anne Freund and I'm a resident of Hamden. I would like to express my strong support as a concerned citizen for Senate Bill 1059, also known as the PROTECT Act, and in particular, greater accountability in the Connecticut prison system. The need for independent an independent oversight council was eloquently documented in earlier testimony of Kednesha Boyd. There have too often there have been serious mistakes and abuses of power in the correction system, resulting in deaths, brutality, and unwarranted punishments such as long-term solitary confinement. And the racial disparities in the impact of this treatment are dramatic and unjust. I believe that practices inside prisons should accord with commonly held values of humane treatment and respect for dignity of the incarcerated and their families. We voters in the state of Connecticut who pay taxes for the operations of the Department of Corrections have a right and an obligation to know whether the treatment of incarcerated persons is serving well our communities. I recognize that a correctional institution is a difficult place to carry out best practices. Those who are incarcerated may be miserable or angry. Those who are employed, not all, but some, may be resentful and over time indifferent to stated rules and best practices. The Department of Corrections officers have a union and supervisors to appeal to, to when they have a grievance. But to whom can incarcerated persons appeal when there are serious problems and abuses? When abuses fester, daily life and performance governance inside a prison can become unmanageable. Staff members have resigned because of stress affecting their health. It is for these reasons that an independent ombuds office or accountability commission, which includes representatives of the formerly incarcerated needs to be established. The office can investigate concerns and make recommendations to the Department of Corrections. In conclusion, to have transparency of DOC practices makes it accountable to the wider community that expects it to work for rehabilitation and reintegration of incarcerated individuals. Rehabilitation can be successful in a prison climate free of abusive power. And I believe Connecticut can be a leader in a move toward greater accountability in prisons. Therefore, I urge you to vote favorably on this bill, 1059. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Freund. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee, comment or questions? I do not see any on it. Thank you very much for joining us this evening uh, and offering your testimony. I uh, hope you have a great uh, evening. Thank you. And you too. All right. Uh, next uh, will be George Guzman, uh, Richard Kilborn, and Ify Chaikizi. Uh, Mr. Guzman, you have your three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Senator Winfield, Representative Storstrom, members of the, mem of the committee. I am here in support of SB 1059. My name is Jorge Guzman. I'm a resident of Norwalk, and I'm a member of One Standard of Justice. A statewide civil rights advocacy group, OSJ, works with men and women arrested or convicted with a sexual offense and their families 
I also identify as a person who once was incarcerated. I was sentenced to prison as a young man. I was set my, when I was sentenced, my lawyer told me that I would go to a level three facility, which was organized as a, categorized as a medium risk person, meaning I get more physical activities, less time locked up. Instead, I was sent by DOC to a level four facility, minimum to high risk. I was locked down 22 hours a day. Recreation would often be canceled and staff, if staff didn't want to go outside because it was too hot. So the hour we would have gotten a, outside our cell was too often taken away. There was nothing else to except to sleep or sit on our bunks or watch TV. Because if you couldn't really work out or do anything else, in a tiny cell meant for one person that I was shared with another person. If there was a lockdown somewhere other than our block, the whole prison would be locked down, so we would lose more time. The food is horrible, everything is soy-based and full of carbs. I became pre-diabetic because of the lack of exercise and proper food. People who make small mistakes are sent to jail and can end up with poor health and with more issues. When returning to our community, they may rely on government assistance and may have developed mental health issues, especially PTSD. Trying to readjust to life on the outside is hard to do with or without family support. There is a huge gap between comfort and basic needs. The humility and dignity is lacking in our prison system, making us feel less than. I am here in support of SB 1059 and particularly the support implementation of a ombudsman office and allowing all people out of their cells eight plus hours a day to eliminate solitary confinement by using more humane alternatives to achieve transparency and accountability for all staff overseeing people inside and inside prisons and provide a fair grievance system where people inside and their families will actually be heard. I too have seen many scary things and traumatized me. Prisons could be a pos could be the most violent place on earth. Thank you for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Guzman. A uh, comment or question from members of the committee. Comment or question. I don't see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening and offering your testimony. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Uh, Richard Kilborn, followed by Ify Chakizi, uh, and then Bandy Lee. Richard Kilborn, uh, Kilborn? Ify Chakizi? Good. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm here, Kilborn. Oh, Hi, uh, Senator. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Winfield, uh, members of the uh, Judiciary Committee. And I, I feel very privileged to be here to um, deliver a message by proxy and it's on behalf uh, primarily of Senate Bill 972, which we've heard much touching and agonizing and heartfelt testimony today. Um, it's on behalf of my stepson, Michael Bram, who couldn't deliver it uh, himself because he's currently incarcerated in um, the Cheshire Correctional Facility. Uh, but uh, this, what I'm reading now is uh, his testimony, his statement. Michael Bram, uh, B R A H A M, and he's 231451. And these are his words My name is Michael Bram. I support Senate Bill 972 because the way Securus operates in Connecticut harms the state and its residents. Michael says, I have a daughter who was six months old when I became incarcerated. And because her mother couldn't afford Securus's prices, I have rarely spoken to her throughout my incarceration. As a result, my daughter and I are essentially strangers. Now she's in her mid twenties now. Ironically, the pandemic has made this less so because since it began, Securus has given prisoners two free calls weekly. I use those calls to speak to my daughters or my daughter rather, and to her son. It's unbelievable when I think about it, but I've spoken to my daughter more in the past year than I've had uh, in the 24 years before that. Because a successful re-entry of prisoners depends on their having strong family ties, phone call costs should not prevent families from staying in contact with their incarcerated loved ones. And on a related note, I support Senate Bill 978 because I'm statutorily ineligible for parole. I'm also statutorily barred from earning both good time and risk reduction earned credit. 
This means that no matter what I do to rehabilitate myself while incarcerated, I have no way of attaining early release. And this is unfair because others do have that opportunity to earn parole. So uh, if I just may, that's the end of his, uh, Michael's statement. Just briefly, if I can, uh, I know I'm pushing the time here, but uh, you know, certainly the, uh, the bill to provide uh, free phone calls and uh, to eliminate uh, solitary confinement are steps in taking Connecticut out of the dark ages. But this bill, SB 978 is I think equally important in that uh, it would eliminate the possibility that anybody convicted of a crime when they're under the age of 25 would be able to receive a sentence of life without parole. And this would bring us uh, not just out of the dark ages, but, but the US Supreme Court. Uh, yes, uh, Senator. Uh, you you have uh, expired your time, so I'm yes, going sir. to ask if there are any comments or questions from members of the committee. Uh, any comments or question? Um, and I, I want to say to you, um, we're trying to be fair to everybody, so we're not trying to give extra time. But I do recognize the importance of the bill that you're referring to, and yes. have noted have noted your testimony uh, in support of it. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for testifying on behalf of your stepson, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I will. We, we just don't want to be behind South Dakota, which just last week, the Senate, uh, state Senate passed a bill that uh, would uh, make it uh, that revoked all or eliminated all sentences of life imprisonment for anybody under 25. And we don't think of South Dakota as being a uh, most of us as a particular Mr. Kilborn, Mr. Kilborn, thank you. Thank right, you. Thank I, I, I appreciate it. And I understand the, the, the passion behind it. And I, I agree with you. I've uh, pushed this bill or a version of it for a couple of years now. So you have Senator, I appreciate uh, that. We, all, we appreciate and, 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 and I think I actually have uh, had conversation with Michael. At some I point, know but, he speaks very highly of you and, uh, uh, in our conversations also. Yes. So I'm aware of that. I'm aware of the work that you've done and I do appreciate it. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your, your advocacy on his behalf and on behalf of the people of the state of Connecticut. Right, Have a great you, evening. Sir. You too. Thanks. Uh, next we'll hear from Ify Chakizi, followed by Bandy Lee and then uh, Sydney Bryant. Is Ify Chakizi in? Uh, yes, I'm right here. Uh, there you are. You have three minutes. Great, thank you. Good evening, esteemed members of the committee. My name is Evie Chigazie, and I am a student with the Lowenstein International Human Rights Law Clinic at Yale Law School. Our clinic has been investigating solitary confinement in Connecticut for more than a decade, and we urge you to pass SB 1059 for the following three reasons. First, SB 1059 will end several ongoing severe human rights abuses in Connecticut prisons. Prolonged isolation, the use of solitary confinement for punitive purposes and use of restraints for punitive purposes all violate international human rights norms. The Lowenstein Clinic has found, and we've heard from many people here today, that Connecticut routinely engages in these practices. In response to the question about how recent extreme isolation and punitive restraints are, our clinic team is in communication with individuals on the inside and the testimony you're hearing today reflect current conditions and recent events. Just last year, the United, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Melzer, concluded that right here in Connecticut, the OC's use of extreme isolation can lead to, and I quote, severe and often irreparable psychological and physical consequences. Connecticut's practices constitute, at a minimum, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, and as the Special Rapporteur affirmed, quote, may well amount to torture. There's a publicly available letter, letter from the clinic that includes information underlying Melzer's statement, and also the complaint of a recently filed lawsuit against DOC by Disability Rights Connecticut includes recent specific incidents that are representative of the abuses taking place in Connecticut's prisons and jails that many have been discussing here today. In addition, Juan Mendez, one of the former United Nations Special Rapporteurs on Torture, submitted written testimony just this morning in support of SB 1059. And I encourage you to review for more in-depth review of the serious human rights concerns regarding extreme isolation. Second, SB 1059 addresses practices that courts have increasingly found to constitute cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. For the sake of time, I won't belabor this point as federal public defender, Mr. Andrew Gearing spoke to this earlier. I'll just note that the loss of dignity and humanity, which the Constitution is meant to protect, 
has led many federal judges to conclude that solitary confinement itself may be considered a cruel and unusual punishment. And Justice Sotomayor of the Supreme Court has said that this practice raises, quote, clear constitutional problems. Finally, SB 1059 opens space for the implementation of alternative practices that do not isolate and torture individuals. States across the country are taking steps to eliminate prolonged isolation and instead use alternative practices like several others have mentioned today. And I believe individuals who will speak after me, some individuals speaking after me will be speaking about this a little bit more. By employing alternatives, correctional systems have experienced reduced assaults, reduced suicidality and self-harm and reduced recidivism. By implementing SB 1059, Connecticut will end practices that international and federal bodies have recognized to be abusive. The state can instead pursue alternatives to isolation that are less harmful and more effective. So we emphasize that the choice between solitary confinement and safety is a false choice and Connecticut has options. We urge Connecticut to make the choice to end a knowingly torturous practice and to join the growing movement and solitary by passing SB 1059. And thank you all so much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chikizie. Is that better pronunciation than what I did? It is, it is better pronunciation of what you did, yes. I'm trying. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? Uh, I do not see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us and offering your testimony. I'm sorry about butchering your name. I hope you have it's a okay. good day. Thanks. Thanks uh, so much. Next, we'll hear from Bandy Lee, followed by Sydney Bryant and Margaret Nelson. Is Bandy Lee in? Yes. Can you hear me? I do hear you and see you. You have your three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Bandy Lee. I am a forensic psychiatrist, prison psychiatrist, and was assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine for 17 years. I would like to express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059 or the PROTECT Act. Since 1997, I have researched prison programs that are viable alternatives to solitary confinement for managing and preventing violent behavior. Since 2011, I have testified or served as ex expert consultant for several states, including New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Alabama, and California, on prison programming and on the harmfulness of solitary confinement for both individual mental health and societal safety. I consulted with governments in Ireland, France, and Israel on prison reform and violence prevention programs. In 2013, I co-drafted the report to the New York City Board of Corrections on Solitary Confinement, which led to several reforms at Rikers Island Correctional Facility. I've also consulted with the World Health Organization Violence and Injury Prevention Department since 2002 and published the textbook Violence. Since 2017, I'm president of the World Mental Health Coalition, which is dedicated to promoting societal safety. I would first like to emphasize that solitary confinement is probably one of the worst forms of torture. Everything about the human makeup, including the overblown frontal brain, which is the social center, the formation of the brain itself through social interaction, and the shaping of brain structure well into a person's 20s and 30s, not to mention continually changing connections after that, depend on social input, which is critical to neurological and mental health. Just as oxygen is critical to survival, but often overlooked until it is taken away, the critical need for social input to survival is often overlooked. The effects of prolonged isolation are profoundly damaging on a person, and like the deprivation of oxygen, the damage can be permanent, even if the individual survives. One study showed that loneliness and social isolation heightened mortality by 29%. Yet vulnerable individuals, such as those suffering from mental illness, are disproportionately more likely to be subject to solitary confinement. According to the Bureau of Justice, 25 to 35 percent of people who spent 30 days or longer in solitary confinement in the previous year showed serious psychological distress. This increases the probability of self-mutilation and suicide. Common acts of self-harm include ingestion of poisonous substances or objects leading to metabolic disturbance, hanging or laceration. At Rikers Island, individuals with experience in solitary confinement were more than seven times as likely as those in the general population to engage in self-harm. 
In California's prisons, an individual held in isolation was up to 33 times more likely to commit suicide than someone in the prison system's general population. While the United Nations Committee Against Torture declares that more than 15 days in solitary confinement is torture, most American citizens in isolation spend more than five years under these conditions, Ms. and Lee? many even decades. Ms. Lee, your, your time has elapsed, if you could summarize. Those without prior history of mental illness are also more likely to develop symptoms such as anxiety, depression, psychotic symptoms, and self-harm. Or psychiatric syndrome that consists of hypersensitivity to external stimuli, hallucinations, panic attacks, cognitive deficits, and numerous other physical and psychological problems, including the loss of ability to be around people. Finally, violent behavior generally worsens as a result of isolation through mental health consequences, obsessions, rage or disorientation, and erratic behavior. Ms. So uh, recent uh, research Lee, has uh, Ms. shown- Ms. Lee, yeah. um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off because I asked you to summarize and um, you're going a little longer. So sorry about that. Um, is a, a, a comment or question uh, from members of the committee. Comment or question. Um, thank you, Ms. Lee, for joining us. And I wish I could give you more time, but then I would have to give everybody more time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. We want to make sure everybody has a chance to testify. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. I appreciate you waiting around and, and offering your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear from Sydney Bryant followed by Margaret Nelson uh, and Annabelle uh, Lugo. Is Sydney Bryant uh, around? Yes, hi. You hello, respected chairs. Team. Thank you, Senator Winfield. Um, hello, respected chairs, vice chairs, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Sydney Bryant. I'm a student with Yale on a graduate prison project and resident of New Haven. In support of State Bill 1059, I'll be using my time today to read anonymous testimony that was shared to Stop Solitary Connecticut by someone who is currently incarcerated. I was transferred to Northern CI on administrative segregation pending. When arriving at Northern, I was brought into the facility with 10 to 20 guards. They proceeded to do a five point strip search, four or five guards pinning every part of my body to a wall with a lieutenant or a captain with a can of mace inches away from my face, saying if I move or resist any time during the procedure, I will be sprayed and restrained. After bending over and spreading, I was placed in a medical cell, naked and cold. A couple minutes after being placed in the cell, I cried the most debilitating cry I've ever cried. The closest circumstance that could vaguely relate to this event is when a slave coming from Africa into the new world, being violated and peered at by the people auctioning his humanity away. In the days I'd been here, I'd begun to become socially awkward, depressed, antisocial, and I started to frequently stutter in most conversations. For the past week, every time it gets dark, it seems as if the walls are closing in, my heart picks up and Seems all my problems come rushing to me at once with no rational solution or remedy. I'm starting to feel there's no way out. It's certain inmates that have been in and out of here for years. The longest I'm aware of is 17 years. When looking at these individuals, you notice that they can't make eye contact. They either zone out or fall asleep standing up and have weird twitches. I honestly don't see how being shackled to the phone or being walked chained like a dog to the showers or being in a cell 23 to 24 hours a day with no programming is going to help anyone become a better citizen or inmate. The only outcome that I see coming from any length of solitary confinement is the best scenario, coming home and being on disability for life, or worst scenario, coming home and killing themselves like Khalif Browder with reoffending somewhere between the two. Seeing as we are in the historically progressive state of Connecticut, I feel it is in the best interest of the people that legislators pass a law banning all forms of solitary confinement. I'm not perfect and I've made many mistakes, but the psychological torture is cruel and unusual punishment. If the goal of the Department of Corrections is to destroy an individual offender from the inside out, then they have surely succeeded. And that is the end of their testimony. Thank you very much for sharing that testimony. Is there a comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I do not see any. I want to thank you for uh, hanging in there with us and offering the testimony. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Senator. Uh, next, we have Margaret Nelson, <clears throat> followed by Annabella Lugo, and then Barbara Fair. Is Margaret Nelson around? Uh, what about Annabella Lugo? 
Yes, I'm here. There you are. You have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Annabella Lugo, and I'm a member of the Yale Undergraduate Prison Project, as well as a resident of New Haven who supports State Bill 1059. I will be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of Joe Baltas, J-O-E-B-A-L-T-A-S, a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he is incarcerated. I, Joe Baltas, have repeatedly suffered the abuses and torments of Connecticut corrections for years. I came to prison at 18. And soon after, the DOC began placing me in isolation for the most frivolous reasons you could think of, such as not walking fast enough. I have been subjected to all of the weapons in the DOC's arsenal, inclusive of physical assaults, false disciplinary reports, in-cell restraints for days on end, and use of mace for no other purpose than abuse, and so on and so on. But the worst torment I have ever experienced were the tortures of long-term isolations and abuses imposed at Northern CI by way of their administrative segregation status, or AS, where corrections daily objective is to completely break the prisoners confined there. The sole purpose of this facility and these segregation statuses are to demean and destroy the people sent there, them who are nine towns times out of 10, only there because the administration is upset with them, not for engaging in violence or posing a threat of any kind. There are currently five young Black and Spanish men in AS because they refused to lock their cells until they saw a supervisor regarding a problem with their food and rec. Afterward, they locked up without issue. Subsequently, they were removed from their cells and sent to AS for so-called rioting. I was placed in AS on false disciplinary charges. I had a hearing in one, but I was placed in AS anyway, with a complete disregard for the process. Connecticut DOC has done nothing but weaponize isolated confinement against its prisoners, to no effect but damaging people. Everyone who has gone through AS or is currently there suffers and has become a disciplinary problem. What other impact could it have when you sit in a dark, empty cell all day, every day, with no property and nothing to do? When you are kept awake all night by cries, screams, or people banging their head on a wall? I cannot count the times where I've seen people break and begin to harm themselves in vicious ways. While corrections would stand by and watch and cheer on the self-harm because it gives them an excuse to run into a cell, hurt someone and put them in chains. All AS and isolation ends in is people getting worse, hurting others, hurting themselves or killing themselves. What is the point in a system that only accomplishes that? Nothing but harm. I wholly support a bill to end solitary confinement. I call upon the legislator and demand that they act to end this cycle of abuse and torture and pain. Thank you uh, for reading that testimony. Is there a comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I do not see any. I wanna thank you again for joining us and offering the testimony. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Barbara Fair, followed by Luke Connell. Uh, Fernicia Smith and Jovan Lumpkin, uh, Barbara Fair. Hi, uh, Senator uh, Winfield, um, Representative Stastrom, uh, Senator Kissel, and Fish, Representative Fishburn, and other distinguished members of the ju judiciary. My name is Barbara Fair. I'm a West Haven voter, a member of Stop Solitary, and um, a licensed clinical social worker for over 30 years and I'm a mom of a formerly incarcerated. Um, I first have to say this has been a really, really hard day for me, but I'm gonna try to get through parts of uh, testimony my son had exhibited um, the first time we tried to get rid of solitary. Uh, my name is Keisha Tucker. I'm a survivor of solitary confinement in maximum security prison. I live in New Haven. I've been in solitary the longest time, six months. My first time in solitary was when I was 17. I wasn't convicted of anything. I was pre-trial. I had a threatening and breach of peace charge and I just wasn't able to cope with being in prison. I got tickets for disobeying a direct order but most of those tickets were simple minor violations. Uh, it was, I was in MYI Manson Youth. I was there for three months in um, another kind of uh, isolation. Each time you come out, you're handcuffed, even going to and from the shower. I was there for about three to four months. Um, MYI, for the people who don't know, that's uh, where we keep our, our young people. So this doesn't only happen to adults, it happens to young people also. While I was there, they accused me of assaulting a correctional officer and that's how I landed in Northern, a maximum security prison. What happened, I was going to the shower 
to the cell and a correctional officer handcuffed me. He yanked me back to the cell and pulled on the handcuffs and we both fell. And he wrote up the ticket as an assault. And so I ended up in the worst place I've ever been in. When you first enter, you're handcuffed and shackled. They take the handcuffs and the shackles off. They strip you down and handcuff and shackle you again. They walk you down this long hallway. I couldn't even walk the whole way, it was so long. The shackles were cutting into my skin and a correctional officer had to carry me into the cell. I didn't have anything, no books, no writing material. The first night was looking out and I witnessed what they call the, the goon squad. It was like six to eight seals with helmets on and shields. I watched them go into someone's cell, drag the person out. They were unconscious on the ground. I saw a nurse come in and she was standing over the person shaking her head like she didn't know what to do. They carried him out of the stretcher and I didn't know if he, I didn't know if he ever woke up and that was my first night. You can't see any of the other inmates, you can't talk to them, but I remember in the cell next to me, I heard this voice and was like, where is this coming from? It was coming from the sink. He said, talk to the sink. And that's how I communicated with people in the next cell. It was crazy. Well, Barbara, can I ask you a question? Because your time is up. How, how much more do you have to go? Already? Oh, my God. Um, I, I just ended with, um, I remember suffering from anxiety and depression. And, and I'll just kind of leave it there because that's something uh, he continues to um um, experience and he talked about uh, being a survivor but decades later um, after this dehumanizing experience um, I can tell you he still struggles with um, anxiety and, mm -hmm. and depression. Yeah. Um, I know that Rep Palm has a comment or a question. Thank you Mr. Chair. Hi Barbara. Um, Based on your very considerable experience and your long time of advocacy, um, I'm, I'm assuming you're you're testifying in favor of 1059. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's yes. okay. Um, and is do you feel this bill is adequate? You know, it doesn't completely eliminate solitary. Um, and I and I realize that, and I see I see it as um, putting us on the pathway to actually ending it. I don't see it actually ending it, and I am concerned when you know we. There's the question of um, will we, will we actually will we actually eliminate solitary confinement? And in my opinion, we should eventually. That should be our end goal. Solid, well, no you, one should be tortured. You know that public policy is often incremental, and and sometimes we just move along in steps. But it, it does seem like a, a leap from what your son's experience was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, that's it. Okay. Thank you, Representative Paul. Comments or questions from other members of the committee? Comments or questions? Um, I, I don't see any, but Barbara, I, you know, I almost feel like I'm a broken record. I wanna thank you for um, coming, uh, not on just this, but on a host of things that you've been uh, working on for a long time. Uh, a very long time. And and just thank you for uh, staying in the fight uh, as someone who's been involved for a long time as well. Uh, I, I know that a lot of the faces disappear over the years and, and yet you persist. Um, uh, and that says a lot about um, what this struggle means to you and about you as a person. So I, I just wanna thank you for continuing that work. Um, and I, I know we'll see you again. So. Thank you, Gary. Um, this work won't ever be over for me. Once yep. they harmed my son in this way, it just can never end for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe that to my core. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Um, Luke Connell, followed by Fernicia Smith and Jovan Lumpkin. Esteemed co-chairs and members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Luke Connell and I'm speaking today in support of SB 1059. I will be using my time to read ex excerpts from the testimony of Kyle Lamar Pashal Barros, spelled K-Y-L-E-L-A-M-A-R-P-A-S-C-H-A-L-B-A-R-R-O-S. Mr. Pashal Barros is a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he's incarcerated. My name is Kyle Lamar Pashal Barros. Prior to my hostage ship incarceration, 
I had residing in, at Torrington, Connecticut, and I wholeheartedly support the Protect Act SB 1059 and all of its proposed provisions. I support it because it creates humane conditions, which the executive branch refuses to provide. I ask for a moment of your time and consideration to share truths realized by my personal experiences. At the beginning of my exile to the custody of Connecticut DOC, I was nine days short of 18. I have no shame in letting it be known that I suffer multiple mental disabilities. So I entered CDOC's care triple cursed. One, an alleged criminal. Two, an underdeveloped brain. And three, mentally disabled. I couldn't, nor at this time still can't, adjust to a quote, healthy prison life. Hindsight and intellect has enlightened me to see it as because of this triple curse. Despite the doctors employed by CDOC, the department either failed to notice or deliberately ignored these factors. I was treated as a developmentally matured, non-disabled male and subjected to prolonged solitary confinement, which does not exist solely at Northern. It was to use a fisherman term, catch and release, back and forth, in and out. Each day becoming longer and the more dysregulated I became. Depression, frequent stays on incel restraints, suicide attempts, in facility hospitalization, no calls, no visits, uh, infrequent mail. I became so dysregulated, I drew portraits and had full blown conversations with them. CDOC heavily medicated me and I was practically mindless. Eventually the medication changed, but the damage is done. The reality is this, there are a lot of mentally ill inmates subject, subjected to solitary. Most are expected to someday re-enter society. The PROTECT Act must be passed. When will those who the people elect not only ask what is going wrong, but also take the steps needed to stop things from going wrong? You have that power and the corrective means are before you. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your uh, reading of the testimony. Are there comments or questions from members of the committee? Comment or question? I don't see any. I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, next is Farnesha Smith, followed by Jovan Lumpkin, and then Gemini Rory. Uh, Farnesha Smith, you have three minutes. Chair, Chair, Senator Winfield, and Representative Strathstrom, Strathstrom, sorry, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Frenisha Smith, and I am a Justice Advisor at the Connecticut Justice Alliance, CTJA, and I'm writing this testimony to communicate my strong support for SB 1059. The, S the CTJA is a statewide youth adult partnership working to end the criminalization of youth. The use of solitary confinement does more harm than good, especially to the mental state. Humans are not designed to function properly in solitude. We are social beings who survive by having constant interaction with other human beings. The conditions within these prisons are already no good. So to then place individuals all alone in a cell with no other interactions for days on end is like adding fuel to the fire. What you get is someone who will be more damaged than they were before the confinement thus making it much more difficult for them to reintegrate back into society after. That is the purpose of sending them to prison in the first place, correct? To give them time away from society to grow as a person and to be better when they return. So let's take the year 2020, for example. Many, if not all of us, experienced our own little version of solitary confinement within the start of the pandemic. We were stuck in the home for weeks, months for some, with little to no human interaction, depending on one's living situation. The difference is that not all of us were in solitary and we were definitely not completely confined because we had access to virtual means of communication. Even virtual communication was enough to help people's sanity. I say this because our pandemic version of confinement was not even close to what incarcerated individuals experienced in solitary confinement, yet statistics show that it still had a major impact on the mental health and well-being of many people. I urge you to think about this comparison. The previous year has also reinforced the need for urgency when addressing issues that have been going on for far too long. Think about the mental, the mental state of the people who have suffered from solitary confinement, those who are suffering from solitary confinement as we speak, and those who will suffer from solitary confinement if we do not act on this in an urgent manner. Is that something you want to be responsible for allowing to continue? 
I strongly encourage this committee to vote in favor of SB 1059. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Fernisha. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I don't see any. Fernisha, how long have you been with the Justice Alliance? I actually just started in December of 2020, so I'm new to this. Okay, you're new, but you're doing great. Um, and 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 I want to thank you for uh, that comparison. I often uh, talk to people about um, a time when they were sick for an extended period of time and stuck in a room. And then I asked them to remember how at the end of that period, they felt like they really needed to get out of that room and they might be, to their perspective, losing their mind. And then I say, well, take away the television, the nice carpet, the bedding and all of that. And you still don't really understand the situation. So I really appreciate yep. the way you, you, you've characterized that. Um, thank, you. thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, have a great rest of the evening. Thank you, you as well. All right. Uh, next is Javon Lumpkin, followed by Jim and I Rory, and then Kevin Poonin. Hi, Senator Winslow. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You have your three minutes. All right. Thank you. Um, good evening to you and the rest of the committee. Um, I am, my name is Javon Lumpkin. I'm a Hartford, Connecticut resident and formerly incarcerated person. I am in support of Senate Bill. 972, an act um, <clears throat> for the telecommunications services to Department of Correction. Um, I'm in support of this bill because I think that not only would it alleviate burdens placed on family members of incarcerated people, but it will also create a safer environment inside of the prison. When I was incarcerated, um, I was fortunately blessed with a strong support system and I was able to use the phone often, but there were other inmates that were not. And I noticed that there was uh, issues regarding that. I was assaulted by another inmate that was jealous of the fact that I could use the phone and I was my jaw was broken subsequently. Um, I was placed in solitary confinement for two days before I had medical treatment and then I was sent to Yukon uh, Medical Center to have reconstructive surgery on my face. Um, so I just want to testify to the fact that inmates that can use the phone and can have stronger family ties, I think that research would agree that we have um, a higher chance at reentry, as a successful reentry. Also, we have better behavior inside and we could focus on uh, rehabilitation and inmates without uh, strong family ties and access to the phone are um, at, on their worst behavior because they they um, don't have those that that support from the outside. So I would just like to say that um, I think that this bill would do do wonders for families as well as currently incarcerated people and in creating a safer environment for correctional officers and other inmates as well. Um, and just to know, I am also, as a person that endured solitary confinement multiple times, I am also in support of Senate Bill 1059, also known as the Protect, the Protect Act. Thank you very much for your testimony. Let me uh, check, are there comments or questions from members of the committee? Comments or questions? Um, I don't see any, but I wanna thank you for uh, coming and sharing your uh, perspective. And um, I, we, we know it's your story, so um, we appreciate that. It's not always easy to, to share your story. So um, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for hearing me and, and you too, and you as well. Um, next, we have Gemini Rory, uh, Kevin Keenan, and Ali Marat Galley. It's Gemini Rory. And yep, I'm right here. Yep. You you me? Thank you. Yeah, Hi, my name is Gemini Rory. I am a justice advisor with the Connecticut Alliance, um, Connecticut Justice Alliance, CTJA. And I am writing this testimony to communicate my strong support for Bill SB 1059. <clears throat> The CTJA is a statewide youth adult partnership working to end the criminal criminalization of youth. Okay. 
<clears throat> there are so there are many conditions in our prison systems that concern me. But when mentioning solitary confinement, I find it is completely in inhumane. People in solitary confinement or isolation are not given access to education or vocal or vo vocational training. They are basically sitting idle in their cells. Solitary, as many are aware, can cause a, a specific psychiatric syndrome categorized by who, who, <clears throat> who listen, who, who panic attacks, over paranoia, diminished impulse control, and hypersensitivity to external stimuli and difficult difficulties with thinking, concentration, and memory. Some people lose the ability to maintain a state of alertness while others develop crippling obsessions. This all equals to torture and in no way can this tactic rehabilitate any persons because solitary confinement requires people to learn and live in a world without people. I believe we can use other tactics for discipline and deterring. We should be looking for other ways to keep prisons safe including new ways that may have not been invented yet. Some of these new ways can be getting to the roots of the problem that incarcerated people have with one another. Getting proper, <clears throat> getting proper mental health treatment for individuals as well. I know many people in today's society that went to prison on a costly mistake. And when they were put in sol solitary confinement, they were never they never were the same and still are recovering from those conditions. Thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> for listening to my testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Rory. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I don't see any. Uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I see you have an audience there with you. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, there, there you go. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm going to let you get back to him and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have next Kevin Keenan, followed by Ali Murat uh, Galley uh, and Ben Howell. Is Kevin Keenan in and ready to go? Yes, I am, Senator Winfield. Thanks right. so much. And thank you, Representative Staffstrom and the, and the members of the committee for being here this late and really hearing from uh, all these good folks. Uh, I'm Kevin Keenan, I'm a vice president at the Vera Institute of Justice. We're a national criminal justice research and reform organization headquartered in New York City. Um, submitted some written testimony, but I know that can be hard for, uh, to find. If, uh, if you, the members or anyone listening would like that, please email me and I'll send it to you directly. I'm at kkeenan at vera.org. Uh, and before getting into the substance, you've heard so much tonight, I just want to speak as a Connecticut native. I grew up in Fairfield, um, to law school in Hartford and New Haven. Family's still there. And I just uh, have immense pride seeing all of you, um, our representatives and the people of Connecticut, and hearing from the voices of people who are incarcerated. It's actually a beautiful thing to see you speaking from your cars and with baby high chairs in the background. Um, and to hear these uh, voices that um, we don't hear from ordinarily. So um, just to highlight a couple points, we've actually worked for 10 years, hands-on with jurisdictions around the country to end solitary confinement. Um, and we've learned a lot uh, from that. We've learned, for example, that when solitary confinement is not comprehensively restricted, it is abuse. It's usually not intentional, but there's just some characteristics that develop. The use of solitary becomes the default. The lengths of confinement just protract when someone's in there, and reentry planning is impeded in significant ways. We've learned conversely that when solitary confinement um, is restricted, the results are positive. And it's early days still, but we've got really great results from Colorado, Maine, Washington State, and numerous other jurisdictions that have scaled back. Um, I uh, I would say we've also um, seen some of the unintended consequences. And I want to speak for a moment about um, why this bill is such an important contribution to the national conversation. These provisions that you have in there about restraints and communications and accurate data and oversight and even officer wellness, those are actually uh, truly uh, visionary in anticipating what are some of the challenges of eliminating solitary confinement and getting ahead of those. And my written testimony speaks to that as well. 
Finally, I want to talk about a program you may know, the True Unit and the Worth Unit that Vera partnered with Connecticut on uh, to create. It's a transformational approach to treatment of young adults based on a trip to Germany that your then governor and secretary of corrections took. And uh, a lot of things have been said about that as covering 60 minutes, but fundamental to that, we started by ending solitary confinement in those units. It was fundamental to seeing um, people as human beings and, and building on a basis of trust. I'll conclude there and thank you so much for your time. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Keenan. Uh, comment or questions from members of the committee? Comment or question? Uh, I don't see any, but I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening and thank you for reminding us um, how we got the true unit, which we celebrate so much. Uh, I think it's important to um, all of our knowledge, but also to this discussion. Um, thank you and hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. All right, uh, next we'll hear from Ali Marat Galley, uh, Ben Howell, and then Denise Paley. Is Mr. Galley in? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, you have your three minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, y'all. Uh, my name is Ali Murat Gali, and I'm a resident of New Haven who supports SB 1059. I will be using my time today to read excerpts from the testimony of Keslin Mendez, a supporter of this bill who cannot be here today because he's incarcerated. I'm a victim and witness of Northern CI's abuse while I was housed there on AS or administrative segregation. I respectfully ask with sincerity that the legislative strongly support the bill to end solitary and ask that anyone who can have a helping hand to support the bill to stop solitary because it destroys individuals like myself and leave people with serious mental health issues such as antisocial disorder, anxiety, bipolar disorder, anger and aggression problems without the proper treatment or help. While I was in AS, I was tortured by COs and lieutenants daily and weekly. And today I live with mental health illness caused at the hands of correctional officers sworn to serve and protect. I've been assaulted by COs and lieutenants, chained up in a cell for days, fed out of a bag with nothing to eat but other than my hands. My food was cold and sometimes tampered with by the officers. No shoes on my feet, doo-doo on the walls, doors, floor, and blood as well from the person who was in the cell chained up before me, beaten by officers and left to heal for days, sometimes without medical attention. I, Keslin Mendez, was that prisoner. Yes, me, someone's son, brother, father, and uncle was a victim of abuse by individuals sworn to protect me from any harm. I've had my genitals grabbed by an officer and twisted after another officer punched me in my stomach while a lieutenant looked on smiling. Northern CI is a dump site for DOCs. I don't wanna deal with prisoners. And if you're in mental health, the doctor will take you off your mental health medication in order to keep you at Norton facility, knowing that the prisoner should not be there due to his mental health issues. I have scars from Norton physically, but my biggest scars help me mentally and I can't get rid of them because they're in my head. And I live with them every day and fight them every day just trying to live a normal day of my regular prison life. And for those reasons alone, I, Kezin Mendez, call for a bill to stop solitary. It's not healthy for any human being. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, comment or question from members of the committee? comment or question. Mr. Gali, uh, I don't see any comment or question. I wanna thank you for joining us and waiting to offer that testimony. Um, it's very much appreciated. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, next, uh, we will hear from Ben Howell, followed by Denise Paley and then Lee Colt. Uh, Mr. Howell, are you in? I am here. All right, you have three minutes. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, and the members of the Joint Judiciary Committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Benjamin Howell. I'm a resident of New Haven. I actually recently moved to Senator Winfield's district this past weekend. I am a primary care physician at Cornell Scott and a researcher in the Yale School of Medicine and a faculty in the SAFE Center for Health and Justice. My research is on the long-term health impacts of mass incarceration. This testimony represents my views and none of those of my, of my employers. I am testifying in support of Senate Bill 1059. 
The use of extreme isolation causes irreparable physical and psychological harm on incarcerated individuals. This is true whether it is called solitary confinement, administrative segregation, restrictive housing, or any other name, or whether used for disciplinary or administrative reasons. Connecticut should abolish this practice across all its correctional facilities. In testimony today, you have heard the stories and experiences of individuals who have been harmed by extreme isolation in Connecticut's prisons and jails. Their stories are consistent with what we know about the effect of extreme isolation in the medical and public health research. Exposure to extreme isolation is physically unhealthy and psychologically traumatizing. It can cause severe psychological distress and psychosis, as well as increased hostility, increased self-harm, and suicidal behaviors. The harms of extreme isolation persist after release. After exposure to solitary, there's increased risk of death in the time after release, especially due to non-natural causes. There's twice the risk of dying by suicide in the year after release and increased risk by dying by a homicide and drug overdose. People who are exposed to solitary confinement are more likely to experience post-traumatic stress disorder. Exposure to solitary confinement has also been associated with worse uh, cardiovascular disease with likely increase in heart attacks and strokes. The harms of extreme isolation correctional settings compound the structural racial violence and mass incarceration on black and brown individuals who are more likely to be incarcerated, but also more likely to be placed in extreme isolation. They also compound the harms of incarceration for people with serious mental illness who are also more likely to be incarcerated, more likely to be placed in extreme isolation, and more likely to suffer the harms of extreme isolation. Connecticut has an opportunity to continue its place as a leading state on issues of criminal justice reform. SB 1059 get us, gets us closer to a more just and equitable society. Uh, these steps will continue to move Connecticut past the era of mass incarceration, which harm and dehumanize too many Connecticut residents. Uh, thank you for your time uh, and attention. Thank you, Dr. L. Uh, comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? I don't see any. Uh, Dr. Howell, thank you for joining us and uh, offering your uh, testimony. I appreciate it and welcome to the district. Uh, hope no, you enjoy no the rest of the evening. Thank, right, you. thank you very much. Good night. Uh, next, we'll hear from Denise Paley, followed by Lee Colt and Leighton Johnson. Denise Paley. Hi, thank you. Um, hello, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Denise Paley. I'm a board member of NAMI Shoreline. And this is my son. His name is Ellis Taber. He's currently in pretrial commitment, confinement, excuse me, at MYI. So thank you for allowing me to speak in support of Bills 1059, specifically addressing the use of isolated confinement and 972. In preparation for my testimony, I looked on the DOC website and I found the following statement under the heading agency vision. It says, Revictimization is reduced by providing offenders with tools and resources to make positive changes for a successful transition back into the community. So my child suffers from serious mental illness. Between Garner and MYI, he's been subjected multiple times to 24 hour isolation for one week or more while enduring a state of psychosis. It's under the pretense of ensuring his protection when he's had no bedding, sometimes no control of lighting in his cell, no shower, no option to exercise with his meals in his cell next to his toilet. They have isolated him with nothing other than his psychologically tormenting thoughts. Now in MYI, he's recently been granted permission to participate in a vocational class. And this is great for getting him out of his cell. It gives some meaning to his day. And I would suggest having meaning in your life is probably healthy for a person's interactions with whichever community they're in. However, on a typical day, even when Ellis does get to go to class, he spends fewer than four hours out of his cell. This is between his class, meals, showering, everything. He spends 20 and a half hours a day in his cell. He doesn't get any time outdoors, except with, for, for fresh air, unless it's to enter from one building into another. And it seems that 24 hour lockdowns are pretty frequent. I believe this practice is in direct opposition of the agency's vision of providing offenders the tools and resources to make positive changes for a successful transition back into the community. How do you do that if you spend most of your time locked in isolation? And what are we doing as a society anyway? Prison is punishment. Having your freedom revoked, remaining separate from society, stigmatized with mar marginal opportunity upon release 
that's punishment. The use of isolated, isolated confinement, seclusion and restraints, what we're doing here in Connecticut is just primitive. And regarding Bill 972, it's my understanding that Connecticut is the most expensive state in the country for prison phone calls. A 15 minute call costs nearly $5. And then these calls have zero privacy. Ms. Kelly, uh, your, your three minutes have elapsed, so if you could summarize. Okay, so in my opinion, nine, um, the charge for the phone calls is an abuse of authority and it does nothing to further the much needed connection to loved ones for people living in incarceration. So please, thank you for listening and support bills 1059 and 972. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comment or questions from members of the committee, comment or questions. Can I, may I ask you a question? Um, uh, are you, how much do you get to communicate with your son? I can con communicate with him pretty regularly. He can, okay. he, he can call me. And his, his experience, how has it changed his ability to communicate with you? Has it? In, term, in terms of how the conversations happen and the, the, the tenor of the conversation, has it had impact on those? Well, everything is recorded. So we kind of keep that in mind. He, it makes him very nervous to speak freely. Um, Let you me, know, to, be, to be clear, I'm, I'm asking, at, do you perceive a change beyond those things? Obviously those things change the way you can hold a conversation. But just, yeah. just as you know your son as well as anybody would, do you perceive a change because of his experience? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I could go on about um, how this is not good for his mental health. The way he is, yeah, I think it's I think it's detrimental to his mental health. And I am not criticizing the people who work in mental health in the mm -hmm. in the you know in the system who have the intention of helping him, I just don't think that they have the resources necessary. I mean, I literally just found out two days ago that there's a psychologist there and he's been, he's been there for months. So if that, if that tells you, <laughs> if that tells you anything at all, he, well, he did not know that there was a psychologist there. I, I would say that everything that you and the others who testified today come to tell us about the actual experiences of people um, tell us something. So um, I, I appreciate it. And I don't want to pry too deeply into to your background, but I, I was just wondering what that experience was. Um, thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Since you thank asked, you. I was my, my, my greatest fear right now, mm -hmm. more so than him being incarcerated and the trauma from incarceration and the risk to his well being and all that physically is that it is so psychologically um, detrimental to his um, mental health that we will lose him forever because there does not seem to be any opportunity for recovery in prison. And it doesn't, you know, between, you know, access to care and the way everything is set up. I, I mean, I wouldn't wish, nobody belongs in a cell for over 20 hours a day. I mean, it, everyone's experiencing COVID right now. Everybody knows what it feels like to be completely isolated. You know, it just, it, it's hard to imagine, but I, I feel like I can pretty closely imagine what that's like through him. And no one deserves this. Not, there's not a soul out there that deserves this. And thank you for that. Um, I, appreciate, um, I appreciate your testimony and I appreciate you sharing uh, your very personal experience with us. Um, I don't see any further comments or questions, so um, I'll bid you a, a good evening um, and thank you again for coming to testify before us. Thank you for listening. Um, Lee Colt, uh, Leighton Johnson, Tabari Hashim. Lee Colton. Lee Colt. Yes, sir. Hello? Yep. Uh, Sorry about that. Can you hear me? I hear you. Go, you My name is Lee minutes. Colton. I'm a, a resident of Rockville. I strongly support the PROTECT Act, SB 1059. I was just released from Northern Correctional 16 days ago. I was incarcerated in 2016 for two robberies as a result of my struggle with heroin addiction. In January of 2020, I was transferred to Carl Robinson in Enfield. Then the COVID-19 outbreak began. 
Multiple attempts were made by inmates to get more protocols put in place to keep the staff and inmate population safe, such as mask mandates for staff, access to bleach, hand soap, and other antiviral measures. None of these were being done. I told the warden and deputy warden when they toured the unit that not enough was being done to protect us and that a mask mandate should be in effect for everyone. 24 hours later, I was sent to Northern Correctional for impeding order, which is tantamount to inciting a riot. And placed in the administrative segregation program, which is a solitary confinement setting of 23 hours in the cell. Um, for all intents and purposes, it's really 24. But I was charged with impeding order because Deputy Warden Kenny alleged that I threatened to take over the dorm and escape from the facility. This never happened. I was placed in solitary confinement for pointing out the staff's refusal to enforce proper and accepted pandemic protocols. I spent 11 months in the AS program despite the original charge later being thrown out on appeal. I was a level two, three offender with no DOC related history of violence in a level five facility on the same tier with special circumstances, which is just reclassified as death row. To explain what it's like to spend 11 months in solitary confinement reserved for CTDOC's worst offenders for asking staff to wear masks is like trying to explain a dream to someone. No matter how hard you try, if you weren't there, it's never going to make sense, which in this case is an apt description because Northern Correctional can best be explained as a nightmare. I have read the provisions of SB 1059 and I feel strongly that when this bill passes, it will make it very difficult or unlikely for this sort of thing to happen to anyone else in the future. An ombudsman program will be able to assist inmates in fighting unjustified charges because the grievance program is by design, very confusing and convoluted with tight timeframe restrictions. Although NCI is closing, the ASSRG program still exists and will be transferred to another facility. The solitary problem is simply being transferred from Summers to Suffield. The underlying issues will still be there if this bill is not passed. More needs to be done to address mental health concerns in the correction system. If you aren't mentally ill when you arrive, you will be by the time you finish your sentence. The system is designed to break people. When they break, there's no effective system in place to put them back together. Most people don't think about prison conditions until it hits home. This can happen to anyone. I'm somebody's son, brother, and father. Thousands of sons, brothers, fathers, daughters, sisters, and mothers are languishing in various forms of CT correctional institutions as we speak. The population of the, the inmate population is not truly 9,200, 9, for you have to count every family member and friend who suffers as a result. That Mr. makes Cole. hundreds of thousands of people. Mr. Cole, who, your, your time has elapsed, if you could summarize. Uh, I support um, the 972 bill too. Um, with the communications, but nah, I appreciate it. Thank you for giving me time. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you coming and testifying before us this evening. Is there a comment or question from members of the committee? Comment or question? Uh, Mr. Uh, Colt, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We, we know that you just recently got out and most people aren't here before us that quickly. So uh, thank you for your advocacy on behalf of uh, the, the bills that you're supporting today. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Uh, next, we'll hear from Leighton Johnson, followed by Tabari Hashim, followed by Jasmine Goodwin, uh, Godwin. Leighton Johnson. Thank you, um, Senator Winfield, staff room, and members of the Judiciary Review Committee. My name is Leighton Johnson. I'm a resident of New Haven and a steering committee member of Stop Solidarity CT. And I express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059, also 1058 and 972. I spent close to five years in solitary confinement in Northern and an innumerable amount of time in other forms of prolonged isolation in general population during my 10 and a half year sentence. I have experienced being locked in, in my cell for 22, 23, even 24 hours a day. Sometimes due to a lockdown, I have experienced being locked in the cell for weeks and only able to shower maybe once or two times in that span of time. I have been thrown in, in cell for disobeying a direct order and being fully chained up and left in the cell for three days. I have been thrown in SAG and left in there for 21 days pending transfer or 20, 14 days pending investigation. I've experienced um, having conversations with someone for months through the door or through the vent ventilation system only for them to silent, go silent one day because they cannot take it anymore and they committed suicide by hanging themselves. I've witnessed the mental deterioration of people I considered close associates who resorted to self-mutilation and headbanging. I've seen what happens to a person's mind and behavior when they resort to taking debilitating medication that's supposed to help but adversely causes more harm. 
I've witnessed the look in my daughter's eyes when she asked me, when can she hug me again? Because it had been years since we had human contact. I've seen the pain inflicted on my mom that she tried to mask with a half-hearted half -hearted smile since these long trips up to see me only to be turned away for half an hour behind the glass was torturing her heart. I can go on and on about the horrors, but I only have three, three minutes. So I'm just gonna give you a glimpse into my world. Um, I went to prison at the age of 23. I was already a product of society that tells me from birth that I don't matter because of the zip code I grew up in, which is 10456, the South Bronx. Um, I grew up in poverty, surrounded by violence and despair and dysfunction in my neighborhood. Opportunity is scarce, not the same opportunity that more affluent um, neighborhoods are given. I ended up in the streets, gangs, ultimately prison. And I was already inflicted with anxiety and insomnia and drug and um, alcohol habits and depression and anger. Um, I suffered panic attacks and episodes of paranoia. Um, what I'm not trying to do is, is um, say that I'm innocent of my crimes, that I want some um, pity for my pre-trauma that I dealt with, but I want to you know, just give some context to the experiences I endured prior to my incarceration. And then on top of that, the experience inside, I came home at 34, um, diagnosed with PTSD. Um, I could speak to what physicians say about, you know, what the harm that is, but I, it's not, I don't think it's no need for that. The, the, the most, for the most part in general population, extreme isolation is rampant. Incarcerated individuals spend most of their time in cell, um, and that's an extended form of torture akin to solitary. Mr. Um, Johnson, uh, uh, let's summarize. Okay, so um, I don't believe that that's um, conducive to a civil environment inside or outside. It's not productive or safe for the prisoners or the staff. And um, it's for, for, for people to return from corrections uncorrected. Um, I'm urging you, to, urging you to favorably vote SB 1059 out of the judiciary and unlock humanity. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, comment or questions from members of the committee, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and hello, Lincoln. I didn't have any questions, just wanted to thank you uh, for being here with us tonight and to really thank you for coming home and advocate the way you do. You really do this on a strength, and um, I think that that is admirable, that you haven't forgotten about the brothers and sisters that are still locked up and still experiencing um, a lot of what you've gone through. So just wanted to say thank you for that tonight, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Representative Porter. Comment or question from other members of the committee? Um, I don't see any late and I wanna uh, thank you for coming to testify and uh, for the continued work you do and uh, to let you know that your testimony really does have meaning. My, my, my zip code during my formative year is 10472. Uh, I understand um, the, the issues with those zip codes. So um, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate it and I appreciate your continued work. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. Um, next, we'll hear from Tabari Hashim, and I will turn it back over to Chairman Staffstrom. Yes, good evening. My name is Tabari Hashim. My name is Tabari Hashim. I'm a member of the Murray CT. I'm from New Haven, and I'd like to speak on support of Bill 1059. Solidary confinement is nothing but poison for the mind and soul. I was trapped for 365 days in solitary confinement. The trauma and mental decay due to solitary confinement cannot be ignored. Mistakes and errors are part of life. The practice of oppression, the practice of torture, the, pra the practice of isolation from family, also friends, is inhumane. I remember counting down and praying for opportunity to see my mom and my son again. When I was allowed visits, I was behind the glass in another room, fully chained to my feet. I hope nobody listening to me go through this, head, this heartache. Can you imagine feeling degraded, fighting back tears and smiling at the same time? I wanted to be positive for my mother because I knew she was feeling helpless. I knew she was feeling the trauma and I knew she was feeling confused seeing her son fully chained like a slave. I still don't get the reason behind solitary confinement. You can't practice tactics that make me less than a human and try to make me a better human. I don't, I don't want to see nobody living in the bathroom, and I don't want to, and I want to see nobody trapped living in the bathroom. I strongly support 1059 
I strongly support a better system that can provide, you know, clarity, transparency, honesty, and really seeing how we can help each other, not divide and conquer and oppress each other. You know, when they take us out, you know, when they do take us out to go outside, you know, the COs, the sergeants, lieutenants, all of them, they make little funny jokes saying they're going for dog walks. So we leave one box to go to another box and we fully chain to our feet. Only different from the box that we're trapped in and the box that we go outside supposedly in that we're standing up and we're not sitting down. To me, to me, this is a system, this is a system that really needs to be correct. It really needs to be looked into. It, it really needs to be studied because I, did, I don't get it. I don't get how locking me up in a room that's literally the size of a bathroom can help me come out better as a man. If anything, that's going to not only decay my mind and wear and tear on my body, but that's going to make me continue, continue to be upset, continue to be violent, continue to be a threat, not only to myself and my family, but to the inmates around me. So hopefully, you know, we can all do the right thing and we can all do the, the beneficial thing, the positive thing, and vote for 1059. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, questions or comments from the committee? If not, um, I want to thank you for sticking with us all day and, and for sharing your story with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, next up will be uh, Jasmine Godwin. Jasmine Godwin with us. If not, um, Robin Miller Godwin. Taylor Benares. Benares? That's me. Benares. Yeah, you got it right the second time. All right. <laughs> You'd, you'd be amazed how many ways people pronounce the word staffstrom, so. Oh, I know it. <laughs> um, good afternoon, co-chair Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, and the other members of the Judiciary Committee. I am here just as myself because it is right. What does a phone call mean? Whether it's a voicemail from my grandma that's so important to me, I found a way to upload it to iTunes from a not Apple phone at the time so that I could always listen to it and never lose it or it's me calling her on the first day that it snows, which is her favorite holiday besides Christmas. My dad, when he goes to work, calling me to chit chat, even though we live together. My best friend and I watching shows on FaceTime. We take these for granted, which is why I'm here. Before, but especially now during this pandemic, we have all fallen back on trusted phone calls, FaceTimes, texting, and Zooms to see our family and friends. Those in prison are forced into isolation in general, but even more so due to this. Their families in 2016 spent around 14 million with a bit under 15,000 people in prison, which comes out to roughly $933 per prisoner's family. That is ludicrous given that our phones that we have are unlimited and have apps and calls and texting and video chats at virtually any time but this is the most basic of phone calls and they are paying a similar rate to someone who owns one smartphone, just including the service bill. We all know that the rich do not suffer the same consequences as the working and poor class. And we know that people who are working in poor class, especially people of color get locked up more than those who are well off, even when they are convicted of the same crime. So we are asking people who are often making minimum wage or less to pay hundreds of dollars per year just to talk to someone in their family. That's isolation, not just on the side of the prisoner, but on the family as well. Prison is already extremely isolating, not to mention during this pandemic when visiting isn't allowed. In workplaces, bullying and harassment definitions include social isolation. It's a form of elder abuse or domestic abuse. Solitary confinement is a form of physical and mental torture, but this is another form of isolation as well. I often as a teenager felt isolated, even as in my home, and I dealt with depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, 
self-harm, and even attempts. I grew up in a place of privilege in several ways, so I cannot even imagine what prisoners who are often disproportionately people of color face when put into solitary confinement. I urge you to pass Senate bills 972 and 1057 because we are all human beings and we cannot forget that. When we forget that, we lose our souls. Thank you to the committee. Thank you, ma'am. Um, appreciate you uh, sticking with us. Um, next up will be Tracy Blanford. Hello, um, good evening to the committee. Um, thank you for, um, for continuing this this long for the day. Um, again, my name is Tracy Blanford and I'm a resident of New Haven. I'm here today to express my strong and full support for Senate Bill 1059, the PROTECT Act. And um, I want you to know that I'm a mastered prepared um, nurse and I've worked throughout my career with people who have mental health and behavioral health challenges people who act in ways that might have caused harm to themselves or have caused harm to themselves, others, or property. And I've also worked um, at the interface of the judicial and the mental health systems as people both entered into the Department of Corrections and returned to New Haven after release. Um, I preface my comments with my background just to ensure you that I know a little bit about these systems and how they both work and don't work. So the PROTECT Act or uh, Bill 1059 is a necessary reform with specific goals to enhance public safety, inmate safety, and to reduce harm to correctional officers. The, it would end isolated confinement practices and all the things that they are named. And we've heard all those terminologies used throughout the day today. We know already that these practices degrade and damage the mental health and the physical well being of any person. And prolonged isolation for incarcerated people constitutes torture. So it's just a matter of time before these practices stop. They've stopped in many places, and, and those places are more forward thinking um, states. And it's important for us to ask the question, what can truly lead to improve public safety and secure and humane supervision of offenders while providing opportunities that support the successful offender community reintegration? So this question comes directly from the DOC mission statement. And, you know, it's important to know solitary um, practices and isolation will end in Connecticut. It's just a matter of what group of legislators are willing to consider using humane best practices and bring reforms to our state. And I want to ask the question, will you be a part of that group or not? In addition, we need clear and enforceable standards for the use of any isolative or restrictive measures utilizing these best practices. Um, systemic data collection so that we can understand the amount of use that's occurring. It's been clear throughout the day that those questions are unanswered and transparency and accountability within the DOC. Um, please support the, the movement of this bill out of the Judiciary Committee. It is imperative that these changes take place now. Thank you very much for listening to my testimony. Thank you. Um... Questions or comments? Seeing none, appreciate you uh, sticking with us. Um, Carlos uh, Moreno. Is Mr. Moreno with us? If not, I see Deborah Martinez. Good evening, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Deborah Martinez, and I am Ishkar Howard's sister. I'm here today in support of Senate Bill 1059. My brother is amazing. So amazing that the Connecticut Department of Corrections handpicked him to represent them on national television in a 60 minute segment. This is a huge jump from being the Ishkar Howard who they housed in solitary confinement for five and a half years. When asked about solitary, he says, when you're in a place like that, what's illogical becomes logical. Fighting the CERT team, a group of corrections officers padded up. Fighting the CERT team becomes on the dance floor. Popping the fire sprinkler becomes popping crystal. Wearing chains and 
handcuffs is rocking platinum. We twisted our reality. And before I knew it, years had passed and I found myself lost. That's solitary confinement. During COVID, my brother was put in the commissary housing unit at Cheshire, cells just a foot or so bigger than a bathtub, no room to move around. During one of his calls to me, I could hear the anxiety and panic in his voice talking about how small the cell was, how it looked like a hundred year old dungeon and felt like he was locked in a tube. He kept saying, there's no button, Debbie. What if something happens to me? No one will know. I realized he was suffering from a flashback because that button in his cell he was referring to, that was at Northern 20 years ago. That's what solitary confinement does to you. Or when he was in eight cell under the stairs in the corner, they called it the hidden cell because cameras couldn't see it. One officer who delivered his tray would spit in his food daily right in front of him. For the longest time, he would refuse the food until he just couldn't anymore. So he would slide the spit over so he could eat the rest of the rice. That's what solitary confinement does to staff. It becomes a place where the environment creates justification to treat people like garbage. When did it become okay for us to determine who is worthy of human dignity? Scott Urfey, a DA recently retired from the Connecticut DOC said in that same segment, their punishment is their incarceration. It is not our job as correctional professionals to punish somebody even more while they're incarcerated. My brother was transferred to Northern from Manson Youth at age 19, not on a murder charge. He was sent to solitary confinement for breaking a phone and kicking a window, handcuffed, tethered and shackled daily. The Connecticut Department of Corrections discharged 19-year-old Ishkar Howard directly from solitary confinement, and he returned charged with murder six months later. That's what solitary confinement creates. Please don't fool yourselves into thinking it creates positive change. What created positive change in Ishkar was connection, things worth looking forward to like hugs, phone calls, and family. Dr. Hines, who created the program at Northern, asked Ishkar once to do a video. Ishkar asked him why he would create something like Northern. He replied with, sometimes things get used for the purpose they're not created for. Thank you for your time. And I appreciate how hard this committee works and how late you stay. Thank, thank you, ma'am. And um, thank you for being with us. I've, I've had the opportunity to meet your brother um, inside the true unit before. And so uh, please, please make sure to extend my best as well. Um, uh, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Deb. I, I will just say the same thing that Representative Saxon just said. Wanted to thank you, first of all, for your continued advocacy. I mean, you are a champion for all people, but really, and specifically for those who, who don't have a voice right now. Um, and just make sure you tell, as I said, we're thinking of them, we're praying for them, and everything that we do. He is definitely one of those who are on our minds and our hearts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, next, uh, I think we have Robin Miller Godwin with us. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I missed my call, but I, my, I'm speaking tonight on behalf of my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority New Haven Alumni Chapter, as a member, but also as a family member of a currently incarcerated young man in support of uh, SB 972. It is uh, by the grace of God that our family is able to provide him with constant phone calls. But I know the financial undertaking it causes his his immediate family, his mother and his brothers. So those of us outside of the family spend tons of dollars to keep him connected with family. And during COVID-19, he was put in solitary confinement because he became uh, positive with COVID. He has asthma, his, he had no contact with, the, with us, his mother or anyone. So I believe that having opportunities to have phone calls at no cost to the family and to keep them connected, especially when their health is at risk, is paramount. So I speak in support of SB 972. I thank you for calling me this afternoon, Representative. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thanks for being with us and, and for sharing your story. Um, next up, we have Michael Mushlin. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Stastrom and members of the committee. 
Thank you for holding this important hearing. I think that the record of this hearing should be, sir, should be shared with the people of the United States of America. You have done an incredible service uh, by opening uh, your, your forum to so many powerful uh, witnesses who have spoken so eloquently on such a critical subject. I'm a professor of law at the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University. I'm a member of the American Bar Association Task Force on the Legal Status of Prisoners that drafted standards on the treatment of prisoners, which was adopted by the American Bar Association uh, and which banned extreme isolation. I'm the author of a four volume treatise on the rights of prisoners. I'm past chair of the Correctional Association of New York, a 177 year old organization chartered by the New York legislature with the responsibility to visit prisons and report to the legislature. And I chaired the Corrections Committee of the New York City Bar Association. I am a strong supporter of SB 1059. I applaud you for considering this bill. I've been in this field for 40 years. And in, those, in the time I've been in this field, the two issues that seem the most important to me, if we're gonna make our prisons work for the citizens of your state, as well as for the staff of the prisons and the people incarcerated in your prisons, the two issues are ending solitary confinement and establishing oversight of prisons. This bill does both. In the few moments I have, I'd like to briefly address both solitary and oversight. Solitary is torture. I first confronted it four decades ago when I was a trial lawyer in a case in upstate New York dealing with a, a prison that had solitary confinement at Clinton Prison. Uh, solitary harms people immeasurably. People, pe it degrades the people who inflict it and it shames those of us who, who, whose names it is used. And uh, Charles Dickens visited the United States in the 1840s and he reported back when he saw solitary that it in, it's immeasurably worse than any torture of the body. But he said the slumbering humanity doesn't arouse to it because it's not inflicted uh, on the body. But we now know, and you've seen today, that solitary is as bad as physical torture. We've ignored, we can no longer ignore it. Uh, Justice Sotomayor, in an opinion that she issued last year, said our eyes are now open. Public officials have an obligation to end what she said comes perilously close, and you've heard today, to being a penal tomb. A judge in Connecticut last year said the fact that people commit inhumane crimes does not give the state the right to treat them inhumanely. Unless solitary is ended, as this bill would do it, prisons cannot be humane. Thank you. And, and one other point I want to make that is often overlooked is they cannot be safe with, that, with, with solitary. Ending it isn't easy. I don't pretend it is, but it can be done and it must be done. And I urge you to pass this bill. Thank, thank the, you, the second thing that I would say is this bill sir, provides for oversight. Without sir. oversight, any reforms envisioned for Connecticut's use of solitary confinement, no matter how well intended, are less likely to be implemented. Th thank but you, sir. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, we appreciate you uh, you joining us today and, and sharing your expertise with us. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Um, seeing none, have a, have a great evening. Thank you very much. Um, next up will be uh, Kebra Smith-Bolden. Hi. I apologize if you are. <laughs> um, dear Chairs Winfield and Staffstrom, Vice Chair Kasser, Blumenthal, Ranking Members Kissel, Fishbein, and other members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Kebra Smith-Bolden. I'm currently a resident of Hamden, Connecticut. I'm a mother, RN, business owner of several New Haven-based businesses. I employ over 30 inner city residents, and I would like to express my strong support for Senate Bill 1059. This bill is important to me for several reasons. First, that I am a lifelong New Haven, Connecticut resident. I was a teenager in the 90s, and I personally saw the effect that the war on drugs, which was really a war on people, had on my community. In the ninth grade, I remember learning of the gun-related murder of a young man I attended preschool with. 
I was attending Hill House High School, and the day he was murdered, they made an announcement informing the entire school of his murder, canceled classes for the remainder of the day, and offered us grief counselors if needed. I felt supported and that I could heal beyond this moment. However, by my senior year in high school, we had lost hundreds of classmates to murder, prison, or addiction. They stopped canceling classes, they stopped sending counselors, and we were no longer offered time to process. We were just left as traumatized, devastated children with little to no hope for the future due to conditions that surrounded us. And we were made to normalize those circumstances as being part uh, as part of being Black and from New Haven. As a child, I was unable to fully understand what was happening to my community, but as an adult, I have been able to understand how systemic racism, the oppression, the purposeful destruction of my community, and disenfranchisement of my people is directly related to mass incarceration as a continuation of slavery due to the 13th Amendment. This clause states that people can't be made neither slaves nor involuntary servants except as a punishment for crime. And how else do you ensure slavery and obtain free labor off the backs of Black people? Well, by criminalizing Blackness, removing resources and opportunities, creating disparities in all areas of life, and then saturating those very same communities with drugs and guns. So the majority of my brothers and sisters that are currently locked up in prison are due to the policies and legislation that has been put in place to lead them there. Have you ever heard of the school to prison pipeline? So to then get members of my community in prison and treat them like animals and claim it is because this is who they are. No, this is what our constitution, our government, racism, and white supremacy created, and it all needs to be torn down, starting with solitary confinement. Prolonged isolation, exacerbates trauma, can lead to the development of lifelong mental health issues, including PTSD, and is completely and undeniably inhumane. How do I know firsthand? I was a nurse at Northern Correctional Facility. I accepted a position as a nurse because I thought it was an ideal job. I was a mother of four, which included triplets. So I thought I'd have great benefits and financial stability, but I also thought I could be a ray of light and hope and care for incarcerated individuals with respect and with cultural understanding. But I learned very early on that this would not be possible yeah. in training. I was told essentially that these were not people, these were criminals and should be treated as such as all to, at all times. That kindness would be seen only as a weakness and to be cold and uncaring. Then actually working with incarcerated men, I wasn't allowed. Ma'am, you know, I just, we're at the three minute mark and I, I got a couple of questions for you. So um, if you got a final concluding thought, that's fine, but I do want to get to the questions. Okay, um, I just wanted to talk about my experience as a nurse. It was terrible there. But um, I just uh, believe that in 2021, we can come up with alternatives to incarceration that does not include throwing people in cages, but we can start by ending solitary confinement this year. And I strongly support this legislation. Thank you. Um, Representative Gilchrist, followed by Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Smith Bolden. Um, you're Testimony was incredibly impactful. Um, I too was a teenager in the 90s, but had a completely different experience than you. And I appreciate you being here to share what that experience was like and how it connects to the legislation we're working on today. My question is, could you tell us more about your experience as a nurse? Sure, um, to finish my statement, um, I was told very early that it wouldn't be possible to help people, um, that these were criminals, they should be treated as such as all time, that kindness will only be seen as a weakness, to be cold and uncaring. And once actually, once I was actually working with the incarcerated men at Northern, I wasn't allowed to provide even the most basic of care from a Band-Aid to an aspirin. As I walked from cell to cell, medicating inmates, I was chastised, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional about this. I was chastised by my guard escort for smiling, saying hello or asking an inmate how he was doing that day. I saw the effects of prolonged isolation and lack of human interaction with my own eyes. And the final straw for me was a young man with obvious mental health 
issues understandably acquired. He was being released after 20 years of incarceration, 18 of which had been at Northern, which meant 23 hours of lockdown per day. And he was being released without any transitional services or assistance because he had served his full sentence. They were giving this man $20 and a bus ticket and sending him on his way, also known as setting him up for complete failure. I could not be a part of a system that dehumanizes and tortures people and then sends them back into the world even more broken than when they arrived. So it was rough. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I'm sorry, but I really appreciate you being here to share that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Kiva, for being with us tonight. Um, I just, man, you spoke truth to power, and, and my hope is that all ears that, you know, have that power are really listening to not just you, but everybody that has come before us today. Um, there's been some pretty powerful testimonies given, and I think the one thing that I will say um, on my own accord is that there is no denying that this is inhumane and that it is torture and that it needs to end. So thank you for um, making time in your busy day uh, to be with us and to share your story and your lived experience with us. Yes, and thank you all. Thank you and thank you for all for your time and attention and staying with us so late tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, appreciate you being with us and enjoy the rest of your, your night. Um, next up will be Heather Bertram. Thank you. Good evening, Senator Winfield, Representative Straystrom, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Heather Bircham. I'm a partner and chair of the Long-Term Care Practice Group at the law firm of Mercy Kalina, which represents the Connecticut Association of Healthcare Facilities. I thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight regarding Raise Bill uh, 1029. We oppose this bill for several reasons, which are more fully outlined in my written testimony. First, a longstanding and well-developed right to sue for negligence already exists in common law, and therefore this bill is unnecessary to protect the rights of individuals to bring claims arising from COVID-19. Second, the bill as written is vague and ambiguous, both in its scope and applicability, including whether it is intended to apply retroactively, its interplay with existing statutory and procedural requirements for negligence actions, and the scope of guidance intended to be covered. Finally, the proposed bill attempts to apply what amounts to a negligence per se standard for violations of DPH and CDC guidance by elevating such guidance to a standard of care, which is inappropriate. Guidance issued by DPH and the CDC, and indeed any agency, is just that, guidance. It is not intended to have and does not have the force or clarity of a statute or regulation enacted after a rigorous process. It is often worded as recommendations rather than directives and is frequently broadly worded to allow flexibility in its application. This is particularly true of the guidance issued by DPH and the CDC during COVID-19. The guidance was being developed under, under uh, unprecedented circumstances and in very short timeframes to address a global public health emergency about which little was understood. Agency personnel themselves referred to their attempts to develop guidance as trying to build the plane while they were flying it. Much of the guidance was intended to apply to a broad range of healthcare providers with varying access to PPE, testing supplies, resident populations, and even across multiple states. Often the guidance conflicted with other agency guidance, was unclear, or was simply unable to be applied to the real world situations which were unfolding in nursing homes. Just looking at the CDC guidance as an example, the CDC itself states that it issued more than 180 guidance documents to advise healthcare providers regarding COVID-19. When revised, guidance documents do not have any red line or summary showing what changes were made and no archive of earlier versions of the guidance are maintained on the website. The CDC itself acknowledged issues with the COVID-19 guidance. On March 10, 2021, the CDC published a summary of a comprehensive review they did of COVID-19 guidance. The CDC principal deputy director stated in that summary, quote, as I conducted my review, I found it difficult to A, tell whether a new document represented a major or very minor update to an existing guidance, and B, decipher the core recommendations in long documents. She also noted that the guidance often lacked directive language, instead using terms such as consider and if feasible, and expressed concern that some guidance was not even primarily authored by CDC staff. For all these reasons, we oppose Raise Bill 1029. And thank you for your time. I know it's been a long day for you all. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And uh, well done on the three minutes. So, <laughs> well done. Um, 
questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you uh, sticking with us. Thank you so much. Uh, Erica Bradley, Irene Corsero, Matthew Matthew. Matthew Matthew. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, sir. Okay. Um, respected Chairs Winfield and Straystrom and other members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Matthew Matthew. I'm a resident of Danbury, Connecticut, and I would like to express my strong support and advocacy for the PROTECT Act 1059. As a 16 year old high school student at Danbury High School, it may seem uncommon to have a teenager speak within a political atmosphere. But though it is unconventional, I recognize the importance of using my voice as a youth member to fight for the social justice and public health equity desperately needed in our communities. At this point, we're living in a nation with the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world, disproportionately affecting people of color, and our government continues to fail to realize the inhumane actions our system accepts. My social awareness of the unacceptable impacts of solitary confinement comes from my personal experience with social distancing. Like so many of us, COVID-19 has brought unprecedented times impacting our social communication. But with the pandemic's impact of challenging most of our mental health status, it has allowed many people to advocate for a mainstream dialogue concerning the stigma with mental health. This led me to truly recognize the experience countless incarcerated individuals face. Though my social distance learning environment is temporarily, it is unimaginable to be in the position of an incarcerated person who has to go through this issue daily. With or without a pandemic, incarcerated individuals can face being locked in a cell for 23 hours a day without any type of social interaction. The neurological impacts of this form of punishment also are blatant. For instance, as prison facilities continue to normalize the practice of solitary confinement, this increases the risk for incarcerated individuals to decrease the size of their hippocampus, which is the brain region that controls spatial awareness, and increase the amygdala, which is basically the brain, part of the brain which functions fear and anxiety. The mental health effects of solitary confinement include anxiety and depression, and the impacts of solitary confinement can also cause greater violence among incarcerated people. So though we tend to believe that we're serving a term which will allow a person to have the opportunity for individual improvement, how can we truly believe this theory when we regulate practices that foster the opposite result? The PROTECT Act will effectively address these issues in the overall crisis, and one of the bill's most prominent features is that it prohibits all isolated confinement for more than 72 consecutive hours or 72 cumulative hours in 14 days. Though I do not have personal experience with solitary confinement, it is imperative that everyone rally together to protect all individuals. And while I understand that this law will become debated across this Judiciary Committee, I hope that we all recognize that this, that this issue is extremely personal and it's affecting many people. And this should neither be politicized nor partisan. And the fact of the matter is that change needs to happen and it is our duty as citizens and taxpayers of this state to make change. I urge you to vote for the PROTECT Act. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and um, very well done. Uh, congratulations. I don't know if this is uh, your first time speaking before a legislative committee or uh, city council at the age of 16, but uh, you, you, may, you may have a future in this, as they say. So uh, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Um, Amber uh, Kelly, um, Amber Kelly, oh, yes, yeah. go ahead, ma'am. Hello, Representative Staffstrom and other distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Amber Kelly and I'm a resident of New Haven, as well as Associate Professor of Social Work with Quinnipiac University. My scholarship and in intervention development focus on trauma-informed programming with survivors of violence, including those surviving incarceration in the United States. I'd like to state for the record that I am in strong support of SB 972, SB 1058, and SB 1059. I believe each of these bills works to support safer communities for us all by humanizing those incarcerated in our state. And I have submitted further written testimony for each of these bills. Today, in lieu of my further verbal testimony, I'm sharing the testimony of one of our Connecticut residents currently incarcerated at Robinson Correctional Institution. 
He wanted to testify in support of SB 972, but was unable to in person due to our current constraints for testimony from our incarcerated residents. This is his testimony. My name is Joshua Robillard, 415-115. I'm in support of the free phone calls in Connecticut. Since I've been down, and I've been down 15 months, it's been a lot of strain on my relationships with my wife and children. There are times I can't call home. There are times when I have to choose whether I want to call or eat food or get commissary soap. It's been a struggle. I'm definitely for the bill. Over the years, it's been thousands and thousands of dollars. In the last 15 months, it's been at least 1,500 between my wife, my kids, my grandson. It's out of control, actually. And I have my mortgage, my car insurance, things for my kids. It affects not just me, but them on the outside as well. The phone definitely helps. It helps with them on the outside. It's tough to get a letter out nowadays. It puts stress on me and it puts stress on them. It helps a lot when we can afford the phone calls and get the phone calls. And it helps a lot when we can talk about the future, the past, and how it's changed. There's a lot of changes in life. And with the money that's there, when your 15 minutes is up and your kids are upset, it affects them. They like to hear my voice, but with the cost of the phone calls, it's hard. It makes them upset. My grandson will say, call me back, call me in a couple of days, but then the phones don't work and it affects them. It affects me, it's a tough situation. It makes them upset. You don't love me, you don't call me, you're not there when I need to be there, and I can't call you. It's a struggle. It's been humbling today to hear from the formerly incarcerated folks and incarcerated folks and their families who had enough faith in this process to reopen wounds. We can all collectively, I feel grateful for the risks that they are taking and the vulnerability they have trusted in us and in this process with some of the horror stories we've heard. In some ways today has stood as a truth and reconciliation moment for our state around the isolation that has come with telecom barriers, the long-term PTSD impacts of solitary confinement and the lack of increased compassionate release options for those incarcerated here. I hope that this truth and reconciliation moment ends in action by this committee, pushing these bills forward, and thus pushing for safer and more connected communities for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, appreciate you being with us. Um, Erica Abraham. Hello. How you doing, ma'am? We can hear you. Hi, I'm Erica Abraham. Um, I just wanted to speak on the bill for the phones. Um, I have a family member that's currently incarcerated and due to the, you know, phone calls, it's hard to, you know, sometimes keep in touch with them or with him, with us. And especially with me, you know, being in the financial situation that I'm in now, it's, even harder. You know, I have three kids and one is autistic. So it's kind of hard to, you know, keep money in my pocket being a single mom to put, you know, money on the phone. And, you know, I know they give the free calls, which I really appreciate, but it's really, you know, not enough when you're trying to keep in contact with numerous family members. You know, my loved one has been incarcerated for almost 21 years now. You know, his daughter just turned one when he went in and he has a granddaughter now. And it's like, she's a young mom, she's in college and it's just a lot that you want to connect with and you can't because of the limited calls. And I feel like moving forward, it should be considered um, even with having to deal with certain situations like we had to tell my family member about our grandmother passing and over the phone and the phone call hung up and 10 days later you know we had to tell him about my mom which is his mom and he had to deal with that and it's, I just feel like if they were able to have longer calls or you know free calls to where it won't be such a burden on the family and um i'm sorry okay man. No. i just um yeah i just like will really wish um the bill could get considered passing 
Thank, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thanks for um, sticking it out with us all day and, and um, for your advocacy. Um, Representative Rabimbus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for your testimony. And my apologies, what was the relationship of the individual that's incarcerated to you? He's my brother. Your brother. Um, if I'm just trying to understand a little bit clearer as to the modes of communication options. Um, so you had mentioned that there are free calls. Do you know how many free calls he, he is allowed and to whom? I believe he's, because he it's me that he calls and his, his daughter that he calls. And I believe he has two calls, I believe. And that's on the weekend. Right. So two calls on the weekends and, and approximately how long are they? 15 minutes. Okay. And does, do you know whether or not he has any other abilities? Is there, does he have uh, internet availability or text messaging or, or anything? Oh, along those lines? No, he has none of that. Okay. And does he ever have the ability also to mail and do you guys send letters or any, or keep communication in that regard? I mean, yeah, we, we mail, he, he writes us and, you know, we write back, but you know, a call is so much better, you know, to hear their voice and, you know, if they're having a bad day, you know, they can call you and you can try to, you know, calm them down, especially what, what he went through there, you know, losing my grandmother and then 10 days later, my mom, like that was hard for him. And it hurt me that, you know, he had to deal with that alone and couldn't sure. call us back because, you know, the call went, the call went, you know, because the time was up and I just, you know, wanted to be there for him and I couldn't. No, of course. I mean, I'm sure having him behind bars like that too is probably a loss to you guys, just in a certain yes. a different way. Yes. In that regard. Yes, it um, is. Mm -hmm. And just kind of a, a follow up. So I know that some facilities had gotten Chromebooks. Um, do you know whether or not where your brother's at, if he has that, I guess the mm -hmm. asset, the, the Chromebook? No, he, no, he doesn't have no Chromebook. Okay. And it, only if you're comfortable, do you mind sharing what he is in prison for? He's in prison for manslaughter. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, obviously, for sticking with us all day and testifying on behalf of your brother. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further questions or comments? Um, seeing none. Uh, thanks again for being, being with us. Um, Next up is um, Juicy Reed Stiff. Um, I don't believe he's with us. And then Steve Carbone. Steve Carbone, I'm here. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Chairman Winfield, Chairman Stastrom, and members of the committee. My name is Steve Carbone. I'm a retired correction officer and now on staff at Council 4 AFSCME, which represents 4,200 state correction employees. I am testifying on behalf of correction locals 387, 391, and 1565 from Council 4. We have significant problems with Senate Bill 1059. We believe that this bill would put staff and inmate safety at risk. We know the intent is well-meaning, this bill does not reflect the reality that inmates and staff face. This bill reduces the already limited tools available to staff in controlling inmate behaviors. With fewer than 9,000 inmates in state custody, down from a high of over 20,000, those who are incarcerated are the more serious and challenging offenders to supervise. Keep in mind that the victims of inmate violence are overwhelmingly other inmates. These are vast changes to policies in handling inmates and working conditions. It is ill-advised to make even more changes considering the strains on the correction system. In addition to the fact that facilities are currently in the process of being closed and a wave of anticipated retirements will occur during the next 15 months, the legislature imposed a new duty to intervene on staff in the July Police Accountability Bill. We have seen this bill 
before us for only six days. It's moving too far, too fast, and it should be a part of your consideration. Corrections employees have tried to cooperate with new changes. Union leaders have urged members to abide by new rules and standards, even when they don't like them. Leaders stress responsibility and duty. Change is inevitable, but it is particularly difficult in a correctional environment where change can lead to instability. Passing this bill would require increasing the number of staff on duty from doctors to captains to correction officers. Connecticut correctional officers are largely unarmed. Our control of facilities is vital to preserving safety, the safety of the public, the staff and inmates. The inmates themselves are often, are most often the victims of violence and taking away tools we currently have available to us will undoubtedly lead to an increase in violent assaults on inmates and staff within the system. We urge caution. The Correctional Accountability Commission is of great concern. It seems inadvisable to have incarcerated people serving, serving on this body. This bill appears to give subpoena power to such inmates. This is a security risk. We appreciate that this bill does give some thought to, to the staff. We agree with sections providing PTS, PTSI, workers' compensation presumption for employees. Sir, we're at, we're at the three minute mark, so I just need you to- I wrap. appreciate it. I, I appreciate your time here tonight, um, but we rise in opposition of most of this bill, 1059. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Questions or comments? Um, seeing none, um, thanks for being with us. Thank you for your time. Um, next up will be Amber Flangus. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, Good evening, uh, Representative Sastrom and esteemed members of the Joint uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, my name is Amber Valangas and I am the Executive Director of the Restorative Action Alliance, a regional advocacy group made up of anti-carceral crime survivors, individuals who've been impacted by the criminal legal system and restorative justice advocates and practitioners. I'm here today to express my personal support and the support of the Restorative Action Alliance for both SB 1059 and SB 972. Both of these bills are built upon one simple concept, a demand that we affirm and recognize the dignity and humanity of both incarcerated people and their families. At RAA, we believe that every person has value, should have the opportunity to experience safety, rehabilitation, and be restored to their communities. This is not a possibility if we as a state are stripping people of their sense of safety, autonomy, and community through torturous and exploitative practices. I don't want to spend the rest of my time reading a written testimony. I want to share with you some of my personal experiences. I am the spouse of a person who spent his entire period of incarceration and admin separation. I've seen and experienced the consequences that occur when residents of our prisons and jails are not treated as human. My husband's a military veteran and had a diagnosis of PTSD. When he was incarcerated, he spent about a year, a short period of time behind bars. Though he's been home for several years and has received excellent care since that time, he remains deeply affected by the experience, which caused his mental health to deteriorate even more. I and other members of my family often support him through episodes of anxiety, depression, and hypersensitivity that are direct results of the isolation and mistreatment that he experienced behind bars. It's important to understand that incarcerated people are members of our community and they will return home. When we damage them, not only is it inhumane, we are also damaging ourselves. For this reason, we urge you to pass the PROTECT Act. I wanna talk a little bit about phone calls, which I personally know a lot about as the person who supported the cost of the calls when my husband was incarcerated to keep him connected with my four children, most notably my five-year-old son. 
Our bill was over $700 per month in order to keep our children connected to their father. And I often had to choose between whether I had heat at my home or whether I kept them connected. I relied on the generosity of friends and community members to help us get through that. For that reason, I urge the passage of SB 0972. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, if there's no question, oh, Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Langus, for your testimony. I'm just wondering if, if you're comfortable, if you could share how you think your husband's incarceration and the phone calls or the lack thereof has impacted his relationship with your children. So I have to say, I spent exorbitant amounts of money through the generosity of family, friends, coworkers of his. And so we were able to keep them connected. Um, they have good relationships. Um, he did miss my daughter's high school graduation and was unable to call her after her graduation. So that has left a big dent in their relationship. So it affected relationships all the way around. The other thing I wanna talk about in terms of that relationship is I often find myself running interference having my children understand some of the anxiety, some of the depression, some of the hypersensitivity, and having to explain why that is. So having to explain to my children what happened to their father when he was behind bars and why our country allows that to happen should not be a thing. And it puts me in a situation that is very stressful and our whole family in a very stressful situation. Well, thank you for talking about such personal things um, and for being here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Representative, and, and thank you, ma'am. Uh, obviously, we've heard, we've heard a lot of compelling testimony today, but, um, you know, we have a little ways to go. But, it, but certainly one of the things that will stick with me for a while leaving here today is the thought of having to choose between... Um, being able to talk, being able to have a dad communicate with his kids and afford heat. Um, and I just, I can't imagine in, in this country and in, in this state that that is a decision anyone should have to make. But um, thank you for putting such a punctuation point on it. Um, next up will be Karen Colt. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen of the Judicial Committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of SB uh, 1059. My name is Karen Colt. I'm a longtime resident of Vernon. Uh, I'm a mental health provider over, over 20 years and the mother of a recently incarcerated individual. Um, you heard from my son, Lee Colt, about an hour ago. My son Lee committed two robberies within two weeks in December of 2015 while he was addicted to opioids and was homeless. No one was injured and he netted about $73. In October of 2016, he was sentenced to a total of almost five years and remanded to McDougal as a level four. In January of 2020, he was moved to a level two dormitory style facility at Carl Robinson in preparation to transition to halfway house last fall and be released this spring. When COVID hit, he followed the news closely. No one knew how contagious or deadly this virus could be. And on 4-2 of 2020, the warden and two deputy wardens came to the unit, quote, to listen to inmate concerns. My son asked when and how they were going to address the safety of incarcerated people and COs since the COs were not using any PPE. 24 hours later, he and dozens of others in the facility were scooped up and taken to Northern Correction for, quote, impeding an order and presenting a safety risk. Lee received no order that he impeded and he posed no risk. He was put in administrative segregation as a level five dangerous inmate. He was able to get the ticket overturned at hearing, yet he remained 
he remained in isolated confinement despite his having no prior incidents and no history of violence during the entire time he had served. He exhausted all avenues of redress available to him. It was verbalized to him by a hearing officer that he was wasting his time in the hearing. The order had come from above and despite the fact that the video did not support the allegation, there were signed witness statements refuting the allegation. It was his word against a warden. There was no recourse to present his case to an independent person whose job did not depend on giving the right response to DOC. He spent the next 11 months in administrative segregation. If the goal was to separate Lee from those who respected his views, it could have been accomplished by transfer to a different facility at the same level, two or three. During the course of his incarceration, he did not share the level of torture that he had been exposed to either by direct experience or by witnessing in order to spare his father and I many sleepless nights. It's incomprehensible to me that in the United States of America, men can be placed in extended solitary confinement for asking an authority figure difficult questions. No violence, no threats, just a request for a viable safety plan. He isn't Nelson Mandela or Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He had no power or control over the group. Thank you. Ma'am, ma we're at we're a little past the three minute mark. I just need you to summarize. And just to, in summary, I support this bill and I correct, I commend the crafters of this bill in creating a level of accountability for decisions um, that would limit any one individual's ability to, expo to impose extended solitary confinement purely as a punitive measure and not uh, connected to any demonstrable safety risk. I appreciate your time and thank you all for staying so late to hear so many people's um, stories and experiences. It means a lot to all of us. And I know it means a lot to the folks that are still locked up. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> and thanks for sticking it out with us. Um, seeing no questions or comments from the committee. Uh, I think we have Germano Kimbrough up next. Thank you, uh, Representative Chair and uh, distinguished committee. My name is Germano Kimbrough. I'm a resident of New Haven, Connecticut, and I do have written testimony that I will submit, but I think that uh, we've uh, heard uh, very articulate, eloquent uh, de descriptions of the problem and um, it's been overwhelmingly uh, emotional and triggering and um, and the vicarious trauma uh, that I've experienced um, <clears throat> at this moment um, hopefully I can just get through and, 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 and highlight a couple points that I've heard in, during the course of the day um, but first I'd like to say that we have a problem in our correctional system and that uh, one thing for sure is that we cannot uh, fix a problem in the mindset in which it was created. We cannot fix a problem in the mindset in which it was created. And this um, problem was created in a particular type of mindset that still persists if we do not uh, do something radical. I heard someone talk about uh, the changes in policy <clears throat> happen in increments. And I think that this is you know, an opportunity to do some things that need to be done radically. I thought that we could have built on the progress that uh, Governor Malloy and, and Scott Simple have moved forward with the brain development in the truth unit, and uh, we can continue on that work. Uh, I'm a big proponent of the oversight and uh, accountability because I think for far too long, our system has been closed. It doesn't make sense to us as taxpayers and citizens of the state of Connecticut. I was incarcerated at the age of 16 and um, I was in isolation for making a little calendar on the wall for two weeks. Uh, I don't know if I ever got over that experience, um, but I spent the next 20 years in and out of the system. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a supporter of the retraining of officers. I remember there was one time that I was addicted to heroin and I came in and I was in detox. And instead of the officer understanding that, you know, I was going through withdrawal, I was stripped, beaten, handcuffed, kicked in the face and the head, thrown in a cell and charged with assault. And so for these reasons, I think that officers need to be retrained. Also think there needs to be overcome, uh, there needs to be oversight and accountability, you know, for the Department of Corrections. We could have not went from where I was at 16 years 
old to where we're at now, if there had been some accountability. We didn't just get here overnight. I've been out of uh, incarceration for over 30 years. I've obtained a full pardon um, and have a degree, and I'm actually a state worker um, for the uh, <clears throat> for Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. You know, I was thinking about um, uh, Nancy Wolf, uh, Warden um, Gill's statement, and she talked about you know, rehabilitation actually being laughable in the 80s during the time that I was actually incarcerated. You know, during that time, I took a GED test and got an associate's degree and applied to Trinity College during this time where rehabilitation was laughable, right? Sometimes I didn't even have books, so I had to pay attention in class and take good notes. Even being in minimum security and being home on successful furlough, I was humiliated. I was taken to Trinity College in handcuffs. And I wrote to the pardon board and asked for six months off my sentence to be reduced so that I could attend college after being accepted through that humiliating experience. I never got a reply. And it's one of the reasons that I worked with Bill Dyson to help reform and revise the, the pardon system. And, and that's that's another system that still needs some work. We've you know come a long way with that system, but I never heard anything back from the pardon board. Today, um, pre, uh, uh, Chairman Jow is doing a great job. I wanted to <clears throat> kind of uh, stay focused on solutions. Um, and so I think that, you know, at some point uh, we need to come out of the box and look at dismantling this system. You know, uh, Nazi Germany was looked at one of the most brutal prison systems in the world. If they can re revise and, and reform this system to one that is more humane, I don't see that why we can't do that here in the great state of America. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, questions or comments from the committee? If not, um, I want to thank you for, uh, for being with us and um, thank you for your work, uh, previous work on the pardon system. I think um, a number of us would agree with your statement that there's a lot to go, but a lot of work to do, but that's, um, that's that's for another hearing, I suppose, but maybe we'll, we'll call on your expertise then as well. So thank you for your time and thank you for all of you for your work that you put in tonight. Appreciate it. Next up will be uh, Mary Sanders. Good evening. Um, caught me off guard. I guess there were a couple other names before mine. Forgive me as I read from my computer. Uh, good evening, committee chairs and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Mary Sanders, and I'm part of the Stop Solitary Connecticut group. Born and raised in New Britain and a Hartford resident for close to 30 years. I'm here to testify in favor of Senate Bill 1059, the PROTECT Act, and other related bills pertaining to treatment of Connecticut inmates. I was happy to hear that Northern will be closing, but it's critical that practices used there to punish inmates are not replicated elsewhere. My background is one of social services, adult education, and employment programs. I most recently served 18 years as the executive director of the Spanish-speaking center of New Britain. Even as the director, I was the person who ran the career programs and provided direct service to people from shelters and those recently released from Department of Corrections. I knew I would understand them and not give up on them. I heard stories from many who had been locked up for years, a good number of them having spent plenty of time in solitary confinement or had received severe forms of punishment in their histories. For those who suffered for those who suffered under these circumstances, it was much more difficult to gain their trust, assess their skills and job readiness, and to convince an employer to give them a chance. Well, I had a placement rate of 80 to 85% for people with no history of incarceration. That dropped to 50 to 60% for those with the record. And for those who had experienced long stints of isolation, no contact with other inmates, let alone family, shackled to their beds, many with unaddressed substance abuse or psychiatric needs, I was rarely able to prepare them for the workplace. Some might make it after a year or two of counseling, intense case management, and other interventions, but many of them would return to the streets and eventually to the system that had broken their spirits. It had all been about punishment and little about correction and rehab. And I don't only speak from a pro professional perspective. I had my own juvenile record and was taken away from my family and community for 14 months as a teenager. It was about punishment, not rehab, and for petty things like skipping school, trespassing, fighting. But I was the poor kid from the projects, and nobody figured I'd amount to much anyway. So when I got out, still a minor, still a delinquent, and now estranged from my family, I continued to rebel and got into bigger trouble. 
Luckily, once I had children, I met folks who gave me hope and helped me get back on track and eventually went to college and became an executive director of a nonprofit. My younger sister wasn't as fortunate. After being in and out of York for years with no real rehab, her addictions continued. And although she was later clean for many years, she eventually died from AIDS, eight years younger than me. Again, it was all about punishment and not rehabilitation. I married into a large family and three of my nephews were in and out of the system. It's difficult for them to talk about their experiences, but I know how much their parents suffered when learning that their child was in isolation and could not have a visit or a phone call. Many former inmates I meet talk constantly about being violated for the most minor things and losing the little hope they had of seeing or calling family. They talk about being shackled, maced, physically assaulted by staff, which only exasperated the trauma of being locked up and made it much more harder to reintegrate upon release. Many of most inmates will eventually be released, no? So instead of these inhumane practices being used, how about more counseling, rehab, substance abuse treatment, vocational training, whatever it takes to make a person whole and not to further break them. I'm wrapping up. Please create a department of corrections, rehabilitation, not one of punishment. Please support the PROTECT Act, Bill 1059, and please support SB 972. And let's stop these predatory phone carriers who break the bank for families only trying to let their loved ones know that they still matter. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Uh, if not, I want to uh, thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Um, next up will be John Lugo. John Lugo with us. Let's try um, Judy Maddie, Judy Mate. Good Go evening ahead. to all. Blessings to all. My name is Judy Mate, and I am currently a resident of Walker, Connecticut. And I am the mother of inmate Lewis Junior Mate. His Connecticut inmate number for the record as follows is 287 207. He has been incarcerated for a period of 19 years in multiple prisons such as Northern, Walker, and McDougal. I would like to share it. I am very thankful to the committee who granted Lewis permission to give testimony to support Senate Bill 972 and Senate Bill 978 earlier today. When I heard my son's voice as he spoke, all I could do was weep and relive those hurtful moments and the absence of my son in all these years. <laughs> I personally would like to take time to thank you all and granting me the opportunity to express my concern on behalf of my family. And my goal today is to plead with you as a mother, as a Connecticut resident, as a Connecticut retiree, and as a Christian woman to seriously consider approval of these two bills, Senate Bill 972 and Senate Bill 978. These bills can help to reunite broken families as my family and to ease their financial burdens. It is vital for all inmates to be able to communicate with family members on a daily basis for their mental well-being and the mental well-being of all Connecticut families. As the effects of our loved ones being away in prison isn't enough, we have to endure securities high rates. And that has been one of the causes of emotional restraint on my family and on many Connecticut families as well as you already have heard from who have given their testimony here today. Let's make Connecticut a better place and let's take part in keeping everyone safe. In conclusion, thank you for your time and attention. I solely support Senate Bill 982 and 87. I am hopeful if this bill is passed that my son will be eligible for parole one day, granting him an opportunity to be part of society and reunited with loved ones once again. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Representative Palm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Matei, I just wanted to um, tell you thank you for your for your very moving testimony, and I'm so sorry for what you've been through. Um, the next time you talk to your son, please tell him to be proud of you because you did a great job, and we were listening. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, and thank you, ma'am, for being with us and sharing your son's story. Um, thank you. Good night. 
Let's try John Lugo again. Is John Lugo with us? If not, then we'll try um, Taylor Campbell. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead, sir. Excellent, thank you everyone. Uh, good evening, my name's Taylor Campbell and as my testimony, I'd like to play a recording from Reed who declined to share his last name but is currently incarcerated and would like to express support for SB 972. So please bear with me with the beeping and the rough audio quality. This is the reality of prison phone calls. Thank you, sir. Um, appreciate you sharing with us. Um, I will try John Lugo one more time. John Lugo. If not, um, Madam Administrator or Madam Clerk. No one else has signed up to testify that is available in the waiting room at this time. All right, well, I want to um, declare this public hearing closed. I want to thank all the members of the public who um, stuck with us on a, um, uh, on a certainly a long and, and heartfelt um, day. Um, I wanna thank uh, the members who uh, hung with us till the end. Um, and I wanna especially thank our, our staff um, you know, these are these are long days for the members of the public. They're, uh, you know, long days for for the members of the committee, but they are uh, the longest of days for our staff who um, was up last night on a Sunday night compiling the list and um, back at it getting all the technicals together this morning and, and stuck with us. So um, certainly they they uh, deserve our, our thanks uh, as we close this out. Um, with that, um, we will be back in action Wednesday with a uh, another public hearing, um, and we will uh, see everybody then. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good night.